Cary Grant, Rosalind Russell. The Gulf Screen Girl Theater. Your host, the director of the star's own theater, Roger Pryor. Good evening, everyone. Your neighborhood good Gulf dealer and the Gulf Oil Companies welcome you to the Gulf Screen Guild Theater. During the next half hour, you're going to hear a rollicking yarn about the craziest business in the world, the newspaper game. It's His Girl Friday, starring Rosalind Russell and Cary Grant, with music by Oscar Bradley's Gulf Orchestra with Frank Tours conducting. In just about two quick ticks of a watch, our two box office champions will come out of their corners fighting. While we're waiting for that to happen... I'd just like to remind you folks that today you're getting a lot more car for your money than ever before. And you might naturally think that the bigger the car, the more complicated the engine, the more care you'd have to give it. But thanks partly to your friend, the good Gulf dealer, cars today are actually easier to care for. Of course, there are some mighty important things to see to, such things, for instance, as checking the oil, the water, and the tires. If things like that aren't done and done regularly you may be in for a heap of trouble. That's why it's just plain common sense to stop at your local Gulf dealers. You see, he's trained himself to look after such things. Every month, he gets a special eight-page folder with information about the latest cars, how to care for them, what things to look for that might cause you trouble. So give him a chance to give you really top-notch service. Tomorrow, stop at the sign of the Gulf Orange Disc at your neighborhood good Gulf dealers. And here come the stars, Cary Grant and Rosalind Russell are just making their entrances on our Gulf Theater stage. The house lights fade, and here are Rosalind Russell as Hilde Johnson and Cary Grant as Walter Burns. I'll play the part of Bruce Baldwin. And now, his Girl Friday. office of Walter Burns, managing editor of the Morning Post. The door opens to admit Hildy Johnson, ex-star reporter and former wife of Walter Burns, who has dropped in for a farewell visit with her one-time husband. Walter's busy talking on the phone and doesn't see Hildy. Don't give me that duffy, you drag your bloody carcass out of that juke joint. Find the governor. You are two in a juke joint. I can hear music through the phone. You tell him, Walter. Shut up. Now listen, Duffy, the governor has to sign that reprieve because if Earl Williams gets hung tomorrow morning, the Morning Post is washed up. Now find the governor. Of all the petrified pit... Hilde! Hello, Walter. Well, Hilde. Hilde. Hmm. Hmm. Gee, it's good to see you. Thanks, Walter. Let's see. Uh, how long has it been? Well, I was in Reno six weeks, then Bermuda. Oh, about four months, Walter. Ah, uh, Hilde, you look wonderful. Yeah, you look like the latest edition right off the press. And aren't you sorry your subscription's been canceled? <laughs> Hilde, I could cry. You did the wrong thing. You never should have divorced me. Makes a fellow lose all faith in himself. Gives him a feeling he wasn't wanted. Now, that's a beautiful understatement, but you see, that's what divorces are for. Nonsense, Hilda. You've got the old-fashioned idea that divorces last till death do us part. Well, divorce doesn't mean anything today. Hilda, we've got something between us. Nothing can change. Oh, I suppose that's true in a way. Not a girl. I just wish you weren't such a stinker. Hmm? <laughs> now, why did you promise not to fight our divorce and then do everything you could to gum up the whole work? Oh, well, I was only a husband trying to protect his home. What home? What home? Don't you remember the home I promised you since we got back from our honeymoon five years ago? No, what a honeymoon. Instead of two weeks in Atlantic City, we spent two weeks in a caved-in coal mine with a man named Krupski. <laughs> yeah, wasn't that a whale of a story? Oh, look, what's the use of fighting, Hildy? You come back to work on the paper, and if we find we can't get along in a friendly way... We'll get married again. What? Oh, Walter, you are wonderful in a loathsome sort of way. Well, thanks be to heaven, you're no longer my husband and no longer my boss. Look, third finger, left hand. Hmm, very pretty ring. Isn't it? Yep, wonderful what you buy at the dime stores. (laughs) Now, this was given to me, Walter. I am getting married. And Mm. I'm also getting as far away from the newspaper business as I can get. Really? Hmm. What do you do? Get some poor guy drunk, make Google eyes at him? Why, you bumble-headed baboon, if you All don't right, stop all right, go ahead, get married. I know his type, one of those matrimonial draft dodgers. <laughs> Where'd you meet this heel? 
On the beach in Bermuda. What is he, a beachcomber? What's his name? His name is Bruce Baldwin, and he's in the insurance business. Hmm. And he's kind, and he's sweet, and he treats me like a woman. How did I treat you? Like a water buffalo? (laughs) And he wants a home and children. Ooh, it sounds more like a guy I ought to marry. (laughs) Don't you think I ought to meet this paragon and, well, you know, sort of congratulate him? That's so sweet of you, Walter, but when you're sweet, somebody always gets loused up. Oh, no. Hildy, Hildy, you don't mean to say you're afraid to have me meet him. Afraid? Now, why should I be afraid? I'll call him in. He's right outside. Baldwin, Baldwin. I knew a Baldwin once. Pickpocket in St. Louis. Couldn't be. Oh, Bruce. Yes, Hildy? Come in, dear. Is, uh, is anything wrong? No, no. Everything's under control. Bruce, I want you to shake hands with the best managing editor and the worst husband I ever had, Walter Burns. Well, this is a mighty fine pleasure, Mr. Burns. Well, thank you, Bruce. Give me back my hand, will you? Well, well, well. You're the lucky man, huh? You know, Bruce, certainly hate to lose Hildy. She's a fine newspaper man. If I ever needed her, this is the time. Now, no office, Walter. Well, Earl Williams case, well, I'm Bruce. afraid I'm behind in the news, Mr. Burns. Uh, who is Earl Williams? Well, he was just a poor little bookkeeper who lost his job. He went screwy, traveling around the parks, making soapbox speeches. A cop came to quiet him down, Bruce. Yeah, William shot the cop, and tomorrow morning, Williams hangs. Well, if Williams was crazy when he did it, why doesn't the state put him away? No, because there's an election coming up in a few days, and the mayor is using the gallows for a bandwagon. Yeah, the mayor would hang his own grandmother to be re-elected. Well, I'm certainly glad you told me. I won't vote for him. No. Uh, spoken like a true rover boy, Bruce. Now, uh, look, Walter... Don't they have to have another expert examine Williams before they hang him? Sure, a guy named Engelhoff is going to do it. He'll say Williams is sane just like the rest. Well, suppose he does. Well, what do you mean, Hildy? Now, look, Walter, why don't you get an interview with Earl Williams? Uh-huh. Then print Engelhoff's statement. Yeah, yeah. And right alongside of it, you know, double column yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, go on. Uh, you run the Williams interview. Uh-huh. Alienist says he's sane, yeah. and the interview shows he's goofy. Oh, Hildy, it's wonderful. You could do it. You could save that poor devil's life. Yes, I know. I... Oh, no, I couldn't, Walter. No, Bruce and I are taking the 4 o'clock train to his home in Albany. Now, Hildy, we could take the 6 o'clock train if it would save a man's life. No, hey, Bruce. Listen to Bruce. No, Bruce, I am through with this crazy business. Well, that's right. Now, look, Brucey boy, I'll tell you what. You persuade Hildy to do this story, you can write yourself a nice fat policy for oh, me. Oh, Mr. Burns, I couldn't use my wife for business purposes. Uh... Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, Bruce. What's the commission on a nice fat policy of, say, uh... $10,000, No, let's quick. say $100,000. Too quick. Oh, $100,000. Now, wait a minute. 100, uh, well, the commission on that would be a thousand. Bruce, Bruce, we could use the thousand dollars. Now, how long would it take to have Walter examined? Oh, I could get a company doctor here in ten minutes. How about it, Tiger? Oh, I thought you meant me. Okay, okay, get the company. All right, all right, it's a deal. Now, look, Bruce, I'll be in the press room of the criminal courts building. Mm -hmm. That's right by the jail where they've got Williams. Now, you phone me as soon as you've got Walter's check, and be sure it's certified. Maybe you'd like my fingerprints, too. (laughs) No, thanks. I've still got those. (laughs) Hey, Bruce. How much money have you got on you? Five hundred dollars. It'll be safer with me. But Hildy... Now, now, really, dear, I know what I'm doing. Mr. Burns might get you into a crap game. But, Hildy, I don't gamble. Darling, I knew a little man once who didn't drink till he met Walter Burns. Now they've got him in a bottle at Harvard. (laughs) Now, let me have the money, dear. Well, all right, here. Thank you, darling. Now, Walter, no tricks. No tricks, Hildy. Honest, I cross my heart. I'll even go further than that. I know. You'll double-cross mine. Criminal Court's press room. Who? Hey, Hildy, it's for you. Thanks, Jake. Hildy Johnson speaking. Oh, hello, Bruce. You got the check? Certified? Oh, fine, dear. Wait a minute, though. Maybe it isn't so fine. Look, Bruce, put the check in your hat. In your hat, dear. Yeah, I know it sounds silly, Bruce, but, but do it for me. And don't let Mr. Burns see you. That's fine, dear. Now go right down to the railroad station and wait for me. I'll be there just as soon as I can. Hello, Walter Burns speaking. Who? Oh, yes, Louis. Look, I've got a job for you. No, you don't have to croak anybody. All you have to do is pick up a beefy gent by the name of Bruce Baldwin at the railroad station. He's got my certified check in his wallet. And I want that check back, you understand? Great. Oh, oh, Louis. Do you think you could fix it so that Mr. Baldwin would be very busy around 4 o'clock? Fine, thanks. Hello, Hilda Johnson speaking. Yes, Bruce. Where are you? You're what? In jail? For stealing whose watch? His name is Louie. Now, listen, don't worry, dear. Just hang up and I'll get you out of there right away. That double-faced, triple-crossing, two-timing snake. I'll show him he can't. Hello? Hello, Walter. I've got some news for you. 
Now get this, you double-crossing chimpanzee. If I ever lay my two hands on you again, I'll hammer that monkey skull of yours so hard it'll ring like a Chinese gong. Oh, you don't, don't you? Well, maybe Louie can tell you why Bruce is in jail for stealing somebody's watch. Goodbye, you run over heel. I'm going to Albany, and you can go to... Well, boys, you heard it. So long, you copy slaves. Ah, you're leaving, Hildy. It does my heart good to hear Walter Burns told of. When we see you again, Hildy. You and the criminal courts building are never going to see me again, Jake. I'm going to be a wife and not a news-getting machine for a two-faced maniac. I'm never even going to read a newspaper again. I'm going to Albany and settle the... Hey, what's that? It's a jailbreak. Hey, look, it's Williams. He's crawling along the edge of that roof there. Get out of my way. Hello. Let me speak and give me the desk. Hey, Mike, get this. Earl Williams just... Hello, Shut up, you lughead, and get this. Earl Williams just escaped from the county jail. Yes, yes, don't worry, Walter. Hilda's on the job. Us on. I thought you were on the job. Uh, yes, Weasel. But I gotta get the exclusive story, and I've got it now on Williams and how he escaped. But it cost me five hundred bucks to tear it out of the warden. Never mind that. What's the story? You'll get it when you pay me the five hundred. That money belongs to Bruce. Oh, you'll get it back. I swear it on my mother's grave. All right, wait. Just a minute. Your mother's alive. All right, on my grandmother's grave. Don't be so technical. Well, send over the money, and you'll get the story. Otherwise, no soap. What's the matter with you, Hildy? Why worry about a little money? I'll see if you get it right away. Hold the wire a second. Louis. Yeah, boys. I need five hundred dollars worth of counterfeit money. No, I just happen to have it on me. Thanks. Hello, Hilly. The money's on the way. Louie's starting right now. He'll be there with the 515 minutes. He's got to pass the bank anyway. Okay, Walter. Wait a minute. It's after 3 o'clock. The banks are closed. Not to Louie. Now, listen, Hilly. While you're waiting, see if you can pick up an eyewitness. Okay, Walter. I'll call you back a little later. <whistles> what a day. Uh, come in here, Fred. I think we can... Oh, oh, hello, Miss Johnson. I thought this room was vacant. Greetings, Sheriff Hartwell. Hello, Hildy. And the mayor, too. Well, well, I imagine after what's happened, you two boys want to be alone. Be seeing you on the front page. Huh. Did you hear that, Sheriff? This blunder of yours will make me the laughing stock of the town. No, Mayor. Williams can't get away. If he does, I'm absolutely washed up in next week's election. Why, his hanging was one of my solemn campaign promises. What do you want? My name is Petty Pond. I don't care who you are. I said, what do you want? I'm looking for Sheriff Peter B. Hartwell. I'm the mayor. He's the sheriff. Well, go away, Mr. Pettibone. I'm busy. But, Sheriff, I've got a message for you from the governor. It's a reprieve for Earl Williams. What? <laughs> what does this mean, Sheriff? You promised me there wasn't going to be a reprieve. Well, no, Fred. How did I Mr. know? Mr. Pettibone, who else was there when the governor gave you that reprieve? Why, nobody, Mayor. He was out fishing. Hmm. Hello. Yes, yes, this is the sheriff. What? Holy Moses. Fred, the rifle squad has Williams trapped right up on the roof. Cover up that mouthpiece. Listen, you, Mr. Petty Bone. Petty Bone. You never arrive at this reprieve. Yes, but I... Here's a really... hundred bucks that says you didn't. Oh, well, you understand? I... You never brought this reprieve. Well, I don't know whether my wife would Here, like you to... got her this address, and uh, you forget you ever had a uh, wife. Uh, you told the mayor sent you. Goodbye. Fred, the captain in charge of the rifle squad is still on the phone. Good. Well, what'll I tell him to do about Williams? You tell him to shoot the kill. <laughs> I'm back in the press room. I just called to say goodbye. Oh, you got the money? Yes, Louie brought the 500, and I'm going to get Bruce out of jail on the way to the railroad station. No hard feelings, Hildy. No, no, of course there's no hard feelings. Walter. What's the matter? There's someone at the window. He crawled down from the roof. Walter, listen. Drop that phone. Williams. Stand back. Put that gun down, Earl. No, I won't. You're not going to shoot me, Earl. Why, I'm your friend. I don't believe you. You're going to tell them I'm here, so they'll hang me. Earl, Earl, put down that gun. I'm going to kill you. Oh! Oh, I guess I used all the shells. I can't shoot you. I can't shoot anybody. Oh, Earl, you must never do that again. Give me that gun. Oh, I'm awful tired. I couldn't go through another day like this. I couldn't go through the last minute. Oh, they'll hang me now, right out there. I saw the gallows. No, 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 they won't. No. Now, listen, don't worry, Earl. I'll save you. If there were only some place to... Earl, get in that desk. Oh, no, no, it's... Too no, late. no, it isn't too late. The desk, the other reporters won't find you in there. Get in the big roller top desk and pull the lid down. Come on, come on, Earl, get in. Well, all right. You can trust me, Earl. Now listen, pull the lid down and remember, whatever happens, don't make a sound. Hello, hello, Walter. Are you still there? Listen, I'm all right. I really am. Now listen, stick on that hat of yours and beat it over here as fast as you can. I've got the hottest exclusive story in town wrapped up in a roller top desk. Mr. Burns, believe it or not, your ace reporter, Hildy Johnson, has just captured Earl Williams. And 
that, folks, was Act One. Cary Grant and Rosalind Russell will be back following our usual brief intermission, which we will put to good use with some mighty helpful information. A man or woman who drives a car hears a lot of talk about motor oils, and a good deal of it can be mighty confusing. And yet any motorist can easily determine just how good a motor oil actually is. You can tell with your eyes, your ears, and your pocketbook. Take Gulf Pride motor oil, for instance. Use Gulf Pride in your car, and your eyes tell you that Gulf Pride stays up to the full mark a long, long time. Your ears tell you that Gulf Pride helps keep your motor purring like a contented kitten. And your pocketbook tells you that Gulf Pride helps keep repair bills down with a capital D. That's because Gulf Pride motor oil is refined by the famous Alclor process, a process that makes Gulf Pride more resistant to the chemical breakdown of oil that's caused by air. So, being more air-resistant, Gulf Pride forms less sludge, less carbon, less engine varnish. Naturally, then, it lasts longer, gives you finer lubrication, and saves you money. So, next time, let your eyes, your ears, and your pocketbook be your guide, and get Gulf Pride motor oil. Now the curtain of the Gulf Screen Guild fit is ready to rise on the second act of Ben Hecht and Charles MacArthur's great play, His Girl Friday, starring Rosalind Russell as Hildy Johnson and Cary Grant as Walter Burns, her ex-husband and managing editor of the Morning Post. It's a short time later, and Walter, in response to Hildy's excited summons, has arrived at the press room of the criminal courts building. He's bending over the roll-top desk where Hildy has hidden the escaped Earl Williams. Hildy, having completely forgotten that Bruce Baldwin, her fiancé, is still waiting for her to get him out of jail, is pounding out her story on the typewriter. Even though you got Hildy, and going to smear it over the front page. Earl Williams captured by the morning post. Hey, Williams, how are you doing in there? Let me out. I can't stand it. Keep quiet. I kept the blonde in there for three days. Once, what have you got to squawk about? Maybe he wants you to put the blonde back. <laughs> Hello? Yep, Dubby. Dubby, here's your leaf for that story. The blackest page in American history. You got that? Set it up. I'll shoot you the copy just as fast as Hildy pounds it out. And Walter, Duffy. I just happened to think. Hello, Duffy. You still there? All right, look. Send over Butch and a dozen strong arm guys. I want to move Williams and the desk out of here. Walter, I've got to go. Then order out the window with pulleys, you dope. Can you imagine that? Hey, Hildy, where do you think you're going? I've got to get Bruce out of jail. Are you crazy? How can you worry about a man who's resting in a nice, quiet police station while this is going on? Hildy, this is war. You can't desert me. I've got to collect Bruce and catch that train. We're getting married. You drilling idiot. There's 365 days in a year you didn't get married. How many times you got a murderer locked up in a desk? Once in a lifetime. Oh. Hildy, you kicked over the city hall like an apricot. You got the man, the sheriff, backed against the wall. This isn't just a newspaper story. It's a career. And you stand there worrying about getting married. Gee, Walter, I, I never figured it that way. Aye, Hildy, they'll be naming streets after you. They'll be statues of you in the park. The radio will be after you. The movies. By tomorrow morning, I bet you there's a Hildy Johnson cigar. I can see the billboards now. It says, line up with Hildy Johnson. Oh, Walter, stop that hammer. <laughs> we got a lot of work to do. Yeah, now you're talking. Now, as soon as Butch and the boys get here, we'll move Williams and the desk over to my office. Now, sit down that typewriter. Get the story rolling. All right, Walter. Can I call the mayor a bird of prey? Call him anything you like. Give him the works. What the blazes happened to Butch? Why doesn't he? Is that you, Butch? No, it's me. Bruce. Oh, it's a bat, you Bruce. Now, what the devil do you want? Why don't you stay in jail? Well, I've got to talk to Hildy. Well, come on in. I've got to keep this door shut. Hildy? Uh, Hildy? What? Oh, Bruce, how did you get out of jail? Well, not through any help of yours. Will you please tell me? I'd be trying you to tell him nothing. He's a spy, Hildy. Now, you keep out of this. Hello? Yes, this is Walter Burns. Uh, Hildy, what happened to a you? A story, Bruce. A wonderful story. Now, wait a minute, Butch. What do you mean you, you know can't what I had over? to do, Hildy? I had to wire home for $100. Oh, really, I'm bail. sorry, Bruce. Really, here's your 500 you gave me to keep. I'll explain what? everything later. Now, listen, Butch, I'm depending on you. Wait a second. Hildy, will you please get going on that story? Yes, Walter, excuse me, But, Bruce, Hildy, please. this isn't the money I gave oh, you. Oh, I what? know, I know. I spent that. I got this from Walter. Now, now get this straight, Butch. You make tracks over here. Hildy, dear, I'm taking that 9 o'clock train. And don't forget to bring your gang. Are you coming to Albany with but me, Hildy? I'm pounding on you, Butch. Don't let me down. Did you hear me? I said, oh, are you coming? Please, com- I'm trying to write. Why, Hildy. Kind of girl, Hildy. Now, you shut up, Mr. Burns. What? You're doing all this to her. Hildy, I don't think you love me oh, at all. Oh, darn it. I broke my nail. Yeah, I see what you did. You broke her nail. I see what you are now. You're just a reporter. A story means more to you than a clean, honest life in Albany. Oh. But in case you come to your senses, I'll be at the station waiting for the 9 o'clock train. Goodbye. Now, can you imagine a guy like that? Now, come on. Come on, Hildy. Keep that typewriter hot. Now, look here, you. I can't stay in here any longer. Hey, Williams, get back in that desk, you mock turtle, and stay there. Don't come out again unless you hear three knocks. Like that. Now, you got that? Good. Now, sit tight. Now, how's it coming, Hildy? Pretty good. Where's Bruce? 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 Who's Bruce? Oh, Bruce! You went out to get a cup of coffee. Oh, is he coming back? I didn't...
You hear what he said? Sure he's coming back. Yeldy, you'll be back any minute. Keep that copy rolling. Hello? Hello, Duffy? Well, where is Duffy? Oh, he is? All right, all right. When he comes back, trying to get him alone, this boy. I got a hunch Butch's ratted on us. Call me back. Well, what have you got, Hildy? And while hundreds of the sheriff's relatives spread their reign of terror, Earl Williams was lur- lurking just 20 yards away. All right, pick Meanwhile, up the mayor, you... You double What are you in there for? I mean you, you backfiring Zach Hart. Hey, I just remembered. Remember what? Bruce isn't coming back here at all. He said he was taking the 9 o'clock train. Oh, well, in that case, he's gone by now. Don't sit there like a frozen robin. Get on with the story. What a sap I am. Yes, well, now you've had a nice rest. Get back to work. I'm not going back to work, Walter Bain. I'm still... Uh, no, listen to me. I've still got 10 minutes to meet Bruce and catch the 9 o'clock train, and I'm going. Now, uh, Hilly, don't open that door. I'm going to Bruce. Hilly, don't! Just don't try and stop me, that's all. Oh, well, hello, Hilly. Oh, hello, Sheriff. We were just looking for you. Listen, Sheriff, I've got a train to catch. But a holy Sheriff. Yeah, she and Walter Burns are cooking up something. Now, oh, wait a minute, boys. What do you mean by breaking in here like this? Oh, let go of me, will you? Ask her where William said. Yeah. Hilly doesn't know anything. Hilly, I want you to talk. All right, what do you want me to say? What do you know about Earl Williams? What do you know about Earl Williams? No, i got ways of making you talk. Hilda, you're under arrest. And you too, Burns. Who's under arrest? Listen, you insignificant, square-toed, droop-snooted spy. Do you realize what you're doing? I'll show you what I'm doing. Burns, you're obstructing justice, and I'm going to see that you're fined $10,000. You'll see nothing of the kind to work. And I'm going to begin by impounding the Morning Post property. Is that roller top desk yours? No! Yeah! Why, of course it is, Hildy. Why lie to the sheriff? Huh? Sheriff! I dare you to move that desk out of here. Oh, why, yes, Sheriff. You just dare move it out. I warn you, Sheriff, you touch this desk, you'll be sued. Oh! What was that? There's someone in that desk. No, it was just my knees knocking, Sheriff. You've got Williams in that desk. Stand back, everybody. Get out your guns, men. No, wait a minute. Don't shoot him. He's harmless. Williams is a dangerous criminal. Shoot right through the desk. No! Call Duffy! Keep away from that pole. You want to get a scoop, you beetle-faced mongoose? Everybody aim at the center. When I say three... One, One, two... Hello, Daily Bulletin. Hold the press. And... Williams! I couldn't stay on there any longer, Miss Hildy. Go ahead, Sheriff. I give up. Go ahead. Shoot me. He's unarmed, boys. We got him. Flash, Earl Williams captured in criminal court's press room. Flash, Earl Williams. And come in, boys. Flash, Williams in desperate struggle, but police overpowered him. Take him away, boys. I'll be with you as soon as I finish with these two. Come on, Williams. Ah, oh, Duffy. The morning post just turned Williams over to the sheriff. Oh, give me that phone, Burns. Well, Sheriff, what's all the excitement? We got Williams, Mayor. Caught these two red-handed trying to kidnap him. Splendid, Sheriff. I think they both get ten years for this. Anytime you think you can lick the morning post, Mayor, it's time for you to get out of town. Yeah, uh, we've been in worse jams than this, haven't we, Hilly? No, Walter, we haven't. Thanks, Ed. You forget the power that always watches over the morning post, Mayor. Hello, Duffy, get my lawyer. All the lawyers in the world aren't going to go... Poise, oh, poise, oh, poise, oh, poise. Terrible. I mean, who is this man? Why, don't you remember me, Mayor? I'm the man that brought you the Earl Williams reprieve. Wait a minute. You don't mean a reprieve from the governor. Of course not, you Oh, know. but of course, yes. And here's your money back, Mayor. My wife said I shouldn't take bribes. Bribes? Who was trying to bribe you? A hundred dollars. That's all he gives me. Well, the man's an imposter. I never... Besides, he's insane. Uh. You're both another. Why, you uh... I I gave them the Earl Williams reprieve hours ago, but they gave it right back to me and a hundred dollars to forget all about it. Uh-huh. So you would hang an innocent man, would you? You're trying to swing an election with a rope, eh? No, Harry. no, no, no. I wouldn't hang an innocent man. But <laughs> my dear girl, you you've got the wrong attitude. My dear man, Williams almost got the wrong altitude. Now, let's forget this little incident. Come along, Sheriff. We'll take dear Mr. Pettibone over to the warden's office and deliver this reprieve ourselves. I'm sure it's all a little misunderstanding that might happen to anyone. That was a tight squeeze, Walter. Yeah. Hello. Hello, give me Duffy. Oh, of course, there was the time we stole old Lady Haggerty's stomach off the coroner's table. <laughs> yep. Yeah, we've had some swell times, Hildy. Million laughs. But it's all over and you're doing the wise thing, Hildy. The newspaper game is a bad business. Well, well, you better get going. Meet Bruce. Oh. Oh, gee, Bruce is gone by this time. Well, send him a wire, honey. Meet him in Albany. You really mean that, Walter? Sure, I mean it. Now, can't you understand I'm doing something noble for once in my life? Get out of here, honey, before I change my mind. Walter, gee, listen a minute, will you? Uh... No, no, I know I made fun of Bruce. I know I got him in Dutch. You know why? Why, Walter? Uh, because I was jealous of him. You were? Yes. 
Yes, because he can give you the sort of life you want, Hildy. I'm sorry. I promise you Bruce will have no more trouble. Well, I, you know, I could stay and do the story and take the train in the morning. No, no, no. Forget I... it. Forget it. You better go. Hello, Duffy. Read me what you got so far. I'll get the other phone. Hello. Yes, this is Hildy Johnson. The 43rd Street Police Station. Did you say Bruce Baldwin? Arrested again? For passing counterfeit money. Oh, 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 hold on, Duffy. A little trouble coming up on this end. You sure it's counterfeit? And he says I gave it to him. Oh, I see. Goodbye. Now, 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 Hildy, I think I can explain. I don't blame you for being mad and... Well, if you're going to throw that telephone at me, go ahead. Get it over with. Oh, Walter, you darling. Oh, oh honey, what are you crying about? Oh, now, you never cried before. Oh, I thought you really wanted me to go away with Bruce. I thought you didn't love me. Oh. Now, what were you thinking with, honey? Yeah, I don't know. Well, what are you standing there gawking for? Send Louie down to the jail and give Bruce sure. some honest money so he can go back to Albany where yes. he belongs. Yes, yes. Hello, Duffy. Everything's fine now. Hilly and I are coming back to the office. No, she's not quitting. We're going to be married again. Walter, can we go on a honeymoon this time? Certainly, darling. Jeez. Duffy, you can be married together. Well, I'm on my honeymoon. Atlantic City, Walter. Yeah, Atlantic City, Hilda. A whole two weeks, Walter. Certainly, a whole two... Wait a minute. What's that, Duffy? A strike? What strike? In Albany? Oh, now I can't all have right, to... All right, all couple... right. We'll honeymoon in Albany. Fine. Fine. Hey, Hilda. What? Well, I just thought of something. Albany. What is it, Walter? Hey, I wonder if Bruce has got a spare room. (laughs) Thank you, Cary Grant and Rosalind Russell. It was swell of you to give up time from busy shooting schedules to do this performance tonight in the Gulf Screen Guild Theater. As you know, ladies and gentlemen, our stars contribute their performances here in the Gulf Theater, and the money which the stars would normally receive, Gulf gives instead to the Motion Picture Relief Fund toward the building of a home for the less fortunate members of the picture industry. Next week, the marquee of the Gulf Theater will read Ginger Rogers and William Powell. Ginger Rogers, in her first radio appearance since winning the Academy Award, starred with one of your favorite screen comedians, William Powell, in Lucky Partners. It's a story about a girl and a psychology-minded artist whose luck changes the minute they meet. Everything goes splendidly until they decide to go on an experimental vacation together a week before the girl is to marry another man. It's one of the funniest comedies of the season. There'll be music, of course, by Oscar Bradley's Gulf Orchestra with Frank Tours conducting. So tune in the Gulf Screen Guild Theater next Sunday night at this same time. It's William Powell and Ginger Rogers in Lucky Partners. Rosalind Russell will soon be seen in MGM's The Uniform. Cary Grant's latest for Columbia Pictures is Penny Serenade. And remember, you have a date to attend the Gulf Theater a week from tonight when we present Lucky Partners, starring Ginger Rogers and William Powell. Until next week, then, this has been Roger Pryor speaking for your neighborhood good Gulf dealer. Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Irene Dunn and Joseph Cotton in Penny Serenade with Edgar Buchanan. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Somewhere in the life of every man and woman, there's a book or a play, if the true story were known. 
But many people miss half the joy of living because they see only routine dullness in their own lives instead of drama. In Penny Serenade, there's all the excitement of great events in the simple, everyday incidents of one home. There's something truly universal about this story of one man and one woman whose faith in each other has been lost along the way, but who have the courage to reach out again for happiness. It's a play that, that makes high demands on its stars. So tonight we have the same talented artist you saw in the Columbia picture, Miss Irene Dunn. And co-starring with her is one of the important discoveries of recent Hollywood history, Joseph Cotton. Irene, incidentally, has just returned from New York, where her new Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer picture, White Cliffs of Dover, is opening this week. You know, there's quite a story behind the production of any one of our plays. Actually, it begins in stores all over the nation when you go in and ask for Lux Flakes. But here in this theater, it begins with the selection of a script from the best that Broadway and Hollywood have to offer. In the casting, our stars come first. But the same careful attention is given to even the smallest bit parts. And then all the different elements meet at rehearsal, with actors, writers, engineers, sound technicians, musicians, and stagehands, each a part of the human machine that does the job. Teamwork makes any task easier. And Lux Flakes is ready to join the team at your house at the drop of a soap bubble. And here's the signal for the curtain to go up on the first act of Penny Serenade, starring Irene Dunn as Julie and Joseph Cotton as Roger, with Edgar Buchanan as Applejack. Our scene is quite simple. An automobile parked on the main street of a small town. Two people, a man and a woman, are sitting quietly in the front seat. The passerby would see nothing wrong. But in this everyday setting, tragedy is taking place. And the lives of two people are changing course. The man is silent, brooding. With a sudden movement, he opens the car door and gets out. What's the matter, Roger? Take the car on home. What about you? I'm not coming home. I don't ever want to see anything or anyone that reminds me. All right. Goodbye. Oh, Roger. Yes? When you do come home, I may not be there. Where are you going? I'm not sure. I don't know. Well, I guess Applejack's there. He'll he'll help you if you want anything. Yes. Goodbye, Roger. Bye, Julie. Well, I guess that's everything. Will you call the station, Applejack? Make sure they've got my reservation. That if you'll carry the grips down the car for me, I'd like you to drive me to the train, please. Miss Julie, you'd better think this over. I have been thinking it over, Applejack. I've been thinking it over for days. I'm leaving. You and Roger have been married a long time. But we don't need each other anymore. And when that happens to two people, there's nothing left. Miss Julie, I guess I've known you two people better than anyone in my whole life. What with working with the boss on the paper here and seeing everything that's happened, why... Like... Well, somehow it just doesn't seem right that... Applejack, please. I'm leaving. Yes, Miss Julie. Oh, I meant to ask you. I found these records. Do you want to take them along with you? Which records? These phonograph records you've been collecting all these years. Oh. You made them into an album, remember? The story of a happy marriage. Hmm. A happy marriage. Well, you were out before I played a couple of them. Nice tunes. Do you remember this one, Miss Julie? Let me see. Oh, yes. Yes, I remember when we bought this record. I remember the first time I ever heard it. The day I met Roger. It was in the phonograph store I worked in 12 years ago. We were playing this tune on the loudspeaker, and Roger was standing out on the sidewalk. I was fixing some records in the window when I looked up and saw him. He was smiling at me. <laughs> I thought he was pretty fresh. The next thing I knew... He was inside the store. Hello. Yes, is there anything I can do for you? Hmm? Oh, oh, yes. Uh, uh, that's a new tune, isn't it? Yes, yes. We just got it in today. It'd be nice to dance to, wouldn't it? <laughs> yes, would be. Yes. Would you like to buy it? Well, uh, what's on the other side? Another new one. Oh, can I hear it? Certainly. Right over here, booth three. I mean, would you play it for me? If you want. Thanks, sir. 
wait, as long as you're listening, might as well hear some of these others, too. I'll just take the stack here. There we are. Oh, well, now, wait a minute, please. Oh, it's all right. I can carry them. Get along fine. Now, let's see. You sure you want all these? Oh, yeah, sure. 27 records at 50 cents. That'll be, um... Thirteen fifty, please. Thirteen fifty. Here you are. Thank you. Say, it's uh, pretty late, isn't it? Yes, we're closing now. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, say, you must be tired. Maybe I could take you home. I'll get a cab. A cab? You certainly like to throw your money around. What are you, a, a bootlegger? <laughs> no, I'm a reporter. Good one, too. Oh, how nice. Just the same, I think I'll walk. All right, maybe a walk would do us good. But I didn't invite you to walk. Oh, it's all right. I got nothing to do till ten o'clock. Hmm, records are kind of heavy. Yes, it must be. Well, thank you very much. Good night. What's the matter? Nothing. I live here, that's all. Oh. Well, good night. Good night. Oh, oh, wait. Uh, do you mind if I ask you a personal question? I guess not. Have you got a phonograph inside? Yes, why? Well, uh, uh, would you let me hear this record? Otherwise, I'll have to take it home and imagine how it sounds. Haven't you got a machine at home? No. Well, then why on earth did you buy 20... Oh, silly, wasn't oh, it? Oh, <laughs> really? Every time I've heard that song since, I've thought of that day. There was another one in that bunch of records, too. Oh, yes, this one. They were playing this one night in a little Chinese restaurant down near the beach. We'd stopped off there for dinner on our way home. Roger was very quiet. We sat there for the longest time, never saying a word. What are you thinking about? Just wishing. Wishing we could always be together like this. I, I mean, I wish every day were a holiday like today. Never have to go home. Never have to go to work. Oh, would be perfect, wouldn't it? Mm. What's that you've got? A rice cake. It's got my fortune inside. What does it say? Nothing. Silly. Oh, let's see it. <laughs> no. Oh, oh, silly. Read it. All right. It says, uh, a baby. Ah, uh, these things are a lot of bunk. They never come true. You don't like kids very much, do you? Oh, I like them all right, except when they're pests. Huh. What does your fortune say? Nothing. Here, read it. You will be an old bachelor. Oh, very unromantic. Told you they never come true. Well. We played this one at my New Year's Eve party. Guess I'd known Roger about four months. You remember that New Year's Eve, Applejack? You came to my place, remember? <laughs> you weren't very happy about it. Look, I, I don't belong here. Of course you belong here, Applejack. I invited you, didn't I? Come on in and meet some of my friends. Oh, no. Say, where's Roger? He's not here yet. I thought maybe you'd know. Not me. You're pretty crazy about that reporter, aren't you? Well, I'm fond of him. That's bad. I hate to see a nice girl like you get mixed up with a newspaper man. I never knew one worth a darn when it came to a woman. He's lots of fun to go out with, that's all. Oh, he's running down a story. Hanging around a speakeasy waiting for the proof to come up. At least that's what they say they're doing. But you never know what they're up to. I wish for a single man it's swell, but for a married man... Applejack, listen. Don't worry about me. I don't need any advice. I never even thought of getting married. No fooling? No fooling. Well, it's fine. Julie! Oh, here he is now. Hello. Julie, I've got to talk to you right away. Where can we be alone? Why, alone? I'm having fun. Come on, we'll go out on the fire escape. Oh, but Roger! Roger! I... Julie, now don't be angry. I'd have been here sooner, only a lot's happened. Nice time to come to a party. It's almost 12. I know, I know, darling. I'm sorry. I've had a million things to do. Here. Here, let me put, put my coat around you. Now, look, honey. I've had a real break. Slim quit his job over in China. He got fed up with the assignment of the weather or something. Imagine what a spot that leaves the paper in. One man in the Orient, and he walks out on the job. Roger, you going to take his place? Well, that's what, I, that's what they want me to do. I've got a ticket in my pocket on a train that leaves at 3 a.m. I'll get to San Francisco just in time to catch the next boat. I can't believe it, Julie. Imagine them picking me. Well, you're able, Roger. You have ability. Anybody can see that. You're going? Well, uh, that's what I wanted to talk to you about. It's a fine salary, two-year contract. I'm more or less my own boss, and, well, I, I was wondering... Oh, listen. Uh, listen, little boy. Of course I want you to go if that's what's worrying you. Please don't oh, think... Oh, I wasn't worrying about that. I knew you'd want me to take the job, sure, but... Well, uh, well, what I hurried over here to tell you was, uh... Julie, uh, Julie, let's get married. Let's get married tonight right away. I can send for you in three months. I'll have the money then. Three months? Well, why the rush to get married now? Because, well... 
Well, do you think I want to leave a girl like you running around loose? So suppose somebody else comes along. Julie, I've got to have you. Oh, Roger, darling. Julie, is it till death do us part? Till death do us part. Mm-hmm. It's New Year. Julie, I've got everything all set. All you have to do is sign the marriage license. Come on. Get in, Julie. There isn't much time, Roger. It's all right, darling. Porter, compartment G. Compartment G, yes, sir. How much time before the train leaves? Just about two minutes. Sir. Thanks. Go in here. Well, Mrs. Adams? Mrs. Adams. Oh, it sounds strange, doesn't it? Not strange, darling. It sounds great. Oh, it does sound great, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, there's something about a train. I, I don't know what it is. The way it looks or smells or something... Always makes me want to be off somewhere. I know. I feel the same way. Oh, Roger, I wish this was our honeymoon. So do I, dear. Darling, I, I can't say goodbye to you. Well, it isn't really goodbye. It, it won't be for long. It's it's just... I'll see you later. That's it. I'll see you later. Let's never say goodbye. Yes, dear. Promise me something. Promise me never to take your ring off. I won't take it off, no matter what happens. Thank you, darling. Roger. Roger, the train's moving. All right, all right. Now, don't worry, darling. I'll get you off at the next stop. Oh, well, how far is the next stop? About three hours. Roger went on to China, and I waited for him to send for me. I didn't have to wait long. Four months later, I was with him. He had a great big house and four Chinese servants. Roger was living like a prince. Darling, what do you think of your new home? Well, Roger, I... I didn't expect anything like this. It doesn't seem real. Are you sure you can afford all this? And don't be so practical when I'm romantic. Nothing's too good for my little wife. Well, are, are we going to keep it? I mean, stay here right along? Certainly, it's yours. I bought the lease from an American who went back. Furniture, four servants, three kids, everything. Kids? Whose? The servants. They live here. Well, I thought you didn't like children. Who, me? They all right. Anyway, I got the whole shebang for $1,000 American. But how in the world did you do it? I mean, get the money to send for me and buy all this, too. Got an advance. An advance? Sure, an advance on the salary. Everybody does that out here. That's how you operate. Oh, Roger, no, I... No, no, now you're not going to be one of those wives always worrying about money and budgets, are you? No, but I... Well, I sort of hate to start off in debt, especially now. What do you know? Roger. <laughs> Remember this? What? Oh, oh, the fortune. Sure, I got it to beat. <laughs> Imagine you keeping that. Uh-huh. You were wrong, darling. Sometimes those things do come true. Sure, but... sure they do, certainly. Let's see it. A baby. <laughs> Say, if that... Hey, wait a minute. Roger. Ju- Julie, wh- yeah. why didn't you tell me? Why, why didn't you write me? But you don't like them. Of course I do. Why, why would I have three of them running around here? And this one be ours, an American kid, ours. Oh, gee, that's good. Oh, darling, I'm so glad you want it. <laughs> We went north after that. Roger had an assignment away from the city, and I went up with him. He began to talk about traveling all our lives, never settling down. Well, we we were there about three weeks when, when it happened. I can still hear the sound in my ear. First, I thought it was just a sort of rumbling. And then it grew louder and louder. The floor began to shake. I could hear the crowds outside screaming. I saw the pictures dancing on the floor. We came home on the next boat, back to San Francisco. I think I knew then that I would never have my baby. And in the hospital, a few weeks after, the doctor told me. Well, that's all, Mrs. Adams. Otherwise, you'll enjoy the best of health. Now I've got some good news for you. I'm letting your husband see you today. Come in, Mr. Adams. Hello, darling. Hello, Roger. Oh, Julie, I'm, I'm so glad to see you. She's doing well. You'll be able to take her home soon. Thank you. Oh, darling, I've been miserable without you. I've had a chance to do a lot of serious thinking. I've been out scouting around the nearby towns looking for that little paper I once talked about buying. And no more silly ideas like traveling around. You are absolutely right about that. I think I found it too, honey. A little place just north of here, a place called Rosalia. Ever hear of it? No. Best of all, we'll have a home of our own, one that will always be ours. 
If I get the paper going good, I, I, I can give you everything. Furniture, cars, clothes, everything. <laughs> you know, it's strange, Roger, but I can't get myself to care about those things now. They don't seem important anymore. What I want, I can't have. The one thing I've ever really wanted, I'm never going to have. <laughs> Now, in our brief intermission before Mr. DeMille presents Irene Dunn, Joseph Cotton, and Edgar Buchanan in Act Two of Penny Serenade, here's a popular song. And now, a Lux version of this favorite, Take It Easy. Take it easy, take it easy. Please don't get upset at washing dishes every day. Take it easy, take it easy. As you wash your hands go red and rougher, don't give way. Take it easy. Take it easy. You can change that daily chore to one that gives you bliss. Make it luxy. Make it luxy. Then you'll have the kind of hands men seem to want to kiss. Change to lust. Change to lust. You'll be so pleased. Change to lust. Change to lust. You'll be so pleased. That's saying it in music. If your hands are growing red and rough from dishwashing, don't be discouraged. That so often happens when you use a strong soap. No, don't think it's dishwashing. It's the kind of soap... Because scores of women prove that simply changing from a strong soap to Lux takes dishpan redness away. Lux flakes are so gentle, yet they're so rich, make such good suds, that they go farther than other soaps tested. Lux is very thrifty to use. If your dealer is temporarily out of Lux, try again soon. Lux is worth waiting for. When dishwashing time comes, be sure to... Make it Luxy. Make it Luxy. Now our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act two of Penny Serenade, starring Irene Dunn as Julie and Joseph Cotton as Roger, with Edgar Buchanan as Applejack. An album of old phonograph records, an album of memories. To Julie Adams, each record is a chapter in her life, bringing back the heartaches of the happiness, the sorrow and the joy of years gone by. Remember this one, Applejack? It was popular about the time you came to help Roger with a newspaper. <laughs> it was fun in those days, wasn't it? The linotype machine running downstairs and the smell of printer's ink in the house. But there was something missing even then. You knew what it was, Applejack. You mentioned it one night at dinner, remember? Roger's out running down subscriptions and said he might not be home till late. Well, come on, sit down, Applejack. We might as well have our dinner. Yes, Miss Julie. You know, Miss Julie, I think we ought to have a kid around this house. What? Well, I thought you knew Applejack. Oh, sure, I know about that. I'm talking about adopting one. You get some pretty good ones that way. I'm an adopted kid myself. Of course, I know that's not much of a recommendation, but I didn't turn out so bad. Want some bread, Applejack? Miss Julie, I wish you could have seen some of those little sons again. They was the cutest little rascals you ever want to look at. Well, I don't think Roger would want a child that way, Applejack. One that wasn't his own. Why not? He's no sucker. You don't want to gamble. How do you know what they're going to be like when they got to be your own? This way, you walk in and help yourself to exactly what you want. There's no guesswork. I've thought a lot about it, Applejack. I want one. But Roger was so disappointed when... Well, I, I just haven't had the courage to suggest it. Miss Julie, do you want to know something? He's all for the idea. Well, only a few days ago when we were working together... I was talking to him, and he... You were talking to him about this? Sure, and he was all for it. Why didn't he say something to me? Well, uh, he was afraid to say anything to you. He was afraid you might have some fool notion. Fool notion? What's a very idea. My own husband talking about things like this with a, with a printer. Press manager, please. All right, press manager. You going to be the mother? No, oh, I just... Thought a it... fine thing. Hello? Well, Roger, come here. What's going on, a fight? Hey, Roger, I want you to look at that new ad. Would you come downstairs? Oh, no, wait a minute, Roger. Why didn't you tell me? Hmm? Tell you what? What you and Applejack been talking about. Miss Julie, I told you in confidence. What were we talking about? A Applejack, what did you say to us? The, uh, well, you know about the... He told me. Told you what? Roger, if you wanted to adopt a baby, why, why didn't you tell me? What? Sure, you should have told her in the first place, not me. I'm not going to be the mother. Now, wait a minute. Did, did you tell Julie I wanted to adopt a baby? Well, I hinted at it. I tried to bring it to her gently. 
You told her that... Oh, Roger, I'm so glad you feel that way. Yeah, and she wants it even more than you, Roger. Well, if, uh, if, if that's the way we all feel about it... I like it, too. Uh, I suppose it's settled, huh? Oh, Roger, I'm so glad. If it hadn't been for Applejack letting it slip out, I don't suppose I ever would have known. Come on, sit down, darling. I'll get you dinner. Well, I guess I better go fix that press. Yeah, you fix everything else, don't you? What's the idea of telling her a thing like that? I never said I wanted a baby. Well, oh, she... Oh, shut up. <laughs> Roger, hurry. The lady said three o'clock. Now, look, Julie, while I think of it, when, when we get to this place, don't get enthusiastic right off the bat. You know, don't don't just rush in and grab the first kid you see and go nuts about it. Well, what makes you think I'll grab the first one I see? I've been doing the shopping in this family for some time now. I just don't bring home anything. Well, you came on with this tie, didn't you? Oh, but darling, it's nice. Everybody's wearing bow ties. Yeah. <laughs> Down, Mrs. Adams. I have your letter here. You want a two-year-old child, blue eyes, curly hair, dimple chin, sweet disposition. We prefer a boy. But we like to look at the girls, too. Now, Julie, you know we agreed on a boy. But he won't hurt to look at it, then, will he? All right, we'll look. Now, uh, what can you show us, please? Well, this, uh, this is the administration building. We don't have any children here. Oh. oh you... Everybody wants blue eyes, curly hair, and dimples, and... Everybody wants a two-year-old child. Now, will you tell me why? Well, you see, in our case, that would have been the age of our own child. If... Oh, I see. Anyway, when they're two years old, they're, uh, well, they're more or less housebroken, aren't they? Well, not always. At the moment, we haven't any children available at all. And there's a long waiting list. If you get one within a year, you're lucky. What? A year? You mean we, we might have to wait a whole year? Well, after all, real parents wait almost a year. Oh, yes, certainly, my dear. But you see, Miss Oliver, we've waited so long already. I know, my dear, but you're both very young. Then, too, we have to have time to make our investigation. Investigation? Oh, yes. You see, we're just as particular about you as prospective parents as you are about the child. Oh. Well, naturally. Yeah. Uh, what is your business, Mr. Adams? Oh, uh, uh, I'm a publisher. I run Rosalia Courier. A publisher? That's right. I see in your letter that you live in the country. I presume that means, then, that you have a house and a yard. Well, I... No, we don't have a yard. Uh, we live in an apartment over the newspaper office. But you have a separate room for the child, haven't you? Oh, oh sure. Yes. yes, we have a lovely room. It's practically fixed up now. Well, that's fine. Now about income. Approximately, how much do you make a week? Well, I, uh... I, I couldn't tell you offhand. I, I imagine about $100 a week. Uh, of course, I'd have to look at the books. Well, that's excellent. Now, if you'll just take that application home with you and mail it in to us so we'll have all the details, in due time, one of our investigators will call on you. Oh, fine. You'll call us before you come, won't you? No, we just drop in. That's our policy. You see, we want to find your house as it really is every day, and not when it's fixed up for company. Oh, I see. Goodbye. Uh, goodbye, Miss Oliver. Goodbye. Uh, oh, Miss Oliver. <laughs> uh, it, it doesn't matter if he hasn't got curly hair. It doesn't really matter. Very well, Mrs. Adams. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, Roger. Hey, they are darn choosy, if you ask me. Why do you always have to be a big shot? What do you mean, big shot? Well, you know we don't make $100 a week. Well, you want the baby, don't you? Anyway, they can't prove it. We don't keep books. The day that Miss Oliver came to investigate us, I was cleaning house. I had on an old dress, and my hair was a sight. Just to make things a little worse, I had the phonograph going full blast. Good afternoon. Does Mrs. Adams live here? Yes, upstairs. I'll call her. No, don't bother. I'm Miss Oliver from the orphanage. I'll find her. Oh, uh, well, I don't think she's home just now. I, uh, I think she's in church. In church? This time of day? Well, uh, you see, she and Mr. Adams go there quite a lot. They just go there and sit. Fine people, the Adams. Well, I'm sure she won't mind if I just look around a bit. No, no, she won't mind. Oh, oh, Miss Oliver. How are you, Mrs. Adams? Oh, oh, it's I'm all sorry. right. It's I... all right. Oh, you've come to see the apartment. That's right. Well, this is it. It's uh, not very neat at the moment. We're cleaning. Mm, I see. Julie, where in blazes did you put my pants? Oh, Roger. Do I have to go around the house in a bathrobe all day just... Uh-oh. 
Hello, Mr. Adams. Well, uh, hello, Miss Oliver. <laughs> we weren't expecting you. But Mr. Adams was working late last night getting out the paper. I understand. Well, I think I have a surprise for you, Mr. Adams. A baby came in yesterday. No. Miss Oliver, you mean... Here, come, uh, sit down. <laughs> Thank you. That's the reason we came around to see you sooner than we expected. It's a little girl. Oh, well, we don't want a girl. Five weeks and three days old. Five weeks? Well, we did speak of an older child, you know. Sure, two years. You might have to wait a long time. After all, aren't you making too great a point out of the child's age, Mr. Adams? Eventually, this child will be two years old. But we don't know anything about such little babies. Well, no one does until they have them. And this is such an unusual little baby. Actually, there's another couple who have first choice, but somehow... Well, I feel she's exactly the child for you. That's why I wanted you to see her first. And I... I couldn't resist giving you the chance. Did you bring her with you? Oh, no, she's in the nursery. You and Mr. Adams will have to come over to the city to see her. Oh, what's she like, Miss Oliver? Well, I can't describe her exactly, but she's... Well, she, she's like no other child. Like no other child? Yeah, she isn't a boy. Well, Roger, there's no harm looking at her. If you don't like her, I won't say a word. What's the use? We don't want her. Oh, but please, darling, it won't hurt just to look at her. Oh, all right. We'll look, Miss Oliver. Well, that's fine. (laughs) Roger, (laughs) she's holding your finger. Yeah, got quite a grip, hasn't she? Uh, For a girl, I mean. Would you like to hold her, Mrs. Adams? Would I? Oh, thank you. Oh, Roger. She's sweet. Look. <laughs> Quite a kid. Well, you've had your look, dear. How about going back home? Home? You mean you don't... Oh, oh Roger, you... All right, all right. She's yours, I guess. Oh, darling. Well, when do we get her? Now, if you like. She's yours. On a year's probation. Now? You mean we can just walk out with her like this? It sometimes happens that way. Well, but uh... we we have no clothes for her, and we, and we don't know how to feed her. Oh, she's an awful little baby. Well, Miss Morgan will take care of everything. She'll give you the formula and so forth. Oh, well. Well, thank you, Miss Oliver, for being so kind. Oh, don't thank me. It just happened so. Uh, perhaps before you make up your minds fully to take the child, you'd like to have me go into her history. I can assure you it's an excellent one. Oh, that's okay. If she'll take a chance on us, we'll take a chance on her. <laughs> Chairs around the bed. Look out, look out. You're in the way. Shh, darling, don't make so much noise. If she wakes up again, you know what that means. There, that'll do. You think she'll be all right in here? Sure, sure. It'll be okay. She? Yeah, yeah. Now, come on, let's go to bed. Well, I don't know. I, I don't think I'll go to bed. She eats again in a half hour. Directions say so. I'll set the alarm. Come on. No, maybe, maybe I'd better just sit here and watch her. Don't be silly. But she, she might wake up. It won't wake up. Oh, Roger. What's the... Well, turn it off. Turn it off. I'm trying to. Well, quick. It's stuck. I can't well, move the thing. Oh. It's, it's... Oh, Roger. I couldn't help it. Well, look at the baby. Is it awake? No. No? Well, what's the matter with it? Well, I don't know. You think she's all right? I don't know. Is it breathing? Yes. Yes. She's all right. Come on. Oh, she's certainly a good little baby, isn't she? Yeah, we were lucky together. Let's go to bed. Oh. Now be quiet, closing the door. Don't worry. Go ahead. Roger. Roger. Oh. What's the matter? What's the matter? Roger. Roger. Do something. Do something. What do I do? Well, do something. Can't you see the baby is suffering? I don't know what to do. Well, don't just stand there. Do something. Well, well, take her. Pick her up. Huh? Well, go on. Do, do something. Oh, 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 no, you might. I'm going to call Miss Oliver. You can't call her at this hour. I'll pick her up. I'll pick her up. Come on, baby. But Come. You... Oh. Hey, look. Shut up. Oh. <laughs> Oh, just, darling. Just wanted a daddy, that's all. Yeah. <laughs> oogly, oogly, oogly. <laughs> that first year passed so quickly, it seemed like just a few short weeks. Roger was happier than I'd ever seen him. Even the trouble he was having with the paper didn't seem to matter. He had Trina. Up she goes. Down she goes. Julie, look. She's trying to dance. Oh. That's the girl. Go ahead. She's got your smile, Roger. Oh, sure. She's good looking. <laughs> Still sorry she wasn't a boy? A boy? What do you mean, a boy? Don't don't let her hear you say that. You wanted a boy. I didn't want a boy. Trina's daddy's little girl, aren't you, Trina? Hello. Now, Roger. Roger, be careful. Hello. Oh, hello, Miss Oliver. Roger, turn that off. How do you do, Mrs. Adams? Sit down, Miss Oliver. 
Thank you so much for letting us know you were coming this time. Hello, Miss Oliver. Trina, this is your fairy godmother, Miss Oliver. Say hello, sweetheart. <laughs> She's not very timid, is she? <laughs> I can plainly see that she adores her father. Uh, she means everything to us. Uh, when are we going to uh, own her outright, Miss Oliver? You go before the judge, the 27th. 27th, that's huh? fine. Mm -hmm. Now, these are the same questions that you answered last year. We just want to bring them up to date. Now, let's see. Uh, religion? Same. Age? <laughs> One year older. Yes, I have that. Profession? Still publisher, isn't it? Uh, yes. Income? Income? Well, you, you see, Miss Oliver... Uh, none. None? Well, I don't understand it. Oh, that's, that's the way it is in the newspaper game, Miss Oliver, especially when you're starting one of your own. You, you have to close down once before you really get going. Oh, it's only temporary. I'll, uh, I'll have it humming by the 27th. Yes, I'm sure you'll find a way, Mr. Adam. But you and I have to prove to the judge that your income is enough to take care of Trina. Well, you know we'd give Trina everything she wanted, Miss Oliver, no matter who else had to suffer around here. I realize that. Well, I must go now. That's all we can do today. Goodbye, Miss Oliver. Goodbye. Mr. Adams, you'll bring the baby when you come before the judge. It's 27. We'll be there. There she is. All ready, Daddy. Roger, don't forget to take the coat off in the train. I won't. Goodbye, dear. Bye. Come on, Trina. Oh, Roger, wait. Wait, her, her bunny. She may want it. Here, darling. Take your bunny with you. Bye, dear. Bye, Trina. Mr. Adams, in looking over these adoption papers here, I see that you have no income at present. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. What is this, Miss Oliver? You know this case should never have come before me. Well, Your Honor, I feel that this is a special case. I've kept hoping until the last minute that Mr. Adams might be able to resume the operation of his paper, but unfortunately... Yes, well, under these conditions, I cannot grant the adoption. This child will have to revert to the orphanage. Mr. Adams, will you draw up a chair, please, while I prepare these release papers for you to sign? It's just a matter of routine. If you please, Your Honor, it can't be just a matter of routine for people to have their baby taken away from them. And those are the requirements of the law. Yes, but well, you see, we've had her since she was six weeks old, and it just doesn't seem reasonable that... She should have to go back now to, to strangers. Hey, Mr. Adams, you're not here to plead your case. You've had the regular opportunity to prove your fitness to provide. But we are fit, Judge. I'm sorry. Without an income, I have no alternative. Look, Your Honor, she's not like an automobile or an icebox or a piece of furniture or something you buy on time, and then when you can't keep up the payments, they take it away from you. <laughs> Trina could still be a good girl. Anyone can give up those kinds of things. But I ask you, Judge, how can you give up your own child? And she is our child, just as much as if she'd been born to us. Look, Judge... We've had her over a year now, and we've, we've walked the floor with her when she had the colic. We've lost nights of sleep worrying every time she cut a tooth. We've, we've gone through everything, everything that real parents have with one of their own. And you sit there and say it's a matter of routine for you to take her away from us. Please, Mr. Adams, I'm you sorry, must... Judge. But, well, you see, we weren't, we weren't as fortunate as most people. We would have had one of our own, only, well, you don't know how badly my wife wanted a child. It wasn't so important to me. I don't know. I, I suppose most men are like this, but... Children never meant a great deal to me. Oh, I liked them all right, I suppose. But, well, well, what I'm trying to say is, Your Honor, the first time I saw her, she looked so little and helpless. And when she took hold of my finger and held on to it, she, she, she sort of walked into my heart, Judge, and she was there to stay. I didn't know I could feel like that. I'd always been, well, uh, kind of careless and irresponsible. I, I wanted to be a big shot. I had to be my own boss, that sort of thing. And now... Here I am standing in front of a judge pleading for just a little longer so that I can prove to you I can support a little child that doesn't weigh quite 20 pounds. It's not only for, for my wife and me that I'm asking. It's, it's for Trina's sake, too. She doesn't know any parents but us. She wouldn't know what had happened to her. There, there's so many little things about her that nobody would understand the way Julie and I do. We love her, Judge. Please, please don't take her away from us. Look, I'm not a big shot now. I, I'll do anything. I'll work for anybody. I'll beg. I'll borrow. I'll... Please, Judge, I'll sell anything I've got until I get going again. Only, she'll never go hungry and she'll never be without clothes. Not as long as I've got two good hands to help me. Julie. Roger. Roger. You've brought her back. She's yours, dear. Ours. But 
judge said so. Ours now and forever. Oh, Trina. Trina. Nothing can ever take her from us now, darling. Nothing. Darling. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. In a few moments, Mr. DeMille returns with Irene Dunn, Joseph Cotton, and Edgar Buchanan for Act Three of Penny Serenade. But now I have a question to ask a couple of the ladies here tonight. Uh, Mrs. Mounier, about how many miles do you think you walk in a day? Why, I just keep house and don't go out very much. Only to market and back. That's about a mile. And, oh, I suppose another mile or so around the house. Not more than two or three miles a day, all told. And you, Miss Gregg, how far do you think you walk? Oh, not more than a couple of miles. I'm a secretary and just sit at my desk most of the day. Well, I'm afraid you under, both underestimate your jobs. Statistics show that housewives often walk up to seven or eight miles a day, and office workers about three and a half to four and a half miles. You probably do a lot of bending and stooping in addition to just walking. All those things are hard on stockings. Well, often I do get a run just from bending my knee. I wish I knew how to make my stockings last longer. Then you'll be interested in recent stocking tests. A famous laboratory washed rayon stockings three ways. Part of them with Lux Flakes. Others with a strong soap. Others were rubbed with a cake soap. And what happened, Mr. Kennedy? Then they made tests to see how much strain these stockings would stand. The kind of a strain they get in everyday wear, when you stoop down, climb stairs, and so on. Here are the results. The Lux stockings stood more than twice as much strain. Lasted over twice as long before going into runs as the others did. I'd like my stockings to last twice as long. Lux will help you do it. Just Lux stockings after each wearing. Dry rayons, 24 to 48 hours. Now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. We'll have a few personal questions for our stars after the play. But now the curtain rises on the third act of Penny Serenade, starring Irene Dunn and Joseph Cotton with Edgar Buchanan. In the little apartment over the newspaper office... Julie Adams plays her album of old records, the story of a happy marriage. She's almost at the end of the album now. As Applejack watches silently, Julie places another record on the turntable. We played this one at Trina's fifth birthday. Remember, Applejack? You bought it for her. Yes. And we played it again last year on my birthday. That was quite a night, wasn't it? I was really surprised. Surprise! Surprise! Oh, happy, happy birthday, birthday darling. For oh, heaven's sake. Happy birthday, Mommy. Oh, thank you, darling. Come on, sit down. Trina's going to make a presentation. I've almost forgotten it was my birthday. Here, Mommy. This is from Dad. From Daddy? Mm-hmm. I... Oh, Roger, a wristwatch. Darling, I've always wanted one like this. And this is from Uncle Applejack. Uncle Applejack? Oh, I think I can guess what this is. It's a handkerchief. Ah. Uh-huh. Oh, it's beautiful, Applejack. I always figure a person can't have too many handkerchiefs. I better tend to the gravy. And this is from me. From you. I can't imagine what this is. What on earth? I got you a record because you love records and because you and Daddy love each other so much. Come on, great. Ah, oh, Trina, you're sweet, darling. Thank you. I'll put on the phonograph. Put the record on, Mommy. Trina picked it out herself. Did she? Oh, that's nice. <laughs> I'd love to. You get nice, Mommy. Oh, thank you, darling. Dinner's ready. Come and get it or I'll throw in the creek. <laughs> oh, this is wonderful. Dinner in my own home, and I didn't have to cook it. Well, we sure changed the complexion of that bird. We certainly did. What did you do in school today, darling? Oh, I almost forgot. I was choose. I'm going to be in the Christmas play. In the Christmas play? What are you going to do? I'm going to sing in the carol. Hey, that's all right. Why, Trina, that's wonderful. It'll be fun making you a carolist costume. I don't need any costume. Nobody sees me. Nobody sees you? All I have to wear is a clean dress and some sneakers. I'm the echo. 
I'm a way off behind the scenes. You only hear my voice. And Hoffman says he gives a faraway sound, like the angels in heaven. Oh. Well, uh, why do you have to wear the sneakers? The sneakers are so I'll be quiet. I have to walk up a ladder behind the scenes and take a big star with me. Then when I get over the manger, I stop, and then the angels sing. And when my turn comes, I sing the echo. Then I sneak off quietly. <laughs> and next year, when I'm big, I'll get to be an angel and wear an angel suit. I'll get seen then. Of course you'll get seen, darling. Is it a long time until next year, Daddy? Oh, no, darling. It'll be here no time at all. Anything's happened? Oh, what could happen? She said she had to climb a ladder. Look, look. There's the star. Oh. Oh, Roger. She's doing very well, isn't she? Oh, Roger, she fell off her ladder. Don't worry, Trina. You did fine. No, I didn't. I spoiled everything. Now, Miss Hopkins will let me be an angel next year. Oh, yes, she will, darling. Certainly she will. Well, I was talking to her, and she said you just did fine, Trina. Did she? Uh-huh. Sure. Why, you, you were better than all the rest of them put together. See, dear? Honest? Honest. Gee, I don't know what people would do without Christmas. Oh, I don't know what we'd do without you, honey. All this past year, Trina was looking forward to this Christmas. She wanted Miss Oliver to come and see her in the play. I wrote to Miss Oliver just last week. Dear Miss Oliver, I should have written you sooner, but I could not. Less than three weeks ago, Trina was here looking to Roger and me for food and clothing and shelter with the helplessness of the very young. Now she does not need us. A sudden, brief, hopeless illness, and she was gone. Quickly, quickly. The day so long ago when she became ours, we said nothing can ever take her away from us. But we had forgotten about death. With that light step of hers, she has outdistanced us, Roger and me. Roger, why don't you speak to me? Roger, don't you hear me? Yes. I'm going out for a while. I wish you wouldn't. I've got to get out of here, get some fresh air. There's someone at the door. I'll answer. Yes? Oh, uh, may I use your phone, please? Our car is stalled in the snow, and I'd like to call a taxi. Yes, the phone's right there. Come in. Thank you. Come in, Tommy. Thank you. Is this your little boy? Yes. Say hello, Tommy. Hello. We're in such a hurry, and I saw your light burning. Oh, oh dear, the line's busy. I guess cabs work overtime on a night like this, but I do hope we can get one. Tommy's in the Christmas play. I hope we don't get late, Mommy. Well, our car's right out in front. I'll drive you over if you like. Oh, that's very kind of you, if it wouldn't be too much trouble. Oh, no, it's not much trouble. I'll get my coat. Can't start the car. Battery's dead. I'll have to crank it. I can get. Oh, thank you. This is fine. You can go in the side door. Yes, I know. Mommy, they're singing already. We're late. Good night, and thank you again. If you only knew what these things mean to a child. Good night. Come on, Mommy, come on. What's the matter, Roger? Take the car on home. What about you? I'm not coming home. I don't ever want to see anything or anyone that reminds me. All right. Goodbye. That 
That's the last of them, Applejack. Those old songs really take you back, don't they? Yes, they take you back. Did you decide which ones you're going to keep, which ones you're going to leave for him? Funny thing, I can't seem to divide them. They belong to both of us. Guess I'll just leave them. Julie. Applejack, will you get the rest of my things out of the bedroom for me, please? Sure. You're leaving, Julie? Yes, Roger. I don't blame you. Don't blame you at all. You should leave me. I haven't done any of the big things I planned to do for you. We're right where we started, still struggling. I've let you down all around, honey, and all I've needed to make it 100% was for you to leave me. And I can't think of a reason in the world for you not to. I'm licked, Julie. You're not licked, Roger. It's just us. We're licked as far as our being together is concerned. When something really came along that hit us hard enough, we couldn't face it together. I've needed you an awful lot these last few days. You've been miles away. I've been entirely alone right here in this room with you. I know, dear. It just didn't work out. Oh, it did work out, Julie. Things were wonderful until this happened to us. I don't know. I just I just haven't been able to think straight the last few days. She was never sick before, and then, then all of a sudden it was over. If there were only some way that, that people could know a few days ahead what was going to happen. Yes. The day before she was taken sick, she asked me for a quarter, and I wouldn't let her have it. And then she asked me to take her to the movies, and I said, no, run along, I'm too busy. I know. It was the same with me. I was trying on her angel costume, and she was so excited, she couldn't stand still. I scolded her. I said, I'll never try another dress on you again. I never did. Hello? Oh, it's Miss Oliver. She wants to speak to you. To me? Hmm. Hello? Hello, Mrs. Adams. Yes, Miss Oliver. It's a very strange thing, Mrs. Adams, but we have a little boy who's just two years old. The oddest thing is, he's the exact image of the youngster you asked for when you first wrote to me. Do you remember? Oh, yes. Roger, listen. Well, I have that old letter here in front of me now. Curly hair, blue eyes, dimple. Now... Off the record, for really another couple has the right to see him first. But he's such a remarkable baby that I thought perhaps you and Mr. Adams might want to take a look. Oh, yes, yes, we do, Miss Oliver. We'll come down and see you tomorrow if that's all right. And, uh, Miss Oliver, uh, please don't let that other couple see him till we do, will you? I won't, dear. Goodbye. Goodbye? Roger, did you hear? Well, <clears throat> if he's only two years old, I'd better put up that gate around the stairs again. Yes. I wouldn't want the little fellow falling downstairs and breaking his arm. No, I, I guess we'd better get out the crib. But then if he's two years old, he can sleep in a bed, can't he? Oh, sure, sure. And we won't have to put the chairs around him, No, right? and uh, over in that corner, I can, uh, I can put a little electric train. Yeah. In just a moment, our stars will return for a curtain call. Now... Here's our fashion reporter, Libby Collins, with some colorful news about lingerie. Nowadays, women are wearing birds, flowers, bow knots, even animals on their slips and nighties. It's hard to get nice lace because of the war, so many of the new undies rely on applique designs and contrasting color for interest. Touches like that give a handmade look to undies. Of course, whether you still have some pre-war lacy ones in luscious pinks or blues or yellows, or the new ones with gay trimmings, you want to keep the colors fresh and lovely just as long as you can. That's why recent washing tests will interest women. In these tests, some slips were washed the Lux way. Then exactly the same kind were washed by harsh wash day methods. The slips washed with Lux flakes stayed lovely three times as long. That's a worthwhile economy, Mr. Kennedy. And as every woman knows, daily luxing protects daintiness, too. Here's another thing about Lux care. You'll find shoulder straps don't fray so easily. Seams don't pull out so soon. Those are annoying things we women hate. Suppose we sum it up with music, Libby. Here's the story. Undies lead a long life. When they lead a luxe life. Now, here's Mr. DeMille with our stars. Irene Dunn and Joseph Cotton are before the footlights again. And since Irene has just returned from Broadway... Perhaps, uh, well, perhaps she'll tell us how the old street is looking. Very military, Mr. DeMille. Soldiers and sailors and wax and waves everywhere. And all the wax and waves out gunning for Irene Dunn, I guess. Irene, is it, is it true that you said the boys in uniform don't ask the girls in uniform for dates? <laughs> you certainly stirred up a, a small hornet's nest in the newspapers, anyway. I'm afraid I was a little misunderstood. 
What I said was that we really didn't have enough entertainment for the girls in uniform. Oh, well, that's a great lay- load off my mind, Irene. I, I just couldn't figure why wax and wave shouldn't be in demand for dates, judging from the ones I've seen all over the country. And uh, aren't you helping a little with wave recruiting yourself? Well, I did have some of the waves at the house on Sunday afternoon, along with some girls who were interested in joining the waves. Anyway, I'm sure they have all the dates they can handle. <laughs> well, speaking of dates, Joe, when do we see that new David Selznick picture that you and half of Hollywood are in? You mean since you went away, C.B.? Very soon, I think. Uh, that's, the, that's the first picture you've made for David, isn't it? Yes, it is. Uh, I've been out on uh, Len Lease at the other studios all the time. <laughs> well, I, I read in the financial page the other day that cotton was an important item in Len Lease. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, after that, there's nothing left but next week's play. And that's plenty, Joe. Because our play is the Warner Brothers hit, Action in the North Atlantic. And our stars will be George Raft, Raymond Massey, and Julie Bishop. This is the story of the merchant seaman whose days and nights are spent in the shadow of the undersea killer. There's romance and adventure in it. But above all, Action in the North Atlantic means action at this microphone next Monday night. Save a seat for us, Mr. DeMille. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> well, that, well that, that's a penny serenade. Penny serenade. <laughs> sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents George Raft, Raymond Massey, and Julie Bishop in action in the North Atlantic. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. tin can you use tonight. It will be handy for saving used fats. Any size can will do, but be sure not to use glass. Keep this can near your stove and pour in every drop of used fat from your broiler or frying pan. Even black burn fat or fat skimmed from soups and stews is just as good as clear grease. When it's full, take the can to your butcher. He'll give you four cents and two extra red ration points for every pound. And in three weeks, this fat will be ready to make medicines for our fighting men. Fill it in and turn it in. Heard in tonight's play were Regina Wallace as Miss Oliver, Norman Nielsen as Trina, and Charles Seal, John McIntyre, Leon Ledoux, Dwayne Thompson, and Bobby Larson. This program is broadcast to our fighting forces overseas through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. Three bells for three great shows. Same time, same station. Listen tomorrow night at Lux Time for George Burns and Gracie Allen and their guest star, Ray Milan. Listen Wednesday night for Frank Sinatra singing I'll Be Seeing You. Robert Benchley will be Frank's guest. This time, Lux Time. Every Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday for the tops in entertainment. Our Lux Radio Theater production of Penny Serenade, starring Irene Dunn and Joseph Cotton with Edgar Buchanan, has come to you with the good wishes of the makers of Lux Flakes the tissue-thin soap used by smart housewives everywhere. In the Lux Radio Theater next week, we will have, as usual, our producer, Cecil B. DeMille. Be part of the coast-to-coast audience that gathers each week to enjoy this hour of dramatic entertainment with the finest artists of Broadway and Hollywood in plays that you yourselves have told us you'd like to hear. This is your announcer, John M. Kennedy, reminding you to tune in again next Monday night to hear George Raft, Raymond Massey, and Julie Bishop in Action in the North Atlantic. Brand new spry, ladies. New Easy Mix Spry cuts cake mixing time by two-thirds. No creaming, no long, tiresome beating, yet lighter, better-tasting cakes that stay fresh longer. New Easy Mix Spry shortening is at your grocer's in the same handy jar. Grand for all baking and frying. Tomorrow, buy spry. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Presents Hollywood.
The Lux Radio Theater brings you Cary Grant and Claudette Colbert in The Awful Truth with Phyllis Brooks. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. With a feeling of gaiety and excitement along Hollywood Boulevard tonight, lights are ablaze and crowds are gathering in front of our theater. All the visible signs of a Hollywood opening are here to welcome the Lux Radio Theater back to the air after our summer vacation. But there's another scene that interests us more than the bright lights on Hollywood Boulevard. A scene repeated some millions of times throughout the country. It's the scene in your living room, where you and your family once more occupy the reserved seats, which are yours tonight and every Monday night. You are the ones who've made this theater possible by your purchases of Lux Flakes and Lux Toilet Soap. We owe you an obligation to make this new year in the Lux Radio Theater the most entertaining in our history. And tonight we pay you the first installment on this obligation by presenting The Awful Truth, starring Claudette Colbert and Cary Grant, which reminds me that we still owe an obligation to Miss Colbert. Whenever she's done a comedy for us in the past, Claudette has always said that next time she'd like to do a serious drama, and we've solemnly promised that she could. And we'd keep that promise if she'd give us the chance. But we're continually finding comedies that she insists on doing. And I'm not a man with either the courage or the inclination to refuse Claudette anything. At lunch not long ago, we talked about plans for the opening coming for the coming season in the Lux Radio Theater. The moment I mentioned the awful truth, I noticed a hungry gleam in Claudette's eyes. But quickly explained, of course, that wouldn't interest you. It's a comedy. I was wrong again. Before we came to dessert, Claudette was asking for the script. The memorable performance of Cary Grant as Jerry in the film produced by Columbia Pictures Corporation instantly suggested him for the same role in our radio adaptation, but he was easier to cast than to find. In fact, Cary Grant is probably one of the hardest men in Hollywood to find. Our intelligence service, however, tracked him to the beach where he'd gone swimming with Phyllis Brooks. That gave us another idea, and we signed them both right there, dripping wet. And so, ladies and gentlemen, the very pleasant truth is that we're ready to give you the awful truth as we raise the curtain on a new season in the Lux Radio Theater and act one of our plays, starring Cary Grant as Jerry and Claudette Colbert as Lucy, with Phyllis Brooks as Barbara. <laughs> the Sunlamp Room of a Midtown Manhattan Athletic Club. Hank, the attendant, is piling towels on a shelf as a young man in gym trunks makes a hurried entrance. He's Jerry Warner, a tall young man, well-built and healthy. But just now, there's a sharp contrast between his decided pallor and the two dark, magnificent circles under his eyes. With a quick movement, he bounces up on the table and stretches out luxuriously. All right, Hank, my man, turn on that sun lamp, give her all she's got. Well, about 15 minutes on each side is all I'd recommend, Mr. Oh, Warner. Oh, no, 15 minutes, nothing. I've got to get a deep Florida tan if it takes all afternoon. Give it the juice. Well, okay. boy. All aboard from Miami, Palm Beach, and Point South. Hi, Jerry. Oh, hello, Frank. I heard you were in here. Thought maybe you'd like to play a little squash. Sorry, Frank, no time. Say, you're awfully white-skinned for a guy who just spent two weeks in Florida. You no, know, that's just what I thought. Uh, what mm -hmm. did you do down there? Carry a parasol? Or uh, didn't you go? Ah, uh, 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 don't let any idea like that get around. Uh-huh, I get it. Pulling a fast one on the little wife, eh? Oh, now look, Frank, I'm surprised at you. I'm supposed to have been in Florida. Now, suppose one of Lucy's friends says, why, isn't he tanned? Well, Lucy's going to be embarrassed. Well, I'm going to be tanned. Lucy's not going to be embarrassed. <laughs> and what wives don't know won't hurt them. What was it? A poker trip? Sure, a fellow's got to bust out once in a while, assert his independence. Boy, did I assert it. Yeah, you certainly look it. But I'll bet you wouldn't like Lucy to pull a stunt like that on you. Why not? After all, a person doesn't have to stop being an individual just because she gets married. Oh, maybe. Anyhow, how about coming over to my house for breakfast? We were all out late last night, and some of the gang are stopping by. I got a better idea. Everybody come to my place. Lucy will fix up breakfast for us, and maybe later we can sneak away and play some golf. What do you say? I'm convinced. I'll see you later. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, ladies and gents, come on in. The joint is yours. Jerry, that sunburn. You're positively for a minute. Yeah. Wait till Lucy sees what Florida <laughs> did for you. Yeah, where is she? Hey, Lucy, Lucy, surprise. <laughs> well, well, hello, old dog of mine. How you been? Hey, where's Mama? Where is she? <laughs> Welcome back, Mr. Warner. Oh, hello, Celeste. Will you tell Mrs. Warner I'm here? I'm sorry, sir. Mrs. Warner's not at home. Not home? Where'd she go? I don't know, sir. Oh, well, uh, uh, when did she leave? I'm not sure, sir. I think last night. You mean she hasn't been... Oh, well, uh, okay, never mind. Uh, What's the matter, Jerry? No welcoming arms to greet you this trip? Mind your own business, will you? Come to think of it, she probably ran up to her Aunt Patsy's cabin in the mountains. She always does it. She gets lonely. Suppose her Aunt Patsy wasn't home? Oh, I get it. I'm up to my neck in funny people, huh? (laughs) No, no, seriously, I wish Lucy would go out and get some fun for herself now and then. Do her good. That's the trouble with marriage. People are always imagining things, and the next thing you know, they end up in a divorce court. Ah, the broad-minded man from Miami. Yeah, yeah. well, if you think you're going to get a chance to prove my broad-mindedness, you're crazy. She's up at Aunt Patsy's cabin, and I'll bet on it. Say, and is that a spot, Frank? Why, the Hello, fish just... Up at Aunt Patsy's cabin, eh? Well, there's Patsy now. <laughs> some fun, oh, eh? shut up. Hey, turn that radio off, will you? Okay. Well, uh, hello, Patsy. How did you get here? By invitation. Lucy invited me yesterday on the phone. Say, what is this? Lucy invites me, no Lucy. Where is she? I don't know. I, I... Hello, hello, hello. Hi, Lucy. Lucy. Hey, Lucy. Hello, Jerry, darling. Oh, darling. Gee, it's good to see you. Oh, it's grand. You're looking marvelous, Jerry. Yeah? Oh, oh I nearly forgot Alma. Alma, come on in and meet everybody. Alma's the best music teacher a woman ever had, aren't you, Alma? Thank you, my dear. You know Al Molivar, Jerry, of course. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. How are you? How do you do? Everybody else, this is Al Molivar. Oh, how you do? How do you do? How, how are you? Oh, well, now that we're all introduced, I can relax. Oh, <laughs> Al Molivar and I have had the most terrible time. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah, well, I imagine you must have. Where was the recital? Oh, now, silly, what do you mean? Well, I didn't know they had recitals in the morning and the people went to them in evening clothes. <laughs> That's horrible, isn't it? <laughs> well, Alma does look silly and Dale at this time of the day, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah. Oh, it was such an awful time. Oh, why? Somebody sing off pitch? Oh, now, <laughs> stop it, darling. You don't know what happened. Alma's car broke down a million miles from nowhere. He had to park me at a farmhouse and hike to the nearest town to get them to tow the car. And then he had to stay there, hang around garages and things to pick me up in the morning and bring me home. Oh, it, so. it was dreadful. We were coming home from a party. You were the loveliest human being there. Oh, thank you, Alma. You say the nicest thing. But, <laughs> <laughs> well, Jerry, uh, you understand, don't you? Mm, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Werner, you have the continental mind. <laughs> oh, sure, that's it. <laughs> I've got a continental mind now. <laughs> Lucy, dear, so sorry, but I have to run. That horrible dressmaker of mine. Oh, of course, darling. Well, I have you know, too, Lucy. I'm sorry. Oh, wait a minute. What's the idea? The party hasn't even started yet. Oh, sure, sure. We know, but uh, you probably want to talk to Lucy. Oh, come on, people. I'll give you all a hint. Okay, hit. Frank, look at here. Goodbye, Jerry. Bye. Oh. Well, Mr. Louvel, why didn't you let Frank give you a hitch? <laughs> I wanted to explain. You see, Mr. Warren, uh, the next time I take your wife out, I hope... That, I hope uh, you buy a new car, or else I'll loan you mine. Are you hungry? Huh? Oh, thanks. Well, yes, I, I am. Now, why don't you run out and get a bite? <laughs> Big, strong fellow like you should take care of himself, sitting in drafty garages all night. Uh, uh, Mr. Warren, uh, what have I done? That's what I'm going to find out. Oh, now, Jerry. Uh, we'll discuss this in private, please. That is, if Mr. Louvel can remember where we keep our door... Very well. Perhaps it's best this way, Lucy. Will I see you soon? Well, of course, Alma. Oh, it's all been so perfect, Lucy. Thank you for everything. And, Mr. Warner, I think you must be out of your continental mind. <laughs> well, you know, that was pretty funny at that. I mean, what he just said. Oh, very funny. Brush me <laughs> off, will you? <laughs> well, he's gone. You can speak freely, darling. Well, Lucy, what have you got to say for, for yourself? yourself. <clears throat> oh, that's so smart. <laughs> well, I knew you'd say that, and I'm prepared to answer Alma was invited to the party by a young man whose sister is a pupil of Alma. Alma invited me to go along. I went because I could think of nothing better to do. Believe it or not, I was lonely. Yes, and then the car broke down. Yes, and then I stayed at the farmhouse. I slept badly because of insufficient blankets. Uh, twice during the night, I, I coughed. Now, let me see. Was there anything else? Now, look, Lucy. This situation isn't amusing, although you seem to think it is. If you had sense enough to see it, you'd know that our marriage is teetering on the edge of a cliff. Well, you're trying to be funny. But perhaps marriage doesn't mean anything to you. 
Perhaps you've no sentiment left for me. <laughs> Look at this on the table, a letter I wrote you from Florida, and you didn't even open it. Mm, it's enough to destroy one's faith, isn't it? Oh, I haven't any faith left in anyone. Not even in that conscientious soul at Miami Beach who followed your direction so nicely and mailed me a letter every day? Huh? What on earth are you talking about? Oh, Dolly, <laughs> you look so cute and pleased with your little athletic club sunburst. <laughs> Rather like a small boy who's just had his curls cut off. Well, I don't like to be unpleasant, Jerry, but you are not in Florida. Now, don't change the subject. You weren't in Florida and you weren't in Montreal that time you said you were going there. Once you, you even had the letters mailed from the wrong place. Huh? The huh? dear Lucy... Charleston is such a quaint city. And the quaint thing about Charleston is Charleston's postmark is Perth Amboy, New Jersey. Nice trick your friend played on you. Now, now, wait a minute. Don't try to justify your behavior by insinuating things about me. What? But I haven't any behavior to justify. I, I've just been unlucky, that's all. You came home and caught me in, in the truth. And it seems there's nothing less logical than the truth. Oh, 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 oh. a philosopher, huh? You don't believe me? How can I believe you? Oh, listen, Jerry. Now, don't you see that there, there can't be any doubt in marriage? The whole thing is built on faith, and if you've lost that, you've lost everything. Yes, I suppose when that's gone, the marriage is washed up, isn't it? Do you mean that? Sure. Well, I guess that settles it. I guess it does. And let me tell you something. Well, let me tell you something. I wouldn't go on living with you if, if you were dipped in platinum. So go on. Oh, go on. Divorce me. It'll be a pleasure. Divorce you? Are you crazy? Do you think I want people to think you preferred that that, that music lover to me? Oh. Well, well, then I'll divorce you. It's customary anyway. I, I think it has something to do with the, the husband being a gentleman. Never mind the gentleman stuff. Just get going on it. Go on. I, I'll call the lawyer right now. By the way, what's the most convenient day for you to be divorced? And in the case of Warner versus Warner, the court grants an interlocutory decree of divorce to the plaintiff, Lucy Warner. The divorce, if not further contested, will become final in 90 days from this date. That will be all. One moment, Your Honor. There's one matter still unsettled. According to my client, Mr. Warner, it's a matter of, uh... Uh, uh, Mr. Smith! Yes, Your Honor, Mr. Smith. And who is Mr. Smith? Mr. Smith is, uh, he's their dog. No, no, Mr. Smith is my dog. He's mine. Uh, silence. But Mr. Smith belongs to me, and she's got him. I told you to keep quiet. But... Oh, but... ignore him, Your Honor. I told you he was impossible to get along with. Oh, well, let's hear it. The animal at present is in Mrs. Warner's possession. Mr. Warner wishes to have him because... Because he's mine! He is not! Yes, so! He is not! Yes, silence! So. Silence! He is not. This seems to be a custody case. And in custody cases, we frequently permit the final decision to rest with the, uh, the dog. Ah, ah, well, now we're getting somewhere. Now let Mr. Smith decide whom he wants to live Silence, with. Silence, please. O bailiff, have the dog brought in. The custody of the dog will depend on his own desires. And let me warn you, neither of you must use any false means of influencing the animal's decision. Unfasten the dog, please. Now... You may each call the dog. Come on, brother. 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 Come on, What's Mr. Smith doing with that rubber bone in his mouth? Well, it always was his favorite bone. Where did he get it? How would I know? Oh, you. <laughs> You'd stoop to anything. You hid that bone under your handbag and Mr. Smith smelled it. You're not going to get him away from me like that. Get him? <laughs> I've got him, darling. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Why, Aunt Patsy? Is it doing anything besides falling? I don't think so. Nothing unusual ever happens around here. If I'd known we were going to be buried side by side, I'd never have considered to take an apartment with you. Yes, but I needed you, Aunt Patsy. You know the period of readjustment that comes in the wake of a divorce. Readjustment? My foot. Just another word for moping around. Oh, don't be silly. Oh, why, you know dozens of men who turn handsprings as a chance to take you out. But no, you'd rather sit around and readjust yourself. No, you're just an old grouch, that's all. Yeah. Well, this is one old grouch who wants to go somewhere where there's life. And I don't mean plant life. Well, 
We can't go out without escorts, so that's that. Well, I don't need an escort to go down to the lobby. I'm going down to the newsstand and see Joe. He may be funny looking, but he's a man, and maybe he knocks off early. Oh, Aunt Patsy, you wouldn't. Oh, I wouldn't, eh? You're talking to a desperate woman. Hey, Mr. Wainwright. Well, I guess I've read pretty nearly everything here, Joe. Too bad, ma'am. Mm, isn't it? I'm so bored. <laughs> Too bad they stopped printing zippy stories. Yes, ma'am. That's what my wife says. Oh, she does. I see. Oh, Pardon me, but did that copy come in of the Tulsa, Oklahoma Bugle? Sorry, Mr. Leeson. I guess maybe there's something wrong with the mail. Oh, oh the boy well, that's too bad. Looks like I won't find out how we did at the Rodale. Oh, <laughs> how do, ma'am? Oh, <laughs> how do you do? I hope you don't think I'm fresh. My name's Dan Leeson, room 1214. Ma, and I see you coming in and going out sometimes. Oh, <laughs> we've noticed you, too. You did? Mm-hmm. Well, <laughs> say... Who is that beautiful girl who's with you sometimes? Um, She has a dog, and, uh, well, she's beautiful. Oh, that's my niece, Lucy. She's just a little homebody. No. Mm -hmm. Say, I wonder if you'd do me a favor. Why, of course I would, Mr. Leeson. What is it? Well, you see, I'm a stranger in town, and I thought that perhaps I'd better write a little thing down there. Go right in, Mr. Leeson. Oh, thanks. You know, I think it's just wonderful that we met this way. Oh, Lucy, Lucy, may I present Mr. Leeson? Mr. Mr. Leeson, this is my niece you were so anxious to meet. Her name is Lucy Wadena. How do you do? Oh, how do you do, ma'am? Uh, Mr. Lucy, Mr. Leeson's from Oklahoma, Lucy, and he'd take it as being right neighborly of us if we'd show him some of the bright spots. Well, it's raining rather hard. And uh, Mr. Leeson lives right across the hall with his mother. Isn't that what you said, with your mother? Yep, with Ma. Mm-hmm. We're here on a visit. I'm in oil, you know. Oh, marinated, so to speak. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Say, that's a good one. I must remember to tell that to Ma. <laughs> oh, I'm sure she'd adore that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, uh, tell us all about Oklahoma, Mr. Leeson. Well, we all think Oklahoma, well, it's... Pretty darn swell. Oh, there's the door. I'll oh. get it. <laughs> yes, Mr. Leeson? Well, like I was saying, ma'am, Oklahoma <laughs> is pretty darn... Oh, <laughs> right, Jerry. Oh, dear. Well, how's the old girl? Well, never better. Won't you, won't you come in? <laughs> I fully intend to. Well, uh, hello, Lucy. Hello. What do you want? Well, now, read this little legal document. I guess that'll explain better than I could. Well, what is this? It's a writ. That's what it is, a writ. The court just ruled that I'm permitted to see Mr. Smith for two hours a week. I am permitted to take Mr. Smith walking, riding, motor play, no, motor boating, or aquaplaning. No, not aquaplaning. That's too dangerous, isn't it? Yeah. Well, the order reads that I can visit with him and entertain him in any form or manner that does not endanger life or limb. And that would rule out aquaplaning. <laughs> I suppose you've come to take him bicycling. What, in this weather, are you crazy why he catches death of cold? No, I've come to entertain him in any form or manner. Hey, Smitty, where are you? I'll get him. Oh, Miss Warner, perhaps oh, I'd I'm, better... I'm sorry, Mr. Leeson. Uh, this is my husband. Oh, uh, I mean, oh. Well, uh, he's only my husband for... How much longer is it? Oh, 60 days. No, 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 59. <laughs> well, how are you, Mr. Leeson? Howdy. I'm glad to know you. Uh, excuse me, what do you say? I said I'm glad to know you. Oh, all right, well. How can you be glad to know me? I know how I'd feel if I was sitting with a girl and her husband walked in. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, I'll bet you do. What's that supposed to mean, huh? Nothing, nothing. Uh, Why don't you go and play with the dog? Sure, where is he? Hey, Mr. Smith! Where are you, fella? Oh, gee, what's his book? Gee, old fella, it's good to see you. Look what I've brought. You're all out of scrap. Come on, let's have a tuck around. You were telling us about Oklahoma, Mr. Leeson. Oh, yes. (laughs) Well, I'm really a man of many interests out there, Mrs. Warner. Oil is my main business, of course, and I, I can't complain about that. It's treated me fine. And I have a big ranch that's more of a hobby than anything. Oh, the lamp, Jerry, you broke the lamp. Oh, it's nothing. I'll get you a new one. Oh, don't bother. It's only the limb point. Like I was saying, Mrs. Warner, this ranch is just outside of Tulsa. I have just about everything that they see. Good heavens. Jerry, do you have to play that game? Do any other one? Yes. Get his rubber bone for him. He loves that bone. Oh, yes. I remember. Where is it? In the closet, right there. Huh? In here? That's right. Well, I can't find it. Oh, but just keep looking. Hey, hey, what is this? Don't lock the door on me. Aunt Patsy, what are you doing? Hey! Lucy, dear, why don't you run along with Mr. Leeson? 
Clancy, Clancy, let me out of here. I'm locked in. Say, is anything wrong? Oh, no. <laughs> That's just a game Mr. Walton up has with the dog. Oh, oh, oh. Mr. I want to get out of here. Oh, Lord. Well, come on, Mr. Leeson. Let's go. Huh? Oh, oh, swear. Good night, Aunt Patsy. I hope you know what you're doing. Good night, dear. Good night. Night. Ooh, I'll break the door down if you don't let me out of here. Oh, just oh, a oh. minute, just a minute. Come on out, Jerry. Oh, oh, framed. That's what I am, framed. Huh. You're trying to cook up something between my wife and that Buffalo Bill, aren't you? Your wife? She's still my wife for 60 days. 59. All right, 59, but she's still my wife. Do you understand? And what are you going to do about it? You'll find out what I'm going to do. Stick around and watch. I've got some rights around here. To entertain Mr. Smith in any form or manner. Oh, shut up. <laughs> For Jerry to make good on those threats, we take a brief intermission from our play to hear from Mr. Ruick. Ladies and gentlemen, in our intermission before Act Two of The Awful Truth, starring Claudette Colbert, Cary Grant, with Phyllis Brooks, we bring you a musical interlude. Three charming young ladies will sing a song suggesting something about our product, Lux Toilet Soap. Well, Sally, what is your song going to be? Sweet Sue, Mr. Ruick. Shall we sing it? Yes, please. Every star above knows the one I love. Sweet Sue, just you. And the moon on high knows the reason why it's you. No one but you. No one else it seems ever shares my dreams. Without you, dear, I don't know what I do. In this heart of mine. You live all the time, sweet Sue, just you. Mmm, a sweet song. And you chose it because... Well, Mr. Ruick, because we think one of the nicest things about Lux Toilet Soap is the way it leaves you feeling so sweet. So sweet Sue reminds you of a Lux girl. Mmm, that's nice. And it's true that Lux Toilet Soap leaves you feeling sweet and dainty. That's why it's such a delightful bath soap. Really, a fragrant Lux Toilet Soap bath is the most refreshing experience you can have when you're tired and feeling sort of, well, uncharming. Its rich, creamy, active lather just floats away perspiration and dust and dirt, leaves you utterly dainty. And when you consider how little Lux Toilet Soap costs, only a few pennies, why every member of the family can share the luxury of this kind of bath. You know, it's because so many millions of cakes of Lux Toilet Soap are sold that it can cost so little. So everybody, fathers, mothers, youngsters, babies, can have its gentle care. Remember that it's gentle, it cleanses beautifully, it leaves you dainty and sweet and charming to other people, as you always want to be. Buy three cakes at a time so that Lux Toilet Soap will always be at hand. Our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act Two of The Awful Truth, starring Claudette Colbert as Lucy, Cary Grant as Jerry, with Phyllis Brooks as Barbara. It's morning, a few weeks after Jerry's hectic visit. Across the breakfast table in their lonely apartment, Aunt Patsy is looking at her niece with an expression of growing horror. What did you say, Lucy? I said, of course I like Dan Leeson. Why shouldn't I? He's sweet and thoughtful. And you should be the last one to object. You introduced him to me. Only because he was a man who could take us out. I didn't expect you to get silly about him. Is it silly to like a man who's sane and considerate? I was married to one of those gay romantic types, and one's enough. Your toast is burning. Oh. Lucy, do you know what rebound is? That business of trying to get over one love affair by bouncing into love with somebody else? That is fine. Except the rebound is rarely the real thing. There's the first bounce, the second bounce, and, well... Look at me. You wind up like an old tennis ball. Now, look, I, I tell you, I'm serious about Dan Leeson. He's a fine person. I like him. I, I like him very much. And I'm all through with Jerry. He, he doesn't mean a thing to me. I don't love him. What's more, I probably never did. I guess that surprises you, doesn't it? I hate Jerry Warner, and I like Dan Leeson very, very much. I, I can hardly wait to see him tonight. And I hope he's just mad about me, because I think he's the finest man I ever met. Lucy. I know, my toast. Honest to 
goodness, Mr. Warner. I think it's simply wonderful of you to come here just to hear me sing. Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Mr. Warner, you're awful sweet and all that, but you always seem to have your mind on something else. Or maybe it's someone else. Am I right, Sugar Pie? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm in love with love, uh-huh. In the spring, a young man's fancy likely turns to what he's been thinking about all winter. <laughs> Say, uh, how long have you been talking like Amos and Andy? Oh, for a long time. It helps me in my work. Well, shut my mouth. Who's that dull, just looking creature just coming in? Oh, where? Oh, my, my. Well, you've heard that gag that's flying around town. Who was that lady I saw you with? You mean that's no lady, that's your wife? Ah, uh -huh, that's my wife. I guess this is our table over here, Lucy. Sit down. Come on over and meet her. Well, well, well. Hello, folks. Oh, hello. Uh, uh, this is uh, Miss Dixie Bell Lee. This is Mrs. Warriner, and this is Mr. Leeson, the gentleman Mrs. Warriner is going to marry. That's right. I'm mighty proud to meet you all. Uh, now, you're sure we're not intruding? Huh? Well, what do you mean? Well, wouldn't you like to buy us a drink? Oh, oh, why, why yes, of course. Well, uh, sit down. Oh, <laughs> oh thank you. <sighs> <sighs> well, my, 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 isn't this cozy, huh? <laughs> So, uh, so you two are going to be married, huh? Oh, I was glad when I heard that. Yes, I said to myself, that Leeson's just the man for Lucy. And then I said to myself... He's always talking to himself. <laughs> yes. Uh, this is a charming place, don't you think, Miss... Uh... Uh, Dixie Bell Lee. Oh. Do you like it, honey? I'm so glad, because I, I kind of feel like the place is mine. Oh, you, you come here often? Well, I work here. Didn't you all know that? No, no. Say, you're from the South, aren't you? Now, isn't he just the cleverest yet? How'd you all ever guess that, Mr. Man? Oh, <laughs> I don't know. It was just a shot in the dark. Sure. <laughs> shot in the dark? Well, you see, Dixie Bell Lee isn't her real name. No? Oh, no, no. She changed it because her family objected to her going into show business. Isn't that right, Dixie? That's right. Well, I guess I'd better go now and get ready. You reckon you all can stay to see my act? Oh, of course we'll stay. Well, nothing could drag us away. Well, I'll see you later, honey child. I'll be here. Mm -hmm. She seems like a lovely girl. Ah, uh, she is, Lucy. But wait till she sings. A golden throat, that's what. I keep coming here all the time just to listen to her. How faithful of you. Does she really sing awful good? Well, no. Uh, I don't think her singing's up to Lucy's, no. Dixie has a sort of an elfin charm. Uh, a je ne sais quoi, if you know what I mean. And I don't. Dan, dear. Don't. Uh, don't you think you ought to ask Jerry about it now? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, sure. Uh -huh, uh -huh. About what? About our mine, Jerry. What mine? Our mine. You know, our coal mine. It's our last tie, Jerry. And, well, I was telling Mr. Leeson how badly it was doing, and he thought maybe he could do better with it. That's right. I'd like to gamble on it, Mr. Warner. I'm pretty lucky. Do you know what they call me out west? <laughs> <laughs> I can guess. <laughs> Well, how about us having a conference at my apartment tomorrow? Well, I don't know. I'll have to think about it. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure that I present that great little artist, Miss Dixie Bell Lee. Here she comes, isn't she pretty? She sure is. The costume's a little short, isn't it? I mean, unless she does a tank act. Uh-uh. Shh. Listen to this. I got an invitation from Mrs. Hutton. Oh, yes, I don't care for nothing. I'm strong. Is that what you mean by elfin charm? I might be right there. <laughs> Say, she'd go great in Oklahoma, well, wouldn't she? Come on, swing it, miss. Yippee! Dan, I, I don't feel well. Yippee! Why, well, what's the trouble, Lucy? Dan, I think you'd better take me home. But, Lucy, we can't walk out in the middle of Miss Lee singing. Well, don't you like her, Lucy? Oh, I love her, yes. Uh, I can see now it was easy for her to change her name than for her whole family to change this. Uh, come on, Dan. I'm well, gonna... all right, if you want, Lucy. Don't forget tomorrow afternoon at my apartment, Mr. Warner, about that mine. <laughs> I'll be there, big boy. All dressed up, don't care for nothing, I'm sorry. Warner. I want to hear all about these mines. Well, I've got all the records and history with me. Oh, by the way, Lucy, I searched all over for the for the report my call made before we bought it, but I couldn't find it. You must have it. Oh, well, perhaps I have. Well, uh, when you get a chance, take a look through your stocking drawer, will you? You know, Dan, she always hides important things in the top drawer of her dresser. She does? Oh, sure, sure. It's an old habit of hers. Every legal paper we ever had smelled a sachet. Hmm? 
Even our marriage certificate. Uh, about the mine, Jerry. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, the mine, uh-huh. Good afternoon. Oh, come on in, Ma. Come on oh, in. Oh, hello, Mrs. Newton. Good afternoon, Lucy. I guess you don't know this fella here, Ma. He's Jerry Warner, Ma. Hello. Well, it's, it's very funny seeing you here, Mr. Warner. Is it? Well, it's funny seeing you. Uh, I met some people today, and they spoke about you, and uh, about Lucy, too. They knew you both before the divorce. Oh, I imagine you run into dozens of people who did. They spoke very well of you, Mr. Warner. They said you were a real gentleman. No kidding. Mm -hmm. Got any gum? No. <laughs> they, uh, they talked about Lucy, too. <laughs> well, isn't it nice not to be forgotten by your old friends? You know, Lucy, as many times as I've heard your fine singing, I never realized that you uh, must have had a teacher. <laughs> they, um... Tell me he's been uh, teaching you for some time, and he's a very romantic type. Mm -hmm. This woman I was talking to told me that, uh, oh, well, no matter. What's that, Mom? No, no, no. Look at this map, Leeson, about no. this new opening in the northern side of the mine. Now, Lucy. Here, now, let me show you the prospectus. Jerry, I think I ought to tell you that nobody's listening to you. Huh? Huh? Uh, what do you mean? Now, what could possibly be more interesting than the Warrener mine? The Warrener divorce. The gal's name needs clearing, partner. Oh, that's ridiculous. Is it really? Certainly, Mrs. Leeson, and so are you. Well, ah, no, no, what? Dan, I... relax, relax. No fisticuffs, oh, really? I'll explain. Mrs. Leeson, our divorce was one of those tragedies you read about in the newspapers. Yes, a trusting woman and a worthless man. Lucy's above suspicion, Mrs. Leeson, always has been. She's as pure as the driven snow, as faithful as she is fair. I tell you, something wonderful went out of my life when I lost her. Yep. I know just how you feel, Mr. Warner. How do you know? How can you know how I feel to have used up the best years of a woman's life? Huh? Oh, well, folks, that's the way it goes. Excuse me, Mrs. Leeson, you're sitting on my prospectus. Oh! oh. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I'll be going now. Take good care of her, Dan, won't you? I'm sure you'll be happy out where the West begins. All three of you. Maybe you'll succeed, Dan, where I failed. Goodbye, now. Well, Ma, are you convinced about everything? What about the music teacher? Oh, but now, Ma... look, you two. Why don't you go back to your room and settle things for yourself? But... Hmm? And let me know how it all comes out. I'll tell you. Put a light in the window if it's yes and two if it's no. But Lucy, And if you are... can't make up your mind, just pull down the shade. <laughs> Is. What has Armand Louval got to do with all this? Why is he coming here? Because I sent for him. You said that. I still say, why? He ruined your last happy home. He'll bust the Oklahoma deal wide open. That's just it. There isn't going to be any Oklahoma deal. Hmm? I'm not going to marry Dan Leeson. Why not? Oh, <laughs> because I'm still in love with that crazy lunatic. And there, there, there's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> What's the matter with you? I'm a gibbering idiot. I'm a oh. mad woman. <laughs> oh, now, Patsy, stop this. Yeah, answer the door, will you? Oh, good evening, Mr. Lubar. Good evening. Alma, come in. How are you, my dear Lucy? I got your call. Yes. Look, Alma, sit down, will you? It's about Jerry. Ah, yes, your husband. <laughs> he's a very funny man, yes? <laughs> yes, he is. But I'm convinced he still cares about me, or he wouldn't do the funny things he does. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but uh, he doesn't care much about me. No, he doesn't, no. And that's just what I'm getting at, Alma. You know that everything was all right that night. And I want you to convince him that everything was just as we said it was. Oh, I'd be glad to. Um, does he carry a gun? Oh. Now, you're not afraid of him. Oh, of course not, no. But you know husbands. <laughs> then you'll do it as soon as possible, won't you? He mustn't know that I've had anything to do with it. Oh, very well. As soon as possible? Uh, yes. Huh? Open up, Mr. Oh, oh. Smith. Oh. It's Jerry. Oh, but this is much too soon. Oh, of course it is. Well, we'll do something. <laughs> I, I, what shall I do? Well, 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 you can't stand there. I, I, Go in the other room. And, and hurry and don't come out. I don't care for this. Well, neither do I. Let, let him in, Aunt Patsy. Oh, Lord. You said it. Ah, greetings, Patsy. Oh. <laughs> hello. Oh, uh, hello, Lucy. Hello. Hello. What's the matter? I, uh, nothing. Well, I, uh, I guess you two want to be alone. No, 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 Aunt Patsy. I don't. I'll whip up a little omelet from the kitchen. No, Ah, uh, uh, smart girl, you Aunt Patsy. I, matter of fact, yeah, I, I did want to be alone. You did? Yes. 
Look, Lucy, let's get right down to it. I've been a sap. Have you? Yes, yes. I want to apologize. I know that Chump Bell couldn't have meant anything to you, but, well, guys like him just make me murderous. I just want to... Oh, oh, well, then. I just want to say I'm sorry for everything, oh, dear. Oh, and... Jerry. I... Oh, look, Jerry. L let's meet later, hmm? And talk it all over, shall we? Sure. Yes, that, that's wonderful. Here's your hat. Goodbye, dear. Yeah, but, but... I'll call you. Goodbye. Oh, uh, uh, are you trying to get rid of me? Oh, no, of course not. Why should I try to get rid of you? Here's your hat. My hat? Well, that isn't my hat. Oh, no. no look, look at the thing. It comes down over my ears. Look at that. Oh, <laughs> oh isn't that funny? Did you, did you get a haircut, maybe? Well... Well, well, not since I came in. Now, 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 look at that thing. Doesn't that look funny to you? We saw day, look. Yes, I know. It, it, it's just a little roomy, but maybe they're wearing them that way this year. Well, I don't think so. I'm not. <laughs> oh, I'll catch you the bell. All right. Why am I always answering doorbells? Oh, well, look, Lucy, if you've got company... No, no, it's nobody. It's just Dan Leeson, probably. Leeson? Oh. Well, I don't want him to see me here. I've caused you enough trouble. I'll just duck in the other room. No, no, oh, Jerry. No, 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 Lucy, no. I want you to be happy. No. I'll wait in there till they've gone. Yes, but Jerry, you just... Oh. Hello, Miss Adams. Oh. It's Mr. Leeson and his mother, Lucy. Oh. Hello, Lucy. Lucy, dear, I've come to tell you something. Oh, hello. We've come to tell you, Lucy. Well, what have you come to tell me? I want to apologize for those awful things I accused you of this morning, Lucy. Yes. Oh. Uh, truth. And I assure you, a great surprise is in store for Jerry Warner in Act Three. But before the curtain goes up, there's a word or two of wisdom, I believe, for the ladies. In the very brief moment before Kerry Grant, Claudette Colbert, and Phyllis Brooks return, I would like to make this observation about our product, Lux Toilet Soap. Everyone knows that nine out of ten screen stars use Lux Toilet Soap. And we're very proud of this fact, because it certainly is significant that such an overwhelming majority of these charming women whose very livelihood depends to such an extent upon their appearance, have come to look upon Lux Toilet Soap as such a trusted aid in the task of keeping themselves ever beautiful. But another fact, which is just as important and just as significant, is that lovely girls, young women and older women in every village and town throughout this broad land also look upon Lux Toilet Soap as a trusted aid in the very important feminine job of keeping beautiful. Screen stars must have lovely skin because they're screen stars, of course. But for another reason also. These famous beauties have close-ups to face off the screen, too. 
They know that for every woman who wants to win romance and hold it, lovely skin is important. And that's why they are really glad to be able to pass on to other women the happy experience they've had with Lux Toilet Soap. Here's what Betty Davis says. I use Lux Toilet Soap regularly, as other Hollywood screen stars do. Why don't you use this fragrant white soap? So I'm going to ask every woman in our audience if she won't go to the store tomorrow and buy at least three cakes of Lux Toilet Soap and use this fine white gentle soap with active lather faithfully. And it is my honest belief that if you do this, when the three cakes have gone, you will be just as enthusiastic over Lux Toilet Soap as the screen stars. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Grant, Claudette Colbert, and Phyllis Brooks proceed with Act Three of The Awful Truth. <laughs> Two weeks have gone by, and the divorce is almost final. Determined to block Jerry's impending marriage to the society heiress, Lucy has tricked her way into his apartment. Just inside the door, she stands facing him, smiling coyly. Hello, Jerry. Well, now that you're in, what's the nature of this visit? Well, I just thought I... You know what today is, don't you? Certainly. Our divorce becomes final tonight at 12 o'clock, and tomorrow we'll both be back in circulation. That's mm-hmm. right. I, I just thought I'd drop up to wish you a lot of luck. Oh, that's very nice of you, but I'm just on my way out. Where to? Well, as you must know, I'm on my way out to a pre-engagement dinner for me and Barbara at the Fancies. Oh, Jerry, you can't. Who says so? You can't because you love me. The things you believe me guilty of couldn't cause aggravation and heartache unless you love me. Of course, I loved you. I said love, not love. Oh, you're so stubborn, Jerry. You're, you're throwing away our happiness. Barbara's a fine girl. We're getting along swell together. But that isn't necessarily happiness, Jerry. Look, you and I fight, and we disagree on every subject under the sun. But we were happy. It's no fun for me to come here practically crawling to you, Jerry. But our marriage is worth it. I'd do anything to make you understand that you and I belong together. Tomorrow will be too late, dear. Once you're free, the Vances will officially announce your engagement, and you won't be able to jilt a girl whose jilting would be news for every newspaper in the world. You'll be caught by circumstances. You'll be lost, Jerry. Oh, I'm very contentedly, too. Oh, no. You'll be miserable. Oh, you dope. Why can't you understand? I'll take it. Oh, no, you won't. I've got it. (laughs) Hello? Hello. Oh, hello. Who is this, may I ask? Give me that phone. Jerry, I think it's... Hello. You have to answer my telephone. I only said hello. Hello. Shut up. Now give it to me. Hello. Tell her to call you back. Yeah. Hello. Shut up. Hello. Oh, hello, darling. Well, it took you long enough. Have you made up your mind who the woman is? Oh, that's funny. I knew you were going to ask me that. Uh huh. So did I. Who was she? Well, it's really very simple, dear. That was my, uh, my, uh, my sister. Oh, really? Your sister. Now, how are you ever going to get out of that? I didn't. Oh, sure, sure. She just got back from Paris. Dropped in to see me, you know, and... Oh, that's lovely. <laughs> I'd love to meet your sister, Jerry. Why don't you bring her along tonight? Oh, no, no. I don't think she can come over this evening. She has a previous engagement. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, naturally, dear, she's very anxious to meet you, but... Oh, yes, tell her I'd love to meet her. Tell her to wear boxing gloves. Keep quiet. <laughs> now, look, Barbara. Look, Barbara. She said if she possibly could, she'd break her engagement and come over later. Yes, but I doubt that very much. Yes, I doubt it, too. Well, if she can, she can, of course. That's right, dear, but I'll do my best to fix it up so the two of you will meet very soon. (laughs) Goodbye. Goodbye, dear. Hurry over. I will. (laughs) Now I'm in a fine fix. She wants to meet my sister. Well? You're a big help. Well, you know me. Anything I can do? Oh, to break it up? I see what you mean. (laughs) Well, I'm in a fine mess. No, I'm sorry, Jerry. Really, I yeah, am. Yeah, sure. But I wouldn't worry about it, dear. She trusts you, doesn't she? Of course she does. Hello? Ah, hello? Oh, oh, I did it again. Oh, give me that thing. Oh, listen, you don't have to take that from hello? anybody. Hello? Uh, quiet. Oh, you don't have to take that from anybody. Put your foot down. You're bringing your sister tonight. But, but, darling, I told you she couldn't make it. There's no oh, reason for her to call you up every five minutes, is there? No, 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 look, dear, there's no reason for you to call me up every five minutes, is there? Jerry! Goodbye. Well, well. <laughs> I'll keep quiet. 
Sit down, my boy. Sit down. Thanks, Mr. Vance. It's too bad your sister couldn't come tonight, Jerry. Oh, yes. Well, she was terribly sorry, Mrs. Vance. You see, she uh, she didn't weather the boat trip very well. As a matter of fact, when I left, she was calling the doctor. Uh, you can imagine my surprise when I heard a woman's voice on the phone. You can't blame me for being suspicious, Jerry, darling. Well, certainly. I, I mean, of course not. I was thinking, dear. Mother, don't you think it would be nice if I asked Jerry's sister to be a bridesmaid? Oh, lovely. Oh, well, I think she's sending back to Paris almost immediately. She said she'd do her best to see you before she goes, though. Oh, you'd like my sister, Barbara. She's very much your type. Where did she go to school? Uh, uh, excuse me, what do you say? I said, where did she go to school? In, in, um, Switzerland. Oh. And, uh, you say your father was a Princeton man? Yes, that's right, sir. Uh -oh. Class of 92. He tells some very funny stories about the place in those days. Yeah. He tells one in particular about a football game. Mm -hmm. It seems Yale was playing Princeton one day. I beg your pardon, Mrs. Vance. Yes, Edward? Mr. Jerry's sister has arrived. What? Miss Lula Warriner. Jerry, a surprise? Oh, you maniac. What'd you say, dear? Uh, I, I, oh, I just asked how you were feeling. Well, I'm feeling fine. Oh. Mrs. Vance, may I present my sister, uh, Lola? How do you do? <laughs> How'd you do? Oh, it's lovely to know you, Mrs. Vincey. Vance, my dear. Oh, sure, I forgot. Uh, Barbara, this is Lola. How do you do? How'd you do? Well, you know, it's nice getting a chance to meet you. I see your pictures in the paper, and I, I wondered what you really look like. I've uh, wondered about you, too. Oh, well, thanks. Oh, Lola. Yes, dear? Uh, this is Barbara's father, Mr. Vance. Mm. Mr. Vance, my sister. How do you do? How do you do? <laughs> well. Uh, what's the matter? Oh, nothing. Only I never would have known you from Jerry's description. I think you look kind of cute. <laughs> uh, won't you sit down, Miss Warner? Thank you. Say, did I interrupt something? Go right on with your story, Jerry, honey. Oh, well, I was telling a story about my, uh, about our father. Oh, you were? Well, go right ahead, dear. Thanks, thanks. You see, Mr. Vance, it was Yale's ball on Princeton's two-yard line. Oh, Mr. And, Vance, uh, I, I don't want to appear rude, but I wonder if I could have a little drinky. Why, uh, why, certainly. Well, I, I had three or four before I got here, but they're beginning to wear off, and you know how that is. Oh, well, don't look at me like that, Jerry. You like a little drink yourself. <laughs> you know what we call him, Mr. Vance? We call him Jerry the Nipper. Uh, uh. <laughs> he likes to sneak him when nobody's looking. Oh, he's awful cute about it, too, yeah. I've seen him go along all evening and apparently not have a thing to drink and all of a sudden fall flat on his puss. <laughs> Edward, a glass of sherry for Miss Warner, please. What, sherry? Oh, no, I don't like sherry. Oh, Mr. Edwards, come here. Will you? Yes, miss. You know what I want, don't you? About the three fingers? Yes, miss. And snap it up, will you? I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Jerry. What were you saying? Well, I, I was just telling them one of Father's stories. You've heard it. Oh, I have. You see, there was a minute ago. Dad had the ball and... Ball? Uh, what ball? What? The, the football. Well, well, what in the world was Dad doing with the football? <laughs> look, look, I was just telling a story about when Father was at Princeton. You remember that. Oh, sure. Well, because I remember. Oh, oh yeah. That. You know, Pop loved Princeton. Yeah, he was there nearly 20 years. Oh, yeah. If ever a man loved the place, he did. He, he just adored it, and, and he certainly kept it looking beautiful, too. You've seen the grounds, haven't you? The grounds? Of course. Well, uh, well, Mrs. Vance, I'm afraid that my sister has a somewhat distorted sense of humor. So have I. Uh, your drink, miss. Oh, gee, thanks. No, what she really meant to say was... Mm, uh, that... Oh, gosh, was that good. <gasps> Woo, it's so thirsty. It must have been that ham I had for dinner. Now, listen, you... Where did you get your liquor, Mr. Vance? It isn't too personal. Uh, it's imported from Paris. You don't say all the way? Oh, gee, well, that's pretty good stuff, though. Yeah, if I ever get managed to get to Paris, I'm going to look up the guy who sold it to you. If you ever get to Paris, didn't you just come back from there? Who, me? <laughs> oh, I only wish I had. Oh, I guess that's just one of Jerry's stories again. You know, when Jerry and I were kids, we were the worst liars in the neighborhood. We always used to pretend we had rich relatives who were going to leave us money. <laughs> Oh, I guess it was harmless enough, though. Everybody knew we were just sort of kidding ourselves. Are you sure everybody knew? Well, sure. Who would be dope enough to look at Jerry and me and think we had money or a family? <laughs> oh, but you have to give Jerry credit. You look at him. We're proud of him, you know. He's worked himself up from nothing to this. <laughs> what do you mean by this, Miss Warner? Well, now, you look at me. I'm different. Now, it isn't money that counts with me, your position in life. No, sir. No, it's art. All the time I was working at the Virginia Club, I you thought that I... You worked at the Virginia Club? Yeah, didn't Jerry tell you? No, he didn't. You're a singer, Miss Warner. That's what I do. I sing. Well, uh, perhaps you'd sing for no, us no, now. No, no, no. some other time. You see, my Oh, sister... now, that's the trouble with you, Jerry. You've tried to keep me in the background all your life. 
Why, of course I'll sing for you. Sure I will. Do you own a piano? Mm -hmm. Right there. Well, thanks. Now, you see when... Oh, oh, wait a minute. Don't anybody leave this room. I've lost my purse. Good well, gracious. There's your purse, Miss Warner, on the chair. Oh, well, am I relieved. Oh, Mr. Edwards. Uh, yes, miss? Well, you kind of keep an eye on my purse, you know, right? Here. Thanks. Lola, uh, I think we'd better go now. It's getting late. Oh, no, now, not before I sing, Jerry. <clears throat> your tuning? I'm sure I don't know. Well, maybe it's just the piano. Uh, what are you going to sing? <laughs> oh, it's a surprise, is it? But the first time I sang this number, oh, I killed him. You know, there was a fellow there, I, I think he was a critic. He said my voice had a, let me see, what was it? Oh, yeah, uh, elfin charm. A uh, je ne sais quoi, if you know what I mean. <laughs> now, quiet, please. Barbara, I'm afraid. Uh... Quiet, Mrs. I got an invitation from Mrs. Hutton. I'm all dressed up, don't care for stop nothing. It, stop I'm it, stop it, Get up. You're getting on it, please. No, I won't stop. All my life, you've got to keep me in the background. I said I'll stop, stop it. I'll go stop now. Oh, oh, my finger. Oh, oh, oh I'm not too late for speaking to Mrs. Hutton. I'll tell her how to make her feel I'm sorry. Just one dollar, dear. This way, sweet Aren't you speaking to me? No. That's better. Oh, it's wonderful of you to drive me up to Aunt Patsy's cabin after all the trouble I've caused you. Shut up. I'm handing you over to your Aunt Patsy, and then I'm leaving for good. I don't blame you, Jerry. I really don't. Um... Thank you, Jerry. You can leave now. Oh, no, no, no. I want to see you safely in the door where you can get your aunt's hair and out of mine. Mrs. Warren. Hello, Frank. I wasn't expecting anybody tonight. Will you tell Aunt Patsy I'm here? Why, she ain't here, Mrs. Warren. She ain't been here for weeks. Yeah. Oh, I get it. Another one of your little tricks, huh? Well, it won't work. I'm going back to town and I'm going alone. Good night and goodbye. Goodbye, Jerry. Be careful driving, dear. Hey. What's the matter? Well, the, the keys to the car. Where are they? What? The keys to the car, the ignition key. Where is it? Well, I don't know. Did, did you have it when you came? Well, how do you think I drove here? Now, listen, Lucy, you took that key and I want it back. I haven't got it. You have so got it. Do you want to search me? Yeah. Uh, no. Oh, poor Jerry. I, I, I'm afraid you're stuck here all night, darling. Isn't it a shame? <laughs> here in front of the fireplace. Just the way it was when we came here on our honeymoon, dear. Oh, now, please, Lucy. The less you have to say about it, the better I'll like it. Well, it won't be long. It's a quarter after 11. 45 minutes and you, you'll never have to listen to me again. Just 45 key minutes. Funny, isn't it, Jerry? Well, it wasn't my fault. I only... Oh, I'll keep quiet. 45 little... I'd say. All this that happened tonight will be forgotten. I'll tell Barbara Vance myself that it was all a joke and, and that I want you to be very, very happy. It's only 30 minutes now, Jerry. Lucy, listen, I... Oh, what? Uh, 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 nothing. Oh. Uh, she seems to be a nice girl, Jerry. I, I'm sure she'll mean more to... Never let me spoil your happiness, Jerry. I'll, I'll get along all right. Just be happy, darling. I'll, I'll get along all right. No one will ever know that I... Oh, I shouldn't say these things, should I, Jerry? I'll get along all right. Uh, wait a minute. Listen. Yes? Listen, Lucy. What? Listen, it's, it, it's all off. I'm not going to go through with it. I don't care whether you love me or not. You're married to me and you're going to stay married, you hear? Jerry! Yeah, call the caretaker. No, I'll call him myself. Frank, Frank, come in here right away. 
anything wrong, Paul? Now, listen, Frank, you're a witness. See, the divorce is on. Oh, yes. Exactly 30 seconds before 12 o'clock, we called off the divorce. Remember that and swear to it. You betcha. All right, now, uh, 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 get out. You oh. betcha. Oh, Jerry. Ah, <sighs> oh, Lucy. Oh, Jerry, listen. 12 o'clock, wedding bell, darling. Every second that passes, I love you twice as much. Say it, darling. I love you, Lucy. I love you, Jerry. I love you, Lucy. I love you. With, with peace restored in the Warrena family, Terry Grant and Claudette Colbert are returning now to our microphones. In fact, the whole family is here, with the exception of Mr. Smith, the dog. What happened to him? Well, I suppose he lived happily ever after, too. Oh, I envy those dogs. No troubles, no worries. No worries? <laughs> you don't know my dog. He worries more than I do. <laughs> I don't doubt it. I bet he's home worrying about this program right now. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, C.B., who does he worry about next week? What play are you going to have? Next Monday night, we're going to have Barbara Stanwyck, Brian O'Hearn, and Ida Lupino. And the play is Wuthering Heights. One of the strangest love stories ever told, and certainly one of the most gripping. Barbara Stanwyck, Brian O'Hearn, and Ida Lupino. Say, that sounds great to me. I don't think your dog will have to worry about that show, TV. No. You know, my dog's a critic, too. Every once in a while, he chews up one of my favorite hats. Oh, chews up women's hats, huh? Well, I think he'd get his slant on that. But every dog to his taste. You know, I was in a picture once with a dog that weighed 23 pounds when we started shooting, and a week later, he was up to 30 pounds. <laughs> what was he eating, scenery? Oh, no, sir. The director was eating that. <laughs> he had to wait for the mutt to reduce. Oh, now, Gary. What, what made the poor dog so fat? Ice cream. Oh, every time he did a trick right, he got an ice cream cone, and that dog never missed. <laughs> that, was killing him with, that was killing him with kindness. <laughs> couldn't, you, couldn't you find a better way of rewarding him? Well, when we were shooting The Awful Truth, Mr. Smith's trainer used a mouse, a rubber mouse named Oslo that squeaked. If Mr. Smith performed well in a scene, he could play with Oslo. Worked fine, too, until he spotted a still camera on the set with one of those rubber bulbs dangling alongside. <laughs> Mr. Smith thought it was the mouse, I suppose. Oh, it squeaked just as well. But you know, after that dog took his first picture, he wanted a dark room put right in his doghouse. A very tall tail, Mr. Well, Grant. Well, it was a tall doghouse, Claudette. Yeah. Really, he could have managed it. Now, Carrie, just relax. <laughs> But before I go, I, I want to say something about the product behind this program. I've used Lux Soap now for a good many years, and from my own experience, I can recommend it wholeheartedly. Good night, C.B. Good night, Terry. Hello. Good night. <laughs> and thanks for teaching an old dog fancy with a new trick. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, Join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Barbara Stanwyck, Brianna Hearn, and Ida Lupino in Wuthering Heights. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. <laughs> This is Melville Roig, asking you to be sure to listen to the Lux daytime radio program, The Life and Love of Dr. Susan. This human and gripping story of a young, attractive woman doctor is brought to you every afternoon, Monday through Friday. For the time and station, see your newspaper. The Life and Love of Dr. Susan comes to you in addition to the Lux Radio Theater. Heard in tonight's play were Lou Merrill as Dan Leeson, Gail Gordon as Frank, Inez Seabury as Aunt Patsy, Ralph Sedan as Armand Louvat, John Fee as judge, Verna Felton as Mrs. Leeson, Forrest Taylor as a lawyer, Mary McDonald as Dixie Bell Lee, Ted Bliss as Joe, Lee Millar as Edwards, Molly Joe Duncan as Gladys, Annalisa as Celeste, and Ross Forrester as Hank. Claudette Colbert has just completed the picture Drums Along the Mohawk for 20th Century Fox. Cary Grant appears through courtesy of Columbia Pictures and Harry Cohn and will soon be seen in His Girl Friday. His current picture is the RKO production in name only. Louis Silvers is from 20th Century Fox, where he directed music for The Rains Came. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.
Silver Company presents The Silver Theater. Starring Cary Grant with Phyllis Brooks in Wings in the Dark, directed by Conrad Nagel. Brought to you in behalf of two of the greatest names in silverware, International Sterling, world-famous Solid Silver, and 1847 Rogers Brothers, America's finest silver plate. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Conrad Nagel welcoming you to the third of a new series of Silver Theater Dramatic Productions. In weeks to come, you'll hear such stars as Rosalind Russell, James Stewart, Helen Hayes, Ginger Rogers, Betty Davis, and Clark Gable, playing in stories by America's foremost authors. Today, we're proud to present Cary Grant as Ken Morgan, with Phyllis Brooks as Sheila Mason in Wings in the Dark, especially adapted for us by True Boardman. And now our play is about to begin. It's dawn. And on a great landing field rests a silver plane, its nose pointed toward the Atlantic. Pilot Ken Morgan and his mechanic, Joe McDonald, are surrounded by reporters in the shadow of a gleaming wing. Would you give us a story, Mr. Morgan? We've been waiting around here for about an hour now. We're She's all set, Ken. Running like a dream. Okay, Max. Pull out the wheel block. Hey, wait a minute, Morgan. Come on. How's about a statement before you go? You're heading for Paris. Come on. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. Okay. I'll give you a statement. I wanted to keep this quiet till it was over, but as long as you're here, you may as well know. I am heading for Paris, that's true. Well, this isn't just a stunt. No, I'm doing it to test my automatic blind flying device. I've been working on it for over five years. Well, how come, Morgan? Why, well, blind flying isn't new. No, but this kind is. This ship of mine will not only fly by itself in the air, she'll take off and land without my touching the stick. I'm not going to fly this plane to Paris. She's going to fly herself. I'm just a passenger. Hey, how's about a picture of that robot business? Yeah, how about that? Oh, boys. Okay, back. I'm underway. Oh, oh, Ken Morgan, hold it. Hey, Ken, it's Jenkins, the inspector from the Commerce Department. Don't get in that plane, Morgan. You're not going. Not going? No. Your permit for the flight is rescinded. Rescinded? What do you mean rescinded? The department can't sanction a man going out to commit suicide. And that's what it would mean to try to fly to Paris with this, this crazy blind flying device of yours. Crazy? Why, I've spent six years on I it. won't argue with you. Your permit is rescinded. And Morgan, the department also disapproves of cheap publicity stunts. Publicity stunts? This is not a publicity stunt. <laughs> oh, yeah? Just take a look at this newspaper. Newspaper? Morgan, I'm disappointed. Let me get a load of that. Hey, what do you want to say? Let's see. Hey, for the love of... Girl stunt flyer is stowaway on experimental ocean. Hey, Morgan, what's the idea of giving that story exclusive to the star? Hey, where is she? Yeah. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh, Girl stowaway? Well, that's crazy. The whole thing is... Hey, wait, Mac. Hmm? That rear compartment. Oh, Why, it's Sheila Mason. Get out of that plane. How about to wait for the press, Miss Mason? Story. Come out of that plane before I pull you out. Let go of my arm. I'm coming. Hold it. Hold it for a picture. Swell. Yeah, yeah, oh, clear oh, out of here, you guys. Oh, well, Your reporters better be detained. All right, come on, guys. Oh, yeah. Ken, I don't understand. What's wrong? Hey, what's the idea? Oh, Nick, I'm glad you're here. Hey, what did you say to those reporters, Morgan? You spoiled everything. Oh, so you're back at this, Williams. Nick. I thought you told me. Oh, wait a minute. Give me a chance. You see, Morgan, it's this way. I happen to hear on the QT that you're making this flight flying to Paris. Sheila's great copy, Ken, and at the same time a swell flyer. So I figures the two of you doing it together would be the biggest thing since Lindbergh, see? Yes, I see. You thought I'd take this flight and turn it into one of those cheap stunts you and Sheila Mason go in for. Is that it? Well, you certainly fix things. I've been refused permission for the flight. Oh, Ken... Well, suppose you go now. Oh, come on, Sheila. You're wasting time. Okay, Nick. I'm sorry, Ken. Can you imagine that? I figure out a million-dollar proposition the guy just got up for you. Look, Ken. Don't think it's too hard. After all, now we can spend more time on the blind flying device. Then when you're really tested... It... Yeah, what are we going to use for money? <laughs> By tomorrow, half the country will know that Ken Morgan has some kind of a half-baked blind flying contraption the government thinks worthless. No, Mac, the whole thing is washed up. Six years' work in the ash can. Oh, well, never mind. Get Betsy back in the hangar, will you? I'll be in the office. Look, Ken, after all... I didn't ask you to talk. I said get the plane in the hangar. Did you 
lock up the... Oh. Oh, it's you. Yes, Ken. I, uh... I waited till everyone was gone because... Because I wanted to tell you how sorry I am. Oh, it's all right. Forget it. Ken, there's a... One thing I want you to understand. This wasn't just a publicity stunt for me. I wanted to make that flight to Paris more than I've ever wanted to do anything in my life. And then being a part of something really worthwhile in aviation. Hmm. That's a little funny coming from you. Hardly goes with the aviation career of Sheila Mason. Stunt flying for carnivals for the movies, flying under bridges, doing skydiving. Maybe you think I like that kind of flying. Why would you do it if you didn't? Because I'd rather fly that way than not at all. Did you ever think what it means to be a girl in a game where all the good jobs go to men? Hmm. Oh, well, maybe I never looked at it that way. I'm sorry I got sore a while ago. It's just that... Well, this flight meant an awful lot to me. Sure it did. And that's why you still ought to make it. Still make it? When I've been denied permission? So what? Didn't you ever hear of a guy called Corridan? Hey. Hey, you're right. Sheila, you're right. Who are you calling? The main gate. I've got to stop Mac. You don't have to. I've already told him to keep the ship warm. Oh, woman, you're marvelous. Where's my stuff? Say, where's that coffee? On the stove there. I'll heat it and put, and put it in your thermos. Oh, the heck with coffee. Listen, now, you're not flying the Atlantic without hot coffee. You get your maps and stuff together. Swell. Hey, wait a minute. I just thought you're being pretty swell after the way I treated you. Forget it. Fine excuse for a stove you've got there. How do you light it? Oh! <laughs> What's the matter? You burn yourself? Yeah, you better let me. Sometimes you have to light it down here from underneath. Sometimes it's... Ken, no, look out. I had to turn down the full of gas. And Ken! Oh, Ken, oh, your oh. face! Oh, Ken, oh. my dear. Your face! No. No, it's not my face so much. It's... It's my eyes. I can't see. I can't see! <laughs> have it, Doctor. It's straight. All right, my boy. This is straight. The tissues surrounding the eyeball are quite intact. The optic nerve is unaffected. The injury is to the cornea itself. Never mind all that, Doc. Will I ever see again? I can't tell you, son. I believe that no one could. I'm sorry. Thanks, Doc. Well, I guess that tells me. Thanks. Don't ask me to tell you what Ken is, Miss Sheila. I can't say nothing. Ken made me promise. Then forget the promise, Mac. Ken's hurt and afraid. Mostly afraid of pity. Well, we've got to make him see that it's not pity we have for him, but faith. Well, but... Right now is the turning point in Ken Morgan's life. If he cuts himself off from everything now, he's lost. And Mac... We can't let that guy be lost. You're right. Okay, I'll take you to him. He's in a little cabin up in the hills. Well, but first, Mac, tell me, can we get an exact model of Ken's plane made? Betsy? Sure, I suppose so. Then do it. I'll pay for it. I've got a plan, Mac. I've got a plan. <laughs> It's... it's me, Chief. Come in. Uh, hi, Chief. I thought I told you I wanted to be alone up here. Can't you understand? Mac only came up to bring me, Ken. Sheila. Nice keeping your mouth shut, Mac. It's not Mac's fault, Ken. I made him bring me. Well, you can make him take it right back. And if you brought a card of sympathy with you, you better take that back, too. If I need your help, I'll ask for it. Swell. Swell, Ken. I, uh, I only hope that goes both ways. What are you talking about? Well, you see, uh, I really came up here to get your help. <laughs> My help? Yes, Ken. You see, I've heard of a new kind of aileron that makes a plane maneuver a lot easier. But uh, before I had one put on my ship, well, I thought maybe you'd tell me what you thought of it. Hmm. A new aileron, huh? Well, I don't know. Look, Ken, I brought a model of my plane along, perfect in every detail, including those new ailerons. And you can tell by... Well, 
Ken, you've got more knowledge of planes than just your fingers than a dozen other flyers have in their whole bodies. Try it, Ken. You, uh, you say you got a plane model there? Yes. Well, let me see it. Uh, I mean, give it to me. Thanks. Hey, it's a good sized model. Low wing mount, retractable landing. What do you mean, new kind of aliens? These are. Hey, wait a minute. What do you mean, a model of your plane? This is Betsy. This is my plane. Of course it is, Ken. It is Betsy. Perfect and exact. And you know why it's here? I'll tell you. So that you can finish your job. You say that blind flying device of yours isn't perfect yet. Well, it's going to be. Yeah, she's got a swell idea, Ken. Look, you know what changes you need to make in that equipment. Make them here on that model. Mac can carry them out on the plane herself down at the shop. Why not? But how can I do... Well, there are instruments to read. Read them by touch. Take the glass off the front and have raised dials so you can see them with your fingers. You can do it, Ken. I know you can. I wonder. I wonder. Ken, the thing you're doing is too important to you and aviation. You can't stop now. Finish the job. I will, Sheila. Ah, but wait. There's one thing we're all forgetting. Money. It would take plenty. I've thought of that, too. You're going to earn it. Oh, me? How? By turning author. Who knows more about aerodynamics than Ken Morgan? Nobody. So what's to stop you writing articles for magazines? Hey, Chief, that's a swell idea. Of course it is. Well, how about it, Mr. Morgan? Is it a go? It's a go. Hey, hey, there's just one thing I don't get. What? Well, uh, why should you be doing all this for me? I don't know. Maybe it's just because I really learned to care. To, uh, care? Yeah. About the future of uh, aviation. And so ends the first act of tonight's performance in the Silver Theater. Before the second act starts, a very important member of our Silver Theater is going to carry on where Shakespeare left off when he said, What's in a name? John Carty. Those of you who follow the fashions pretty closely know that the names of certain designers stand for smartness and originality. In fact, the very best in style and workmanship. Well, the same thing holds true in the creation of silver. Certain names represent the best in silver smithing. Take 1847 Rogers Brothers, for example. For more than 90 years, the name 1847 Rogers Brothers has stood for the highest ideals of beauty in design and craftsmanship. And now, with their latest and loveliest pattern, First Love, 1847 Rogers Brothers adds still greater luster to that famous name. For First Love is real news in silver plate. Its flower-like ornament is more deeply etched, more richly raised than ever before, in a perfection of craftsmanship found formerly only in sterling silver. And this finest in silver plate costs far less than you think. A service for six in the glamorous first love pattern, 32 pieces, costs only $32.50. Go to your silverware dealer tomorrow and ask to see sets of first love. Find out about the convenient payment terms while you're there. You'll be surprised to learn how easily you can own the finest silver plate this country has ever seen. 1847 Rogers Brothers. And now the concluding act of Wings in the Dark. Three months have passed during which Ken Morgan has worked feverishly on his automatic flying device. And Sheila has become more reckless than ever in her stunt flying. As the curtain rises, Sheila is arriving at Ken's cabin on the hill. Hello, Mac. Oh, hello, Miss Sheila. I've been waiting outside to see you before Ken does. Bad news. Bad news? Yes, sir. Another story rejected. Ken doesn't know. Oh, sure not. I got it out of the mailbox and kept it myself, same as usual. Here it is. Ah, gosh. Don't worry, Mac. It just happens got, I got another check today. That county fair job, 200 bucks. Oh, now look, Miss Sheila, you've done enough already. After you all... You finished that automatic pilot, mustn't he? Parts and instruments cost money. When he's going to have it. Come on. And remember, not a word. Ken... Oh, hello, Ken. Hello, Sheila. I was afraid you weren't coming today. I, uh, I was delayed a little on business. 
How's the invention of the age coming? Oh, you can laugh, but about one more week, I'll be able to get in Betsy and fly myself. Yeah, over my dead body. <laughs> oh, Mac, hey, was there any mail down at the box? Was Where? there mail? And what mail, Mr. Morgan? Sheila, they didn't buy another story. Mister, somebody must have told you. Oh, them. great. You know, I was just wondering where the money for those new instruments was coming from. How much did they pay for this one? Two hundred dollars. Yeah. Two hundred? Boy, we're in the money. Hey, hey, Sheila. Sheila, give me that check, will you? I, I want to hold it in my hands. Sure. Sure, Ken. Here it is. Gosh. Oh, Sheila. I, I don't know how to thank you. Thank me, Ken? Yeah, for giving me the idea of writing that stuff. Funny, I never thought it was much good. <laughs> well, I guess a guy can't tell about what he writes, huh? I, I guess not. Hey, Mac. Yes, yeah, Chief? Beat it. Huh? Oh, oh. Okay. Sheila, come over here to the window, will you? I want to show you something. All right, Ken. Look, ever see anything that could touch that out there? The daffodils growing on the hill? The lake with the willow trees along the shore silhouetted against the sky? Ken, you... you no, can't... No, it's not what you think, Sheila. I've had Max standing here just as sundown for the last three nights telling me everything he saw. So I could, well, see it just once with you. Oh, Ken. Say... <laughs> I'm an awful dope, you know it. When I had a chance to take a good look at you, I didn't do it. Ken. Come closer, Sheila. Uh, hey, your hair. It's soft and fragrant. Gold color, isn't it? Corn yellow, my dad used to call it. Sheila. Oh, Ken. Ken. Ah, uh, don't give me that, Mac. I'm going to see you. Nick. Her. Hey, Sheila, I had a hunch you'd I'd find you here. Hi, Ken. Hey, listen, Sheila, if I got news and sister, I mean news. I'm sorry, boss. I tried to stop him. Oh, that's all right, Mac, old boy. Hey, listen, Sheila. I got the Hexel Oil Company all set to pay you 25,000 smackers for a single nonstop flight, and they furnished the plane. $25,000? Where do I fly? From pool to pole? No, ma'am, you do not. You fly from Moscow to New York. Moscow? Ken, isn't that wonderful? No, it isn't. That's a jump of nearly 6,000 miles. It's too far and too dangerous. Oh, so it's dangerous. What do you think she's been doing around these county fairs? Playing tiddlywinks? Oh, well, Sheila's been stunt flying for a long time. She oh, hasn't... not like this she has, and she's gone bats the last couple of months. Double outside loops, spins that she don't come out up to that crater. Hers is nearly on the ground. And all for what? So she'll get maybe 200 on a job instead of 150. Nick. Now look here, Sheila, use your head. This Moscow flight is a chance to clean up for both of us. Shut up, Nick. Sheila's not going. Hey, what right have you got to interfere in her business? Nick. Besides, she needs the dough. Well, not anymore, she doesn't. What? I'm giving Sheila a third interest in my blind flying device. Ken. So what? I suppose I should cheer. Hey, Morgan, everybody in aviation knows that idea of yours is crackpot. And even if it wasn't, you can't finish the thing. <laughs> You're broke. Oh, broke, am I? Broke? Take a look at this check. Ken, no. Here it is. Look at that. Broke, huh? Well, just be sure that you have Sheila endorse that before you try to cash it. Nick. Have Sheila endorse. Oh. oh, I get it. <laughs> now, will you please go now? You too, Mac. I want to talk to Sheila. Come on, you. Oh, well, I, I'm sorry. I... Ken, before you say anything, please, you've got to understand. I do understand. All of those checks, they were yours. Not one of those stories was sold. That's true, isn't it? Oh, Ken. Answer me! And suppose it is. All that I cared about was seeing you find yourself again. This is a bigger thing than pride, Ken. Pity. That's what it's been from the first. Everything you've done... Will you shut up? Don't you know the real reason for anything and everything I did? I love you, you crazy, stubborn fool. I love you. Chief, for the lover, what did you say to her? Why? Well, she just came out crying and went off with Nick. And I heard her tell him she was going to make that Moscow flight. dramatic adventure. At last report, she was 100 miles off Halifax, fighting headwinds but making satisfactory progress. We continue now with our regular program. Halifax! You hear that? The worst of it's over. Now you go get some sleep, Ken. You've been sitting there for ten hours, and that long drive in from the cabin, you're worn out? Come on, I'll wake you up when there's news. No, no, save your breath, Mac. I'm staying here till she lands. Reported somewhere between Halifax and Portland, Maine, 
Sheila Mason has been out of communication with any radio station for more than an hour. Also, she's heading toward a heavy fog bank, now moving in off the Atlantic, which is bringing visibility down almost to zero. At last reports, her gas supply was running low and... Why turn it off? Come on, we're going down to the field. But Ken! You heard me. It's my fault she's up there and... Well, I want to be at the field. Come on. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, here's the field. You better take my arm. Yes, Mac, but get going. Hello, Ken. Hi, Mac. Oh, what a night. Nick! Nick! What's the news? News? You mean you don't know? Sheila's here. Here? Yeah, up there somewhere in the fog. Oh. She can't find a way into the field. Well, how about a gas? Well, it's nearly gone. Ten minutes ago, she said that... Mac, what? The hangar. Take me there. What? Why, you... I'm going up in Betsy and lead Sheila in. Chief, you can't. Because I'm blind, eh? Well, who isn't tonight? But I've got something no one else has. A plane that'll fly without eyes. Now, come on, I'm going up for Sheila. No, Ken, she's not warm enough. That motor's... Then I'm ready. Pull out those wheel blocks. Ken, wait a minute. This is crazy. Think what you're doing. Let me go with you. Nobody's going with me this time. You keep on that transmitter and lead us in and don't stop talking. Don't okay, keep us. And remember this, if I do get Sheila on the ground, keep her there, no matter what happens to me, you understand? What do you mean, what happens to you? Never mind, pull out those wheel blocks. Okay. Good luck, Chief. Ken Morgan, Ken Morgan, this is the field dispatcher calling Ken Morgan out on the field. Don't take off. The inspector for visit. Calling Morgan. Don't take off. Morgan calling the field. I have taken off. Got to find Sheila Mason. Mac will be there in a minute. Let him take over to guide me in when I'm ready. Now I'm switching off to talk to Sheila. Okay. You're crazy, but go ahead. Good luck, fella. Sheila. Hello. Sheila. Come in. This is Ken calling. This is Ken calling Sheila. Sheila. Can you hear me? Hello. Ken. Ken! Yes, this is Sheila. Where are you? In Betsy, a thousand feet over Roosevelt Field. Ken, you're not alone. No, I'm not alone. I've got a dream with me. The automatic pilot. It's working? I just told you. Like a dream. How much gas have you got? I don't know. Ten minutes? Maybe less. Climb above the fog and look for me. Right. Now. I can see you now. How far away am I? About a quarter mile. Good. Pull up alongside. Right. How are you? I was tired. Dead tired. But not now. Okay. I'm alongside. Swell. Stay there. We'll go down in a minute. But but first I've got to tell you something. Yes? I love you, Sheila. Oh, Ken. Ken, you can pick the craziest times and places to save me. I love you, too. I always have. But it's goodbye now, Sheila. Goodbye? Listen carefully. I'm taking you down. Follow me. But remember this. Whatever I do, I want you to stay on the ground once you're there. What are you talking about? I'm coming up again, Sheila. Coming up and flying on. Flying on? Where? That doesn't matter. You've got to be free, Sheila. You have a right to be. And believe me, this is the best way out. Ken, you can't. I love you. Goodbye, darling. I'm cutting my radio. I have to switch over and pick up Mac. He's going to drive us in. Follow me down and keep close. Ken, listen to... Hello? Hello, Mac. Mac! Morgan, call him McDonald. Come in. Okay, Ken. Here I am. Bring her down, boy. Mac, keep talking. I'll follow your voice in. But keep talking. Count. Anything. Right, Chief. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Keep it coming, Ken. Keep it coming. One, two, three, four. That's the boy. One, two, three, four. He's done it. Five. He's done it. 
Look, he's coming down. And Sheila right behind him. Uh, if the automatic pilot just works. It's got to. One, two, three. He's three. down in those caves. Now, holy Sheila. Easy, Sheila. Easy. Yeah, she made it, the boat. Hey, something's happened. Ken's going up again. Hey, what's Sheila doing? She's going to... Hey, Sheila, look out! Come on! Stand back! Hey, Sheila! Get him out! Sheila! Sheila, you're all right. Why did you crash into him? I had to... I had to stop Ken. He was going up again to fly on to... Oh, Matt, get him out of there. Let me throw. Easy, easy, easy. Boss, you're all right. Ken, Ken! Oh, my darling. Why didn't you let me do it, Sheila? Why didn't you? Because you're mine. Because I love you and need you. Can't you see that, Ken? Yes. Yes, I think so, dear. Ken, you're hurt. No, it's my head. It's flashing with lights. I... It must have been the cracker. Flashing? There are flashes of light. Caramel flashlights. Ken, you can see them. Yes. Sheila, I can see them. I can see them! In just a moment, Cary Grant and Phyllis Brooks will be back for a curtain speech. But first, here's another friend of yours with a really amazing offer. John Conti. One of the beautiful things so many women long for most frequently is lovely, gleaming silverware. A few minutes ago, we told you about one kind of silverware, 1847 Rogers Brothers Silver Plate. Now we'd like to tell you about the other kind, solid silver by International Sterling. International Sterling Silver is fashioned by master craftsmen. And in all the world, I think you'll find no more radiant example of their skill and artistry than the stunning pattern Enchantress. The richness of that soft, lustrous finish. The simplicity of that mirror-clear center panel with the delicate carving at either side combined to make Enchantress truly breathtaking. Right now at your silverware dealers, International Sterling is making a special offer to introduce you to Enchantress. A solid silver spoon that sells regularly for $3.25, is yours for only $1. And remember, this is sterling silver, solid silver through and through. When you get your spoon tomorrow, be sure to look at complete sets of enchantress, and then learn from your silverware dealer about the budget payment plan whereby you, too, can make a dream come true and own the best in silverware, international sterling silver. And now to Conrad Nagel, who has brought Cary Grant and Phyllis Brooks out before our silver curtain. Well, first, may we congratulate both you, Cary, and Miss Brooks on your splendid performances. You know, I've read a few stories and heard a few rumors, Phyllis, that you and Carrie are contemplating a little aisle-walking or matrimonial plan. Uh, but that, Conrad, is according to the newspapers. Oh, yes, and the uh, rumors. Yes, but if you were contemplating anything like that, now's the time. You're both free as air. You both just but, finished uh, new pictures, so... Uh, but, Conrad, it's still according to the newspapers. And the uh, rumors. Yeah, well, now, wait a minute. My point is, if the rumors were true, you'd have to furnish a house, wouldn't you? That's right, if. And furnishing a house means silverware. You mean like uh, first love? Or uh, enchantress? Yes, so... Uh... Uh, I'll tell you, Conrad. We'll check up, and if the newspapers... And the uh, rumors, Phyllis. The... Yes, and if the rumors have anything to them, we're customers. Right, Grant? Right, Brooks. Right, and good night, Cary Grant. Good night, Phyllis Brooks. Thank you. <laughs> Next week, at the same time, the Silver Theater will star Rosalind Russell and James Stewart in the first episode of a thrilling two-part drama directed by Conrad Nagel with original music scored and conducted by Felix Mills. And in the meantime, if you want solid silver, you want international sterling. If you want silver plate, you want 1847 Rogers Brothers, both proudly created by International Silver Company. Wings in the Dark by Nell Shipman was adapted by permission of Paramount Pictures. Harry Grant will soon be seen in the RKO picture Gunga Din with Douglas Fairbanks Jr., Victor McLachlan, and Joan Fontaine. And his books can be seen in the 20th Century Fox picture Great Place and Show. John Conti speaking. This is Columbia Broadcasting System.
Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Cary Grant, Claude Rains, Evelyn Keyes, and James Gleason in Here Comes Mr. Jordan. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. One evening after dinner, the family and I settled down in our most comfortable chairs to see a motion picture at home. None of us stayed settled long. The picture was Columbia's Here Comes Mr. Jordan. And from myself down to the youngest grandchild, it kept us all on the edge of our chairs. Following the peculiar career of a prizefighter named Joe Pendleton, who was killed in the first scene... He had lived to get the girl at the end, the neatest trick of the year. A slight error of destiny takes the hero through adventures that make Christopher Columbus, Marco Polo, and Magellan look like stay-at-homes. You see, Joe gets killed, but he is is not dead, and thereby hangs one of the most curious picture stories of the year. So here comes Mr. Jordan, and here comes Cary Grant. And from the original screencast, Claude Rains, Evelyn Keyes, and James Gleason. Whenever a producer announces a new picture, he's immediately deluged with applications from hundreds of ambitious young ladies, some of them with real talent, who want to become motion picture stars. It took me weeks to examine all the applications that came in when I announced Reap the Wild Wind. But it was very gratifying to learn how many of these girls were boosters for Lux Toilet Soap. One of tonight's stars, a Lux girl herself, Evelyn Keyes, made her screen debut several years ago in one of my pictures. Perhaps you'd like to hear what it was in her screen test that caught my attention. It was her completely natural beauty. She was talented, of course, and her voice was very good. But more than anything else, that fragile blonde beauty and the lovely complexion that goes with it dominated the screen. So my advice to the would-be stars of tomorrow is this. Keep your beauty natural. And naturally, Lux Toilet Soap can give you a lot of help there. Now the rising curtain brings Here Comes Mr. Jordan, starring Cary Grant as Joe, Claude Rains as Mr. Jordan, Evelyn Keyes as Betty, and James Gleason as Max. Here are the Adirondack Mountains. Here are the murmuring pines, the leafy glades, Here are the cool, bubbling streams. And here in this mountain paradise are two prizefighters trying to knock each other's brains out. They're sparring away in the training ring. The one in the blue trunks is Joe Pendleton, contender for the championship of the world. And that man at the ringside in the battered derby is his trainer, Max Corkle. Okay, Joe, that's enough. Cut it up. Inside for a rough down. Oh, come on, Max. They only had five rounds. Can't I have a couple more? You heard me. I said that's enough. Now, save some of that for my dog. Hey, how'd that look, Maxie? Just fair. Not enough speed. Go on. I'm in the pink. Break down, Maxie. Who's your favorite fighter? Stop your clowning. Look, Joe, I decided to finish training in New York, so we'll break camp right after lunch. Yeah? Oh, that's great. I can fly myself down this afternoon, huh? Oh, listen, Joe. Do me a favor, will you? Leave that plane of yours up here and take the train down. Will you do that? Oh, what can happen to me when I got the lucky saxophone along? Hey, where is it? Where's my sax? Oh, here it is, Joe. Oh, thanks, pal. Joe, I don't like this flying business. The way we're sitting out within two weeks in the greatest fight of your life and on the way to the championship, why take chances? Oh, yeah? Fine thing. Me known as the flying pug, the papers will all say flying pug takes train. Fine thing. Ah, Joe. I'll meet you in New York at the gym tomorrow. (laughs) Hey, Maxley, how about a little of your favorite tune, huh? No, not now, Joe. I, yep. uh... Oh, Joe, cut out, will you? This is serious. Joe. That's awful. Will you please lay off? Will you lay off? Hey, what goes on? What's the matter with this? Hey, what the... What? Hey, 
Hey, come on, baby, straighten out. Don't give me that stuff. Hey, hey, come on. Come on, baby. now, Mr. Pendleton. Your plane crashed. Now, listen, if I ain't in New Jersey, where am I? And who are you? I am messenger number 7013. My mission is to take care of all dead persons in my territory. Huh? Dead? Who's dead? You are, Mr. Pendleton. Oh, you're screwy. I never felt better in my life. I'm in a pink. How can I be dead? Mr. Pendleton, look around you. Does this look like the earth? Well, all I can see is a lot of clouds. Have you ever walked on clouds before? No, and furthermore, I don't like it, so get me out of here. Oh, no. Oh, no. We can't leave just yet, Mr. Pendleton. You see, this is the halfway point, the stopover for new arrivals from the world. Oh, listen, you don't make any sense at all. You must be a little cracked. I'm doing New York. I've got to get there. Where can I find a taxi? There are no taxis here, as you can see, sir. Hey, hey, where are all those people over there? Oh, uh, the new arrivals, sir. They're waiting to be checked off the list. Oh, yeah? Well, I hope they ain't all as screwy as you. I'll find out about this thing. Oh, Mr. Pendleton, come back. Yes, sir. Messenger 424 reporting, sir. Nine passengers. Project their names against this list and then proceed. Yes, sir. Hey, who's in charge around here? Where's the boss? Oh, Mr. Pendleton, will you stop this commotion? What's the trouble? Oh, oh, uh, messenger 7013 reporting, sir. No trouble at all. No, no trouble yet, but there's going to be. Are you the boss here? Oh, Mr. Pendleton, a little more respect. This is Mr. Jordan. Oh, Mr. Jordan, eh? Well, look, Mr. Jordan, I want to get a taxi to New York and quick. What is the meaning of this? Oh, it's a very difficult case, sir. Fought me tooth and nail all the way up here. Uh, fought him. How do you like that? Listen, Mr. Jordan, don't waste your time listening to this comic. Do you know what he keeps telling me? He keeps telling me I'm dead. I'm afraid you are. Oh, what? Dead. Oh, you too, eh? You're just as crazy as he oh, is. Oh, well, Mr. Pendleton, now, please. What is his name? A Pendleton. Joseph. No, no, you even got that board up. I'm Joe... Not Joe Pendleton! Not Pendleton, Joseph. It's oh, Joe Pendleton. Pendleton. I'm the real Pendleton. Pendleton, Pendleton, Pendleton. I don't see his name on my list. Well, I can't be on any list. What's your occupation? Musician? Musician? Well, I never gave you the idea I'm a musician. Well, that uh, instrument you're carrying? Oh, that? Oh, that's my sax. That's just a hobby, like flying. Look, I'm Joe Pendleton, the flying pug, they call me. I'm a prize fighter. You were a prize fighter. There's no Pendleton, Joseph, listed. There, you see, what did I tell you? Mr. Sloan, contact the registrar's office, will you? Ask them for everything they have on Pendleton Joseph. Yes, sir. No, I'm trying to tell you, fellas, I'm not ready for this place yet. I've never felt better in my life. I'm in the pink. Strange he isn't on the list. Oh, now, really, sir, it isn't possible that he could have survived. Why, he was hurtling to earth with the speed of a meteor. Yes, but I wouldn't have crashed. I'd have pulled the ship out somehow if you'd left me alone. Oh, quiet. Messenger. Uh, yes, Mr. Jordan. Am I to understand that you took this man out of that plane before it crashed? Yeah, that's what he did. Uh, yes, sir. I, um... Unpardonably presumptuous. Yes, sir. Oh, but there he was, sir, just plummeting earthward. I wanted to spare him the agony of crashing. That's enough, so. please. You're new, aren't you? I am, yes, sir. I was put on only this morning. I thought so. Overzealousness. Out for record collection. Mr. Jordan. <laughs> yes? On Pendleton Joseph, the official record says both his parents are happily withdrawn and awaiting his arrival. Joseph is scheduled to join them the morning of May 11th, 1992. 1992? 1022? Well, that's 50 years from now. What did I tell you? It seems you were a little premature. Hmm. 50 years to go yet. You fellas certainly pulled a boner this time. Oh, uh, Mr. Pendleton, I feel I owe you an apology. I'll tell the world you do. Oh, well. Never mind. We all make mistakes. There's no harm done. Just forget about it and take me back. Uh, take you back? Naturally. Take him back. Return him to the body out of which you so indiscreetly snatched him. Yeah, make it snappy. Well, I'm glad to meet you, Mr. Jordan. And thanks for straightening everything out for me. Not at all. <laughs> I'll be seeing you 50 years from now, if you're still on the job. I will be. Well, come on, let's go. And Mr. Pendleton, if you don't mind, I'm the one who says let's go. Let's go. Control yourself, Mr. Pendleton. Oh, I thought I was out of this place for keeps. 
Here I am again, strolling around on the clouds. Is there anything wrong? Oh, oh, uh, Mr. Jordan. Oh, hello, Mr. Jordan. I didn't expect to see you for 50 years, Mr. Penny. Oh, Mr. Jordan, something terrible has happened. Uh, shut up, I'll tell him. You keep quiet. Now, look, Mr. Jordan, we go down there to New Jersey. Well, my body ain't in the plane. Now, then we go to Corker's place. My body ain't there either. Finally, I find out what's happened. Why, you guys kept me up here gabbing. That Corker gets my body out of the plane and has me cremated. <laughs> cremated? Yeah. Oh, that's bad. Oh, it's deplorable, Mr. Jordan. I feel just ghastly. Well, how do you think I feel? <laughs> Wait till I see that Corko. He can't go around burning me up and get away with it. This is very bad. This complicates everything. Oh, I have an idea, Mr. Jordan. Couldn't we have him reborn? Nothing doing. I'm not going to go through that again. <laughs> well, I see I'll have to take personal charge of this. Come along, Joseph. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Where to? Well, I'm taking you back to Earth. <laughs> yeah, but you can't. Didn't I just tell you? I haven't got a body anymore. What of it? I'll get you another body. Huh? You'll do what? Um, another body? That's what I said. Come along, Joseph. Ah, uh, now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What kind of a deal is this? You can't go shoving just anybody's body off on me. Not on your life. I put in ten years getting that body in the pink. But, Joseph, it's gone. Your body doesn't exist any longer. Now, Mr. Jordan. Now, Joe, you shall have your choice of a thousand bodies, all excellent specimens. I promise you, we'll keep looking until we find a body you like. Now, that's fair enough, isn't it? Hmm. Well, I don't want any more than what's coming to me. I just want what it was and what it was going to be. No more, no less. So I expect you to make good, Mr. Jordan. I'll do my best. Come along. Goodbye, Mr. Pendleton. Good luck. Oh, that sounds mighty weird coming from you. <laughs> you know, I thought that messenger fellow was good at getting around, but you're terrific, Mr. Jordan. Russia, Australia, South Africa, and now New York. How do you do it? Well, that's a trade secret, Joe. Yeah? Joe, we've made 130 stops. I've offered you the cream of last week's crop, and you've turned up your nose at the lot. Yeah, but there wasn't a decent physique in the whole bunch, Mr. Jordan. You can't slip me a second raider. You gotta remember I was in the pink. That is becoming a most obnoxious color, Joe. <laughs> now, don't mention it again, please. Oh, okay, I won't. Well, where's the next stop? The next stop is that house across the street. Oh, yeah? Hey, it's a pretty snazzy place, isn't it? Who did we size up in there? The owner, Bruce Farnsworth. Well, look, uh, I can't go into a place like that. I, I mean, well, you've got to dress up a little, you know. Joe, that. I've explained it 20 times. No one can see us, and no one can hear us. Oh. We are invisible, Joe. Yeah, that's right. I keep forgetting. Well, let's take a look at this bird. <laughs> You know, Mr. Jordan, I'll never get used to this. To what, Joe? Walking through walls. It ain't natural. Hey, uh, what's the dope on this Farnsworth guy? Well, he's about your age and uh, fairly husky. Well, about my age and he's got a joint like this, he must be rolling in dough. He inherited it, Joe. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, well set up? Oh, quite. Uh, played polo a while back. Oh, that sounds good. Is he dead? No. Mm -hmm. Going to die, though, huh? Mm-hmm. Sick, huh? No, not uh, really. He uh, has a slightly run-down condition. Oh, just slightly run-down. <laughs> He's going to die, that's all. He's being murdered, Joe. What? Murdered? You mean... Well, is it going on right now? Mm-hmm. But right here in this house? That's right. Well, who's doing it? His wife. <laughs> and the man she's in love with, Farnsworth's confidential secretary. Whew. Nice people you want me to meet. How are they killing him? They're drowning him in the bathtub. Holy cow. Well, come on, let's scram out of here. I'm going to keep my nose clean. Now, wait, Joe. Oh, now, look, Mr. Jordan. You don't think I'm crazy enough to change places with a guy who's got a wife like that hanging around? I ain't punch drunk yet. We'll have to wait here until I collect him. It's my job. Well, how can you sit there when there's a guy being killed? Why don't we call the cops? I'm afraid they wouldn't pay any attention to us, Joe. Even the New York's finest can't see or hear us. Oh, yeah, that's right. Wait. It's all over. What? You mean he's dead? Hmm? He's dead. Hurry, Tony. It's all right, Julia. Now keep calm. Hey, are those the two that did it? Mm-hmm. That's uh, Mrs. Farnsworth and the secretary, Tony Abbott. Gee, to look at her, you wouldn't see. Well, she don't look like a murderer, Mr. Jordan. Just you listen, Joe. Tony, I'm frightened. Get hold of yourself, Julia. Tony, I don't know what's come over me. I have a feeling I can't shake off the, 
That's something weird. Something hanging over is watching us. Mm, you said it, sister. Come now, stop it, Julia. Now, what could be more natural? A glass of warm milk, a sleeping tablet or two, and a very tired, dissipated young man unfortunately drowses off in his bath. I beg your pardon, <gasps> Mrs. Farnsworth. Yes, what is it? Uh, Miss Betty Logan is here. She wants to see Mr. Farnsworth. Send her away. Don't be silly, Julia. Ask Miss Logan to come in, Sisk. Very good, sir. I can't talk to her now, Tony. Of course you can. Just be sympathetic. I'll be in the study. If she becomes difficult, bring her in to me. Hey, who's this Logan? Somebody else mixed up in the murder? You judge for yourself, Joe. Miss Logan. How do you do, Miss Logan? I'm Mrs. Farnsworth. May I see Mr. Farnsworth, please? I've got to see him. Why, yes, he'll be right down. Oh, be right down. She knows he's dead. Mrs. Farnsworth, my father's been arrested. Yes, I know. I'm sorry. He's sick, Mrs. Farnsworth. This will kill him. And he's not guilty of anything. It was about some worthless securities he sold, wasn't it? That Mr. Farnsworth sold under my father's name. Really? And what do you expect Mr. Farnsworth to do? I... I don't know. But he can't send an innocent man to jail. Well, I don't know about these things. Mr. Abbott has all the facts in the case, and he's in the study. Would you care to see him? Yes, if I could, please. Just come right in. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Jordan, that Logan girl. Oh, boy, I've never seen anything as beautiful as that, not even in heaven. She is pretty, isn't she? Yeah, she's in a tough spot. She's got a lot of courage to come here alone to fight for her father. She worships him. Yeah, well, she's no match for those buzzards. She needs help. You'd better go to work. Farnsworth is the only one who can help her, Joe. Well, he's dead. Yes, but you can be Farnsworth. Huh? Well, what do you mean? I don't get it. It's quite simple. What? You mean you want me to be Farnsworth and have a swell girl like that hate me? But you'll make a very different Farnsworth, Joe. Spiritually, there'll be no change in you. Yeah, yeah, but I wouldn't be myself. A guy's no good if he isn't himself. Joe, you'll always be yourself. You'd merely be using Farnsworth's physical covering, like uh, putting on a new overcoat. Yeah? Well, it better be a pretty good overcoat. It's got to last me 50 years. <laughs> but inside that coat, you'd still be Joe Pendleton, thinking, acting, and feeling. Yeah, yeah. But that run-down overcoat, that playboy Farnsworth, I'd have to give up everything, a crack at the title, and... Uh... No, no, I couldn't do it, Mr. Jordan. I'd like to help you, but not that way. Oh, sis? Yes, Mr. Abbott? Did you tell Mr. Farnsworth that Miss Logan is here to see him? Yes, sir. Now, what's the idea? That, 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 that guy Abbott knows Farnsworth is dead. Oh, very convenient, the butler discovering the body. You haven't much time to decide, Joe. <laughs> well, don't rush me. I've got to do some figuring. Make up your mind, Joe. Well, now, look... What if I did it only temporary? Supposing I was Farnsworth just for a little while until after I helped that kid out. Could I do that? If you wish it. All right. And after you got me out of Farnsworth's body, you'd have to get me a body that would suit me. Is that clear? Quite. Okay, it's a deal. Well, come on, Mr. Jordan. We've got to hurry. Hey, hey. Look at me, Mr. Jordan. I'm all wet. <laughs> I'm soaking wet. Well, you just got out of the bath, Joe. That's where Farnsworth was. Yeah. Well, uh, where's Farnsworth now? You're Farnsworth. What? Oh, no, no, wait, wait. We can't get away with this. Mr. Jordan, I still feel like me. I still sound like me. Inwardly, you haven't changed, Joe. Outwardly, you're Bruce Farnsworth, and that's what they'll see and hear. Mr. Farnsworth, are you in there? Answer him, Joe. Uh, answer him? What, you mean people can hear me now? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but... But he knows that other guy's voice. That is exactly what you'll hear. To everyone else, you'll seem to be talking like Bruce Farnsworth. Mr. Farnsworth, is anything wrong? Please answer me, sir. Go ahead, Joe. Oh, okay. I'll be out in a minute. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. There. <laughs> now, what he heard was the voice of Farnsworth. Oh, <laughs> It was, huh? And when you open that door, what he sees will be Farnsworth. You try it. Okay, here goes. <clears throat> Excuse me, Mr. Farnsworth, but there's a Miss Logan... What'd you call me? Why, uh, Mr. Farnsworth. Mr... <clears throat> hey, go on. There's a Miss... <laughs> a Miss Logan here to see you, sir. Yeah, I know. I beg your pardon, sir? I mean, uh, I'll go right down. Yeah. <laughs> he never batted an eye, Mr. Jordan. I beg your pardon, sir. Remember, Joe, people can hear you now. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Forgot uh, what, sir? Nothing, I was only thinking. Well, look, Mr. Jordan, you mean they, they still can't see or hear you? No, Joe. Who can't see and hear whom, sir? Nobody beat it, will you? I'll be right down. Very good, sir. Isn't that amazing? Mr. Farnsworth, he calls me, looking right at me. 
How do you do it, Mr. Jordan? Well, if there were no mystery left to explore, Joe, life would get rather dull, wouldn't it? Now to the library, and I think you're going to be something of a surprise down there. My husband's taking rather long, isn't he? Yes, very long. Well... Perhaps he won't come down at all. Julia? So why don't you go, Miss Logan? There's no help for you. Your father's in jail to stay. Hello. Somebody want me? Mr. Farnsworth. Bruce. Bruce, what are you... Hello, Miss Logan. I'm glad to see you. Mr. Farnsworth, I'd like to speak to you privately. Yeah, sure. Why not? How about outside? Bruce, you... You... What's the matter? Nothing. I... I just... Oh, hey, Abbott. Mrs. Farnsworth looks a little pale around the gills. She looks like she's going to... Oh, she did. <laughs> well, I'll pick her up. This way, Miss Logan. <clears throat> oh, sit down, Miss Logan. What's on your mind? Mr. Farnsworth, I just want one thing. I want you to get my father out of jail. Oh, yeah, that's right. He's in jail, isn't he? Yeah. As if you didn't know, you put him there. Well, Farnsworth did. I mean, you see, I'm not really... Well, you know how it goes now... Now, for instance, if you want to change overcoats... This is hardly the time for jokes. Oh, oh, I'm not joking, Miss Logan. Then admit it. You did put my father in jail. Well, all right, I did. But I didn't have anything to do with it. You're just trying to put me off. You're trying to make a fool out of me. You, you think you can laugh me out of it as if I were a child. Oh, look, your father's going to be all right, Miss Logan. Another Farnsworth uh, trick. They told me there was no use coming here to talk to you. Oh, no, please, listen. I knew I... you were cruel. But to play with people like this and torture them. Oh, oh you're horrible. Horrible. Oh, wait, Miss Logan. I'll get your father out. I'll... Listen. She's a high-spirited girl, Joe. Yeah. Did you hear that, Mr. Jordan? I was sitting right there. Yeah. Well, I certainly fixed it, didn't I? <laughs> she likes me a lot. She will in time. Oh, go on. I'm poison to her. Mr. Jordan... This won't work. You better get me out of this, this, this overcoat and let's get moving. She is wonderful, though, isn't she? Oh, yeah. Boy, I'd give my right arm if I could help her. But you promised you would, didn't you? You can't very well move on until you've made good. Yeah, but it's no use. I don't even know what to do. Bruce Farnsworth can do anything he wishes. Well, I'll have to believe in you now, Joe. Hmm? What? My work's piling up. I'll have to get back. Yeah, but, but you can't leave me holding the bag in a mess like this. I'll be back whenever you need me. So long, Joe. Yeah, but Mr. John... Oh, Mr. Jordan, don't go walking through walls on me. Hey, oh, where are you? Mr. Jordan? Mr. Jordan? <laughs> Holy cow. In just a moment, Mr. DeMille and our stars, Terry Grant, Claude Rains, Evelyn Keyes, and James Gleason will return in Act Two of Here Comes Mr. Jordan. Well, here's Libby Collins, our Hollywood reporter. Welcome, Libby. What's new? I've had the most exciting afternoon, Mr. Ruick. Lieutenant, Lieutenant Lupino and I... Lieutenant Lupino? Now, wait a minute, Libby. Are you referring to Ida Lupino? Of course, Mr. Ruick. Ida's a lieutenant in the Women's Ambulance Defense Corps. She enlisted as a private in the Corps, learned how to be a fine mechanic, and now she's a lieutenant. You should see her in her snappy uniform. She looks lovelier than ever. I believe it, Libby. The same exquisite complexion, of course. Ida's a real luxe girl. You bet she is. She says her daily complexion care is an active lather facial with Lux soap. She's glad these busy days it's such a quick, easy care, a care that really works. You know, Libby, I think the ladies in our audience would like to know just how Ida Lupino takes her daily Lux Beauty facial. Won't you tell them? Gladly, Mr. Ruick. Here's what Ida says. Pat the creamy Lux soap lather lightly in, rinse with warm water, then with a dash of cool. Pat gently with a towel to dry. Ida says her skin feels smoother after this daily care, that it's a wonderful beauty aid. Many other famous Hollywood stars say that too, Libby. They depend on their Lux Soap complexion care these extra busy days. They do, Mr. Ruick, because they've found these beauty facials such an easy, quick way to help keep skin smooth. I'm sure every woman who tries this famous Hollywood care will agree with you, Libby. Why not begin tomorrow and try these facials for 30 days? See how thoroughly Lux Soap's gentle, active lather removes stale cosmetics and every trace of dust and dirt. See how flower-fresh your skin looks after this Lux Soap beauty care. Then you'll know why nine out of ten lovely screen stars use this luxurious white soap regularly. Get some Lux Toilet Soap tomorrow. Buy it the economical three cakes at a time way. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Act 
two of Here Comes Mr. Jordan, starring Cary Grant as Joe, Claude Rains as Mr. Jordan, Evelyn Keyes as Betty, and James Gleason as Max. The spirit of Joe Pendleton is encased in the body of Bruce Farnsworth, and Joe is finding the situation very annoying. He's discovered that Bruce Farnsworth is, or was, a first-class crook and all-around cad. Only the presence of his beloved saxophone makes Joe's existence bearable. Mr. Farnsworth, you sent for me? Yeah. What are you looking at, Abbott? Well, I didn't know you played a saxophone. No? Well, a lot of people don't know it. You'll get used to it after a while. Now, let's get on to business. I've been thinking over this Logan affair, and it don't sound so good. I want to get Mr. Logan out of jail. With fraud pinned on him like this? Well, who pinned it on him? Well, naturally, we did. That's what I thought, so let's unpin it. Mr. Farnsworth, you realize you'll have to buy back every share of that worthless stock? It's impossible. Hmm? Now, who's got it? Naturally, small investors all over the country. Oh, small investors, eh? <laughs> it's nice work. I'll give them back every cent they paid for it. That will take millions of dollars. Have I got it? Of course, but... All right, let's do it. Don't you feel you ought to think this over first? I have thought it over. And get this. You and I are going to tangle plenty from now on if you don't watch your step. So don't try any funny business. And stay out of my bathroom. <laughs> paper, paper, Fonsway, please, Logan, insecurities fraud. Paper, Logan, released from jail. Millions paid back to investors. Paper, paper. Mr. Jordan! Mr. Jordan! Here I am, Joe. Oh, oh, hello, Mr. Jordan. You're just the man I needed. I told you I'd come if you needed me. How are you, Mr. Pendleton? Oh, you too, huh? What do you want? I didn't ask for you. Oh, really, Mr. Pendleton? It's all right, Joe. He came with me. What's the trouble? Well, look at this in the paper. That's what's the trouble. You mean about giving the money back to the investors? Oh, no, 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 not that. On the sporting page. Listen. Murder out in a fight champ. Mr. Jordan, they can't do this to me. They're trying to ditch me out of the title. This is what comes of fooling around with this temporary Farnsworth business. Now, look at the spot I'm in. You're in no spot whatsoever, Mr. Pendleton. Why don't you keep out of this? I knew perfectly well that you were to have another body. Yeah, well, what have you done about it? Just scoured the world for it, that's all. And I may say, I found it. Hmm. What have you found? A superb specimen. A strapping fellow in Australia who'll soon be available. A motor accident. Huh? What's his weight? 192 pounds. Oh, that's good. What's his reach? Uh, 78 inches. Not bad. Waist, chest, and forearm. Oh, great heavens, what difference does that make? He's got a waist and a chest and a forearm. What more do you want? Well, I want to know. That's what I want. Why are you fumbling around the championships getting away from but me? But it won't get very far. We have found out that you are actually intended to be the next world's champion. What? Is that a fact? Yes, Joe. Well, how do you know? Nothing can prevent it. I knew it. I told you. Well, come on. What are we waiting for? Let's take a look at this Australian fella. Mr. Farnsworth, sir. Uh, oh, it's the butler. Hey, duck, you guys. Beat it. We don't have to duck, Joe. They can't see us. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Why can't I remember that? Mr. Farnsworth. Yeah, what? Miss Logan is here, sir. Oh, Miss Logan? Well, bring her in. Uh, never mind, I'll get her myself. Yes, sir. Oh, is this delay necessary, Mr. Jordan? Yes, and very interesting. Hello, Miss Logan. Come right in here. Sit down. Um, can I get you something? Uh, um, coffee or something? No, I just wanted to tell you my father's home. Thank you. Oh, that's fine. Fine. Sit down. It was a wonderful thing you did. Not only for my father, I mean to give that money back to all those people. Oh, well, as a matter of fact, that's about the only thing to do, wasn't it? I don't know. I... I'm sorry I keep on staring at you like this. Oh, that's okay. I'm doing a little staring myself. I'm all mixed up. When I came to see you that night... When I was trying to hate you most, I couldn't deny there was something warm and friendly, even gentle in the way you smiled. Well, it was, huh? <laughs> Gee, well, well, that, 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 that's wonderful. How long does this dribble go on? A little patience. You know what I told my father this was? A miracle. A miracle? Why? Well, that a man like Bruce Farnsworth could have a real feeling for the happiness of others. Well, now, that's as good a way to go through life as any other, isn't it? That, yes, that's all I meant. Except when you find that in somebody, it's a great discovery. <laughs> I guess that's why I keep staring. I, I can't help it. it. It's something in your eyes and, and what's behind them that, that I keep trying to see. 
That sounds silly, doesn't it? No. No, I know what you mean. When you make a discovery like that, it's pretty important, isn't it? I mean, it's more important than what two people look like, or who they are, or anything else. Of course. Yeah. And even if he was... Well, it wouldn't make any difference what he was. The other thing is all that matters. That's how it ought to be. I'll have to go now. Goodbye. Uh, will I see you again? Yes, of course. Goodbye. <sighs> Goodbye. Gee. <laughs> well, thank goodness she's gone. Oh, Mr. Jordan, did you hear what she said? She was looking at me. Joe, she likes me. Me. Oh, really, sir, we have to get moving. Yes, ready, Joe? Huh? Oh, what do you mean? Oh, yeah, yeah, that Australian guy. If you recall, yes. Well, oh, wait a minute, I can't do that now. Why not? Well, don't you see, Mr. Jordan, she likes me the way I am. Now, if I go running off to Australia and pull a switch just when I get her used to this Farnsworth, I might lose her. Yes, Joe. Yeah. Well, now, look, Mr. Jordan, <clears throat> this Farnsworth was about my age. He had a pretty good body once. You said he played polo. Well, why couldn't I build him up physically like I did me? Why not? Yeah, exercise, plain food, plenty of fresh air. I'm sure you'd do wonders with it. Certainly, him. but what I know about fighting, of course I could. I could get that body in the pink in no time at all and Nick Murdoch with it. Then I've got the title and I got her too. Mr. Pendleton, is this final? You'll bet it's final. I'm getting Max Corgill in here tomorrow to help me train. But I'm going to stay like I am, as Farnsworth. <laughs> Farnsworth. Don't bother a... me while I'm punching the bag. I told you that before. But Mr. Farnsworth, Mr. Corkle is here. Oh, Corkle, He's Max a... Corkle? Yes, sir. Oh, well, where is he? Hey, Corkle, come on in. Excuse me, but... Uh... Hello, Corkle. Right in here. Uh, right here. Uh, thanks. I got a telegram Yeah, wait a minute, you. wait a minute. Hey, you. Sit. Outside. Very good, sir. <laughs> Max, you old son of a gun. I'm glad to see you. Do you know me? I certainly I know you, you dumb ox. Take a good look, Max. Do you know me? Sure, everybody knows you, Mr. Farnsworth. Oh, what's the matter with your eyes, you big sap? I'm not Farnsworth. I'm Joe Pendleton. You're Joe. You're nuts, Mr. Farnsworth. <laughs> Let me out of here! Oh, wait a minute, Max. Wait. Wait. Now, look, Max. I know I don't look like Joe, but I'm him just the same, and it's your fault. My fault? Yeah. Yeah, if you hadn't been in such a hurry to cremate me, I wouldn't be in the jam I'm in now. I... I... I c c cremated you? Uh, didn't you? Take, take it easy, will you, Mr. Farnsworth? It's been kind of hot today, ain't it? I better go now. Oh, no, 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 you don't, Max. Now, listen. You remember the time I went up in the plane? Well, something went fluey, and one of those guys that goes around collecting people, he pulled a boner. He grabbed me off before me time, and while I'm arguing with him, whether I'm dead or not, you cremate me. <laughs> then they got to make good. They got to get me another body. You get it? Sure, sure. Uh, then evidence fine, ain't it? And all you need now is a doctor. The best one. Maybe a specialist. No, no, no. Now, listen to me. I'm a very busy man, Mr. Farns. Wait. The body they give me belongs to this other guy. They drowned him in the bathtub, pushed him underneath the water. Hey! Hey, quiet! Huh? <laughs> now, keep quiet, Max. Having trouble, Joe? Yeah. Oh, Mr. Jordan? Gee, I certainly am glad you showed up. Max, this is Mr. Jordan. Is there somebody here with us? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Mr. Jordan. Oh, uh, uh, pleased to meet you, Mr. Jordan. Where is he? <laughs> oh, well, I forgot. You can't see him and you can't hear him. Oh, well, maybe if I had a good stiff drink... I'd... Well, you can't see him because you're not dead yet. Oh. Oh, well, uh, well, I guess you two fellas have got a, a lot of business to talk over, so I'll be mooching the law. Oh, now, come here, Max. Come here and sit down. Oh, uh... Mr. Jordan, I've got to get this through to him. Make him understand, will you? You can do it yourself, Joe. Try. Oh, I can, huh? Oh, well. Uh, all right. L now, listen, Max. Now, how would I know about Joe if I wasn't Joe? And listen to this. You got 40% of me. Yeah? Since when did you give me that? Well, since that time in Astoria when you saw me put away Butcher Boy McKenzie. Don't you remember you said I had color? You said I was what they wanted? And, look, look. How's your sister Rosie and her three kids? And have the twins gotten over the measles yet? Hey... Who are you, anyways? I'm Joe. You're Joe. This is Farnsworth's body because you burned mine, you big stiff. Hey, wait a minute. Wait. Sit there. Hey, now, look. I'll prove it to you. Now, no. you remember this? My saxophone? Hey, that's Joe's. I give it to him. Where'd you get it? It's my sax, I tell you. Wait. I'll play your favorite tune for you. Now, listen. You 
always hit that note, son. You, Joe. It's it's you. It's Joe. Uh, oh, now, Max, Max, don't faint. Uh, uh, no, come on, Max. No, 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 Max, no. Come on. Sit down here. Joe, Joe, Joe. Come on, Max, Max, snap out of it. Come on, come on. Oh, look at me, fella. Easy, oh, Joe, easy, Joe, easy. Joe, Joe, Joe. Yeah. Yeah. Take a deep breath, Max. Come on, come on, fella. Yeah, breathe, Max, breathe. Oh. There we are. That's a boy. Oh. There. Oh. Now you feel better, Max? Oh. Huh? Yeah. You sure to send a hangover from last night. You really are, Joe? Listen, Max. Inside, I'm Joe. Outside, I'm Farnsworth. Yeah. Hey, hey. Is your pal still around? Yeah, he's right there. He is, huh? Maybe I'm somebody else, too. Ask him. No, don't. <laughs> if I'm somebody else's body, I don't want to know about it. Max, I want to tell you why I sent for you. They're talking about matching K.O. Murdoch with Gilbert. Yeah? Well, who did Murdoch have to fight before he got a crack at Gilbert's title? Joe, I mean you. All right. I want you to fix it for me to fight Murdoch. You're crazy. K.O. never fight Farnsworth. Tell him what the registrar discovered, Joe. Yeah, that's right. Is he talking again? Yeah. <laughs> Max, I'm going to let you in on something. I'm the next champ. It's in the book. Nothing can change it. Is that what he said? That's what he said, and he knows. Will he insure any bets? <laughs> Max, I'm telling you what you got to do. Yeah, but Farnsworth, the banking... Look, you go and see Lefty K.O.'s manager. Offer him some money, any amount. Well, like what? Oh, what'll it take? I don't know, 25 grand at least. Okay, I'll send you a check this afternoon. But go down there and sew up that Murdoch fight. Okay. Hey, Joe, is your friend still here? Sure. Oh. Well, I'm pleased to have met you, Mr. Jordan. Uh, could I drop you some ways? Uh, no, no, come to think of it, I ain't going your way, am I? Well, so... <laughs> You didn't have to go yet. I'd like to just sit and talk a while. I'm afraid I can't. I told my father I'd be home. It, it's getting very late. Yeah, I guess it is. Well, I'll have Ab Abbott take care of those papers in the morning, so don't you worry about it. Thank you. Well, the car's waiting outside. Yeah. You know, I could stand here and look at you all night. I mean, well, I never saw you done up like this before. You look wonderful. <laughs> Say, look at me. Did you see anything? Any, any difference? Now, let's see. Healthier, maybe? You look very well. Sort of in the pink? <laughs> yes, almost pink. Yeah, there you are. I've been exercising. Really? Yeah, and I mean exercising. Sparring around, punching the bag, plenty of road work, lots of sleep. You might even call it training. Why on earth should you be training? Oh, that's the point. Look, uh, did you ever box? Oh. Oh, no. oh, no, of course you didn't. Well, I used to. I liked it a lot, too. I thought I'd like to get back in shape again. What for? Well, like I, uh... Well, I thought I might like to do some fighting. Some real fighting, right in the ring. Oh, you're joking. Well, I'm not bad, you know. Bruce, you must stop this exercising. It's going to your head. Yeah, but listen, I... Good night, Bruce. No, no, I'm serious about this. You see, I... I... Oh. oh. Can I see you, Mr. Pendleton? It's very important. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. What's the matter, Bruce? What are you staring at? Huh? Oh, uh... Well, excuse me a minute, will you? I'll be right back. Now, what do you want? I thought I saw the last of you. Oh, I've got some very distressing news, Mr. Pendleton. You can't use Farnsworth's body anymore. What do you mean? Just what I said. You're crazy. Mr. Jordan told me I was going to be champ. But not with Farnsworth's body. Why not? It wasn't meant to be that way. Why not? Don't keep saying why not. Mr. Pendleton, you haven't much more time to stay in Farnsworth. Oh, go on. I'm not even listening. Mr. Jordan said it was okay and this is the way it's going to be. I'm afraid not, Mr. Pendleton. Now, you wait. Come back here. Listen. Uh... Bruce. Huh? Oh, Bruce, yeah. I really must leave. Well, I'm sorry to have kept you waiting. I'll take you to your car. Come on, Betty. Bruce, has something happened? No, no. Bruce, what's troubling you? Oh, nothing. I... I... Look, you just got to believe one thing. We got a great life ahead, you and me. Nobody can take that away from us. Why are you looking at me like that? Well, I... I'm trying to memorize your face. I'm trying to memorize everything about you. So that no matter what happens, I won't forget you. What might happen? Now, don't be scared. Just look at me. You wouldn't forget me either, would you? No, never. Ah, of course you wouldn't. But, but if something did happen, I mean the thing you said you saw in me, 
something in my eyes. Well, if someday somebody came up to you, he might even be a fighter, and acted like he'd seen you someplace before, you'd notice the same thing in him. Even if you thought you did, you'd give him a break, because he might be a good guy. I don't understand you. Oh, well, I'm just crazy. Don't mind me. I... Well, I never want to lose you, that's all. And I'm never going to. Betty, can I kiss you? Oh, yes, Bruce. Hello, Joe. Yeah, I thought you'd be here, Mr. Jordan. Look, it isn't true, is it, about giving up Sparnsworth? You're not going to ask me to do that now, are you? It's not up to me, my boy. Yeah, but why? We got everything going great. You told me I was going to be champ. You will be, but on another road. Yeah, but why not his Farnsworth? I got his body in the pink. Why not his Farnsworth? Because it wasn't meant to be that way. Oh, that's no answer. On the contrary, it's the perfect answer. Yeah, but look, Mr. Jordan. There's Betty. I love her. And she loves me as Farnsworth. You can't ask me to give her up and forget her now. No, if that was meant to be, it will be. Now, don't talk like that. I can't switch now. Listen, Mr. Jordan. Just let me get through this fight and work it out somehow with Betty. Give me a little time. There's only a little time left, Joe. All right. Then I say no. You're not going to play tricks with my life again. I'm going to stay like I am. You can't change the course yeah. of your destiny. Well, we'll see about that. If you think you can get me loose from Farnsworth, you go ahead and try it. I can't stop it, Joe. Farnsworth is going to die. What? You're crazy. He's going to be killed, Joe. Oh, well, what are you talking about? He's going to be killed by Abbott. There's no mistake this time. Oh. Mr. Jordan. Mr. Jordan. Don't fight, Joe. Leave Farnsworth. Oh. This is it, huh? And, and Farnsworth. What's going to happen to him now? Just earthly remains for them to dispose of. Yeah. Yeah, but me, Mr. Jordan. Me. Joe Pendleton. Why, you and I will be moving again, Joe, and searching. Ah, oh, Mr. Jordan. Why couldn't you give me just a little time? Don't you see? I'll lose her now. Betty. Betty. Don't fight, Joe. Leave Farnsworth. Joe. Leave Farnsworth. After a brief intermission, Mr. DeMille presents Perry Grant, Rod Rains, Evelyn Keyes, and James Gleason in Act Three of Here Comes Mr. Jordan. Over at the Martins the other evening, young Nancy had just come home from her Red Cross class. Nancy, Bill just called. He said he'd come for you about nine for that dance at the club. At nine, Mother? Oh, goodness. Well, I'll hurry. But I'm going to take time for my bath before I dress just the same. Of course, dear. I'll draw some warm water. And there's a nice fresh cake of Lux soap in the bathroom. Oh, Mommy, you're wonderful. Mmm, this feels good. Golly, don't know what I'd do without my Lux soap beauty bath. I'm feeling better by the moment. There. Now I'm sure of being perfectly fresh. Gosh, I love the nice perfume Lux toilet soap leaves on my skin. Now to get dressed in a hurry. Hello, Bill. Why, thanks a million. I feel good, too. Gee, Nancy, I love to be near you. Your skin is so sweet. Looks as if Nancy's evening was going to be a great success. Well, she's one of those clever girls who follows the screen star's tip never neglects her daily beauty bath with fragrant white Lux toilet soap. Here's what Claudette Colbert says. It makes a girl so attractive to have skin that's sweet. A daily Lux soap beauty bath makes daintiness sure. Why don't you take Hollywood's tip? Enjoy the luxury of a daily Lux toilet soap beauty bath. A luxury any woman can afford. For this fine soap with active lather costs so little. Buy three cakes of Lux toilet soap tomorrow. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille... Curtain rises on the third act of Here Comes Mr. Jordan. Joe Pendleton's spirit is roaming the world again, this time without a body. For Farnsworth has been killed and his remains hidden. 
It's the night of the Murdoch fight. Joe and Mr. Jordan walk slowly along the street in front of the arena. Quite a crowd in there, Joe. Would you like to see part of the fight? Ah, no. What for? That ought to be me fighting in there, not Murdoch. Just as you like. We can hear it on the radio at the cigar store down there. Read all about it once with disappearance still unsolved. Police question principle. Hey, you hear that, Mr. Jordan? They haven't found Farnsworth yet. Where is he now? In the basement refrigerator. Tony Abbott and Julia got rid of him. Oh, the refrigerator. Hmm, nice guy, that Abbott. Yeah, it's the fight, Joe. Want to listen to it? Huh? Oh, okay, sure. Murdoch throws a right to Gilbert's body and a left to the head and another right to the body. Murdoch is crowding Gilbert into the ropes. Oh, there's a left to the chin, another right, another left, and now they go into a clinch. That Murdoch's a great fighter, Joe, and you know it. In your heart, you'd even like to be like him. Who, me? Now they're out of it. Another right to the head. Gilbert's wings wild and Murdoch... Murdoch staggered. All of a sudden, Murdoch's quit. I don't get it. Gilbert didn't even touch him. That wild punch only grazed the side of Murdoch's head and he's staggering. Oh, well, I don't believe it. Murdoch was going like a buzzsaw. Why should he quit? He was shot, Joe. What shot? By gamblers from the ringside because he wouldn't throw the fight. But they shot him? Murdoch? One of the cleanest guys in the game? Gilbert's swollen all over Murdoch now. Cutting him to ribbons. He's down. Murdoch's down. He finally dropped. Fell in a heap. He's dead, Joe. Dead? He's down. Flat on his face. The referee is trying to get Gilbert to a neutral oh, corner. Boy, I wish I could finish that fight for him. can, Joe. But you mean I could take Murdoch's place? We've just got time to make it. Come on, Joe. He's up at the count of nine. Murdoch is up. Oh, what a fight. One minute lying there like a dead man, and now on his feet like a dynamo. It's amazing. Now he lets go with a terrific right, and a left, and another right. Now Gilbert's down. The referee's counting. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Gilbert's out, and Murdoch is a new champion. Ladies and gentlemen, this fight will go down in history as one of the most sensational encounters of all time. It's... Hey, wait a minute. What's that thing Murdoch's taking off the ring post in his corner? A saxophone. I didn't notice that there before. A saxophone. Uh, come on now, everybody outside. Outside now, the champ's got to rest. Let me see him. I got to see Murdoch. What do you want here, Cockle? Beat it. No, you don't. Let Cockle in here, Lefty. What's Cockle got to do with you? Plenty, and you get out of here, Lefty. You and the rest of them. Now, get out. How do you get that way? I'm your manager. Yeah, and a fine crooked manager you turned out to be. Now, get out of here before I throw you. Now, beat you it. must be nuts. Hello, Max. Listen, there's just one thing I want to know, Murdoch. I was listening to this fight, and the guy said you had a saxophone. Where is it? Mm, right here. That's it. Where'd you get it? That's Joe Pendleton's sax. He always had it in the ring with him. <laughs> Max, don't you know me? <laughs> oh, I, 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 I... Sure, Joe Pendleton. Oh, Joe, Joe... Oh, no, Max, Joe. don't faint, don't faint. I know, I know, I'm all right. What are you doing in Murdoch's body? Oh, I just took Murdoch's body to help him out. He was shot. Look, a hole in his chest. Oh, Joe, what kind of body is this to pick up? I better get a doctor. No, no, it's nothing. Nothing you see with no. a bullet in you? Hey, Joe, what about Farnsworth? Where is he? Oh, he's dead, Max. Tony Abbott shot him. Tell the cops to look in the basement icebox. Oh, boy, they'll hang that Abbott high in a kite. Hello, Joe. Oh, hello, Mr. Jordan. Hey, uh, Joe, is he here again? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Max. <laughs> but would you mind waiting outside a minute? Go sure. call the cops, Max, and then get in touch with Betty Logan. Sure, sure, I want to sure. see her. Well, I'm pleased to have met you again, Mr. Jordan. Ah, uh, Mr. Jordan, I'm glad you came here. How did you like the fight? That was a nice job, Joe. You made Murdoch very happy. He was told how it came out. He was? Oh, that's swell. You fought beautifully, Joe. Cleanly, scientifically. This is your niche, Joe. This is where you belong. Where you were meant to be. World champion. Ah, uh, no. Not me. Murdoch is. I don't mind helping him out, Mr. Jordan, but now get me out of this. Joe. Yeah? Remember I said you wouldn't be cheated? Yeah. Nobody is, really. You were meant to be champion. You are. This is your destiny, Joe. You're going to go on being Murdoch. What? Yeah, but... But wait a minute. You're forgetting about Betty. What good is anything if I haven't got her? That's a chance you have to face, Joe, but don't worry. You'll have everything that was ordained for you. Oh, I don't like it, Mr. Jordan. This I... is your road, Joe. From now on, you're K.O. Murdoch. There'll be no more memory of Joseph Pendleton. And everything's going to be all right. Goodbye, Joe. Wait, listen. Goodbye, uh, Joe. Hey, 
right, Joe? I called the cops. Huh? What do you want in here, Coco? Listen, will you? They found Farnsworth Bunny, just like you said. I don't get it. I don't know any Farnsworth. Ah, oh, now, don't give me no answers like that, Joe. Well, have you got a fever, Joe? Oh, sure, you got a fever from being shot. Who was shot? You was. Look at your chest. You got a hole in... Hey, where is it? Where is what? The bullet hole. <laughs> you showed it to me. You going crazy? Get out of here. I'm going around again. It's that guy, Jordan. What did he do to you, Joe? Why do you keep calling me Joe? Oh, look at me. Take a good look at me. Don't you know me? Yeah, I think so. Well, who am I? Well, don't you know? Well, I got me doubts. You tell me. You're Corkle, Max Corkle. Who are you? K.O. Murdoch. What's the matter with you? Do you... Do you know Joe Pendleton? Yeah, sure. I knew Joe. He's killed in an airplane crash. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's a tough break. Nice fella. Strictly on the level, too. Yeah, he certainly was. Yeah. I understand you are, too. Hey, how'd you like to manage me, Corkle? Manage you? Sure. Oh, yeah. Swell. Well, I gotta be running along. Yeah, sure. Hey, what's the matter with you? Come on, snap out of it. We're gonna do all right, Max. Yeah, sure. Any guys outside? No, they've all went. Good. Uh, so long, Maxie. So long. So long, Joe. Oh. oh. Sorry, miss. Uh, uh, you looking for somebody? Uh, yes, Mr. Corkle. They, they said he might be in Mr. Murdoch's dressing room. Say, don't I know you? I, I don't think so. Uh, no, 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 I guess not. I thought for a minute I did. Funny how sometimes you feel you know people. Yes. Oh, your eyes hurt. Oh, it's nothing, just a little swollen. It's all red. Oh, it doesn't hurt. I'm Murdoch. Oh. Ralph Murdoch, and you're... Uh... Uh, Betty Logan. Hello. How do you do? Yeah, well, glad to know you. Uh, you interested in the fight game? I knew a man who was... Do I know him? Bruce Farnsworth. He... He was killed. Oh? Oh, I'm sorry. Was he a friend of yours? I loved him. Oh. Oh, that's tough. Yes, but I don't know. Maybe it was the kindest thing. He... He was so troubled. I... I don't seem to feel... Wait. What did you do that for? You touched my face. Your bandage was loose. I... I didn't mean to. Well, it felt kind of good. You know, you were looking at me just now, kind of looking right through my eyes. What's that? Oh, don't be scared. They just turned the lights out for a second. Just a warning. Everybody out. Oh. You know, in the darkness, your voice sounded like I'd heard it someplace before. I couldn't remember where. You didn't feel that, did you? Well, yes. I, I felt I was standing high up, looking out over the sea. And someone was swimming toward me, shouting something. Something I... I felt I'd heard long ago. Yeah. I said, don't be scared. Oh, did you? Yeah. People are always thinking they knew someone before, in another existence. You know, I've had a feeling all night I was in a hurry to meet somebody I knew. Hey, uh... There's a little place around the corner. It's a swell little place called Mike's where I go after the fight. You wouldn't want to... No, I... I guess you wouldn't want to tonight. Feeling the way you do about him. I guess not, huh? What was it he said? If I were to meet a fighter, I was to... I'd love to go with you, Mr. Murdoch. Okay. Swell. So long, champ. A Knockout Blow to the Blues by Cary Grant, Claude Rains, Evelyn Keyes, and James Gleason. 
Say a word to the folks in the radio audience, champ. Well, I'm sorry. I'll have to consult my manager. The champ wishes to state that it was a great fight. Oh, he'll have to say more than that. Think of the traditions of the ring. Can I get a word into Mom? Okay. The champ wishes for it to state... Hello, Mom. He'll be right home. Yeah. Well, before you go, I'd like to tell the women in our audience something about Lux Soap. Ah, 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 ah. I don't think you can mention that here. How about it, CB? Mm, I don't know, Evelyn. You see, we well, don't... Well, I'm like... sorry. I, I just can't keep quiet about Lux Soap. Ah, 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 ah. Ah, you're liable to get C.B. in trouble. Well, he should be. He doesn't want every woman to know what a grand complexion care Lux soap is. I used it even before I came to Hollywood. Mm. That complexion is why I brought you to Hollywood, Evelyn. You've got a lot to thank Lux soap for. What's the story in the next week, C.B.? Comedy or drama? Both comedy and drama, Claude. Because our play is the new Paramount motion picture, Skylark. And our stars... Well, uh, some of our brightest stars. The same ones you saw in the picture. Claudette Colbert, Ray Milland, and Brian Ahern. <laughs> Skylark is the story of a girl who almost loses her husband. But when the girl is Claudette Colbert, well, I'll let you guess the answer. Oh, uh, that sounds swell, C.B. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Get ready for the turn back. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Claudette Colbert, Ray Land, and Brian Ahern in Skylark. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Every dime and dollar you can give to your local fight infantil paralysis campaign will be a vote of confidence for President Roosevelt on his 60th birthday. So fight with him to stamp out this disease. You can help, too, in the great war emergency drive of the Red Cross. Give all you can to the organization America always turns to in time of need. Cary Grant is co-starring with Gene Arthur and Ronald Coleman in a new George Stevens production at Columbia. Claude Rains will soon be seen in the 20th Century Fox picture, Moontide. Evelyn Keyes was heard tonight through the courtesy of Columbia Pictures and will soon be seen in Adventures of Martin Eden. James Gleason appeared through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox and is now seen in My Gal Cell. Heard in tonight's play were Howard McNear as The Messenger, Bernard Zanville as Tony, Tori Carlton as Julia, Thomas Mills as Sisk, and Charles Seal, Warren Ash, Edward Marr, and Eugene Forsythe. Tune in next Monday night to hear Claudette Colbert and Ray Milland with Brian Hearn in Skylark. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers, and your announcer has been Melville Ruick. <laughs> this is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Cary Grant and Irene Dunn in Mr. Blanding's Bilge's Dream House. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeling. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. No two stars have given so many performances that honestly rate the word classic as Irene Dunn and Cary Grant. And tonight, we've reunited this famous team in a comedy as timely as today's headlines. It's the RKO picture, Mr. Blanding's Bills His Dream House. You know, almost everyone has had a housing problem at some time or other... And the Blandings had their troubles, even as you and I. In fact, they had so much trouble, their story became a hit motion picture. You know, you have your idea of a dream house, and your neighbor has another. 
But one thing is certain. Any well-run dream house will include a supply of the new bath size Lux toilet soap. Whatever the arguments about architecture, most people agree Lux soap is perfect. Now here's the curtain for Mr. Blanding's Bill's His Dream House, starring Cary Grant in his original screen role as Jim and Irene Dunn as Muriel. Like millions of other New Yorkers, Jim and Muriel Blandings and their two young daughters are cliff dwellers. Home to them is an apartment. Oh, adequate, but somewhat crowded. Not that Jim isn't doing well. He's a college graduate, makes 15000 a year in the advertising business. Anyway, on this crisp September morning, Jim Blandings has just staggered out of bed and commenced a typical 7 o'clock ritual. You looking for something, dear? Hmm? Oh, you're awake. I'm looking for my socks. Why don't you look in your sock drawer? That's where I found my underwear. Why don't you try your underwear drawer? I am in my underwear drawer now. (laughs) Oddly enough, it's full of underwear. Or yours. Mm. Well, socks just don't get up and walk away by themselves, Mm. dear. Muriel, now look. I thought we had it clearly understood that the four bottom drawers were yours and these two top drawers were mine. The closet. Huh? Uh, That's where they are. We put them in the closet. Uh, Put what in the closet? Your socks. Gussie and I decided that from now on, we'll keep them in a basket on the shelf. Oh, for heaven. Basket. Basket in the closet. Well, where is the basket? Right there on the shelf, dear. Under my hat boxes in the overnight bag. Oh. Oh, yeah. Jim, dear, I do wish you'd try to make a little more effort. Well, I'll try, dear. Now, look at that. Muriel, Muriel, maybe if you put the basket on top of the hat boxes instead of underneath the hat oh, now, boxes... Jim, Jim, I... just go out and tell Gussie to give you a nice cup of coffee. I'll try and get the girls out of the bathroom. Oh, thank you, Muriel. I'm sorry. I'll feel better after a cup of coffee. Oh, excuse me, Jim, my face cream. It's in the medicine cabinet. I'll be through shaving in a minute. It's all right. I can reach it. Ouch! Oh, did you cut yourself? I cut myself every morning. I kind of look forward to it. <laughs> Let's see now. There's Betsy's vitamins. Oh, take your time, dear. I can spare the blood. Why don't you... Why don't you get an electric razor? You can't get used to them. That's silly. Bill Cole's been using an electric razor for years. He hasn't got my beard. Bill's beard is just as coarse and I tough. I am not interested in discussing the grain and texture of Bill Cole's hair follicles before I've had my orange juice. All I said was, why don't you use an electric razor? Because I prefer the clean sweep of the tempered steel as it glides smoothly over my... No advertising. Please, please, just hurry. Sorry, dear. You'll be late for breakfast. All right, girls. Who did it? Who tore a piece out of my morning newspaper? Well? I'm sorry, Father. It's part of my research for school. Oh, I see. Another of Miss Stellwagen's so-called progressive projects. Now, huh? Jim, Jim, there just isn't any point in sending your children to an expensive school if you're going to undermine the teacher's authority in your own dining room. I am not undermining anything. I'm in the advertising business, and keeping abreast of the times is important to me. Baker, baker, baker. You drink your milk. Every time your father and I have a lively discussion, dear, it doesn't necessarily mean we're bickering. Miss Stellwagen says that advertising is crass commercialism in its lowest form. Oh, oh, she does, does she? Well, well perhaps your Miss Stellwagen is right. <laughs> perhaps I should quit this crass commercialism, which at this very moment is paying for your fancy tuition, those extra French lessons, that progressive summer camp, to say nothing of the very braces on your back teeth. <laughs> Jim, I wish you wouldn't discuss money in front of the children. Why not? They spend enough of it. Baker, baker, baker. All right, baker. girls, get your things now and run along. Yeah, let's go, Betsy. Goodbye, Daddy. <laughs> Give my regards to Miss Stellwagon. Anyway, you're still the nicest father I've ever had. I'll get it, Gussie. Hiya, kids. Bill, we haven't seen you in ages. Sorry, Billy, we got to run. Hello. Well, good morning. Oh, what are you doing here? Oh, just thought I'd stop by and return these sketches, Muriel. Coffee? Yeah, thanks. 
Now, personally, I think Funkhauser's two or three thousand dollars out of line. Of course, you could save that amount by not tearing out the living room wall. Hmm? Love wall? What are you talking about? Who's Funkhauser? Oh, Funk- Bunny Funkhauser, dear. Who? Well, you know that clever young interior decorator we met at the Collins cocktail party. Uh, you mean that young man with the open-toed sandals? <laughs> What now, about him? What about him? You know how long we've always said we must do something about fixing up this apartment. Well, Bunny has some simply darling ideas. Uh-huh. Uh, what kind of ideas? Well, I didn't want to bother you until I knew whether we could afford it or not, so I... How I... much? What's the point in asking how much, dear, until you know what you're going to get? I've seen Bunny Funkhauser. I know what I'm going to get. <laughs> Well, I think he's got some fairly interesting sketches here. Mm-hmm. Just look at this drawing, Jim. Mm. Uh, here, here's how Bunny sees our living room. Isn't mm. it charming? Yeah. Mm. What's that thing there? A shoe shine stand? No. It's a cobbler's bench, dear. Oh. oh. You see, the whole room's colonial. Break front, hook rug, student's lamp, pie cooler, and over here, uh, a Martha Washington desk. Hmm. Where do I keep my powdered wig? Well, I think it's perfect. It's Mm. us. Bunny says we're very American, very grassroots, very blueberry pie. Oh, well, don't look at me, Jim. Bunny said it. Mm. How much is all this going to cost? Well, $7,000. $7,000? Well, that includes tearing out the wall, but I quite agree with Bill. I I Oh, you do? Well, you're some lawyer, Bill. A defenseless woman without the slightest conception of the value of a dollar asks for advice, and the next minute you've got it tearing our walls. Seven thousand dollars. I wouldn't put seven cents into this broken-down rat trap. How can you talk that way, Jim? This is our home. Why, Joan was practically born in this apartment. That does not make it a national shrine. (laughs) Oh, now, wait a minute. I thought I was doing you a favor. And you were, Bill. He was just showing you how you could save $3,000 by simply not tearing out the wall. Oh, I could save 7000 by not doing anything at all. Well, then, that's that, isn't it? $7,000. Blueberry pie. Huh. Uh, have you seen my hat, Muriel? It's in the hall closet, dear, where it always is. I'll get it for you. Oh, good morning, Mr. Bland. Oh, hello, Mary. Well, I guess the boss will want to see the layouts on Wham Ham. They're here on your desk, Mr. Blanding. Oh, thanks. <clears throat> Let's see. When you've got the whim, say Wham. Oh, my. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For a grand slam in ham, try Wham. Oh, Mary, I didn't really write that, did I? A man's got to make a living, Mr. Blanding. Uh, well, maybe Miss Stellwagen's right. Hmm? Oh, nothing. It's just a private joke between me and whoever's going to be my analyst. <clears throat> Mary, tell me, would you spend $7,000 to tear out somebody else's walls? Would I what? Well, especially when for a few thousand more you could fix up a nice old place someplace. You know, somewhere like uh, Connecticut, maybe. Yeah. And have the kind of dream house you've always wanted. Well, uh, frankly, I never Mary, had... Mary, a... get me the phone numbers of a few of those suburban real estate men. Oh, and call Mrs. Blandings. Tell her to keep this weekend open for a nice drive out to the Connecticut countryside. They, they just drove up, Pop. That couple from New York, Mr. and Mrs. Blandings. Good, good. Uh, what place is you going to show them, Pop? Oh, three or four, son. And then I'll show them the Hackett place. Oh, no. Not the old Hackett place. The old, old Hackett place. Son, you ain't been learning much about the real estate business. But, but Pop, the Hackett place, it, it's falling apart. It, it leans. Hmm. Mighty quaint old place, son. Just the thing for the blending. <laughs> We bought it, Bill. It's ours. Well, <laughs> some steel, huh? A steel is an understatement. Swindle might be a little more appropriate, huh? You've been taken to the cleaners, my friend, and you don't even know your pants are off. Oh, darling, I told you. I said we ought to consult Bill before we buy it. Well, what's so wrong with this deal? $10,000 for 50 acres and only 1500 for the house. That's $200 an acre. $100 an acre is standard top gouge price to city slickers. When the natives sell it to each other, it's around 40 or less. 40? Jim! 
the man's entitled to a fair profit. And not 284%. Now, we're going to write this fellow, Hackett, and tell him he can... We'll do no such thing. You just don't understand business. You mean extortion. Jim, dear, now, maybe Bill's right. I, I, oh, I... Now, now, just a minute. Let me explain something to both of you. For 15 years, I've been cooped up in this four-room cracker box. Just getting shaved here entitles a man to the Purple Heart. <laughs> well, that still doesn't make this Hackett place a good buy. Now, now, look, Bill. Muriel and I have found what I'm not ashamed to call our... our dream house. Why, it's... it's like a fine painting. You buy it with your heart, not with your head... You don't ask how much was the paint, how much was the canvas. You look at it, and you say, Ah, it's beautiful. I want it. And if it costs a few more pennies, you pay it and gladly, because you love it. And you don't measure the things you love in dollars and cents. Well, anyway, that's the way I feel about it. Well, it's your money, I suppose. No. And when I sign those papers on Saturday, I can look the world in the face and say, It's mine. My house. My home. My acres. Our house, darling. Our home. Our acres. Hmm. My, it's a windy day, isn't it? Well, this is it, Bill. Hmm? The dream house on Nightmare Alley. And no remarks. The house just needs someone to love it, that's all. It's a good thing there are two of you, one to love the house and one to hold it up. Jim. Jim, look. There's something blowing off the roof. Hmm? Oh, yeah. Oh, it looks like, like shingles. Well, what did your engineer say when he checked that roof? Our engineer? Who needs engineers? This isn't a train, you know. Say, that house is moving. I just saw it move. <laughs> This house has been standing since the second year of the Continental Congress. You take one look at it and shingles start to drop. Now, look, do me one favor, will you? I've got a client. He's a crackerjack structural engineer, Joe Apollonio. Oh, yeah. Now, he... Well, I'll be right back, Muriel. Just, just want to measure that fireplace again. Oh, uh, not that it's any of my business, Muriel, but uh, how are you and Jim paying for this place? Well, we're cashing in our government bonds, and Mr. Hackett's taking a $6,000 mortgage. Hmm. Well, it could be worse. And as long as you and Jim love it so much... Help! Help! Jim! What's the matter? Where are you? I fell through the floor! Hmm. Bill, I think you'd better get in touch with Mr. Apollonio. Muriel! That's why we've come to you, Mr. Sims. After Mr. Apollonio saw the house, we got our own expert, Mr. Murphy, and then Mr. Gillis, but they all said the same thing. Yeah, tear it down. Well, as an architect, I'm inclined to agree with them. Of course, you can remodel, but uh, for what it would cost you, why, you can have a fine new house. Hmm, a new house, huh? Yes, something like uh, like this, for instance. Now, in this sketch no, here... No, 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 I, I don't think we're at all ready to commit ourselves. Oh, no, no. But if, if, if we were to consider building, I can tell you there's one thing we'd have to have, Mr. Sims. Plenty of closets. Well, yes, if I might uh, make a suggestion... And bathrooms. Each bedroom must have at least one bathroom. You see, Mr. Sims, our problem... I made a drawing of exactly what I mean, Mr. Sims. A little playroom for the basement, you see. Uh, nothing tremendous, just a little something to... And play. I've always wanted a sewing room, Mr. Sims. Mm. A little utility room upstairs where I could be alone and sew or, or sulk on a rainy afternoon. Yes, but I think I'd better point out... And here out... off the kitchen, a little flower sink with a stone floor and shelves for vases and gardening things. And maybe a little closet. Uh, uh, sure, well, sure. Why, well, why not? Now, over here... We my can... dear we can... Mr. Blendings, now in the first place, you've got the upstairs about three times as big as the down. Downstairs. There, you see, Muriel? It's all those bathrooms. Nonsense. It's all those closets. And by extending the breakfast room, you've eliminated the possibility of any stairs going up to the second floor. What? No stairs? Oh. Now, now, is it absolutely necessary for each of your daughters to have her own room with two closets and yes. a private yes, bath? Yes, yes. You see, our daughters are approaching womanhood. Uh, well, I didn't realize they were approaching it quite so fast. <laughs> 
<laughs> now, what about that city flower sink or that sewing room? That I could go. I beg your pardon. What we I... need is a, a major savings. Now, a simple bathroom, Mrs. Blandings, costs about $1,300. Now, if you could do with just no, one less... No, ba- no, I refuse to endanger the health of my children in a house with less than four bathrooms. <laughs> For $1,300, they can live in a house with only three bathrooms and rough it. <laughs> Look, suppose I go ahead with some preliminary plans, and then we can get together in about a week's time. Yes, you do that, Mr. Sims. But just don't forget, we've got to hold it down under $10,000. That, I can tell you right now, is impossible. Oh. Oh, well, I I guess we're not going to quibble about a few pennies one way or another. Mm. Oh, by the way, Mr. Blandings, have you anything in mind as to how you'd like the old place taken down? Yeah. Why don't we just go out there and blow on it? (laughs) Bill. Just in time. Muriel and I are going over the plains. In here, Bill, in the dining room. Hi. Well, so you have torn down the old house, huh? Uh, the most practical thing we ever did. Uh-huh. Uh, how much did that cost? Uh, well, $1,400. Now, never mind, Bill. I bet we've got the nicest vacant lot in the state of Connecticut. <laughs> well, Muriel, he's done it again. Uh, who's done? Well, what's eating you? What did I do? Now, once, just once, why don't you come to me and find out if it's all right? If it's legal before you run yourself smack into another jam. Oh, Jim, what's happened? What's Bill talking about? I don't know. He won't tell me. All you did was tear down a house in which another man happens to own a mortgage without first getting his written permission. Well, what's that got to do? No. Yeah. Oh. And in such cases, the mortgagee can demand full payment of said mortgage. Oh, Jim. And Mr. Hackett so demands 6,000 clams. Oh, my. $6,000. <laughs> well, I, I guess I can turn in my insurance policies oh, or no, something. Oh, no, Jim. No, you can't do that. Well, why not? Well, if anything should happen, the children would be left unprotected. I'm not dead yet. <laughs> no, of course you are not. Well, I'll see the boys at the bank. Uh, you can put up your insurance as collateral. If necessary, I'll sign a personal note. Uh-huh. Oh, uh, thanks, Bill. Sure. Well, I've got to run along. Good night, Muriel. Good night, Bill. Uh, I'll let you know what the bank says, Squire. <laughs> what a wonderful friend. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, th- what's with all this kissing all of a sudden? He comes in, you kiss him. He goes out, you kiss him. Well, what's wrong with that? Well, just because a man is helpful in a business way, he doesn't give him extracurricular privileges with my wife. <laughs> That's a fine thing to say about a friend of 15 years. Well, if he were 15, I wouldn't mind. (laughs) He's 41. Every time he shakes my hand, he kisses you. Would you prefer it the other way round? Uh, Well, why is he always hanging around? Why doesn't he go out and get married or something? Because he can't find another girl as pretty and sweet and wholesome as I am. Mm -hmm. Oh, darling, let's not be silly about this. It isn't Bill that's upsetting you. It's the house. (laughs) Yeah, I suppose so. Now, Muriel, do you think it's worth all this? Of course it is. It isn't a house we're building, Jim. It's a home for ourselves and our children and maybe our children's children. Yeah. Each with two closets and a private bath. In a moment, we'll bring you Act Two of Mr. Blanding's Bills' his Dream House. Here's our Hollywood reporter, Libby Collins. Libby, I see Darrell F. Zanuck has made another outstanding picture for 20th Century Fox. You mean Pinky, of course, Mr. Keeley. Uh-huh. I don't know when I've seen anything that touched me so deeply. It's an honest portrayal of an American problem. The story of a light-skinned Negro girl who gives up personal happiness in order to aid her own people. Certainly a compelling drama. Jean Crane, as Pinky, has a difficult assignment, and she handles it with great skill. You know, the whole cast seems so exactly right. Ethel Barrymore is superb as the southern lady of the manor. And William Lundigan plays the northern doctor with the authority the part demands. I'm glad to see Jean Crane step into a really mature role and do it proud. A remarkable young star, isn't she? And what fresh, delicate beauty she has. You might call her uh, the Lux Lovely type, lady. (laughs) Oh, now, John... But you're right, because Jean is certainly devoted to her Lux Soap Beauty Care. And my, she's pleased with that big new bath cake. It's so luxurious, she says. That's just the word for it, Libby. A generous, satin-smooth cake with a flower-like fragrance. 
No wonder screen stars tell us that now their Luxo Beauty Bath is more delightful than ever. That big, longer-lasting bath cake makes a fine item to put on a family shopping list. And you can be sure the man of the house will like it, too. I just know he will. Men go for a, a bath soap they don't have to coax into a lather. Even in hard water, you get lots of rich, creamy lather with Lux Toilet Soap. It's perfect for shower or tub. So, why not let the whole family enjoy this luxury bath cake? The new bath size Lux Toilet Soap. Now, our producer, Mr. William Keeley. Act two of Mr. Blanding's Bills' His Dream House, starring Irene Dunn as Muriel and Cary Grant as Jim. <laughs> It's a few days later, and in the office of Mr. Sims, the architect, Jim and Muriel Blandings hear the latest report on their dream house. To wit, an estimate. Eighteen thousand dollars? That's ridiculous, Mr. Sims. Well, frankly, with all those extras you've insisted well, We've upon, only I... asked for the barest necessities. Uh, never mind, dear. It no longer matters. Now, if you'll just send us a bill for your services... But Mr. Today, Blandings, please. now, in the first place... Well, I... in the first place, I'm going out to have my head examined. And then I'm going to find the owner of our apartment house and sign a 20-year lease. Goodbye. Well, if you feel that strongly about I'm afraid we do, Mr. Sims. I'm sorry if we've... Jim. Jim, look. Hmm? Oh, oh, oh there. Yeah. Yes, I, I took the liberty of making a sort of a finished sketch of the house in watercolor. It even has our name on it. Residence of Mr. and Mrs. James Blandings. Shrunk Mills, Connecticut. Ah, it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Residence of Mr. and Mrs. Jane. <clears throat> Mr. Sims, do you really think you could keep it to 18000 Well, now, well, 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 well. Let's pull up some chairs, shall we? Well, how's it look, Bill? That's some excavation, huh? Mm-hmm. Oh, what's going on over there? Oh, that's Mr. Tizander. He's digging our well. Been here since Monday at $4.50 a foot. Yeah, I think I'd better have a little talk with Mr. Tizander. <clears throat> Good morning. Yep. How's it coming? Oh, it's, uh, it's coming. How far down are you? Oh, about 150 feet. Well, isn't that pretty deep? Yeah. Well, haven't you hit anything at all yet? Hit some limestone yesterday. Uh, that's good? That's bad. Oh, and right now, looks like we're coming in some shale. That's bad? That's good. Of course, it might turn out to be sandstone. That's bad? Can't tell. Might be good. Might uh, be bad. Oh, I see. Thank you, thank you. Just for the record, Mr. Tizander, what's happened to the water? Oh, it's there, all right. Just got to be patient. And the art department promises the layout's no later than Monday, Mr. Blanding. Okay, Mary, please type up that copy. Right. No, I'm sorry, Bill, but I've got to work once in a while, you know. Yeah, well, uh, oddly enough, that's why I'm here. You see, I happen to be closeted with your boss about a little legal work, and he just happened to mention that you haven't come up with one good slogan for Wham Ham. Well, what's he worrying about? The deadline's months away. Besides, you don't... Oh, just a minute. Hello? Yeah? Okay, put her on. Muriel, Bill, she's uh, up in Connecticut. <clears throat> yes, Muriel? What? What? To Xander struck water. Mm -hmm. Say, that's wonderful, dear. Hey, Bill, we got our well. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. uh, what's that, Muriel? What? Well, what do you mean we got two wells? Oh. Oh. Well, I'll be right out. Say, how could we have two wells? I can't wait to find out. Let's go. <laughs> And so it all happened when Mr. Zucker was excavating, huh? That's what Mr. Wretch says. That's right, folks. Why, Zucker almost drowned. So we've hit a spring. A spring of clear, cold, bubbling mountain water right here in our cellar. And I can't pour a bag of cement until the water's diverted. Hmm. Well, hello, Mr. Tizander. Oh, uh, howdy. Uh, you see, Mr. Tizander, water. Yep. At six feet. Yep. And just over there, you had to go down 227 feet to hit the same water. Yep. Now, how do you account for that, Mr. Tizander? Well, it appears to me, Mr. Blandings, 
Over here, the water's down only six feet. But over there, it's down oh, around 227 feet. <laughs> yep. You've got nothing to worry about, Mr. Blandings. Once we get the pumps here, your house will go up in no time. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Hey, what's happened to that steam shovel? Huh? Oh, well, is, is something wrong, Mr. Zucker? Oh, no, no. I just broke my bucket, that's all. Oh, oh you hit a boulder, huh? That's no boulder, that's a ledge. know something, Mother? I'll never forget this moment. My family about to cross the threshold of our first real home. I'm sure glad we got kicked out of that apartment. Hey, I don't hear any work, Mother. Oh, it's Saturday afternoon. Only the painters are working. Well, aren't we going in? <sighs> no, don't be in such a hurry. <clears throat> you know, dear, uh, Betsy's right. It is a big moment. <clears throat> and I'm going to carry you across the threshold. Oh, Jim, how sweet. Watch that sacroiliac, Pop. It's been 15 years since you've tried anything like that. Oh, that's all you know about it. <laughs> no, 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 not in here. Jim, huh? you better put me down. Can't darling. you read us something? The sign says wet paint. I haven't touched anything. Your feet are touching something, ain't they? The floor. Oh. I just got through varnishing the floor. Well, put some planks down or something. How do you expect us to live here okay, if you don't... Okay, Mac, okay, take it easy. The Republicans ain't in yet, you know. <laughs> Wait till I see Sims about this. Hey, Daddy, come and see what we just found. The windows. We don't have any windows. Well, we'll see Sims about that, too. What time did he say he'd be here, Well, I think maybe he's here now, darling. He and Mr. Wretch, I think they're out in the back. Just a minute, I want to see Mr. Blandings. He's got a few bills Uh, here. I'd like... What about our windows, Mr. Wretch? Well, I think I can answer that, Mr. Blandings. There's been a little slip-up. Oh, the windows were delivered, all right. Only they weren't the right windows. Those windows belong to a Mr. Landings in Fishkill. I just phoned him. You mean he's got our windows? Well, no, Mrs. Blandings. It seems Mr. Landings has some windows that belong to a Mr. Blandsworth in Peekskill. Uh... But where are our windows? Well, as near as we can find out, they've either been sent to a Mr. Banning in Stamford or to a Mr. Ginsburg in Waterbury. Uh, well, uh, how did Ginsburg get into this? <laughs> well, uh, uh, what are we supposed to do, gentlemen? Spend the rest of our lives in a house without windows? Just a matter of a few days, Mrs. Blandings. Now, about that rub-dub water soft NR. The what? Rub-dub water soft NR. Well, now, how would I know about that? Oh, because you've got one, Mrs. Blandings. Furnished and installed for $285. Well, I didn't order it. I'm afraid I did, Mrs. Blandings. You see, to save your water pipes. The plumber assured me that the water in your well is the most corrosive in his entire experience in the trade. Another first. (laughs) Well, uh, send me the bill. You've got it. I left it on the kitchen sink. Well, all right, then. Oh, uh, Padelford's coming this afternoon. Who authorized a Pedelford? Now, first I get a rub-dub and now a Pedelford. He's the painting contractor. (laughs) Mr. Pedelford, I wanted to see him. Oh, 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 well, okay. Well, just get him over here. Uh, Pedelford. Now, first of all, the living room here. I want it to be a soft green, Mr. Pedelford. Uh Uh-huh. Not a blue-green like a a robin's egg. No. And yet not as yellow as daffodil buds. Uh Uh-huh. Now, the only sample I could get is a little too yellow. But don't let whoever does it go to the other extreme get it too blue. No. It should be just a sort of a a, a grayish yellow green. Uh Uh-huh. Now, the dining room, I'd like... Yellow. Not just yellow, but very gay yellow. Uh, something bright and sunshiny. Uh-huh. I tell you what you do, Mr. Pedelford. You just ask that man who's varnishing the floors in there to go down to the grocer and get a pound of their very best butter. And you just mash that butter exactly and you can't go wrong. Now, here, uh-huh. the, here's the wallpaper we're going to use in the hall. It's flowered. But I don't want the ceiling to match any of the colors of the flower. No. No. There, um, there's some, uh, little dots in the background. See? It's, now it's those little dots I want you to match. No, I don't want those, uh, those greenish dots near the hollyhock leaves. No. No, I want those, those little bluish dots there between the rosebud and the delphidium blossom. Clear? Uh-huh. Now, 
the kitchen, the kitchen's to be white. But not a cold antiseptic, hospital white, you know. No. I want something, something warmer, Mr. Padelford. Uh, but still not to suggest any other color but white. Now, for the powder room, I brought you a piece of thread. And uh, I uh, want you to match it exactly and, and don't lose it. I had an awful time finding it. Now, uh, as you see, the, the color of the thread is, is, uh, is like a, an apple red. It's somewhere between a healthy wine sap and an unripened Jonathan. <laughs> dear, dear. You will have to excuse me now. I, I've got to meet a friend of ours at the station. Hey, Charlie. It's okay, boss. I've been listening. Did you get everything? Sure. Red, green, blue, yellow, and white. Check. <laughs> Where's Mother, Daddy? I can't find her. Huh? Oh, she drove Bill Cole down to the station. She'll be back soon. Oh. Well, go on, pack another barrel. Help Gussie or something. I just finished a barrel. And look what I found, Daddy. Uncle Bill's fraternity pin and Mother's diary while she hmm? was in college. It's slightly torn. Oh, now that's none of your business. Now just put that diary down and unpack something else. I'd say Mother and Uncle Bill were somewhat of an item. Uh, people do not read other people's diaries. It's not a very nice thing to do. Oh. Dear diary. <laughs> Tonight, Bill and I drove out to Stover's Point. As we sat there in the moonlight, he started... Holy smoke! Well, the girls are asleep, Jim. Hmm. <laughs> There's no need to be so irritable, dear. Well, sometimes a man just doesn't feel like talking. Oh, something wrong with the office? No. Got the new slogan for Wham? It's not due yet. Well, you're certainly upset about something. But it... It's just that I don't happen to approve of falsehood and deception. What are you talking about? Oh, nothing. <clears throat> but I distinctly remember your telling me that you returned Bill Cole's fraternity pin 15 years ago. That I... What? Well, did you or didn't you? But did I or didn't I what? Give it back to him. Well, of course I did. If I said I did, I did. Ah, well. Then perhaps you'll have the goodness to explain how this happened to fall out of your jewel box. <laughs> fraternity pin... Bill. Now, what's so funny? Oh, you. You're jealous. Now, if you were so crazy about the guy, why didn't you marry him? Because I wasn't in love with him. Well, that's not what you said in your diary. My what? <clears throat> well, it, 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 it just happened to fall open, and I, I happened to look at it. It just happened. Yeah, I, I'll just bet. Well, it's all over the book. You were in love with Bill Cole. Oh, don't be absurd. Of course I was in love with Bill. In those days, I was in love with a new man every week. Then why did you marry me? I'm beginning to wonder. <laughs> it is those big cow eyes of yours. <laughs> that ridiculous hole in your chin. Maybe I knew you were going to bring me out to this $38,000 icebox with no windows. Or maybe I just happened to fall in love with you, but for heaven's sake, don't ask me why. Muriel. What is it? Uh, well, wh what are you doing down there on the floor? I'm trying to sleep. The moving men forgot our bed. Oh. Uh, what time is it? <laughs> Uh, half past twelve. Thank you. I guess I fell asleep downstairs. Muriel, would it do any good to say I'm sorry? I don't know. Well, I am. I behave like a schoolboy, and I'm sorry. Jim. Oh, Jim. If you hadn't kissed me tonight, I, I guess I just would have died. <laughs> uh, why do I love you so much? <laughs> It's awfully late. Uh, uh. <laughs> Maybe you ought to go downstairs and lock the doors. Now, oh, what for? The windows are all open anyway. <laughs> Got to get up at five o'clock, you know. Uh, five o'clock? But why? I forgot to tell you, dear. The railroad just put in a new schedule. Oh. Well, that, that means I'll be at the office before eight. Yes, but it, 
If you get there earlier, maybe you can leave earlier. Yeah, to get home earlier, to go to bed earlier, to get up earlier. So. Jim. Hmm. Yes, dear? Good night, dear. Uh, good night, dear. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. In a few moments, we'll return with the third act of Mr. Blanding's Bill's His Dream House. We always like to tell a success story, and tonight's heroine is Miss Marilyn Mercer, formerly a messenger girl at RKO, and now a full-fledged starlet at the same studio. How did it all happen, Marilyn? Well, I was answering telephones in the commissary when my big chance came for a screen test, Mr. Keeley, and that was just the beginning. Whenever I watch a picture being filmed, I realize how much I have to learn. You had a chance to see some fine acting in RKO's new production, I Married a Communist. <laughs> yes, indeed. There's a tense drama for you, particularly Robert Ryan in the role of a former communist who discovers that he can't escape from the party. He makes you feel the terror of their relentless pursuit as only a fine actor can. Yes, and Lorraine Day brings warmth and understanding to the part of the bewildered wife in I Married a Communist, a most appealing actress. Isn't she, though? She's a favorite with everyone and so lovely to look at. As uh, you might expect, Mr. Kennedy, she's a Lux girl and a very enthusiastic one. Mm, another famous star who finds that Lux soap care really works, eh? Well, now that Lux toilet soap comes in the convenient bath size, she thinks it's more wonderful than ever. And so do I, Mr. Kennedy. The lather's so rich and creamy, and I love the nice perfume it leaves on my skin. That Lux soap perfume is an exclusive blend of many costly ingredients. It's like a bouquet of flowers, you know. A light, delicate fragrance that appeals to fastidious women. For a quick beauty pickup, I count on my Lux soap bath. It's so refreshing. Thank you, Miss Marilyn Mercer. And now, a suggestion for our listeners everywhere. Try this fine new product of Lever Brothers Company. The new bath size Lux Toilet Soap. Remember, it's the fragrant white cake nine out of ten screen stars recommend for top-to-toe loveliness. Here's our producer, Mr. Keeley. The curtain rises on the third act of Mr. Blanding's Bill's His Dream House, starring Cary Grant as Jim and Irene Dunn as Muriel. Well, Mr. Blanding's has built his dream house. And as the Bills and the extras stare him in the face, so does the deadline for a new slogan for Wham Ham. It's now nine o'clock on a very wet night. Jim's at the office, up to his elbows, in slogans. Is there anything I can type up for you, Mr. Blanding? Mm, I can't think of a thing, Mary, except probably my resignation. <laughs> well, it sure is raining, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> That's funny, Mary, how you look forward to little things. Rain, for instance. For a month now, I've been looking forward to the first rainy night in my new house. Oh. Big blazing fire. Muriel pouring coffee. <laughs> Me in my new smoking jacket with my pipe and slippers reading a good book. Ah, well. Poor Mrs. Blandings. Must get pretty lonesome out there. At night, I mean. And a rainstorm. Mm. She's probably worried to death about me. Oh, well. Give me some more paper, Mary. Wham. <laughs> and then out you went and bobbed your hair. <laughs> Let's see now. That must have been about a month before you married him. <laughs> and was Jim mad. Oh, once more coffee, Bill. Uh, thanks. Well, I picked a fine night to come calling, <laughs> didn't I? Rainstorm, Jim in New York. Yes, he's probably worried to death about me. I wonder if my coat's dry by now. 
I'd look a little silly going back in Jim's new smoking jacket. Oh, I think you look very cute. Mm. Oh, thank heavens. Must be the children. Oh, well, sit still. I'll get it. Coming, coming. Well, it's about time you kid. Oh, you're not the kid. Yeah, I'm Harry Selby from down the road. Boy, what a storm. Just come by to tell you that the kids are safe, Mr. Blandings. Oh, uh, I'm not Mr. Blandings. Uh-huh. Uh, I'm Mrs. Blandings, Mr. Selby. Oh, oh well, how do you do? Uh, and Mrs. Williams just called my wife to say your telephone's out of order. Oh, no. And they just roped off the bridge at Shrunk Mills. But my children... Oh, don't you worry about them, Mrs. Blandings. They're spending the night with the Williams. Oh, oh well, that's a relief. I... I was just beginning to get quite worried about it. Well, them. I better get back before I have to swim for them. Good night, Mrs. Blandings. Oh, thank you, Mr. Selby. Oh, not at all. Good night, Mr. Blandings. A uh, uh, Cole, uh, Bill Cole, friend of the family, uh, just came in out of the rain. Uh, uh, oh. Oh, well, good night. No. <laughs> uh, no bridge. How do I get back to civilization? Well, you'll just have to stay here until it stops raining or they fix the bridge or something. Yeah, yeah, I guess I'll have to. Well, get out the cards, Muriel. We can always play gin. <laughs> this one, Mary. <clears throat> compare the price, compare the slice, take our advice by wham. <laughs> oh, now, really, Mr. Blanding? Yeah, I know, I know. It's no good. All right. Now, here's another. If you'd buy better ham, you'd better buy wham. But it's just like boiled petroleum. If you'd buy better oil, you'd better buy boil. Oh. Well, it's no use. I can't think anymore. All I've got on my mind is a house with an $18,000 mortgage and bills and extras and antiques and... Uh... Oh, I don't know. I just don't know. You going somewhere? Uh, yes, I, I'm going home. I'm going home to get some sleep. But the slogan, you haven't even got... I suppose the... I haven't. This isn't the only job in town. Well, what'll you tell Mr. Dascom? Oh, I'll tell Mr. Dascom to, to... Well, I don't know. I'll just tell him. <laughs> Mr. Sims, well, good morning. Come in. I know it's a little early to be calling, Mrs. Blandings. I just thought I might catch your husband before he left for the office. Oh, I'm sorry, but Jim isn't here. Well, come on in anyway. We're going to have breakfast in a little while. Oh, I've already had my... Oh, well, there's Mr. Blandings now getting out of that taxi. Oh, he must be exhausted. He worked all night in the office. You don't say. Jim. Uh, good morning, dear. How'd it go, darling? Oh, fine, fine, fine. Oh, hello, Sim. Mr. Blandings. Everything all right? Yeah, everything's fine. Well, Sims, what are you doing out here with a morning dew? Well, some extra bills have come in from Wretch, and I don't quite understand them. Really? What are they? Oh, a few of the things are all right, I guess. Now, here's an item. Hmm. Mortising five bucks at $1.98. Oh, well, let's not quibble about it. A man's entitled to mortise a few butts now and then, I think. <laughs> oh, and uh, this one here, extra hardware, $9.18. Mm, uh, petty larceny, but let him get mm. away with it. Now, here's one that, frankly, I don't understand at all. Changes in the closet, $1,247. Well, we probably talk... Twelve hundred and what? Forty-seven dollars. Oh, that's the end. What closet? What changes? Well, that's just it. It isn't a closet at all. It's it's, it's Mrs. Blanding's little flower sink. Uh, you didn't authorize any changes, did you, Mrs. Blanding? Well, they certainly weren't changes. Muriel, what have you done? I haven't done anything. All I did was, oh, my goodness, nothing at all. What have you done? <laughs> well, all I did was... One day I saw four pieces of flagstone left over from the porch that were just going to be thrown away. Nobody wanted them. And I asked Mr. Wretch if he wouldn't just put them down on the floor of the flower room and poke a little cement in between the cracks and give me a nice stone floor where it might get wet from flowers and things. And that's absolutely all I did. Mm -hmm. That's all you did. Absolutely. Just four little pieces of flagstone. Did you by any chance authorize a drain? Of course I didn't. All I said was I wanted a nice, dry stone floor, and Mr. What, Mr. Wretch was just as nice as he could be. What did Mr. Wretch say? Well, all he said was, well, you're the doctor, Mrs. Blandings. And that was all anybody said to anybody about anything. Oh, well, I, I think I can tell you just about what happened. You see, those planks run under the entire width of the pantry, so that Wretch had to knock out the bottom of the pantry wall to get at them. Then he had to chop off the top of the joists under the flower sink to make room for the cradle. But all I said was... And then with the added load on the weakened joists, I'll bet he had to put a lally column down there for support. Oh, I'll bet. Lally but it, it was just four little pieces of flagstone, and I only Quiet. asked him... Now, the soil pipe runs under there on wall brackets so that Wretch had to get the plumber back. Oh, 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 good morning, Mr. Cole. Good morning. Good morning, Muriel, dear. Good morning, Jim. Yeah, well, hello, Of course, Bill. there are 
hot but, and cold water. When did you get here? Right under well, as a matter of fact, last night I, I stayed over. Oh, you stayed over. He stayed over. The bridge was roped off. He had to stay. I slept like a rock, too. Now, just a minute. Morning, just... everybody. Wow, what a night. I've never seen so much rain in all my natural life. You mean you weren't here last night, Gussie? No, dear. Gussie spent the night in Lansdale. I passed the girls over by the Williams house, Miss Bland, and they ought to be home any minute Thank now. Thank you, Gussie. Now, you better start breakfast. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Right away. All right. Now, uh, where were we? Why, uh, with the electrician uh, ripping out 60 feet of armored cable. Right, Mr. Sims? What? Oh, yes, yes. Muriel. You mean the children weren't here last night either? How could they be, dear? The bridge was closed. I just came across it. It was closed last night. It's open now. Well, uh, if you'll all excuse me, I think I'll glance through the morning paper. Well, I guess that's about the size of it, Mr. Blandings, except that Wretch also had to repair the pantry wall, and he couldn't possibly have broken through the wall oh, without... Oh, all pr- right, Sims, all right. We'll take care of it. I'll admit it's a little steep. I'll uh, try to get Wretch to knock off $100. If I can't get that, I'll get 75 Well, 50, maybe. Anyway, I'm almost sure we can get 25. Well, good day. Good day. Darling, you're upset. Got a lot of things on your mind. Hmm. Muriel, there's only one thing I've got on my mind. This house, and how soon we can get rid of it. No, that's not what you're thinking. Maybe not. Maybe I was thinking I was once a happy man. I didn't have a closet. I didn't even have three bathrooms. But I did have my sanity, a few thousand dollars in the bank, two children who loved me, and a wife I could trust. Oh, that's a fine thing to say. I also had a job at the Dascom Advertising Agency, something I don't happen to have at the moment. Jim! That's right. I'm going to resign. We're starting all over again, from scratch, and without this house. You love this house. I hate this house. From its mortis butts to its rubbed up water softening off. <laughs> You know you don't mean that. Every word of it. Anybody who builds a house today is crazy. The minute you start, they put you on the list. The all-American sucker list. You start out to build a home and you wind up the poorhouse. And if it can happen to me, what about the fellows who aren't making 15000 a year? What about the kids who just got married and want... Now somebody's looking in the window. <laughs> it's Mr. Tazander. All right, Mr. Tazander. What do you want? Well, at least we can open the door. <clears throat> Hello, Mr. Tazander. Morning. Well... Mr. Blandings, there's a matter of $12.36. No. $12.36. Yep. Well, why be a piker, Mr. DeSander? <laughs> Here, take everything I've got. I'll empty my pockets for you. Take it all. Spread it out amongst your pals. Maybe Wretch would like a little something. Maybe Zucker could use my new smoking jacket. It's open house, Mr. DeSander. Help yourself. Now, now, Mr. Blandings, hold on. It's twelve dollars and thirty-six cents. Uh, you don't owe me. I owe you. Uh, uh, what was that? Yep. Uh, seems that I overcharged you almost three feet. Uh, it is, Miss Blandings. I think it's all there. Thank you very much, Mister Tazander. Uh, well, I uh, guess I'd best be going. My, my, you sure got a pretty place here. And uh, take good care of it. Oh, and uh, I'll tell Mister Zucker about that smoking jacket. Darling, what did you mean? We really going to have to sell the house? Oh, I don't know, Muriel. I just don't know anything anymore. In case anyone's interested, I'm leaving for town. Oh, uh, oh, Jim, if you want to count the silverware, I'll wait. Be patient with me, Bill. Maybe one of these days I'll grow up. Hey, what's happened to him? Twelve dollars and thirty-six cents. Now, do you mind if I say something? You know, ever since this thing started, I've been firmly convinced that you were getting fleeced, bilked, rooked, flim-flammed, and generally taken to the cleaners. I know, I know. Maybe it has cost you a lot more than you thought it would. But when I look around at what you two have got here, well, I don't know. Maybe there are some things you should buy with your heart and not with your head. Maybe, maybe those are the things that really count. Well, see you around. Bye, dear. Bye, Bill. You should have seen the flood last night. The bridge was roped off, Uncle Bill. We had to stay with the neighbors. Yeah, I heard all about it. I'll bet you had a wonderful time. Well, good morning, children. Good morning, morning, morning. Daddy. Good. Why aren't you at the office? Well, uh, I'm on kind of a vacation, Joan. Uh... You mean you got fired? Well, not exactly. I. Yeah, come on, we'll discuss this later. Right now, we're going to have breakfast. Am I starving? What are we having, Gussie? Orange juice, scrambled eggs, and you know what? Ham, Gussie? 
Not ham, wham. If you ain't eating wham, you ain't eating ham. Now, you kids go and wash your hands. Muriel, did, did you hear what she said? What are you talking about? Gussie, if you ain't eating ram, you ain't eating ham. My slogan. I've got my slogan. Jim, where are you going? I'm going to telephone Daskam and tell Gussie she just got a $10 raise. And so Jim Blandings got his slogan, and he kept his job, and he kept his dream house. If this story has a moral, I'm afraid it's escaped me. Unless it's to always be sure to hire a maid like Gussie. Oh, there's much more of a moral than that, Bill. Yes, Mrs. Blandings? I think it's to own your own home, no matter what. Oh, and ladies... You'll, you'll find a flower thing very handy. Now, all you have to do uh, is... Muriel. Yes, dear? Don't you dare. <laughs> the curtain has fallen, but our stars are coming back, and here they are. Irene Dunn and Cary Grant. Thank you, Bill. It's nice to be here. And, of course, we're delighted to have a famous team like Cary Grant and Irene Dunn reunited. Mm. Irene, he means we're like corned beef and cabbage. <laughs> or uh, ham and eggs. No. no, I think it's more like Laurel and Hardy. <laughs> <laughs> well, in that case, one of us will have to put on some more weight. Yes. <laughs> you two played Mr. and Mrs. Blandings with such conviction that I suspect you've had a similar experience. Am I right, Irene? Well, uh, we did put in a new uh, movie projector at my house and had to knock out a wall, but it was worth all the trouble. Well, how's that? Well, now my daughter's convinced I'm important in pictures. I'm the only one who can run the projector. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you do it just as beautifully as you run your home, Irene. Well, of course, to run a home properly... You've got to have the new bath-sized Lux soap on hand, and I always have that. Say, uh, Bill, what's that big contest I've been hearing about? Something about 15-year-old Lux girls. Hmm? It's a contest to pick the most beautiful Lux girl born in 1934, Carrie. Hmm. The year the Lux Radio Theater was born. Oh, and me. And next Monday, October 17th, the 15th anniversary of the Lux Radio Theater, the papers will have full details. That's when the six winners from each of the 163 local contests will be announced. With pictures, I hope. Yes, papers all over the country will carry the photographs of the six lucky girls in their CBS station area. Well, who picks the prettiest Lux girl? Everybody will have a chance to vote for their favorite among the six local winners. Then the girl getting the most votes represents her station in the big national contest. I'd like to vote, Bill, so I'll watch the papers next Monday. You know, there's only one rule to remember. Send in your vote on a Lux toilet soap wrapper. Well, I just might possibly be able to find one. Oh, <laughs> no, not just one, Irene. Vote as many times as you like. Hey, what will you have for the big anniversary show next Monday, Bill? A romantic hit direct from the current screen. The 20th Century Fox picture, Mother is a Freshman. And we'll have the original stars of the film here to celebrate our anniversary. They're Loretta Young and Van Johnson. This is delightful entertainment for the whole family. The kind of play you've liked so much during the 15 years of the Lux Radio Theater. So I know everyone will want to join our audience next Monday night. It's a grand picture, Bill, and Loretta is the loveliest freshman I ever saw. Good night. Good night. Good night, and thank you. <laughs> Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, Join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Loretta Young and Van Johnson in Mother is a Freshman. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. Cary Grant is currently starred in the 20th Century Fox picture, I Was a Male War Bride. Heard in tonight's cast were Donald Randolph as Bill, Stephen Dunn as Sims, Ann Carter as Betsy, Ann Whitfield as Joan, and Herbert Butterfield, Charlotte Lawrence, Tim Graham, Lillian Randolph, Jack Petruzzi, Cliff Clark, 
Howard McNear, Earl Lee, and Eddie Marr. Our play was adapted by S.H. Barnett, and our music was directed by Louis Silvers. Our Lux Radio Theater production of Mr. Blanding's Builds His Dream House has come to you with the good wishes of the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, Hollywood's own beauty soap. Have you tried the big new bath size Lux Toilet Soap? It's the same fine white soap you've always used, but in a generous larger size, specially created to make a delightful, refreshing beauty bath. This is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear Mother is a Freshman, starring Loretta Young and Van Johnson. Spry is a new spry, a better than ever spry. You'll be a better cook when you use spry. Spry in your baking pan, spry in your frying pan. You'll be a better cook when you use spry. Like crispy golden brown fried foods, fried with new spry, they're better than ever, supremely tender and delicate. Why? New spry is blander, plays up fresh natural food flavors. And foods fried the spry way are as digestible as if baked or boiled. For all you bacon fry, try new, better than ever Spry. Another fine product of Lever Brothers Company. You'll be a better cook when you use Spry. Be sure to listen next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Mother is a Freshman, starring Loretta Young and Van Johnson. Stay tuned for My Friend Irma, which follows over these same stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Cary Grant, Gene Arthur, and Ronald Coleman in The Talk of the Town. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Good things come in small packages, but better things often come in big ones. And three stars like Cary Grant, Gene Arthur, and Ronald Coleman make a colossal bundle of entertainment. And that's what we've got tonight in a play called The Talk of the Town. It was over at Columbia Pictures that they had the idea of co-starring these fine players and the right story to do it with. And with the same formula, we can't go wrong in the Lux Radio Theater. The story is unique, as you might expect, with an interplay of comedy, drama, and romance that doesn't leave room for a dull moment. Cary Grant, unjustly accused of crime, Gene Arthur, his only defender, and Ronald Coleman, knowing justice in books, but not in people, make a triangle that should be the talk of any town. Suppose a Broadway producer were to put the names of Ronald Coleman, Gene Arthur, and Cary Grant in front of his theater as Lux Flakes makes it possible for us to do all over the nation tonight. I'll make a quick guess that he'd discover his theater was sold out months in advance at 660 or so a ticket. The line at our box office runs from Greenland's icy mountains to Hollywood and Vine, but the tickets don't cost a cent, and every seat is the best seat in the house. The only box office return is your loyal support of our product, Lux Flakes, and once you've tried it, you will make it a habit for its own sake. Now it's curtain time for the talk of the town and the first act, starring Jean Arthur as Nora Shelley, Cary Grant as Leopold Dilg, and Ronald Coleman as Michael Lightcap. Lowchester Woolen Mill burns to ground. Mysterious blaze levels factory. Today, Andrew Holmes, owner of the Lowchester Woolen Mill, accused Leopold Dilg of setting the fire in which a foreman perished. Dilg, a factory worker, is being held by police. Dilg accused. Dilg held for trial. Maximum penalty asked for Leopold Dilg. Dilg escapes jail. Dilg escapes. Dilg escapes. 
My name is Leopold Dilg. I worked at that mill in Nochester, Mass. But I never set that fire. All they had against me was that I once said the place ought to be burned. Well, it should have been. It was a rat trap. Anyway, the evidence seemed to be enough for the jury. <laughs> I got one look at their faces when the judge was charging them, and I knew I was a dead duck. So that night, I escaped from the jail. I dropped from the second-story window, almost breaking my leg, and started hobbling away across the fields. They weren't long getting after me. I could hear them yelling in the woods right on my tail. It was raining. I guess that slowed them up. But I couldn't go much further. And then I came to Sweetbrook. That's Miss Shelley's cottage on the edge of town. I managed to get to the back door. Who's there? Who is it? Miss Shelley. I've got a baseball bat here. One move and I'll brain you. Miss Shelley, I'd appreciate the keys to your car. Leopold Dilg, you get out of here. I'm sorry, Miss Shelley, but it's very important. I'm warning you. All I want, all I... I... Oh. oh, oh, you're hurt. Oh, Dilg. Just tired. Come on, get up. Here, let me help you. What are you doing here anyway? I broke out of jail. Oh, you fool. The whole police force must be looking for you. The whole country. I'd like to stay here, Miss Shelley. You can't. I, I'm fixing this house up for rent. It'll be occupied tomorrow. Oh, oh, my, my ankle. Oh, oh, my gosh. How far do you expect to get with that? And where, where are you going? I would appreciate any suggestions, Miss Shelley. Why didn't you think of that in the first place? Miss Shelley, you believe I could burn down a factory? kill a man or... You're crying. One day you love the whole world and all of a sudden everything you count on... Oh, for heaven's sakes, there's someone at the door. Get upstairs quick. Go in the attic and keep quiet. Thanks, Miss Shelley. Now, don't even breathe, do you hear? And close the door behind you. Oh, my gosh. Just a minute. Oh, my gosh. Good evening. Yes? I am Michael Lightcap. Oh. Oh. Oh, Professor Lightcap. Why, you weren't supposed to arrive until tomorrow. Your secretary wrote uh, My that... secretary is getting married. Nothing deranges a woman's mind more than marriage. You must be the person with whom I've corresponded. Yes, Nora Shelley. An excellent name. Yes, I, uh... uh it's, uh, raining, isn't it? Uh, definitely. We're... We're having an early summer. Yes, but uh, could we continue the conversation inside? Oh. It's rather damp out here. Oh, nothing is ready. I thought that tomorrow about noon you'd... Really, I suggest a hotel. I plan to spend the night here, so I'll spend the night here. I'll get my bags. I had a good look at Lightcap from the top of the stairs. <laughs> Very dignified gentleman. It was the beard that did it, I guess. A black Van Dyke. <laughs> When he went out for his grips, Miss Shelley came flying up the stairs. Get back up in the attic. Go on. Who's the guy with the beard? The new tenant. He's the number one legal genius in the state. He's dean of Commonwealth Law School. He eats with the governor. Mm. He writes to the president. Yeah, a very cold character, Mr. Lightcap. He's back. Now, remember, keep quiet up here. And later, out you go. I wonder where. Miss Shelley, open the door. Oh, hello. Why did you lock the door? Why, did I? Why isn't that queer? Miss Shelley, there seems to be a strange atmosphere hanging over this house. Oh, as soon as I get the curtains up, it'll be all right. Any improvement will be welcomed. You're a very sarcastic man, aren't you? Miss Shelley, for the past nine months, I've been teaching 400 weary young men the rudiments of law. I've had to drive all the way down here myself because my man went to see his ailing mother in West Virginia. I was looking forward to a cheerful, brightly lit house and a warm bed. And I find myself in this... this shambles. Well, well, why didn't you tell your blithering secretary to get things right? If you'd come tomorrow like you were supposed to, this house would have been efficiently whipped together and would have been cheerful and bright. Are you through? Yes. There's a certain justice in what you say. However, the violence with which you say it... Well, I'm sorry, but I... I accept think... your apology. Now, please accept mine. And now may I ask, is there a bedroom in the house fit to be slept in? The master bedroom happens to be quite fit. Thank you. Good night, Miss Shelley. You may leave now. Dilk. Hiya. I thought you went home. How could I with you up here? You can leave now. He's asleep. 
You used to live in this house, you and your mother, didn't you? Yes, we live in town now and rent this place. Come on, get up. Uh, my ankle's so swollen now, I couldn't walk five yards with it. Oh, what are you going to do? You can't stay here. You're still the prettiest girl in Lochester. Now, look. This escape was insane. You haven't been convicted yet. Now they'll think you're as guilty as sin. It's possible I am, don't you think? Maybe. Maybe not. Leopold, as far as I know, you're capable of anything. You were the wildest kid that ever went to a Lochester school. Uh, you wore pigtails then. I was in love with you. Always collecting a bad reputation. <laughs> Even after you grew up, speeches on street corners, petitions, any kind of a squawk, and Leopold Dill's right in the middle of it. Yeah, you know, you're even prettier now. Uh, look, what about Yates? Does he know what you've done? Yates? Yates, Sam Yates, your lawyer. Don't you know your Quiet. own lawyer? <laughs> the state made me a present of a lawyer. Well, if anybody can help you, it's Sam Yates. I'll call him. And that's the end of the line, as far as I'm concerned. Thank you, Miss Shelley. And see that you keep quiet up here. Yes, Miss Shelley. The next morning, Nora was still there, floating around the house. Her mother had been over to see why she wasn't home. The moving men had been in, and a reporter from the Sentinel to interview Lightcap. Huh. I felt like I was hiding in the middle of a parade. Then Sam Yates showed up. Uh, hello, Nora. Oh, Sam. I got your message. They said you Why, wanted... Sam Yates. Michael, well, I'll be doggone. <laughs> well, how are you, Sam? Nora, how'd you know that Michael Lightcap was the one man in the world I wanted to see? Well, I didn't. I didn't know you knew him. Went to school with him, that's all. How are you, Michael? Uh, what are you doing up here? Came up to write a new book. I can... Sam, is that a black eye? Uh, oh, uh, yes, I guess it is. You've been fighting, Sam? Why, I fight on the average of three times a day. Yes, in, in school, you had a tendency towards riot. I can't stand the way this town is going after a fellow named Leopold Dilg. He's the only honest man I've come across here in 20 years. Naturally, they want to hang him. Sam? He's been shouting for years that Andrew Holmes, the mill owner, is crooked as a dog's hind leg. So what happens? Dilg predicts the mills will burn down. They do. One man is burned to death. Here's Holmes's chance. It was Dilg, he says. Go get him. He starts slicing this burg into a frenzy. Sam, what did you expect me to do? Well, I figured if you'd demand a fair trial for him. You see, Judge Gronstad, who's trying the case, is nothing but a tool of Holmes and out to get Dill. He said as much. And I say that, uh, uh, you're not buying the idea. Sam, my business is with the principles of law. I can't allow myself to get mixed up in these little local squabbles. Little squabbles, eh? Well, let me tell you, Michael, Now, that what's this... all that? Yes, what is all that? Who is it? Open up. Who lives here? Professor Michael Lightcap. I'll take the house, Joe. You take the grounds. Now, just a minute. Where do you think you're going to take the grounds? Have you got a search warrant? Dilg escaped. We're searching every house on this side of the road. Have you a warrant? Now, look, lady, No I have... warrant out. That's from the Constitution, isn't it, Sam? Well, not exactly in those words. We guarantee nobody's here but us. And that's too many. Now, will you please leave, all of you? You're wasting my entire morning. Go on now. Go on. <laughs> They didn't search the house. When things quieted down, Sam Yates left, and Nora went out to speak to him in the car. Sam, listen. Do you know who's up in that attic right now? Leopold Dilg. Who? Dilg. In the attic? Yes. Now? Yes, now. He stumbled in here last night with a bad ankle. <laughs> What's funny? <laughs> Can't get involved in little local affairs, says Lightcap. And there's a little local affair sitting right in his own house. You've got to get him out of here. Why? Why? Where could he be as safe as in the home of the dean of a law school? Are you kidding? Nora, Dilg's life won't be worth a dime if I turn him back to that jury now. Lightcap can help us, but it'll take time. That's nothing to me, one way or another. He can't stay up there. Why not? Are you insane? Who'll take care of him? Why, you. Me? Listen, I can't hang around here even if I wanted to. Lightcap's ordered me out 50 times since last night. Oh, you're doing all right so far. Sam. Not so long, Nora. But Sam. I'll keep in touch with you. Oh, Sam. <laughs> Smart girl, that Miss Shelley. <laughs> you know what she did so she could stick around? She got herself hired by Lightcap as a combination secretary and cook until his man could get up here. <laughs> yes, yeah, smart girl. That afternoon, they went out in the garden to work on the new book. And meanwhile, I was up in the attic, slowly starving to death. A man can stand just so much. When I sneaked down to the kitchen to get some food, I could hear Lightcap dictating. Uh, uh, the beginning is always a little difficult. Yes, sir. Uh, let's see, uh... Jot down this title. The Relation of Literature to Legislation in the 18th Century in England. 
Yes, sir. The effect upon, of, of literature <clears throat> upon le le legislation is a... Bless you. <sighs> Thank you. Is, uh, is a study that has long claimed the interests of social scientists. The law that was really some high-class stuff he was dictating. I stood man. there listening for a while, the and then he made a statement that sounded a little silly to me about the law being at all times reasonable. <laughs> the law must be built firmly on principles which are above small emotions, greed, and the loose thinking of everyday life. Impossible. Oh. What is the law? It's a gun pointed at somebody's head. All depends upon which end of the gun you stand, whether you think the law is just or not. Uh, who is this man? Oh, uh, uh, he, uh, he, he's the gardener, hmm. Joseph. Uh, Joseph, this is Professor Lightcap, the new tenant. Pleased to know you. Still, you know, your point of view about the law is very interesting. Thank you. Yep, yep, it represents the ideal condition. I don't approve of it, but I like people who think in terms of ideal conditions. <laughs> They're the dreamers, poets, tragic figures in the world, but interesting. Um... How are the zinnias getting along, Joseph? Dying. You see, Professor... Uh, Joseph, <laughs> uh, if, you, if you don't mind, I, I must get on with my dictation. And you might see if, if you can save the zinnias from dying. Bless you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Miss Shelley. Mr. Lightcap, uh, you're catching cold. Uh, out in the rain last night, Professor? Yes, I was. Professor, about that idea... Uh, Miss now, Shelley, uh, I see you're about to have some more company. I'll, I'll be in the study. Yes, sir. Dill, get out of here. What are you trying to do? Well, when I hear a man talk nonsense, I always get an impulse. You get upstairs. With this ankle, it's too late. Then hide somewhere, quick. We had company, all right. Only it wasn't for Nora. I knew the fellow who got out of that car. I'd seen his picture. A fellow by the name of Senator Boyd. Well, sit down, Senator. Sit down. Thanks. Well, Professor, I tracked you up here because the news I have for you couldn't be entrusted to the mails or the telegraph wire. Yes, Senator Boyd? Like Cap, the President would be pleased to appoint you to the bench of the Supreme Court in September. The, the Supreme Court? Me? That's it. I can't... I don't know what... It's... It's a great honor, Senator. A great honor. Well, would you be willing to accept? I... I'd be willing to accept. Wonderful. The Senate will investigate, naturally. I don't think we have to fear that, but I'd keep my name out of the papers in any connection if I were you. Oh, I've been keeping my name out of the papers for nearly 20 years. It shouldn't be difficult to continue. The Supreme Court? <laughs> That's something. When the Senator left, the professor walked around the house in a kind of a happy day. <laughs> you could tell what it meant to him. And then Nora got him off to bed with a hot water bottle. He had a bad cold. You gotta be careful with a guy like that. Yeah. That night, Sam Yates came to talk things over. The Supreme Court. Well, what do you know? Hey, this stuff he reads is remarkable dead. <laughs> got any more chicken, Nora? Are you eating again? Oh, that prison food was terrible. Nora, a Supreme Court appointment or no appointment? We're dragging light cap into this. Yeah, we certainly must. Oh, we must, must we? How do you suggest we start? Well, what have we here? An intelligent man, but cold. No blood in his thinking. So we must start to thaw him out. Oh, we thaw him. Yep. We can't let a man like that take a seat on the highest court in our land. It's bad for the country. Oh, I see. All of a sudden you're concerned about your country. Our country first, yes. Then my neck, next. Ha <laughs> ha. Leopold, that's all very beautiful and commendable. But this thawing out process, uh, we haven't got months, you know. Oh, plenty of time. I like to break out in a cold sweat every time the doorbell rings. How do you propose we thaw him, Leopold, with a blowtorch? Well, we have to give that some thought. But we have a good start, Miss Shelley. What start have we got? You, Miss Shelley, the prettiest woman in Lochester. moment, Mr. DeMille presents Gene Arthur, Ronald Coleman, and Cary Grant in Act Two of The Talk of the Town. Now, has this ever happened to you on a bright spring afternoon when you wanted to look your very best? While strolling through the park one day, in the merry month of May, 
I was taken by surprise by a run of monstrous size. A run in your stocking certainly can make you feel like a blot on the landscape. Well, if you'd lux your stockings after every wearing, you wouldn't be having such trouble. You mean just the way you wash your stockings can make a difference in the way they wear? It certainly can. A whole series of tests has proved that luxing stockings cuts down runs by more than 50%. The United States Testing Company, Incorporated, washed rayon stockings over and over again in different ways and then tested them on a machine that pulls and strains them the way you do when you wear them. Stockings washed with new, improved Lux Flakes didn't go into runs nearly as quickly as those washed with a strong soap or rubbed with a cake soap. Luxing actually cut runs in half. My, that sounds good to me. Well, here are some new words to that song of yours. If you'll do what they say, you can give those stocking runs their runaround. I'll lux my stockings every day, every month including May. If you want to save your home, take a tip from one who knows. Luxing helps to keep those stocking runs away. Now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. Act two of The Talk of the Town, starring Cary Grant as Leopold Dilg, Jean Arthur as Nora, and Ronald Coleman as Michael Lightcap. In the matter of Leopold Dilg, versus the town of Lochester, Massachusetts. We call to the stand our second witness, Miss Nora Shelley. Professor Lightcap wasn't very sick, and the next morning we figured it was all right if he got up for breakfast. His cold was much better. But we hid the morning paper because Leopold's picture was right smack on the front page. When the professor came downstairs, Leopold was just finishing his breakfast. Well, well. Oh, uh... Excuse me, Professor, I didn't think you'd be down this early. Oh, that's quite all right. Stay as you are. No, no, no. The gardener shouldn't be eating in here. Nonsense. Sit down, I insist. Good morning, Miss Shelley. Are you sure you feel all right, Professor? Oh, yes, quite well, thank you. Perfectly normal. Oh, that's good. Is there a morning paper? Uh, uh paper? Oh, no. No, it hasn't come yet. Uh, uh, Miss Shelley's a wonderful cook, Professor. We're in clover. Coffee? Thank you. Well, Joseph, this is very nice and companionable. You know, there's... There's a touch of the philosopher about you that I like. Hmm. And you interest me enormously, Professor. Good, good. Hey, taste that ham. Great, isn't it? I appreciate good food. Ever had borscht, Professor? Borscht? What's that? Beet soup with sour cream. It's a Polish dish. Yeah, yeah, with an egg beaten in it. Don't let anybody give it to you without an egg in it. We must have some, Miss Shelley. Oh, yes, of course. As soon as I finish my course in American cooking... Oh, uh... you can buy it down at Mrs. Pulaski's Polish Dairy near the factory. Mrs. Pulaski's, hmm? Well, by all means, let's get some. I do wish the paper had come. Uh, yeah, well, that's too bad. Still, if you read yesterday's, why read today's? It's just some more about that terrible man, Dilg. Dilg? Oh, the, uh... The fugitive from justice, huh? Uh-huh. Or a miscarriage of justice. Your opinion, too? It might be yours, too, Professor, if you knew Andrew Holmes. He makes the laws. He puts a fellow like Judge Grunstadt on the bench, and Grunstadt takes orders. Well, the voters may exercise their right of the ballot and remove him. Now, this corruption is too thick. That's the way every decent person around here feels about it. <laughs> Feelings have no influence on the law. Facts, Miss Shelley, facts. My dear Professor, people wind facts around each other like pretzels. Facts alone, that's a nut without a kernel. Pass the sugar. Where's the soul? Where's the instinct? Where's the warm human side? <laughs> all right, Joseph, all right. Two schools of thought. I see your point of view, theoretically. In fact, I respect it. Mm. I wish I could respect yours, Professor. Uh, Joseph puts it a little strongly, Professor. He does respect you, of course, but as you can see, he's for the practical side. Yes, yes, and makes the law up as he goes along. Out of common sense, yes. In fact, Professor... The way I see it, you don't live in this country. You just take up room in it. I now, your... Joseph. <laughs> it's a discussion amongst friends. Of course. Delightful. All you know about the American scene is what you read in newspapers and magazines. Somebody else's impressions hashed up for lazy people. If you don't feel it yourself, you've learned nothing. <laughs> just like having somebody tell you about his operation. That'll do, Joseph, for this morning. Professor, I challenge you to make an experiment. Spend half a day with your books and the other half finding out what people do. Yeah. By the way, with these indoor habits of yours, you've got the complexion of a gravel pit. Well, really. You know, Joseph, you're no oil painting yourself. 
No, no, a mummy would be closer to you. They wore beards, too. <laughs> well, now, Joseph, what would you suggest? Well, there's a baseball game today. Go to it. Baseball? <laughs> a baseball. <laughs> That was the first step in thawing out the professor. I took him to the game myself, and we sat right next to Judge Grunstadt. Leopold said there was no one like Grunstadt to teach the professor the facts of justice. <laughs> professor Lightcap, this is Judge Grunstadt. Lightcap? Why, of course, of course. How do you do, sir? How do you do? Well, this is a great honor. Thank you. Did you say Judge? Mm-hmm. Grunstadt. Doubt whether you've heard of me, but your work. I've read it in the law review every year. Hey, sit down. Oh, how I envy you, sir. You work in the quiet of your library and... How do you like that? Are you blind? That was right across the plate. The dope. But me. Me, I labor in the vineyards. You've heard of the Dild case, I take it? Yes, yes. Well, there's luck for you. First case I've had in ten years that drew any outside attention. Look at that. Look at that. Slide, you idiot! Oh, he could have made it. <clears throat> and right in the middle of the trial, the swine skips out like a butterfly, and I was preparing a brilliant opinion on the case. Before the trial was finished? Oh, he was as guilty as Judas, the town malcontent. You consider it ethical to judge a man before all the evidence is in? My dear fellow, he broke jail. That proves it, doesn't it? Why, even a library philosopher like you would have to admit that. Uh, yes, Miss, Miss Shelley. I, I think we've had enough baseball for today. <laughs> That evening, Leopold and Professor Lightcap played chess. But the professor's mind wasn't on the game. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. You, you play very well. Where did you learn? My father. Mm-hmm. He was the kind of man who resented work. It interfered with chess and argument. Yes. Uh-huh. See? Yes, you're, you're, you're a man of many parts, Joseph. <laughs> I look forward to a very pleasant summer. Thank you, Professor. Uh... Your king is still in check. Yes, uh, let's see now. Uh, Miss Shelley, did you actually hear what that fool Grunstadt said? Yes, wasn't it remarkable? Joseph, what do you think? Judge Grunstadt was sitting in the box right next to us. No, well, I hear he's a very charming man. He's an idiot. Writing an opinion of a case before hearing all the evidence. Preposterous fake. Mm -hmm. That's serious. Your rules don't allow that. Naturally not. Well, uh, what do you do about it? Why, there's... There's nothing to do. I I can't intrude on the business of the Superior Court of the County. So you just turn your face, huh? Ah, now, Joseph, you don't understand. Mm-hmm. I understand this much. You laugh at my kind of law and wink at the other. What kind do you practice? I refuse to be dragged into any further discussion of the philosophy of law. All right, then let's not. Oh, Joseph, I'm, I'm sorry. It wasn't that I have no respect for your intelligence... Uh, which I may say I find extremely lively. Uh -huh. That you're taking a vacation from law. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I was a little sharp, though, I'm afraid. Don't mention it. Now, let's see. My king's in check, huh? Uh, yes. As a matter of fact, Joseph, I may add that I'm very grateful for your presence in this house. Mm -hmm. And you're a big treat to me, Professor. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you. He was a wonderful man, the professor. He was, well, in so many ways, he was like a little boy. I was very fond of him. The next day, we went for a walk through town. A couple of high school kids passed us and giggled. You know it was the beard. Beaver! Beaver! <laughs> yeah, what, what, what did they say, Miss Shelley? Beaver. It's a game. First one to spot a beard. Beards are quite unusual in these parts. Yes, I, I suppose they are. You know, I, I don't think I've ever told anyone how I came to grow it. No? Well, I, I was one of the youngest men ever to graduate from Harvard Law School. In fact, I was teaching at Commonwealth before I was 22. Wow. And I had... <laughs> I had a frank and open face. People in trolley cars used to call me Sonny. Uh, boys, I was teaching would slap me on the back. Women would wink at me in the street. <laughs> Is that bad? No, but but I was busy and had no time for nonsense. And so uh, the beard became a sort of a fortress. And, well, I, I suppose I grew attached to it. Well, I think it's very pretty. <laughs> now, now, what am I to say to that? I miss Shelley. Isn't that the boshed place? Oh, oh, Pulaski's. Yes. Pulaski's. We must get some for Joseph. 
Oh, I'm afraid we haven't time, Professor. Oh, but think of his face, the ecstasy. Come in a moment. You're going to spoil that man. What, spoil Joseph? <laughs> yes, sir. Some borscht, please. A quart. Yes, ma'am. With an egg in it. With, with an egg? Oh, it must have an egg beaten up in it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I didn't know it at the time. There was only one person in Lochester who ever ordered it that way, Leopold Dilk. But Pulaski knew it. We were to find that out later. We left Pulaski's and I steered the professor over toward the factory ruins. I knew Holmes was staging a demonstration that morning, whipping the town up into a frenzy. It was something the professor ought to see. Mr. Lightcap, it's a pleasure to see you here. Holmes is my name. I own this mill, or rather what's left of it. Well, really, I... I've never known public feeling to run so high in Lochester. As for Mr. Dilg, justice will not be cheated. No, no, I'm sure it won't. Oh, Miss Bush, come here. Professor, this is Miss Bush, a close friend of Clyde Bracken, my former. The man who was killed in the explosion. This is Professor Lightcap, Miss Bush. I'm pleased to meet you. We found her here today, searching the ashes. Yeah, I was looking for a wristwatch I gave Clyde just two weeks ago. All they found of Bracken was a tiny athletic medley he'd won in high school. Gives the girl a queer feeling. One night you got a man who weighs 211 pounds, and the next day, wham, all you got left is a medal for shot putting. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry. But... Too bad they're not taking pictures of Dilk swinging from a telegraph pole. Who said that? I did, Yates, and what about it? Jake, I told you anybody I heard talking like that had to count on fighting me. Put him up. Sure. Oh, John, you... <laughs> I won't have it, Miss Shelley. You deliberately dragged me into this. It's been your purpose since the day I arrived. Well, if I have, my motives are far from selfish. That has nothing to do with it. I've said again and again I cannot be involved. And if it's your purpose to see that I am... Well, I... well, Professor, this amounts to violence. And from you, making charges against Miss Shelley without evidence? Yeah, me. Well, perhaps I'd, I'd better resign, Professor. Uh, no. No, Miss Shelley, I... You're right, Joseph. I apologize, Miss Shelley. <laughs> there, now you see a happy family again. Now the question is, are we ready for dinner? Yes, are we ready for dinner? Anytime you are, Professor. Thank you. Hello, Ed. This is Sergeant Mack. Hey, listen, we just heard a hot tip from a guy named Pulaski. He says Dilg is hiding out in the Shelley house. Yeah, get over here right away. Come on, Miss Shelley, sit down. Right here, Professor. Thank you. Uh, hey. Hey, wait a minute. Who put on the soup plates? There's no soup. No soup, eh? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no soup. My dear Joseph, while strolling in town today... Huh? Uh, no, no, no. That, that's, that's a bad beginning. My dear Joseph, to cement the bonds that bind our happy little family together, what could be more fitting than this? Borscht! Pulaski's! I'd know it anywhere! Oh, be careful, you'll spill it. Well, only Pulaski's would wrap up Borscht in a newspaper. Oh, no, no, mm. let, let, let me unwrap it, please, Joseph. Your eagerness, your... Ah, uh, uh, this is the stuff I've been waiting for. Come on, Professor, shake it up. All right, here we are. Now, if you'll just get rid of this newspaper, Miss Shelley, I... What's the matter, Professor? Is something wrong? There seems to be a picture in the paper, Joseph. A man named Leopold Dill. Professor. He bears a remarkable resemblance to you, Joseph. Professor, what are you going to do? Call the police and tell them to come and pick him up. No, no, you won't do that. Wait, Professor. I'm sorry I spoiled your party. Of course, there's no use discussing the merits of my case right now. I'm afraid not, Joseph. Uh, Leopold, I have a simple duty to perform, and I must do that before anything else. <laughs> Well, well, here we have the two schools of thought, Professor. This time in action. That telephone to you means law and order. And to me, well, I've got to stop you using that telephone. By violence, if necessary. Yes, I see. That's bad. I have a very warm feeling for you, Joseph. But I must use that telephone. Well, if you do, Professor, and I'm as fond of you as a brother... I'll be compelled to knock you down. No, no, please. I should regret that, too. I've never been fonder of a man in my life, but... Hello, operator? Give me the police station. Hello, is this the police? Sorry, I want to... Professor. No! Oh, Leopold. Nora, I'm sorry. 
What else can oh. I do? Oh, help me get him up. You've heard him. He's... Leopold, I couldn't listen. help it. I didn't want to hit him. Get out of here, quick. It's the police. Get out the back way. Look, I... Go on, go on. Get out, you fool. Come on, where is he? Oh, help me with Professor Lightcap. He's hurt. Where's Dale? I don't know. I... Dad, try the upstairs. Nora. Nora, did Leopold get away? Oh, Sam, Sam, help me. What's the matter with him? Look, Sam, is he all right? Sure, sure, he's fine. Come on, Professor, come on. Hi. He's coming around all right. Uh, up you oh, go, Professor. You. Professor Lightcap. Uh, you, you knew it was Dilg, Miss Shelley. All those lies, attentions, just for Dilg. You and Sam Yates. You planned it all, didn't you? Take it easy, Michael. You're a silly, dangerous girl. You had me feeding and lodging a notorious fugitive from justice. You've endangered a lifetime's career for a stupid gesture. Our association is at an end, Nora. That's a tip-off, Professor. You had to get good and sore before you got around to calling me by my first name. Oh, Miss Shelley. Nora, when you're angry. That will be all, Miss Shelley. That will not be all, Mr. Lightcap. Dilg is innocent, and I'd rather be hated by... Forty frozen legal giants like you than turn him over to those bloodthirsty idiots of Lochester? You were right to grow a beard. You were an old man all your life. You put on the proper costume just as soon as you were able. Don't ever shave it off, Mr. Twilight. Somebody might think you were alive, and that would be misrepresentation. Come on, Sam, let's get out of here. <laughs> Pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. After a brief intermission, Mr. DeMille presents Ronald Coleman, Cary Grant, and Jean Arthur in the third act of The Talk of the Town. Tonight, Sally and I have a conservation quiz for you. Questions and answers on care of clothing that every conservation-minded woman needs to know. We've asked some members of our studio audience to try to answer a question apiece. But whether their answers are right or wrong, there's a big box of new improved Lux waiting for each. Here's our first contestant, Sally. Mrs. Charles Isaacs of Los Angeles. Mrs. Isaacs, if you've had washable gloves dry cleaned, should you try to wash them? Why, no. That's right. If you try to wash them after they've once been cleaned, they're apt to get stiff and be ruined. If you lux them right from the start, you're all right. Just follow the directions right there on the box of Lux Flakes that Mr. Kennedy has for you. Here you are, Mrs. Isaacs. Thanks a lot for helping us out. And I know new improved Lux will help you out, too. Help you make gloves and other washables last longer. It's the mildest, safest Lux ever made. Now our second contestant, Sally, is Mrs. Bruce Wilkins of North Hollywood. Hello, Mrs. Wilkins. Here's your question. If the neckline of a blouse or sweater, for instance, is specially soiled, should you rub cake soap on it to get it clean? Uh, yes. No, very definitely no. Rubbing is hard on fabrics, especially on woolens. Take a few dry Lux flakes and work them in gently with your fingers, but don't rub. Thanks for coming up, Mrs. Wilkins. You will find this box of new, improved Lux flakes is super safe care for all your washables. I'm afraid that's all we'll have time for. We'll have to save our other questions for another night. But ladies, don't you wait another night or another day to try new, improved Lux flakes. It's better than ever in three important ways. It's the mildest, safest Lux ever made... Its suds are richer, more cleansing than ever, and they last longer than ever. Give more of your washables this super safe care so they'll last longer than ever, too. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. We'll ask our stars to step out of character for a chat when the play is over. But right now, we present the third act of The Talk of the Town, starring Ronald Coleman, Jean Arthur, and Cary Grant. From the personal journal of Professor Lightcap comes the following narrative. The private diary of a modest and retiring student of the law. Since I trust no eyes but mine will ever read these words, I may confess that Miss Nora Shelley had made a distinct and lasting impression upon me. 
and when she left Sweetbrook that night, I felt very much alone. But she had shown me what I was, a frozen legal giant, she had said, with a beard. <laughs> so when my man Tilney arrived, I took the first step toward correcting that impression. Tilney found me that night in front of my mirror, razor in hand. Mr. Lightcap, sir, what you doing, sir? I am about to shave, Tilney. Oh, no, sir, you can't do that, sir. Sorry, Tilney, there's work to do. The beard is in my way. Uh, yes, I know, but for 15 years, sir. 15 years, beaver. <laughs> The work I referred to was discovering for myself whether or not justice had been hoodwinked in the case of Leopold Dilg. I went first, clean-shaven of course, to a, to a beauty parlour in Lochester. It was run by Miss Regina Bush, the sweetheart of the foreman who had died in the fire. She, uh, she manicured my nails. You got beautiful hands, Professor. Clyde had hands you could use to knock in spikes with. Who is Clyde? Who was Clyde? It'd be more accurate. I'm in mourning. It's a great hardship because I'm the type of girl who loves to get around. You visiting here for the summer? Yes. Gee, I wish he wasn't dead. At least for one night. I sure would love to go dancing tonight. Uh, Miss Bush, I, uh, I, I wonder if I might have the the, 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 the pleasure of taking you dancing tonight. The pleasure? Well, say now. You're real cute. Listen, you blow your horn at seven tonight, right outside, Sonny. Thank you. Sonny. <laughs> what time is it, Tilney? Seven two, sir. Well, it's just at the next corner. Yes. Uh, Tilney. Yes, sir? <clears throat> if you wanted to get some information out of a woman... How would you go about it? Well, Mr. Lightcap, sir, I've lived a cloistered life like you. And on a subject of that sort, we're babes in the woods. But you, you were married once, weren't you? Oh, that was the folly of you, sir. But you wooed her and won her. How? Well, by the darndest series of lies you ever heard. I gave her a character and charm she never possessed. I perjured my soul for a thousand years to come. <laughs> Well, that's very interesting, Tilney. Thank you. Should we sit down, Miss Bush? Yeah, come to think of it, I'm getting hungry. You dance divinely, Miss Bush. Your, your, your physical coordinations are remarkable. I thought I heard them all, Professor, but your line's brand new. Ah, you know, you're definitely a superior person, Miss Bush. Ah, you're cute. You know what? If I was free, I'd take you very, very seriously. Oh, but you you are free, aren't you? Your your gentleman friend is... He's dead, isn't he? Well, that's the general impression. Well, what do you mean? Ah, little Regina's drinking too much. Makes the tongue very, very loose. You know, you're... You're beautiful, Regina. Extraordinarily beautiful. Oh, uh, would you like to kiss me? Why, very, very well. I, I mean, certainly. Oh, on the forehead. Cultured. A cultured kiss. Gee, if I was only free. Oh, but you are free. You're only saying that to torment me. No, no, I'm not. Now, here, I got a letter from him. A letter? He wants me to meet him in Boston in a couple of weeks, see? A letter? From Clyde? Yeah, it says C. Bernard, General Delivery, Boston, but that's him, all right. C. Bernard, he isn't dead at all. Uh -huh. Hey, listen, what are you... Hey, give uh, me that letter uh, back. No, no, but Miss Bush, now, Regina, darling... Don't Regina, I... darling, me. There's something fishy about you, mister. Help! Throw this guy out! Get him out of here! I left the cafe as quickly as possible and drove back to Sweetbrook. Of course, I didn't realize at the time that Leopold Dilg was still hiding there in the attic. It was the most obvious place and therefore the best. Miss Shelley found him there that night. Oh, Leopold. Oh, you idiot. Hey, hey, cut it out. How did you know I was here? Oh, it suddenly came to me you couldn't go anywhere else. Your ankle. Oh, Leopold. No, no, no. Nora Shelley crying. Oh, I've been out of my mind for 24 hours. I thought you were dead. What an idea. <laughs> you know something, Nora? Our friend, the professor, shaved off his beard. He did? Yeah, I heard him talking about it. 
But why? Uh, well, who can tell what a man in love will do? In love with who? You. Mm -hmm. I know just how he feels. The prettiest girl in Lochester. Oh, Leopold, I've been so miserable to you. I, I never really knew you. Oh, Leopold. Uh, uh, stop saying Leopold like that tenderly. Oh, Leopold. <laughs> How funny. You can't do it with a name like Leopold. Oh, shut up. Where did he go without his beard? He'll be all right. <laughs> he won't be all right. He's a child. Yeah, I know just how you feel. Now, don't start that soupy stuff again. <laughs> you don't know how I feel about anything. Ah, uh, look, Nora. He's quite a man, you know. An important man. Be quiet. There's a car. He's back. Now get up in the attic. Okay. Go on. All right, but think it over. Think what over? Oh, go on. Oh. I'll need the car, tell me. Yes, sir. Hello? Miss Shelley. Hello. I'm glad to see you. Miss Shelley, I have every reason to believe that Clyde Bracken is still alive. It seems that... What are you staring at? If you find my face unpleasant? No, no, no. It's uh, the beard gone. I mean... Did you say Bracken? Bracken, yes, alive. Well, I guess at last you know the truth about Mr. Dill. I don't know anything until I can prove it. A stickler to the last. I bet if you knew where he was right I'd now... I'd turn him in, yes. You just took that beard off your face. Inside, you're as whiskered as the Smith brothers. <laughs> You turn me in right now, Professor. Leopold. Uh, what do you say, Professor? Leopold, get back up there. What's the matter with you? Leopold, I'm leaving immediately for Boston to find Mr. Clyde Bracken. How about dropping you off at the police station? Do you hear? Bracken's alive. Very interesting. Well, let's go, Professor. Will somebody please listen to me? Bracken's alive. Why should Dill go to jail? It's the principle. The law says that's where I should be. Thank you, Leopold. Listen, if they get him in jail, they'll make Patty DeFore grow out of him. Doesn't that mean anything to you? Well, that's a bridge we can cross when we come to it. Right. Who knows who's right? Why does, why does Dilk have to make all the concessions, Professor? Isn't there one concession in your bones? Concessions? Why, I, I shaved off a beard I was fond of. I danced with a blonde beauty parlor owner. I kissed her in public. Concessions. Ah. All right, all right, all right. Turn him over. Give him to the mob. Go ahead. Mob? What mob? Do you think they'll let him stay in jail while you're looking for Bracken? They'll drag him out by the hair, they'll... Don't be silly. Quiet. Come on, Professor. Now, now wait, wait, wait. Miss, Miss Shelley has been right in the past, and perhaps... Perhaps you'd both better come to Boston with me. Well, that's a very noble gesture, Professor, but my place tonight is in jail. I'm sorry to disagree with you. Come along, Leopold. Uh-uh-uh. That's taking the law in your own hands, Professor. Oh, shut up! Leopold, sometimes the letter of the law might be wrong. No. I'm afraid I can't agree with you, my dear friend. Well, I'll have to be firm, Leopold. Oh! Now, Miss Shelley, if you'll, if you'll help me to get him into the car, please. Oh, Come Professor, here. you're wonderful. You're really wonderful. Thank you, Nora. Oh, Leopold. Poor Leopold. Did he hit you? Where did he hit you? Oh, poor Leopold. <laughs> We found Bracken, alias C. Bernard, in Boston. It was a brief and heated discussion. He didn't wish to return with us to Lochester, but we prevailed upon him. Uh, by force, I'm afraid. <coughs> Come on, Bracken, let's have the truth. Turning state's evidence is about the only hope you've got now. You know that, don't you? Talk, Bracken. Leopold, how about stopping the car and giving him another... Uh, going over. Uh, pleasure. Okay. Uh, wait a minute. Holmes paid me to burn it. The fact he was on the rocks and his only chance to get the insurance money for that broken down bond. That's what Leopold said for years. Well, why did you have to play dead? To get the people more excited. So when Holmes pinned it on that thorn in his side, Dill, he could put him away good, huh? Yeah. A very simple plan. It's astonishing. Better go straight to the Lochester City Hall, Miss Shelley. No, no. Drive straight home. Home? Why? Well, I'd rather take Bracken alone. What? What about the mob? The mob won't hurt anybody. Professor, you've solved this case beautifully, and I'm very grateful to you. But this country needs a man like you on the Supreme Court bench. I don't want to take the risk of your losing that. That's very thoughtful of you, Leopold, but I see things differently now. So do I. And I want to see this job through. Well, I'm sorry, my friend, Now, but, uh... stop it. The professor's right. Friendly feelings are one thing, Leopold, but a mob's another thing. You ain't going to turn me over to any mobs. Sit down, Bragg. I'll show you. Look out. Leopold, hold him. Sit down. Get his hands oh. off the wheel. <laughs> Our work 
bike had gone for nothing. In the excitement of the accident, Bracken escaped, and the police took Leopold. He went to trial within a week. Whitecap, I've come up here to talk sense to you. Thank you, Senator. Nobody believes this Bracken story. You'll go into that court and make yourself ridiculous with it. So will you please get out of this town? Nope. No, a man's life is at stake. Senator, a friend's life. Michael, I'm warning you. I just came through that town. They're out for blood. There's a crowd in front of the court right now with rope. Oh, no, no. Uh, Miss Shelley, Nora, I know just how you feel. I didn't understand at first. You couldn't help feeling the way you do about Leopold. Now, don't you start that. Who says I feel any way about anybody? Why does everybody try to make up my mind for me? Why should my love life be kicked around from pillar to post? I hear you're in love with Regina Bush. Regina Bush? <laughs> yes, Regina Bush of the Dolores Beauty Salon. How do you like it? Regina Bush? That's where Bracken is. He's hiding there. Nora, did I see a gun somewhere around this house? A gun? I know, it's in the desk. What are you going to do? I'm going to settle this dill business if I have to shoot to kill. Michael, you can't do it. Oh, can't I? Listen. My great-great-great-grandfather fought off two dozen Indians for a whole week in 1756. And I'm a direct descendant. Now, you tell that to the Senate. And if it isn't good enough for the Supreme Court bench, it's just too bad. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we know this man is guilty. Outside of this court right now, you can hear the voice of the people. Listen to it. The voice of justice. The state and the people of Lochester will tolerate only one verdict from this jury, and that verdict should be quick. Guilty! Keep that crowd out of here! Be cash, Your Honor! Give us Dill! We want Leopold Dill! Come on, give him to us! Come on, Your Honor! Who did that? Who fired that gun? I did. I did. Judge Grandstat, this gentleman with me is Mr. Clyde Bracken. Bracken? Clyde Bracken, alive. He's the man the law is looking for, not Leopold Dilg. His only crime was that he had courage and spoke his mind. And you, you people of Lochester, what are you doing in a court of law with weapons and ropes? This is your law. This is your law and your finest possession. It makes you free men in a free country. Why have you come here to destroy it? If you know what's good for you, take those weapons home and burn them. And then think. Think of this country and the law that makes it what it is. And think of a world today crying for this very law. Then maybe you'll understand why you ought to guard it. Violence against it is one mistake. Another mistake is for any man to look upon the law as just a set of principles, something he recites and then leans back and takes it for granted that justice is automatically being done. Both kinds of men are equally wrong. The law has to be engraved on our hearts and practiced every minute to the letter and spirit. It can't even exist unless we're willing to go down into the dust and blood and noise of battle every day of our lives to preserve it. For our neighbor as well as ourselves. I received my Supreme Court appointment in September. Nora Shelley was there the morning I took my seat for the first time. You, you look so wonderful, Professor Lightcap. Miss Shelley, you, you must stop staring. It's just a robe, isn't it? Where's Leopold? I tried to bring him with me, but he just disappeared. Where? Why? Well, you never can tell about Leopold. Oh, but he must come. Now, why do you look like that? I really don't know. It's just all seems so far from Sweetbrook. No, it isn't. Sweetbrook will never be far. Nora, look at me. A dream of 20 years come true. More happiness than any man deserves. But now there's something else, Nora. My friends, I want to see them as happy as I am. Nothing less will do. And Leopold. What a fine fellow he is. And I've been thinking, Nora, that if someone were to take his hand and say, Leopold, my reckless friend, here's love and companionship forever. Well... Someday that man would... You see what I mean, Nora? Justice. It's time, sir. Mr. Justice. I'll go now. Will you kiss me goodbye? Uh... 
goodbye. Far from Sweet Brook, never. Leopold had come after all. I saw him from my seat on the bench. He smiled at me and left. And Nora followed him. <coughs> Leopold, wait! Huh? Oh, oh, oh. Uh, where are you going? Well, that's all I wanted to see. The professor. The rest is about law. Very boring. Hey, he looks fine up there, doesn't he? Yes. Well, our country's in good hands. <laughs> the woman's touch. Indispensable. You better go back in. But, uh, where are you going? Home. Don't you stay Why? Then what? Ah, you're gonna like Washington. Wonderful town. And he's a wonderful man, too. Well... Nora, I'll see you sometime. Uh, Leopold. Uh, I'm in a hurry. You better go back in. He's probably looking around for you now. Uh, Leopold, I'm getting pretty tired of having people trying to make up my mind for me. Now, uh, stop it. Do as I tell you. Leopold. You take a stubborn woman, they're a curse. My mother always warned me against stubborn women. Uh, Leopold. Now, stop following me or I'll call the police. Leopold. And don't say my name like that, Leopold. <clears throat> I told you. It, it, it. Oh, come on. Come on, we missed the train. So they went back together to Lochester, to Sweetbrook. Our stars will return for a curtain call in just a moment. Now, what would you say was the hardest thing about washing dishes? I'd probably get a lot of different answers to that question if I could talk to each one of you. But when it comes right down to it, if there's one thing that makes dishwashing doubly hard, it's hard water. Well, there is a way to get wonderful suds in any kind of water. Just use new, improved Lux Flakes. By actual test, this amazing new Lux gives you more suds, ounce for ounce, than any of ten other well-known soaps. And they're rich, long-lasting suds that make that daily job of dishwashing easier and pleasant for you. Just sprinkle new, improved Lux Flakes into your dishpan, turn on the water, and watch those flakes bubble into thick, hard-working suds fast. You see, Lux is all pure soap. That's why it gives you richer suds. And, of course, it's kinder to your hands. Doesn't leave them red, rough, coarse-looking. Your dealer has new, improved Lux flakes now, in the same familiar package. Better get an extra box tomorrow. Keep it handy in the kitchen for dishes to give you rich, cleansing suds even in hard water. Now, here's Mr. DeMille with our stars. Tonight's performance deserves to be the talk of the town, also of the city and the county. And the credit goes to Gene Arthur, Cary Grant, and Ronald Coleman. Thank you, C.B. Keeping Cary Grant out of jail was a very pleasant assignment. But difficult. Cary's a stubborn criminal. Uh, C.B., I appeal to you. Do I look like a criminal? Well, no. I wish you'd be a little more confident. <laughs> That's a tribute to your acting, Cary. Don't you think so, Mr. Justice Coleman? Now, Jean, don't be formal. Call me judge. <laughs> you, you were all so perfect in your past tonight that I almost suspect you've had experience in the same jobs. Ever study law, Ronnie? I'm afraid not, C.B. Were you ever a combination secretary and cook, Jean? No. Well, it's up to you to save my theory, Carrie. Mm. That's the politest way I've ever been asked whether I've been in jail. Thanks. <laughs> Bill is a very polite man. He told me once that he had a perfect part for me, that I was the only one who was right for it. I hope you took it. What was the part? Calamity Jane. <laughs> I, I, I'd like to suffer a box office calamity like that picture more often, Jean. Uh, Ronnie was telling me he's joined a very interesting crusade. Yeah, I understand. He's out for blood this time. Well, Carrie, it's just this. I'm out to remind those of British birth in the United States that the American Red Cross needs more blood plasma and this week is set aside for donations of British blood for American forces. We can show our gratitude for America's tremendous generosity to Britain in her days of trial by going now to the nearest blood center and offering British blood to save American lives. As an old campaigner for the blood donor service, I know how much it's needed, Ronnie. Good luck. Now, I know the audience is anxious to hear about next week's play, Mr. DeMille. Well, next week, Jean... Our play will be the motion picture surprise of the year. The RKO dramatic success, Hitler's Children. 
And our stars will be Bonita Granville, Otto Kruger, Kent Smith, and Walter Reed. This is not a war play. It's a drama of youth, behind the scenes in Germany, a story of courage and love, which the Nazis could not destroy. And it's an inside glimpse of the Nazis' secret weapon. Well, I look forward to hearing it, C.B. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Sounds like you've convinced the jury. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Bonita Granville, Otto Kruger, Kent Smith, and Walter Reed in Hitler's Children. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Cary Grant's new picture is the RKO production, Mr. Lucky. Gene Arthur will soon be seen in the Columbia picture, The More the Merrier. Heard in tonight's play were Lynn Whitney as Regina, Leo Cleary as Yates, and Norman Field, Horace Willard, Charles Calvert, Robert Harris, Warren Ash, Charles Seal, Fred Mackay, Stanley Farrar, Ken Christie, and Julia Warren. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. And this is your announcer, John M. Kennedy, reminding you to tune in next Monday night to hear Benita Granville, Otto Kruger, Kent Smith, and Walter Reed in Hitler's Children. Today, you can't afford to be tired or nervous because of a diet low in vitamins. Yet with food rationing and shortages, it's harder to get vitamin-rich foods. So take VIMS. VIMS are scientifically designed to help make meals complete. VIMS give you all the vitamins government experts say are essential, balanced in the formula doctors endorse. And VIMS supply all the minerals commonly lacking. Get VIMS at your druggist. VI for vitamins, double MS for minerals. VIMS. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Myrna Loy and Cary Grant in I Love You Again with Frank McHugh. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Somewhere in the voluminous files of the Lux Radio Theater, there's a hastily scrawled memo that says, Team Myrna Loy and Cary Grant next week. I think that note was written four or five years ago. And our chance came last week, when we discovered that through some happy studio miracle, Myrna was doing nothing but coaxing her flower garden to even greater glory, and the already tanned Mr. Grant was just lying on the beach tanning. A phone call to Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, and we had a comedy which made golden music at the box office. I Love You Again, from the story by Octopus Roy Cohn. Just imagine yourself walking into your own house, with no recollection of what you'd been doing for the last nine years. That's the situation Cary Grant faces in the role of Larry Wilson. And to complicate things a bit more, Myrna Loy, as Mrs. Wilson, is extremely doubtful of his whole behavior. We have some doubters in this audience, too, I've discovered. They want to know how I, a mere man, can speak so confidently about Lux Flakes. Between the lines of their letters, I can read, What, my dear sir, have you ever washed in it? Well, well, here's the answer. Right now, I'm probably one of the biggest customers our product has. When you're shooting a technical picture like Reap the Wild Wind, you've got hundreds of brilliantly colored costumes to worry about. And in the course of a shooting schedule of about five months, those costumes get some pretty hard use. But we've got to keep them looking bright and fresh. And that's where Lux Flakes comes in. I know they're good business for me at Paramount, that's why I feel pretty safe in saying they're good business for you at home. Now the Lux Radio Theater curtain goes up once more. This time on I Love You Again. Starring Cary Grant as Larry Wilson and Myrna Loy as Kay. With Frank McHugh as Doc. You 
will meet at least one on every ocean liner. He's usually found in the ship's lounge, drinking lemonade with the boys and talking about himself. He wears black suits and stiff collars, belongs to every club in his hometown, and never forgets his rubbers. He's a first-class bore. In our case, the bore is a certain Mr. Lawrence Wilson of Habersville, PA. At the bar of an ocean liner approaching New York Harbor, he's been boring three tired gentlemen for almost an hour. As yet, there's no sign of a let-up. Oh, yes, sir, gentlemen. That watch was given to me by the Habersville Chamber of Commerce. <coughs> Pretty fine watch, isn't it? Terrific. Well, uh, L.J. Hawksburg himself made the presentation. L.J. is one of the biggest men in our town. Now, I can remember every word he said. He said, it is my pleasure and privilege to present this token of our esteem to one of our first and foremost citizens, Lawrence Wilson, for his unfailing energy as chairman, as cha chairman, he said, that's what he said, of the Habersville Morals and Clean Government Committee. Oh, fine, fine. Uh -huh. I'll bet you're some pumpkins back there in Hammersville. Uh, yeah, well, you know how it is. <clears throat> well, gentlemen, last night out, how about having a farewell drink with me? A uh, Dutch treat, of course. Yes, I figured that one out. Oh, uh, Stuart, service, please. Yes, sir. <clears throat> well, what'll it be, boys? Bourbon and soda. Make mine the same. All right, Stuart. <laughs> you know mine? Yeah, ginger ale and grape juice. Oh, come on now, Wilson, that's no drink. Oh, well, I'm sorry, fellas, but that's all I ever take. Hi, man. Hello, Ryan. Hi, fellas. Hi, Stuart. Fill her up. Hi, Wilson. How's the old sourpuss? <laughs> hey, Stuart, give the old sourpuss a drink. Thank you, Mr. Ryan, but I don't indulge. I don't indulge, eh? You're too good to drink with me, eh? I'm sorry. Good night, gentlemen. Come back here, you. Now, take it easy, Ryan. Mr. Wilson doesn't drink. I know. Grape juice Wilson. But tonight, he does. Listen, Wilson, you've snooted me long enough on this boat. Take off that stuffed shirt. Come on, knock me down. Mr. Ryan, you're inebriated. Oh, so I'm inebriated, huh? I'll show you if I'm inebriated. I'll walk a straight line with anybody on this boat. With anybody on any boat. I'll even go out there in the deck and walk along the rail. Oh, now, here, here, Ryan, don't go out on deck. Inebriated, huh? Oh, now, come back, Ryan, come inside. Let me go, I'll show you. Oh, Ryan, Ryan, you fall overboard. Let me go, I'm not going to wait now, that now, rail. listen, Ryan, old man. Yeah, uh, how's that? Right up on the rail. Oh, now come down. You're too intoxicated to realize your peril. What's this one, Wilson? Tightrope walking. I can balance myself like it. Hey. Uh oh Hey. Uh oh Now be careful. Hold me. I'm slipping. Hey, hey, let me go. Help. Oh, no, let go. Hey. Oh, oh. look out. We're both falling. Oh. Oh, oh. Let, go. Oh. let go. Let go. Oh. Let go. Oh, oh. oh. hey. Man overboard. Man overboard. Pulls Peterson and the lifeboat. Throw away there. Throw away. I saw it. I saw the whole thing. Mr. Ryan fell off the rail and Mr. Wilson jumped in to save him. Wilson, the grape juice man. He's a hero. Well, are the passengers all right, Doctor? I think they will be, Captain, but Mr. Wilson is still unconscious. Unconscious? Oh, he'll come around all right in the morning, Captain. He had a rather nasty blow on the temple. How did that happen? I'm not certain, but I believe when your men lowered the boat, one of your sailors hit him on the head with the oar. <laughs> That's the oh. stuff, Wilson, old boy. Open your eyes now. Oh, dear. Everything's fine. Wake up, pal. Oh, my. <clears throat> what happened? How do you feel, pal? Dizzy? Look at me, pal. It's your old friend, Ryan. Hmm? Ryan? You dirty rat. Come here. Oh, now, take it easy, pal. Take it easy. You slug me. No, no, pal. Honest, it wasn't me. It was a sailor with an oar. Huh? Sailor with a... Uh... Hey, wait a minute. This is a boat. I'm on a boat. What's the idea? Why was I taking off that train? What train? You know what train, you double-crossing... Wait a the... minute, look. Don't you remember me? Ryan, Doc Ryan, your oh, old shipmate? I, I never saw you before in my life. Holy smoke, you sure knocked you goofy. Why, you saved my life last night. What did I want to do that for? Gee, I don't know. I don't remember much, Mr. Wilson. Huh? What's that you called me? Mr. Wilson, your name? Look, look. look what's going on here? What's happened to me? Well, you took a dive for me last night when I fell overboard. You were socked in the head. You're a liar. I can't swim. Look, pal, that won't be a minute. The doctor's right down the corridor. Now sit down. Last night I was on my way to the fight in New York. What fight? What fight? Don't you read the papers? The shaggy smelling fight. Hey, hey, I must have missed it. I'll say you missed it by about nine years. Huh? Nine years? 
What date is this? Here, here's the ship's news. April 10th, 1941. Let me see that. 1941? It's a misprint. No, honest, pal. That's right. But, but... Oh, wait a minute. It was 1932 last night. Now, I've got to get the doctor. Now, sit down, sir. <laughs> I don't need a doctor. I need a drink. Okay, I'll ring for you. Ginger ale and grape juice. What? I want a drink, not a foot bath. Well, that's what you've been drinking. Buckets of it. What, ginger ale and grape juice? Well, there's no prohibition on these boats, is there? There's no more prohibition. Roosevelt did away with that. Roosevelt? Why, Teddy Roosevelt's no, been dead for... No, <laughs> I don't mean Teddy. I mean Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the president. He's been elected three times. Oh, he's president. Hmm. How's he doing? Fine. Look, Mr. Wilson, I'll no, go no, and get the... Why'd you keep calling me Wilson? My name's George Davis. George Davis? Hey, wait a minute. You're not the George Davis that was partners with Duke Sheldon in them con games. Well, what if I am? Well, gosh, don't be that way. After all, we're in the same business. Oh, is that so? What's your racket? Oh, I've been kind of working the boats, you know. Cards, a few tricks with the dice. Say, I get it now. You've been working this boat yourself under the name of Wilson. Oh, what are you talking about? Last thing I remember is getting on that train in 1932 to go to the fight. You mean you ain't got no line on yourself since then? No, I can't. Wait a minute. Somebody slugged me on that train in the card game. Well, what's happened since then? Where have I been? Hey, there's a name for this thing. Name for what? Perhaps a memory, lost identity. Amnesia, that's it, amnesia. Is that what you got? No, it's what I've had. A blow on the head can make you forget the past. You live on as someone else. Perhaps forever, unless... Unless, well, unless another shock, a blow brings you back to your right self. Ah, marvelous. You read about these things, you never figure them happening to yourself. Say, uh, uh, what was this Wilson like? Oh, an awful heel. I like Davis better. Thanks. All you did, I mean, all Wilson did, was talk about Habersville. Habersville? Who's he? Not he, it. It's some burg in Pennsylvania. Never heard of it. Hey, uh, wonder if Mr. Wilson has any money. He should have. You were that, I mean, uh, Wilson was the closest mug I've ever seen. How oh, was he? Well, I think it might be a good idea to take an inventory of our Mr. Wilson's luggage. Say, it's funny, ain't it? Here we are talking about you and a guy named Wilson, and you're both guys. Look at this suit. I must have borrowed that from an undertaker. What's all this stuff? Hair restorers, saltine crackers, dyspepsia tablets? Look at that, a bottle of gargle. Say, I certainly took good care of Wilson. There's a lot of papers and stuff. Boy, <laughs> were you a joiner? Rotary, Elks, Owls, Community Chest, Primrose Lake. Wait a minute. What's it? A bank book. Oh, no, we're getting somewhere. Give it a minute. Habersville National Bank. Lawrence Wilson checking account C. One hundred and forty-seven thousand dollars and eighty-three cents. One hundred and forty-seven thousand. Let me take a look at that. And that's the C account. That means there must be an A and B as well. It might even go right through the alphabet. Yeah. Say, uh, <clears throat> why wouldn't it be a good idea for Mr. Wilson to pay a visit to Habersville? Just long enough to get the money, huh? Do you think you can swing it? Well, it's worth trying. There's a fortune in this thing. Hey, Doc, how'd you like to go in on it with me? You mean it? I'll cut you in for twenty-five percent. I'd have done it for ten. After all, you saved my life. Well, look, uh, I'm going to need some money. I think I'll send a radiogram to the Habersville National Bank. I'll tell them to send me five grand to the Whitney Hotel tomorrow morning when we land. 25% <laughs> of five grand. Oh, boy, what a cut. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. There's one thing, Doc. You've got to stick close to me. If anybody starts asking questions, if I seem to be getting into a tight spot, I'll pull a feint, and don't you forget to catch me. Trust me, pal. I'll be a regular Florence Nightingale. <laughs> Uh, come on, Doc, snap it up. As we go right to the hotel, see if the Habit Bill Bank has set that... Yoo-hoo! Well, well. What's the matter? Yoo-hoo, here I am! Oh, get a load of that girl over there. There's a dish for you, huh? Wonder who she's waving to. Come on, come on, keep your mind on your work. Larry! Oh, Larry! Huh, Larry? La- La- hey, that's you. Oh, Larry, are you all right? Huh? For me? Well, sure, sure, I'm fine, I'm fine. I, I, uh, how are you? Well, Larry, the papers all said you were injured. Oh, well, nothing serious. You know how papers are. Well, it certainly is good to see you. Yes, I know you're surprised. <laughs> Surprise isn't the word. Uh, 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 Larry. Uh... <laughs> oh, excuse me. Uh, this is Doc Ryan. Doc, this is... Uh, uh, uh... <laughs> yes, sir. Good old Doc Ryan. <laughs> how are you, Dr. Ryan? Well, never met- better, miss. Thanks to Larry. 
You know, Larry, Habersville is pretty proud of that rescue. Oh, Habersville, eh? Well, well, well. Good old Habersville. Mm -hmm. Did you, uh, uh, did you just leave there? When I read you were hurt, I didn't know how seriously. Naturally, I had to come. Oh, well, naturally. Well, uh, well, it certainly is good to see you. Yes, so you said. Uh, no, well, it's worth repeating. Larry, you seem so strange. Who, me? Me? Oh, no, that's just because you haven't seen me for a while. Before you know it, uh... We'll be right back where we were. Larry, what in heaven's name is the matter with you? Nothing. Why? I, uh... Well, I'm just, uh, surprised to see you here. Well, what's so surprising about that? Habersville would think it very proper for a wife to meet her husband. Oh, I don't know about... Huh? <laughs> huh? Wife? Did you... Did she... Oh! Oh! oh. <laughs> Larry, what is it? What's the matter? Oh, nothing. Nothing at all. I'm fine. I'm just, uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'm wonderful. Oh, no, no, you're not. You're sicker than you think. You need a lot of rest and oh, quiet. Oh, nonsense, nonsense. I never felt better in my life. I'll take you to your hotel. Huh? Oh, uh, sure. Oh, now, listen, Larry. Now, go away, Doc, go away. Can't a man speak to his own wife? You'll find everything very satisfactory, sir. This suite is one of our very best. Sure, sure. Thank you very much. That's all for now. Yes, sir. <laughs> huh. Huh. Well, dear? Larry, a whole suite? It isn't like you. Oh, now the best is none too good for you, uh, Mrs. W. <laughs> well, uh, here we are, just us two. Cozy, isn't it? Uh, Larry, I'd like to talk a bit if you feel up to it. Oh, uh, talk. Uh, oh, talk, yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, of course, uh, sit down, dear. If you don't mind, I'll sit over here. Uh, I don't know quite how to begin. Huh? Begin what? Well, I've had a long time to think things over, and I've decided once and for all to go through with the divorce. The divorce? Yes. Well, uh, uh... Oh, but now, wait, you can't do that. I've made up my mind, Larry. Yes, but a divorce, why, that, that that's awful. After all, we mustn't be too hasty about this thing. I wouldn't call five years exactly hasty. Mm -hmm. Some mightn't, some mightn't. Mm -hmm. You know, a thing like a divorce, well, it can break up a marriage. So I've heard. Now, now, what's more, very often what really seemed a good reason for a divorce isn't a good reason for a divorce at all. Now, uh, take for instance, if I'd, uh, well, well, if I'd beaten you or something like that. <laughs> I'd like to see you try it. Well, then, uh, say I'd been uh, running around with some woman. You with a woman? Oh, don't be ridiculous. Oh, well, after all, you know, sometimes a vacation can change a man a lot, the sea air and all that. I'm afraid it'll take more than sea air to change you, Larry. Oh, what's the matter with me? Look, 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 let's forget the divorce and try it just once more, starting from scratch, huh? It's too late, Larry. Nonsense, it's never too late. Why, I'll tell you what we'll do. There's someone at the door. Oh, that's all right, ignore it. Go away. You might as well answer it, Larry. I'm leaving anyway. Oh, but listen. I'll be at the Shorehaven until tomorrow if you want to get the hospital. Oh, hello, Mrs. Wilson. Why, well, Mrs. Wilson. Oh, Mr. Billings, how are you? Oh, couldn't be keener, thanks. I was just leaving. I'll probably be seeing you, though. Yeah, I hope so. Goodbye. Uh, goodbye. Oh, wait, don't go. <laughs> goodbye, Larry. Well, well, Mr. Wilson, there doesn't seem to be anything wrong with you. That's what you think. <laughs> Say, Larry, I met Mr. Billings in the lobby. He came all the way from the Habersville National Bank. That's right. Bank? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> well, well, Mr. Billing, how are you? <laughs> I couldn't be keener, thanks. Oh, shall we get right down to business? Oh, yes, indeedy. I got your wireless, Mr. Wilson, and uh, here's your money. Uh, <laughs> 5,000? Yeah, 5,000. Here you are, sir. Well, well, I call that service. Me too. <laughs> now, now, let me see. These 5,000 here make you 2,700 overdrawn. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but wrong. Well, when, when you went away, you had a deposit with us, $2,800. Uh -huh. Then we paid 500 for you on that plot of land at Marsh's subdivision. <laughs> oh, by the way, here's your deed for that. All right, my dear. And, uh, and I owe the bank $2,700? Uh -huh. Oh, but the bank was only too glad to accommodate you. Uh, well, uh, what about those other accounts, the uh, B and C accounts? Oh, oh, those. <laughs> well, those are set. Oh, well, fine. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, here we are. In the C account, we have $147,000 and 83 cents. <laughs> Look, would, uh, would you repeat that, please, sort of uh, slowly? Oh, sure. <laughs> $147,000 and 83 cents. Oh. <laughs> that's the community chest account. <laughs> huh? <laughs> I said that's the community chest account. Naturally, all checks drawn on that have to be countersigned by Mr. Sims, Miss Breathway, two directors of the fund, and yourself. Oh. What about the National Guard? Don't they have to sign them, too? <laughs> 
Well, now, in the B account, which is the anti-vice league fund, we have... Uh, the the uh, anti-vice league. Uh, uh -huh. uh, I think I'd rather not know how much we have there. Oh, well, well, just you say, Mr. Wilson. Well, I'd better run along. I trust I've made everything clear. Oh, terribly clear. Give my greetings to Mr. Sims and Miss Brethwaite. Oh, you? I will indeed. I w uh, goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Oh, my. <laughs> the more I learn about Larry Wilson, the more I like termites. Raising all that good dough for the anti-vice league. You certainly were a stinker. Uh, wasn't I? <laughs> oh. Wait a minute. Now, Larry Wilson may be a dope, but in Habersville, he's trusted and respected, huh? Sure. A guy that raises thousands of dollars for a chest certainly ought to be able to raise a little for himself. Well, let's see. Mm. Well, it's Pennsylvania. How about oil? There's a lot of money in oil. Oh, we'll do it, Doc. We'll locate Duke Sheldon. He specializes in oil. We'll wire him to meet us down there. Wait a minute. What about your wife? Huh? Oh, my wife. Oh, dear. She's divorcing me. I meet a girl, and in 20 minutes, she's divorcing me. Now, Canada do that. I need her more than ever now. What for? Oh, with the divorce going on, Larry Wilson couldn't sell peanuts in a town like that. Now, where's my coat? Where are you going? To the Shorehaven. The call on the little woman. Who is it? Open this door. Take it easy. Open this door, I'll smash it down. Hey, what's the idea? Where is she? Where are you hiding her? Kay? Kay? Hey, who are you? You know very well who I am. Do I? Uh, what I mean is, uh, who do you think you are? Where is she, Larry? Come on. Well, uh, where's who? You know who. Where's Kay? She was here with you. Oh, was that Kay? Shut up. She's been here. I looked at the register. How did you know? Yes, Lawrence Wilson and wife. That's how you signed it, you dirty sneak. What do you mean by that? After all, she is my wife, isn't she? Yes, she may be your wife, but she's engaged to me. Holy smoke! <laughs> engaged to you? Now, wait. Why should Kay want to divorce me? Answer me that. You know why. Oh, do I? I mean, uh, well, of course I do, but do you? I'll say I do, and so does everybody who knows you. Why, it's written all over you. Kay wasn't married to you. Kate McLean, Kate McLean. She was married to the Rotary, the Kiwanis, the Lions, and the Greater Habersville Committee. Boy, is that big of me. Will you please get rid of your wisecracking stooge? We'll settle this thing between the two of us. There's nothing to settle. Things and people have changed. All bets are off. From now on, it's every man for himself. You promised Kay a divorce. I might have known you wouldn't keep your word, you dirty double-crossing. Oh, you've been asking for this. And you ask for this. I guess you forgot I was the amateur champ of Boonton County. Well, so long, Larry. Hiya, pal. Come on now. Wake up, pal. Wake up. Oh, dear. Mm -hmm. Boy, are you going to have a shiner? Oh, my. Well, he might at least have told me his name. Now, get me up. Where's the phone? What for? I'm going to call my wife. You don't think I'm going to take this lying down, do you? You were doing pretty well just a minute ago. <laughs> I'm going to call her and take her out to dinner. And just let that guy try to interfere, that's all. A husband has some rights in this state. Ah, ah, champagne. Good old bubbly. Hmm? Nothing like it, is there, dear? Have some more? Thank you, I've had enough. And if you ask me, Wilson, so have you. Who asked you? Look, darling, did you have to bring your bodyguard along with us? Herbert and I are engaged, Larry. Oh, yes, Herbert, and you are engaged. Mm -hmm. That's what he said this morning, didn't you, Herbert? Now, look here, Wilson. Kay and I came here tonight for only one reason. We want to know what you're going to do about the divorce. Divorce? Oh, Kay can have the divorce. She can? Yes, in a month or six weeks. But I am opposed to this unseemly haste. Somebody might get the idea my wife didn't like me. Oh, you can't fool me, Wilson. It's not Kay you're thinking of. It's the Chamber of Commerce. Huh? Of course, I might have known. Six weeks, you said. And by an odd coincidence, that happens to be the date set for the election for president of the Chamber of Commerce. Oh, now, wait. No wonder you ordered the best suite in town and dining here tonight at the most expensive restaurant. Everything you've done since you got off that boat. All for the Chamber of Commerce. Oh, well, not all. Honestly, Kay. You're just afraid a divorce will hurt your chances. But I'm not going to ruin my life so you can win an election. I should say not. Mm, very well, then. Unless Kay comes back to Habersville with me for six weeks and palms herself off as my devoted and loving wife, I'll fight the case. I would feel it my duty. If he feels it's his duty, Herbert, we're so. Mm. We'll have to give in. Herb, you're taking my wife. The least you can do is give me the Chamber of Commerce. Well... All right, you win. Mm, thanks, Herb. I believe this is your hotel, Wilson. That's right. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much, Herb. Well, good night, Kay, dear. Good night, Larry. Uh, <clears throat> Kay, uh, you think uh, that is if Herbert doesn't mind? 
If I kissed you goodbye? Now, now, listen. It's all right, Herbert. It doesn't mean anything. Oh, that's right. Another thing. I just lean this way a little, dear. <laughs> oh, go on. Lift your hat a little. <laughs> well, that's the girl. <laughs> all right, Wilson. That's enough. I said that's enough. Now, look here, Wilson. Say, what do you think this is? Now, cut it off. Let her go. For heaven's sakes. Doesn't mean a thing. <laughs> well, farewell, Kay, and don't look back. It'll be easier. So long, Herb. <laughs> Mr. DeMille presents Act Two of I Love You Again, starring Myrna Loy, Cary Grant, and Frank McHugh. Now I'm going to ask Lou Silvers to play a march for us. All right, Lou? <laughs> a march? You wouldn't get very far if you traveled at that rate of speed. Well, now listen to this. Now that's more like it. Yes. It's three times as fast. And that illustrates one important fact about new quick lux. It's three times as fast. In water as cool as your hand, new quick lux gives you suds three times as fast as any of ten other leading soaps. Not just twice as fast, three times as fast. That's one reason so many women prefer lux flakes, Mr. Ruick. Yes, indeed, Sally. And there are other reasons. Of course. We know we can count on lux for purity. That's right, Sally. You see, some soaps contain harmful alkali which weakens fabrics and fades colors. But new Quick Lux hasn't a bit of harmful alkali. It's safe for anything safe in plain water. And a little goes so far, it's thrifty, too. No wonder twice as many women use Lux flakes for stockings, underthings, sweaters, and nice dresses. Twice as many as use any other flakes, chips, or beads. Buy a big box of new Quick Lux flakes tomorrow for your pretty washer. It's fast, thrifty, and so gentle that it keeps things new looking longer. You'll find new quick lux at your groceries in the same familiar package at no extra cost to you. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. of I Love You Again, starring Myrna Loy as Kay and Cary Grant as Larry, with Frank McHugh as Doc. Larry Wilson, amnesia victim and confidence man extraordinary, is piecing together the jigsaw puzzle of a life he doesn't remember. And with a wife like Kay as one of the principal parts, he's looking forward to finishing the picture. Traveling by separate compartments, they've taken the train back home to Habersville, but to avoid gossip, they get off arm in arm with Doc Ryan, two steps to the rear. Ah, oh, Habersville. Good old Habersville. Why, the very air smells different in Habersville. That's the glue factor. Oh. Hey, Larry, look. It's a welcome committee. Oh, for me? Of course, you know you're a hero. Hi, young Larry. Hi, young Larry. Well, it's great to be back. Oh, oh Larry. Larry. Larry, darling, let me see you. Huh? Oh, hello. Oh, Larry, I'm so proud. Let me kiss you, darling. Hey, extra, extra. I got the boy for me now. Scram, babe. Eh? Oh, dear. Hello, Mother. Key, darling. Mother? Oh, oh, Mother. Well, well, how are you, Mother? Doesn't she look wonderful, Kay? My mother usually looks all right. Uh, oh, your mother? Sure. Well, that's what I mean. She looks fine. You're looking wonderful yourself. But you've so. changed, Larry. Oh, what is well, it? vacation, you know. Nothing like a vacation to change a man. Larry, here's Mayor Carver. Oh, hello, my boy. Welcome home. Well, well. <laughs> hello, Mayor Carver. How's the old chief executive? Habersville's mighty proud of you, my boy. And here's Habersville's highest award. The key to our city. Well, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, folks. And now, Larry, it's my proud privilege to present a gift on behalf of the municipal band. A solid silver bugle. Yeah. A solid... Oh, yeah. Well, thank you, man. Much obliged, fellas. And now I hope you lead us all in singing the Habersville Town song, your own brilliant composition. Huh? <clears throat> oh, yeah. Well, yes, of course. Well, Larry, suppose <laughs> you start us off with the fanfare on your new bugle. Uh-huh. Uh, 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 fanfare? I mean, uh, uh, fanfare on the bugle? That's mm. it. 
Go right ahead now, Shut Shut up. Get behind me quick. <clears throat> Well, uh, well, here we go. <laughs> now, you see, you see, I, 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 oh, oh, oh. Mary, oh, good oh, evening, oh, David. Good evening, Mary. Dr. Wright. Mary, my poor boy. Stand back, everybody, please. <laughs> she just couldn't stand all this happiness. Get an ambulance. Larry. Larry, are you asleep? No, oh, come in, Mother. What time is it? It's after ten. Feel better? Oh, I feel fine. Uh, where's Kay? In her room. Hmm? Now, Larry, about Kay. I know the whole story, and it's ridiculous. Yes, yeah, well, I hope you brought her to her senses, Mother. Not yet, but I will. Good, good old Mother. When? The idea. You in this room, her over there across the hall for a whole year. I don't know how you could do such a thing. Oh, well, neither do I. Oh, but we're going to change all that. I've come to stay for a while. I'm taking the porch room, which should have been a nursery long ago. Oh, Mother. Don't, don't argue. Well, who's arguing? But you can't win Kay back with a stuffed squirrel. Uh, huh? A stuffed what? Those animals you're always stuffing. You've got to stuff it, Larry. I've been stuffed. Mother, believe me, I'll never stuff another animal as long as I live. <laughs> and now you better try to get some sleep. All right. Good night, Monty. Good night. <laughs> Me, Larry. What do you want? Uh, well, I, uh, I'm hungry. Well, look at the ice Oh. Oh, well, all right, dear. Don't you bother. I'll get my own food. <laughs> that is, if I don't faint again before I get there. Well, good night, dear. All right, wait a minute. Okay. Would you like some eggs? Well, more than anything in the world. Almost. Well, come on down to the kitchen. Okay. Okay, you don't know what this means to me. Never mind the center. We're going down to eight. Here you are, darling. More toast? No. Champagne? No. Coffee? A little. Ah, good. You know, I can't get over it. The last time we had champagne in this house was three years ago on New Year's Eve. And the boss came to dinner. And even that was a bottle my mother gave us for Christmas. Well, I wish you'd forget about the past, Kay. The fact of the matter is, I changed quite a bit lately. Oh, no, not you, <laughs> You couldn't change any more than one of your stuffed owls could change. Oh, but Kay. No, I feel awfully good. Awfully, awfully good. <laughs> you do? <laughs> oh, well, that's fine. Here, uh, um, let me fill up your cup. You know, I'm sort of sorry. Uh, sorry? <laughs> I'm sort of sorry I'm not in love with you anymore. Because if I were still in love with you, I'd be awfully in love with you right now. <laughs> Kay, Kay. I'd like to show you the most wonderful game of two-handed post office. I think I'd better drink my coffee now. Yeah, but listen, Kay, how about the post... Listen, we'd better have an understanding. I'm in this house simply because of our agreement mm -hmm. to convince the general public that I'm still your wife. Well, all right, convince me I'm one of the public. That strikes me as a pretty foul thing to say about the public. Okay, you're certainly making me pay for those scrambled eggs. You're not even eating them. Well, I'm not hungry. Oh, you're not. Uh that is, I mean, uh, well... Oh, you're not hungry. I see. You got me out of bed and spoiled my sleep, but you're not hungry. Well, I'm not really, I guess. You don't want to eat your nice scrambled eggs? No, dear. Then how would you like to wear them over your ears? Kate! Good night. Hello, Mrs. Wilson. How's my patient? Insufferable. Hi, Larry. How'd you make out with her? Just dandy. Hey, what have you got in your head? Scrambled eggs. What do you think? <laughs> I didn't know. No. What'd you find out in town? It's pie. Well, the town's loaded with dough. Just right for an oil boom. Not so loud. Did you phone the hotel? Yeah, Sheldon just got in. He's going to plant the oil tomorrow. Good. Now, uh, now, what about me? You're the manager of a big pottery works here. What? Oh, I make pots? Yeah. You may not have any money, but you've certainly got plenty of pots. Oh, <laughs> pots. That's just what I've always wanted. A whole lot of... Pots. <laughs> well, Larry, it was fine. That whole thing, yes, indeed. No, Welcome no, back, no, Mr. Wilson. The office hasn't been the same without you. Oh, thank you, boys. Thank you very much. Right now, we've all got our little jobs to attend to. That's right, boys. On the job now. Oh, say, Mr. Wilson, yes? I've got some great news. 
70 hours from kill to shipping. Oh, fine. Now, uh, shall we bear down on the jigger wheel or on the pug mill? Uh, uh, oh, on the uh, bugger wheel. <laughs> By all means. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Wilson, your wife is here. Yeah, my wi- oh, my wife, yes. Well, send her in. Outside, everybody. To your jobs, please. Well, uh, hello, Kay. Hello, Larry. What would you like to hit me with this morning? I can recommend the inkwell. <laughs> the inkwell, right there. I'm not going to apologize. You were terribly aggravated. Oh, well, then I'll apologize. I should have ducked. Larry, it's the 15th. Hmm? Well, certainly it's the 15th. By all means, the 15th. That means tomorrow is the 16th. <laughs> oh, dear. What? Something wrong? It's just continually amazing to me the things you can think of to keep from writing a check. A check? Oh, yeah, the 15th, yes. I guess we've established that, all right. Well, now, just slip a mind, Kay. All the excitement of getting home, you know, and... Uh... Well, now, let me see now. That, uh... That would be how much? You know perfectly well how much. And don't try to tell me that slipped your mind. Well, no, certainly not. Now, uh... Mm, uh well, what about $200? What? Well, j- just for the time being, of course. If you run short, just call on me. Well, don't wake me up. Let me dream. Well, goodbye. I'm going shopping. Oh, no. We're going shopping. You need a man's advice. No, thanks. The last time I went shopping with you, I ended up in a cut-price Mother Hubbard. Yes, yes, and today you may end up in a creation by Charmaine. Come on. Just a minute. Where did you learn about Charmaine? Hmm? Oh, uh, uh, I read about it on the boat. I see. Do you know how much a Charmaine creation might cost? Yeah, about a hundred, two hundred. What's the difference? Larry, do you mind if I just faint quietly? <laughs> Tea. Ah, yes, tea. Nothing like tea after a hard day's shopping, is there? Just look at the rain out there. And here we sit warm and cozy. I love this place. Well, so do I. Now, look, uh, you see those tea leaves? You want your fortune told? Please. Well, uh, here we go. <clears throat> I, uh, I see someone in your life. It's a man. No. Mm, yes, it is. It's a tall, dashing, handsome man with a striped tie, just like mine. Go on. Well, isn't that enough? He's tall, he's handsome, and uh, very dashing. That's what puzzles me, the dashing. It's there, all right, and I don't understand it. Oh, nothing at all. Give me your cup. I tell fortunes, too. All right. Well, uh, well, see anybody I know? Mm-hmm. It's a woman. Wonderful. What does she look like? Suppose you tell me. Well, uh, she's about five foot five, lovely complexion, hair just like yours. Seriously, Larry, I'd like to know what she's like. Who? The woman. The one who taught you about Charmaine and dancing and, and being dashing? Oh, uh, oh, her. Where'd you meet her, on the boat? Uh, yes, yeah, sort of. Of course, if you don't want to talk about it. Well, no, there's really not much to talk about. I mean, uh, nothing's really happened yet. Oh, but it will, Larry. I'm sure of it. Honey, honey, if you're sure of it, that's good enough for me. I know it's none of my business, but, uh... I've been worried that you might have changed like this, you know, to please me. And maybe patch things up. But, of of course, that's out of the question. My plans are all made with Herbert. Ah, oh, Herbert. <laughs> should have stuffed Herbert. That's all I should have done. <laughs> Herbert. Have you ever taken a good look at Herbert? Now, listen here, Larry. Don't spoil everything. Why, you can take a good look at him now. He's just outside the window making faces at us. Look at the poor man. Oh, my goodness. I had a date with Herbert. He'll never forgive me standing out there in the rain. Poor thing. Goodbye, Larry. Wait, wait. You can have him clean the press. You look just as good as new. Oh, keep quiet. <laughs> Mother dear. Larry, listen. Herbert's been here all evening. He just left. I don't like it. Well, neither do I, Mother, but what can I do? You can go and speak to Kay about it. Yeah. Where is she? In her room. And if you have to, kick in the door. Oh, Mother, you pioneer woman. <laughs> See you later. Who is it? It's me, Larry. Open the door or I'll kick it down. Open the door, you hear me? It is open. Oh. Oh! <laughs> well, uh, <clears throat> hello. I, <laughs> I thought it was locked. Well, suppose it had been. I would have kicked it down. What for? Well, <laughs> so I could come in. Larry, I've just spent two hours straightening things out with Herbert. Don't you think you've gotten me into enough trouble for today? No. Sometimes you remind me of a high school boy on a street corner, whistling at girls. Mm, well, it's romantic to whistle at the opposite sex. Birds do it. Lovebirds. Lovebirds don't whistle. They coo. They do, too, so whistle. Sort of a low cooing whistle, like this. 
Gets you, doesn't it? <laughs> Not particularly. Oh, it gets me. I once knew of a case where a female lovebird locked a male lovebird out of her nest. He stood outside and cooed for hours. Oh, it's pitiful. Poor fella. Finally, he lost his temper and kicked the door of the cage down. And what do you think the female lovebird did then? Gave him a sharp peck at the base of the skull. Not at all. She put her soft little wing around him and sighed. And laid him an egg. sakes, leave me alone. Oh, okay. I haven't done anything. Oh, you haven't. You've done everything you could think of to make me miserable. Okay, what have I done? I suppose you didn't take me out and buy me the most expensive clothes in town. Was that bad? And I suppose you didn't say nice things and pay me dozens of compliments and try your best to please me. You were just as nice and sweet and kind as you could be, and you know it. Oh, well, when you put it that way, I guess I've been a heel. (laughs) You're not getting anywhere, and I wish you'd stop it. Hmm? I want you to be yourself. Your owl-stuffing, speech-making, pompous old self. Oh, well, now, let's get this clear. You're upset because I'm acting as though I found you lovely. Yes. But you are lovely. There you go again. Oh, well, I was only... Larry! Now, I've got something to tell you, and I don't want you to say another word. Not a word? Just keep quiet, understand? Well, all right. You said before that I was lovely, Mm -hmm. attractive Mm -hmm. to you. Well, that's not so. It's your pride, that's all. You're losing me, so suddenly I seem worth holding on to. But it isn't me. It's just the idea of ever giving up anything that ever belonged to you. You don't love me, and you never did. Public opinion is the only thing you love. Public opinion, public buildings, public positions. That's why I resent your attentions, and that's why my door is going to stay locked as long as I'm in this house. Now, if you've got anything to say, please make it short. Oh? <laughs> oh, you get out of here. <laughs> oh, no, gosh, Kay, there's nothing to cry about. I was only... Oh, please go away. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> Mr. Demille returns in a moment for Act Three of I Love You Again, starring Cary Grant, Myrna Loy, and Frank McHugh. But now, it's a lovely summer night. But Anne's not dancing. She's upstairs, all alone, packing her bags. There, that's done. Tomorrow morning I can get away from here, thank goodness. I hate it. I've been so lonely. So awfully lonely. Darn that music. Poor Anne. Of course she's unhappy. Planning all year for that two weeks vacation full of fun and dates and dances. Only to have it turn out a miserable, lonely failure. Libby... What would you say to girls like Anne? Well, there's one thing I'd like to say to Anne and to all the thousands of girls who are planning weekends and vacations now. It's just this. If you're looking forward to good times, new friends, perhaps romance, then be sure that everything you wear is fresh and sweet and dainty. For neglect of daintiness is one of the surest reasons for finding yourself left out of things. Not invited, not one of the crowd. People won't tell you what's the matter. They just leave you alone. It's cruel, but it's true. The only thing to do is never, never take chances. And after all, it's very easy to protect daintiness nowadays because new quick lux takes away perspiration fast. It takes only a minute or so to lux under things every night, and then you know you won't offend. Dresses need frequent luxing, too, and that's just as easy. Any dress safe in water, you know, is safe in lux. I'm sure if Anne had taken Libby's advice, she would have felt something like this as she packed her bags at the end of her vacation. I guess everything's packed. My, I hate to leave and say goodbye to everybody. But Bob says he won't let me say goodbye to him. Oh, it's been such a wonderful time. Just perfect. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. The curtain rises on the third act of I Love You Again. There's no use arguing with Kay Wilson because her mind's made up. The door's been closed on Larry and he's shut out of her life. In his office the next morning, Larry has decided to go through with his oil swindle and call it quits. It's a cinch, pal. Duke's got an option on all the land surrounding yours. Now, here's the map. Mm-hmm. Is that my land there? That's it, Marsh Creek. Marsh Creek, huh? 
Well, what about the oil? Duke planted it all over the place. It's oozing up through the creek to beat the band. But nobody's given it a tumble yet. Say, it might take weeks for anybody to see it out there in that jungle. Yeah, well, we'd have to fix that somehow. Marsh Creek, huh? Have to get the yokels down there. Did you get a line on any of them? Did I? Take a look at this. All the big income tax brackets. Mm-hmm. Leonard Hawksburg. Boom. Look at that. An income of 210 grand. Edward Littlejohn, 131,000. If we could only get a couple of these old boys to go swimming in that creek. Yeah, swimming in oil up to their necks. How are we going to do it? Oh, Mr. Wilson. Uh, yes, Miss, uh, Miss, uh... Is it all right for Corporal Bellison now? Uh, what do you mean, is it all right? It's Thursday, you know. Oh, that's right, so it is. Who is Corporal Bellinson? Oh, who is Corporal Bellinson? You tell him, Miss... Uh, Why, Miss, he has uh, a ranger medallion, two silver stars, and a community stripe. Then? You don't say. You may come in, Corporal. Good morning, sir. Corporal Bellinson reporting to Scout Leader Wilson. Scout Leader? Who's that scout? Why, <laughs> good morning, Corporal. Mr. Wilson, the troop is very proud of you, sir. That rescue at sea. Well, thank you. It's 2 o'clock, Mr. Wilson. The troop's outside already. Where are they going? Well, that's up to Mr. Wilson. Oh, uh, he can't go this morning. Well, it's Hawksburg's test today, sir. It is out of the question. Uh, 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 wait. <laughs> Did you say Hawksburg? Well, yes, sir. What, you mean uh, <clears throat> Leonard Hawksburg's little boy? Sure, Junior. He's been waiting for you to get back to take the test for first class ranger. And so is Little John. Uh, uh, little little oh. John, eh? Uh, well, of course, yes. Oh, well, I've worked out a special test for today, a sort of a test by water. You remember, Doc, we were just talking about the water test? Of course, very interesting. That's splendid, sir. But first, how about shooting the buck? All right, I'll fade it. Dr. Ryan. <laughs> I'm ashamed of you, Corporal. Gambling at your age. What? <clears throat> this morning, Corporal, we have a new test. Brand new. Really, sir? Yes, indeed. The swimming test. Tell the men we're leaving in ten minutes for uh, Marsh Creek. Mr. Wilson, sir. Yes, Corporal? We've just taken the test, sir, and I'd like to report that the whole troop is all over tar. Tar? Well, where did you get tar on you? In the creek, sir. Oh, Corporal, this is terrible. Tell the troop to report to their homes. I imagine their fathers will find a way to take it off. Troop 7, report home and get the tar washed off. Well, come in, Mr. Hawksburg. Come in, gentlemen. (laughs) Sit right down. How are you, Larry? Fine. Uh, This is uh, Dr. Ryan. Mr. Hawksburg, doctor. How are you? How do you do? This is Mr. Little John, Mr. Bell. How do you do, sir? Well, well see gentlemen, to what do I owe this visit? <clears throat> Larry, I'll come right to the point. The responsible element of this town wants to do something concrete to show our appreciation for what you've done for Haverford. Oh, come now, gentlemen. I've done nothing. You've done a lot, Larry. Of course, my boy. And this is what we've decided to do. You own a piece of land here near Mars Creek. Yes, I believe I do. Well, the state is building a new highway through the suburbs, and we've brought some pressure to see that it runs out through your land. We can take it off your hands at a good profit. Well, now, that's awfully decent of you. I only paid 2500 for that piece, you know. Now, what would you say to a check for $10,000? A cool profit of 7500 Why? Why, that's 300% of my investment. Oh, it's too much. We feel you've got it coming to you, Larry. Of course, oh, my boy. You make me feel like a profiteer. Not at all, not Excuse at all. Excuse me, gentlemen. Somebody at the door. Well, Larry, my boy, what do you say? Oh, it's a deal, gentlemen. Splendid. I've got a check right here. Oh, I've got the deed right here someplace. <laughs> I must see Mr. Wilson at once, sir. It's a matter of the utmost importance. But he's busy. Can't be disturbed. He can and will be disturbed. Now, just a minute, you. Stand aside, sir. Sorry to intrude, gentlemen. Which one of you is Mr. Wilson? Well, uh, I am Mr. Wilson, sir. Thank you. My name is Sheldon, Colonel E.J. Sheldon. Oh, well, uh, how do you do, Colonel? Mr. Wilson, I'll be brief. You're owner of Marsh's subdivision, I believe. Oh, yes. Splendid. I'm prepared to make you a handsome offer for that land. $25,000. Uh, what? You mean that? I am not in the habit of joking, sir. Oh, well, Colonel Shelton must have heard about the new road. New road? I know of no road. I'm in the gravel business, Mr. Wilson, and your land contains valuable deposits of this substance. Uh, gravel on my land? Why, it's ridiculous. Of course it is. Larry, we'll match his offer dollar for dollar. Uh, you of will? Why, that's wonderful. Yes, indeed. Larry, what are you doing? Are you selling the lot you own? No, not yet, Kay, but it looks like I will. You know what's on the land? Uh, well, yes, dear. Yes, I know all about the gravel deposits. Gravel deposits? My foot. It's oil. Huh? Oh, just oil. a wild rumor. Just a wild rumor, I'm sure. It These isn't things a wild rumor. And... This is oil. Gobs of it. I just heard about it. Oil, eh? Colonel Sheldon, you've no right to come in and try to swindle one of our town's leading citizens. Uh, of course Permit not. me to inform you that I have options on all the surrounding land. I'll give you 100000 for a half interest in your property, Mr. Wilson. Now, look here, Colonel oh, Sheldon. I couldn't think of it. My final offer is 200000 Now, wait a minute. Uh, Colonel Sheldon, suppose we buy you up. With what? With hard cash. How much do you want for your up? I 
own four parcels. I'll take 50,000 each. All right, it's a deal. We'll meet later tonight and sign all the papers. Yeah, yes, yes right. indeed. <laughs> That was great work, pal. A clean profit of 200,000 smackers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what happened to Kay? Kay? Oh, I saw her go out a minute ago with a letter in her hand. Say, that reminds me. How did she know about the oil? That's what I want to find out. Okay, okay. Wait a second. Hello, Larry. Uh, if your arm is going my way, I'll give it a lift. Thanks. Well, I deduce from your lack of hat as well as the envelope in your hand that you're going to mail a letter. Yes, to Herbert. Mm -hmm. I'm still so mad I could explode. Those crooks pretending to be your friends. And Herbert's no better. He acted as though I were a common thief. Thought I ought to be glad of a chance to pick a pocket legally. Oh, so that was how you knew. Yes, Herbert came to me. He wanted me to get the land from you. Larry, you're the only honest one in the whole crowd. <coughs> me? <laughs> you're really too good for this town. Uh, no, not really. Oh, here's the mailbox. And that's that. Uh, <laughs> exit Herbert? Exit Herbert. Oh. I want to walk. Let's go up on top of the hill, shall we? Delighted. Isn't it a lovely view from here? Yeah. Yes, certainly worth the climb. Larry, don't tell me you've forgotten this place. Huh? Oh, forgot. Oh, no. How could I forget it? It was right about here. No, no. I would have said it was a little more to the left. I think you're right. Remember what you said? Uh, vaguely. You said, Kay, darling, marriage is the soundest investment two people can make. Ooh. Did I say... Oh. Kay, whatever made you marry me? Well, I felt that underneath that watch chain with all its large pins and trophies, there was another person, an exciting person, the sort of man I dreamt about marrying. Yes, he wasn't really there, though, was he? Oh, yes. But I didn't find him for a long time. I'm sorry I didn't find him sooner. Oh, now, don't apologize for what you thought about me. You were right. You're still right. I was terribly wrong. But I was afraid of falling in love with you again. Ah, uh, well, if you were afraid then, you should be twice as afraid now. I don't understand that, Larry. Ah, oh, darling, I hope you never will. Well, I'd better be getting back. Come on, let's go. Wait a minute. You make me sick, Larry. Huh? If there's anything that turns my stomach, it's a man who acts noble. Noble? You know darn well you love me. You're just being noble and giving me up because something's wrong. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to find out. Oh, now, Kay, wait. Ever since you got off that boat, you've been chasing me like, like an amorous goat. You've been trying your darndest to make me fall in love with you. And now you have. Now, I'm going to do the chasing. And believe me, brother, before I'm through, you're going to know you've been chased. Kiss me. Well? Oh, I know it right now. <laughs> Come on, pal. You've got to get over to Duke's room. All those big shots are going to be there. Larry, what's the matter with you? Doc, how'd you like to work in my pottery mill? What's the angle? Making pots. What do you think? It's a chance to eat regularly and sleep regularly. Maybe have a little home of your own with a porch and a garden. Gee, sounds wonderful. Well, I'm glad you like it, Doc, because that's what we're going to do. What? You're crazy. We can't stay here after the oil deal. Uh, you know, you're not very quick today, Doc. The oil deal is off. Huh? What, uh, uh, what about the Duke? Oh, uh, yeah, the Duke to consider. I don't think Duke cares much for home and the kid is. He's just a wee bit mercenary. Yeah, and he likes money, too. <laughs> However, I may as well get it over with. It may be a tough fight, but I'm not afraid. Not much I'm not. Mm. Don't do it, Larry. I seen you fight in one fight and you were awful. I, I tell you, he'll tear you to bits. He'll cripple you. He'll chew your head off. Let me go with you, just in case. No, thanks, Doc. This is my job. I'll phone you when it's over, if I'm able. Larry. Larry, wait. Listen. He'll be murdered. He'll be... Mrs. Wilson. Mrs. Wilson, where are you? <laughs> What do you mean the deal's off? What kind of a double cross have you and Ryan cooked up? Well, I'm through with rackets, Duke, that's all. You're not through with this one. Look, friend, this has been a hard winter. I haven't made a killing in months. If this is a rib, stop it, because it's not funny. It's not a rib, Duke, and it's not a double cross. I'm staying here in Habersville with my wife. Save your breath, pal. This moonlight and roses, who he don't fool me. You and that dame are up to something. You're wrong. She doesn't know a thing about it. Hello, darling. What? What? Kay! She don't know, huh? 
Kay, what are you doing here? It's all right, Larry. I just had a talk with Dr. Ryan. He told me everything about you. What? Larry, I had to let her in. I just couldn't help it. Shut up. Kay, I want you to go home. Nobody's going home. Now, she's got nothing to do with this, Duke. Let her go. My friend, I'm going to brain you. You overgrown bull, don't you dare lay a hand on him. Shut your trap, madam. <laughs> now, you listen to me, Wilson. If you and this Tootsie want to play house when we get the cash, okay. But this car goes right to the end of the line and nobody gets out till it gets there. You can't give me orders, you crook. That's right, lady. I'm a crook. What do you think he is, a Bible salesman? I don't care if he was an axe murderer. That's all finished. Ah, I've seen him in love before. It usually lasts four to six weeks. That's a lie. Lady, generally speaking, I never sock a dame. But I'm inclined to make an exception for you. All right, Duke. You asked for it. Ooh. Okay, pal, just slip this on for size. <laughs> oh, how dare you? You've killed him. I hope so. Water. Give him water. Oh, get the water pitcher. Oh, Larry. Larry, darling, look at me. Here's the water. <laughs> help, 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 help. I'm, I'm drowning. Oh, Larry, my poor darling. Kay. But Kay, how did you get on the boat? Oh, this is all your fault, Ryan. Your drunken behavior was inexcusable. Hey, it's coming back. Lie still, darling. Don't talk. You'll be all right in a minute. All right, Davis, get up and quit stalling. Uh, Davis. Uh, were you addressing me, sir? What do you think? Well, I'm afraid I don't know you. Holy Ike, he's back again. <laughs> Wait a minute. This isn't the boat. What's happened? Is he loony? Did I knock him goofy? Worse. You've ruined everything. What am I going to do with him now? Davis. George, don't you know me? Dukey. Duke Sheldon, huh? Oh, Duke Sheldon? Well, I'm very flattered to meet you, Your Highness. Oh, what do we do? You think of something. You sucked him. Ah, uh, look, pal, pull yourself together. We got a big deal on. Oh, well, if you'll call in my officer, I'll be glad to show you our full line of pots. Pots? The guy's nuts. I'm getting out of here. Now, listen, you Get can't... out of my way. I'm getting out. Goodbye, Your Highness. All of me out. Come back here. You hear me? You can't get away with this. Oh, Larry. Larry, darling. Yes, dear? You... you've forgotten everything, haven't you? Of course not. I mean, when he hit you, you're Lawrence Wilson again. Uh, do you suppose if you got hit on the head again, you might be George Davis? Hey, wait, put down that vase. I've got to do it, darling. Oh, no, 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 listen, listen to me. Well? Kay, dear, Kay! Well? <laughs> Mr. DeMille brings news of next week's show in just a moment, and Cary Grant and Myrna Loy will return for their curtain calls. Meantime, a question for the ladies in our audience. How many years do you think women have been wearing silk stockings? Well, the answer is more than 250 years. Yes, good Queen Bess of England was presented with a pair of hand-knit black silk stockings way back in the 16th century. But today's filmy silks and nylons are a far cry from the bulky, heavy hose of Queen Elizabeth's day. Why, some of the newest nylons, for example, are so sheer you can read a newspaper through six layers of stockings. And now for another question. What do the people who make today's lovely stockings say about their care? Well, that's an easy question to answer. More than 90% of the hundreds of makers of silk and nylon stockings the country over, more than 90% of them recommend Lux Flakes. Now, that's expert advice, and you'll find it pays. For new quick lux saves the vital elasticity of your stockings, the quality that helps them to give under strain, then spring back without running. You see, if you rub sheer hosiery with a cake of soap, or if you use flakes or chips containing harmful alkali, you're weakening the fibers. Soon, a thread may break. Then you've got to run. And the smooth texture, the color of your stockings may be spoiled, too. So for stocking beauty, and for longer stocking wear... Always stick to gentle, new, quick Lux Flakes. They're fast, thrifty, and safe. There's enough Lux in that generous big box to do your stockings for months. Now, here's Mr. DeMille with our stars. The spotlight turns to Myrna Loy and Cary Grant again. We'll just say, we love them again, and I love you again. I bet he says that to all the actors, Myrna. I thought it was very nice. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. <laughs> so it's been a long time since we worked together, Cary. Years, isn't it? Yeah, five to be exact. 
Let's see, that makes our date next date on uh, Monday, 1946, isn't it? It'll be a Monday, <laughs> all right. <laughs> a Monday night in the Lux Radio Theater, but it won't be five years. What, Mr. DeMille? You want us to come back right away? Right away, Carrie. Ooh. You like the performance that much? That much and more. Oh, well, now, why don't you save yourself a lot of bookkeeping, C.B., and pay us both for the, uh, for both jobs right now, huh? <laughs> uh, may maybe I'd better call you in 1946, Carrie. <laughs> What's your play here next week, Mr. DeMille? Next week, Myrna, we've scheduled one of the most exciting combinations of mystery and glamour that the screen has ever produced. The play is Algiers, and the stars are Charles Boyer and Hedy Lamarr. <laughs> You'll hear Charles... <laughs> uh, uh, You'll hear Charles Boyer as Pepe Lamoco. <laughs> the same great... <laughs> The same great role he played in the Walter Wanger picture. And you'll hear Hedy Lamarr as the girl who found an irresistible attraction in the man who lived outside the law. You're all invited to sail for Algiers next Monday night. And I hope nobody will miss the boat. Well, that sounds swell, C.B. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Good night. Good night. An A plus for both of you. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theatre presents Charles Boyer and Hedy Lamar in Algiers. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Myrna Loy appeared tonight through the courtesy of Metro Golden Mayor and is currently seen on the screen in their production of Love Crazy. Terry Grant has just finished making the RKO production, Before the Fact, directed by Alfred Hitchcock, and Frank McHugh is now appearing in the Warner Brothers picture, Manpower. Included in tonight's play were Arthur Q. Bryan as Duke Sheldon, Jack Arnold as Herbert, Jane Morgan as Mother, Dix Davis as Corporal Bellinson, and Ferdinand Meunier, Ralph Sedan, Earl Ross, Tyler McVeigh, and Betty Ventura. Our music is directed by Louis Silvers, and your announcer has been Melville Ruick. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salud. Your health, senor. The world toasts Roma, and Roma toasts the world. The wine for your table is Roma, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the man in black. Here for Roma Wines to introduce this weekly half hour of Suspense. Tonight in Hollywood, we are honored and happy to have with us one of the entertainment world's most distinguished gentlemen, Mr. Cary Grant. The suspense play which stars Cary Grant and which is produced and directed by William Spear is the exciting and tense bestseller by Cornell Woolrich called The Black Curtain. Suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series, Roma brings you tales calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so, with the Black Curtain and with the performance of Cary Grant, we again hope to keep you in... Suspense! Again, or rather life began again for me, I guess you'd say, that day, on that street. My head was pounding terribly. I could hear all the noise and the people milling around. Everything was a jumble at first. All right. Gang way there now. Let the doc through. I see that happen, Mr. Policeman. He was running. Boy, he really gave himself a clunk on the beat. 
All right, son. Now get back there. Everybody back oh, there. Oh, my Take head. Easy, His wallet fell out of his pocket, and a big boy grabbed it and ran away. He All went right, up... now back, everybody. Let the doctor through. Give him air no. here. I'm okay. No, never mind, Doc. I'm okay. Seems to be not a much the matter with you, sir. No, I'm all right. Yes, oh. I can talk to him now, Doc. Oh, go ahead, officer. Just a bad bump on the head, I think. That's right. We can walk all right, can't you? No, I think so. Ah, sure. Here, now let me press you on. Huh? Thanks, thanks. Well, I'll right. be fine. Hey. hey, wait a minute. What am I doing with an overcoat? All on? right now, mister. Just so they got it on the blotter. What's your name? Where do you live? Uh, Townsend. Frank Townsend. 820 Rutherford Street. I uh, want a cigarette. You're still shaking. No, no, thanks. I don't smoke. Well, I'll be getting back then. Drop in at the receiving hospital if you want us to check you off. Right? Yeah, I will. Hey, here's your hat, mister. I found it. Oh, thanks, That's kid. That's all. Now, come on. Move along. The guy's all right. Come on. Oh, well, thanks. I'm sorry about the fellow that got your wallet. Anyway, here's your cigar case, Mr. Townsend. Guy found it right alongside of you. Hey, now, wait a minute. This isn't my hat. D.N. Those aren't my initials, D.N. Sure, that's your hat. I seen it roll off you when you went down. Try it on. You see, it fits. Looks good. <sighs> but what am I doing with a cigar case? D.N. Same initials as the hat. Uh, don't you even know your own hat, mister? Uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm trying to think. Where is this? What? This street. You're on Tillery Street. T- Tillery Street? What am I doing on Tillery Street? <laughs> All right, now, sir. My suggestion is that you go on home and go lie down. It's cold and starting to snow. No, no, please, wait a minute. Don't leave me. Tell me. What happened? Why, you slipped on this icy sidewalk. Fell down and hit your head good and hard on the curb. You were out for about 20 minutes and then you... Wait, wait, Ice on a sidewalk? Well, look at it. That street cleaning department ought to clear away the snow there, too. Snow and ice? Sure, why? Snow? In July? July? Oh, it's December. December 1943. 1943? Uh, you better go on home, son. Good night. 1943? December 1943. The last I remember was July 1940. Three years, just gone. Amnesia. A black curtain comes down over your mind. That black curtain had been over mine for three years. Where had I been? Who had I been? I hadn't been Frank Townsend. I'd been someone else. D.N. Someone whose initials were D.N. I walked along Tillery Street thinking about it those three years. I could have been married. I could have been a thief. I could have... Something made me turn around on the street for a moment. That was when I first saw him. Gray eyes. He'd been talking to the cop who took my name. He looked up as I did. And then he started to walk rapidly in my direction. I backed away instinctively. Something about him spelled trouble. He called to me as he came forward. Hey, you stop! Townsend! Instinctively, I knew I should run and get away from him. Hey, you! I looked back as I rounded the corner. He had a gun in his hand. He raised it. Then I turned and ran for my life. What lay behind that black curtain which separated Townsend from his past? With this remarkable story... And with Hollywood's distinguished Cary Grant as our star, the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, tonight assumes the sponsorship of Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. This is the dinner hour at an exclusive yacht club in Latin America. And we discreetly eavesdrop on that gentleman and his lady there at the table. This has been a lovely dinner, Ramon. And only you would have thought to have such a delicious wine as the finale. It was so perfect. Is it truly a wine from California in North America? Yes, see? This is the noted Roma port of California in the United States. We were fortunate to have it tonight, for now, in time of war, on the occasional ships can bring us Roma wines. I knew that you would... Fortunate? Yes, for Roma wines please the exacting tastes of wine lovers in many countries. And we in the United States are most fortunate of all. Or we can enjoy any of those delicious wines from the famous Roma wineries 
located in choice wine districts throughout California at prices unbelievably small for wines of such distinguished character. Because we do not have to pay heavy shipping costs and duty, here at home in America, Roma wines cost only a few cents a glass. What's more, you'll find Roma California wines just around the corner at your favorite dealers. Right there, waiting for you now, the types of Roma wines you most enjoy. So if you haven't yet discovered the delight of Roma wine regularly with meals or when entertaining friends, make your first purchases of Roma tomorrow. R-O-M-A, Roma, America's largest selling wines. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. And now it is with pleasure that we bring back to our soundstage Mr. Kerry Grant and the Black Curtain, a story well calculated to keep you in suspense. Why was he following me? With a gun? What did Gray Eyes want with me? I must have done something. I beat it down the subway and hid. I had to think it all out carefully. I knew I was on the spot for something. Gray Eyes meant business. What could it be? Who had I been? During those last three years with that black curtain in front of them. Well, maybe I'd been a gangster. And he was one of a mob that wanted to rub me out. I didn't know. No identification, my wallet stolen. Nothing in my pockets that would help. Just D.N. in the hat. And D.N. on the cigar case. D.N. My head was aching with worry. My stomach had panic in it. I had to find out who I'd been, what I'd done. But how? Where? Tillery Street. That's where I'd been when I woke up. Tillery Street. Well, maybe Gray Eyes would go back there, too, looking for me. But I had to take that chance. Tillery Street. Yes? Oh, good evening, Pop. Oh, oh, hello there. Couldn't see you under that hat at first. Oh, you you know me? Sure. What can I get you, son? Oh, well, uh, you got an evening paper I could look at? Nope, sorry, never read them. Too much trouble in the world these days, anyhow. Yeah. See, how you been? You haven't been around two or three weeks. Oh, well, I've been kind of busy. Uh, look, Pop. Yeah? I made a bet with a guy that even though you see so many customers, you'd walk right up and give me my full name. Oh. Well, I'm sorry I don't know it. I don't think I ever heard your name. Oh. But I know your girl. My girl? Mm-hmm. You do, huh? Yeah. Well, now, maybe I can still win my bet if you'll give me her name. Gee, uh... I've heard you mention it. I, I'd know it if I heard it. You what? Well, uh, see if I can steer you a little. Now, is it Mary? No. Nope. Uh, Alice? Lillian? Ah, uh, Margaret. Huh? No. Wait a minute. Wait. I know. Ruth. That's it, Ruth. Ruth? Yeah. Well, sure, you got it. Now, now, what's Ruth's last name? Gee, I don't know her. Li- I know where she lives, though. You do? Yeah, right across the street, the Tillery Apartments. Well, it's right. Ah, uh-uh, but now, now, what apartment? What's the number of Ruth's apartment? Uh, 3C. Apartment 3C. <laughs> say, that's pretty good if I do say so. I was only there once, remember? The night I brought the sandwiches yeah, over. Yeah. I... Well, uh, thanks. Uh, will you win your bet, mister? Huh? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, I think I will. Uh, what's your name so I'll know it next time? Oh, I'll tell you tomorrow. I hope. So long. So long, Pop, thank you. I'll be... What's the matter? Nothing. Nothing. I... Just tying my shoe. I'd just been going to walk out when I saw him standing across the street, gray eyes again. I ducked down behind the store window and watched him. He looked over in my direction and then up and down the street. Oh, then he lit a cigarette and strolled down to the corner. The minute he disappeared, I yanked the door open, dashed out, ran across the Tillery Apartments and went in. me. Dan! Oh, Danny, where have you been? Get in here. Oh, darling, it's really you. I thought you... Hello, Ruth. 
Oh, Danny, why did you come here? He's been around here twice today. He may be in the neighborhood right now, for all you know. Who? Oh, well, Flattery, of course. Uh, has he got gray eyes? What? Yeah. Did you ever see a detective that didn't? Oh, I see. Sure, sure. Danny, what's the matter with you? You're acting so strangely. Well, I... I just want to look at you. You seem so different, so far away. You haven't kissed me. Well, that's easily fixed. Oh, darling, where have you been for three weeks? All around. Miss me? You know I did. Oh, Danny, do you suppose... Do you think we could get away at night? I've got $3,000 saved up. We could go to Mexico or South America. We could get married. Mr. and Mrs. Daniel Nearing tour the world. Daniel Nearing? Oh, yeah, and wife. Sounds plenty good to me. Oh, you'll never know how good. We'll get out of here tonight. I'll call up and tell them I'm quitting my job. I'll say I'm sick. All my stuff's here. Nothing's out there but a couple of uniforms. <laughs> I'll make Alma and Franklin a present of those. Uh, Alma and Franklin? Don't you bother your pretty head about those two charmers. Maybe they weren't glad when it happened. A couple of vultures. Bye-bye to them. Oh, with you back, Danny. Just think with my 3000 we could... <laughs> oh, dear. Do you think you ought to quit your job? Absolutely, I think so. <laughs> I was never cut out to be a nurse anyway. <laughs> I guess you weren't. Any more than uh, I was cut out... Any more than you were meant to be a secretary. Ah, that's right. <laughs> well, I never wanted to be a secretary. Just drifted into it, I guess. Kind of got on my nerves, especially toward the end. You know, the, uh, the boss was no cinch to work for. He certainly wasn't. He was a rat. The whole Dietrich bunch are mean, rotten, the whole family. Yeah, that's right. Well, except the old man. Uh, oh, yeah, the old man. I, I, I sort of liked him, didn't I? And he loves you, Danny. I think he wished you'd been his son. Poor old man. He's the only reason I've stuck around out there this long. How are things out there? Oh, they've been questioning all of us. They've laid off lately, though, since you... Oh, Danny, don't let's talk anymore about it. You're back. That's the main thing. I just want to forget New Jericho and the whole... New Jericho, huh? Yes. Oh, Danny. Danny, if only it hadn't happened. What hadn't? You know what? Oh, Danny, what's going to become of you and me? I wish I knew. Danny, get away from that window. Leave that shade down. But he's down there. Who? Gray eyes. He's standing in front of the hydrant. He's coming in here, in the building. Oh, did he see you? Ruth, will you help me? What are you going to do? I'm going to give myself up. No, no, well, you... Well, it's better than getting shot at. What can they do to me? You crazy fool, they can send you to the chair. The chair? Well, what do you think happens to a man when he's guilty of murder? Murder? Ruth, listen to me. I'm not a murderer. If the whole world says I committed murder, I say I didn't. The me that's in me says I didn't. I never said you were, Danny. I always said you didn't do it. I hope you hadn't run away. So that's it. All right, Nearing. Open up. Why did you come here, Danny? Why? Ruth, wait. We gotta get out of here. How about the fire escape shaft? Dumb waiter. Dumb waiter. Here. All right, get in. I'll stand on top and work the ropes. I don't think you can hold us both. It's got to. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, Danny. Danny, what do we do? We're going back there to New Jericho. New Jericho? No, Danny, don't, please, for me. I've got to. I've got to find out. We're going together. No. No, Danny, no. I've got the money. We can get out of here and we... Stop it. Danny, ouch. My arm. You're hurting me. From here on in, we're sticking together. They're going to take me back there. Back where it happened. All right, darling. It's crazy, but I'll go wherever you go. I can't lose you again. On the train, Ruth and I said very little to each other. While I hid in the telephone booth at the Pennsylvania station, she'd bought us a couple of cheap overcoats. I sat hunched up in mine, thinking, thinking. Ruth had brought along the newspaper clippings. I looked at what they said for the 20th time, trying to see if there was anything there that would help me. Dietrich Slayer's salt, it said. Secretary wanted in brutal slaying at suburban estate. Police are pressing the search for Daniel Nearing, secretary and the employer of the late John Dietrich, 58, member of a well-known local family who was shot and killed in the drawing room of his new Jericho estate on the morning of November the 7th. Nearing disappeared November the 7th, on the morning of which date he is known to have had a bitter quarrel with the deceased. 
This last was attested to at the inquest by Alma and Franklin Dietrich, widow and brother of the murdered man. Well, I had all the facts now. <laughs> Wanted for murder. And yet everything that was in me told me that no matter who I'd been, however many memories I'd lost, that I was no killer, that I couldn't have. I had to get into that Dietrich house and stand again in the room in which it had all happened. Maybe something would come back to me. Maybe there would be... Franklin just left. They drove down to the village. Did they say anything about you being out here on your day off? Yeah. Alma said something, but I said I had nothing to do in town. He came out to write some letters. Well, let's go, then. Oh, Danny, I'm scared. Please, let's not stay no, out here. You said you loved me. I do, Danny, I do. That's why I'm scared. They're only going to the village. They'll be back in half an hour at the most. Go on, open the door, Ruth. Hurry. I've got to see the inside, that room, the place where it happened. It's wrong, Danny. I'm telling you, you're wrong. They'll find now you. Open the door, Ruth. Quickly. All right. Now, let's have a look at that room. Please, Danny, please don't. Don't talk about it. So this is where I'm supposed to have murdered John Dietrich, huh? Danny, please. Where was it? Show me exactly where it was, Ruth. I've got to know. It was there. Right there, he was standing by the grandfather's clock when... Oh, are you going crazy, Danny? If they get you, you'll hang. Why, the clock, huh? You still believe in me, don't you, Ruth? I believe you, Danny, but I'm scared. I love you. Uh, Ruth, wait a minute. What's that? Listen. It's only the old man. He's asleep in that room off there. Don't go in there, Danny. You'll wake him. I want to see him. No. No, don't, Danny. He can't help you. You know he's paralyzed and he can't talk. Turn on the light. I want to see him. There, you woke him. It's me, Mr. Dietrich. Ruth. Uh, this is Danny. You remember Danny, don't you? Hello, Mr. Dietrich. See how his eyes are shining? Yeah. Was he here when it happened? You know that, Danny. Why do you ask such funny questions? He's been in bed here for five years. That mirror. On the wall there. The clock. Look. You can see the grandfather's clock in the other room. What are you getting at, Danny? He could see it. The old man could see the murder through the mirror. Oh, if only he could talk. He can't talk. You scare me, Danny. He saw the man who killed John Dietrich. Look, look. He understands what I'm saying. He's blinking his eyes. Oh, stop torturing him, Danny. Can't you see what you're doing? But he's trying to say something. Look. Look. His eyes are blinking. He's going to help me. Go outside and watch, Ruth. Go on. Now watch out at the entrance way. Be careful, Danny. Please, they'll be back any minute. All right, leave me alone with him. Now call if I hear them coming. Look now, Mr. Dietrich. Don't be afraid. I'm going to ask you a question, and you're going to answer me. Are you trying to tell me something about the murder? Now, blink your eyes. Blink twice if you are. And that's it. Once. Twice. That's good. Did you see it happen? Here, in your mirror. Blink once if the answer is no. Twice if the answer is yes. Once. Twice. You did, huh? You saw it. Now then, is the murderer in this house? Danny, Danny, they're coming. Franklin and Alma, get out of here. Hide. Run, Danny, run. Is the murderer in this house? Blink once for no, twice for yes. Yes, in this house. Danny, Danny, they're coming. Wait, wait, I've almost got it. Now, Mr. Dietrich, was it me? Once for no, twice for yes. Was it me? Get out of here, Danny, into the big room behind the curtain. I'll talk to them. All right, all right. Thanks, Mr. Dietrich. I'll be back. Ruth? Ruth, is that you in Father's room? Yes. Are you here alone? Why, yes. Why? Well, we thought we heard voices. What are you so jittery about, Ruth? I, I'm just tired, that's all. May I go to bed now? Father's still awake, Ruth. He'll go to sleep, all right. I'm going upstairs, Mrs. Dietrich, now. Good night, Ruth. And uh, take your flashlight with you. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. It was dark on the road tonight. Good night, Ruth. Good night. She's brought him back here with her. Him, I think. Who? 
Dan? Oh, Franklin. Well, take it easy. If he's here, we'll get him. After the evidence we gave against him at the hearing, I... Oh, I'm frightened. Let's get out of here fast. I'll go to the village for the police. Call the police. No, I'll do it. Hello? Hello? It's too late. It's dead. The wire's cut. Come on, we'll both drive to the village. Eh? But he may be waiting for us out by the car. Uh-uh. Oh. What? Yeah. What are you doing there, Franklin? I think I just might need my gun. Come along. The moment they left the house, I made for the old man's room. I called for Ruth, but she was gone. Maybe Franklin and Elma had caught her after she cut the telephone wire, but I couldn't wait. My life was hanging on minutes now. I shot the flashlight on the old man's face. Now, Mr. Dietrich, you're helping me fine. You know I'm trying to save my life, don't you? Now, the murderer. Was it me? Was it me who did it? Me, Danny Nearing. Blink once for no. Once. Once! Oh, you're sure. You're sure it wasn't me. Oh, you're smiling, Mr. Dietrich. Smiling. Now, it was somebody in this house. Then who was it? Oh, can't you make a sound? Help me, you've got to. Was it Elma? Twice for yes, once for no. Once. Not Elma. All right, then. Was it Franklin? Up with the hands, Mary. Up or you'll never go to trial. Franklin. Look, you've got to listen. You've got to. Shut up and drop that flashlight. Trying to kill the old man, too, huh? The murderer returns to the scene of his crime, huh? You know I didn't kill him. Well, you tell that to the police. Elma will have me in a couple of minutes. Where's your girlfriend, Ruth? She's not here. I don't know where she went. Never mind. They'll find her. You're a dead duck, Neary. You killed my brother and beat it. What'd you get out of it? That's always puzzled us. You killed your brother, and now you're going to kill me. Oh, you've gone nuts, too. Why should I kill my own brother, you idiot? To get his share of the estate and his wife, Alma, amongst other things. But you can't stop with killing me. Someone else knows the truth. The old man saw it in the mirror. Huh? You'll have to kill your own father, too. The old man saw it. How, how do you know? He told me. Oh, you're lying. He can't talk. He can't even move. He can hear. And he can blink his eyes. Come over here and look. Now, look here. I don't... Be... Rose! He'll be all right. I heard him. He was going to kill you. Here's the gun, Danny. Take it. Oh, Rose, you shouldn't have. In another minute, I... I'm not sure it was Franklin. Oh, Dan, darling, please, let's run for it. They'll be here in a second. It's your last chance. They'll all swear you did it. Not if I can be with the old man in another half minute. Mr. Dietrich. Mr. Dietrich. It's Danny again. No, Danny, don't. Don't. What? Tell me, Mr. Dietrich. Was it Franklin? Did Franklin kill your son, John? Blink once if he did. He's afraid. Well, why are you afraid? Oh. Oh, it's this gun. Here. Take the gun, Ruth. You take it. He's afraid. I'm not going to hurt you, Mr. Dietrich. What's the matter? Why don't you answer me? Who killed John Dietrich? It wasn't me. It wasn't Elmer. It wasn't Franklin. But someone in the house. Was it? Ruth! Ruth! You! I told you. I told you not to come. Oh, I love you, Danny. I wanted you. I wouldn't have let them get you. Why? Why, Ruth? Why did you kill him? He was always after me. He wouldn't leave me alone. I hated him. Then that night he came at me, threatened me, said he'd kill me. If he couldn't have me, nobody could. He had a gun, and I got it away from him. It... He hit the clock. He leaned against it. I thought he'd never fall down and die. It was the day you ran away, and I was crazy. They thought it was you. They started looking. I love you, Danny. I still love you. I begged you not to come back here. Ruth, put down that gun, Ruth. No. Stand back, Danny. Stay over there. I just want to look at you. I was hoping we could get away together. But you've been through enough, Danny. And all because of me. Now you're clear, Danny. And this is going to clear me. Darling. <laughs> Ruth! Ruth! Well, I guess that's about...
about all there is to tell. I tried to put it all behind me, to resume my life where it left off over three years ago. <laughs> Sometimes when it gets toward evening, I go and walk along Tillery Street. <laughs> Once in a while, somebody, somebody I don't know, will say, hello, Danny. And I just say hello and walk on. <laughs> I don't want to find out anything anymore. I want it all to die away and be still. And it will. All except Ruth. Because somewhere behind that black curtain, I was loved and loved someone. We must have known a love that I'll never know again. And so closes The Black Curtain, starring Mr. Cary Grant. Tonight's tale of suspense. Since the beginnings of history, people have enjoyed wine. Ages ago, our ancestors found that wine made any food taste better. Wine is a simple pleasure that anyone can enjoy. That is why Roma has devoted all its winemaking skill to producing wines of fine quality at a price that means you can enjoy them often. Just a few cents a glass. Don't feel that you need fine crystal or a special occasion to serve Roma wine. Next time you have a quick supper, serve Roma wine in plain tumblers with your spaghetti or cold meats. And notice how much more enjoyment and zest it adds to the meal. Serve Roma wine often, cool or chilled. You'll quickly discover why Roma, R-O-M-A, Roma wines are America's largest selling wines. Yes, Roma wines are true to type. Roma wines are faithful in flavor. Roma wines are sound of character. Roma wines are reasonable in cost. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Our thanks to Cary Grant for his suspenseful performance here tonight. And Mr. Grant wants us to say that he will be listening with you next week at the same hour to Mr. Robert Young in the story called The Night Reveals. Don't forget then, next week, same time for Robert Young in... Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, brings you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Cary Grant and Phyllis Thaxter in I Confess. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Irving Cummings. Greetings in Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight's play, I Confess, has one of the most unusual plots for sustained interest and suspense I have ever seen. And, of course, when that master director, Alfred Hitchcock, adds his individual touch to the action, it's bound to be another screen hit for Warner Brothers. And for our stars, we have one of the finest actresses on the screen, Phyllis Thaxter, co-starring with Cary Grant, who will again prove his great versatility in a highly dramatic role. You know, there's no soap quite like mild and gentle Lux. Lux toilet soap has been a Hollywood custom for years. Once our glamorous Hollywood stars start using Lux, they won't use any other soap. And once you start using it, you'll know why nine out of ten screen stars depend on Lux soap for their complexion care. Now, I confess, starring Cary Grant as Father Michael Logan and Phyllis Thaxter as Ruth. night, the venerable city of Quebec. In the moonlight, the narrow cobble-side streets are all but deserted. A man, wearing the cassock of a priest, has darted into the rectory of a church. He sheds the cassock, and now he enters the church itself. Who is it? Who's there? It's Father Logan. Oh, Father Logan. I did not recognize you in the dark. Is that you, Keller? Yes, Father. What are you doing here this time of night? I I came in to pray. Is something wrong? Can I help you? 
No one can help me. I have abused your kindness. How? You who gave my wife and me a home here, right with the church, a job, even friendship, to me a refugee, a German. Now you will hate me. Oh, no, I don't hate anyone, Keller. You will, you will hate me. But it was for her, for my wife. She worked so hard, Father, it breaks my heart. Keller, what is it? I must confess to you. I want to make a confession. All right, we'll go to the confession. Yes, yes. I want you to hear my confession. So, you've been to the house of Mr. Villette. Go on, Keller. Yes, Villette the lawyer. I killed Mr. Villette. Keller. I went to steal his money. I wore a cassock. If anyone saw me, they would think I was a priest. I was looking for the money when Villette surprised me. I did not mean to kill him. You must believe me, Father. I did not mean to kill him. Oh, you didn't do it. Otto, you did not kill him. I have just come from confession. Oh. Father Logan is my priest. You are my wife. It is right that you should also know. But why, Otto? Why? I am not a murderer. It was an accident. It was the money. How could I watch you work so hard? I lie awake night after night, and I think all we need is $2,000, Alma. With $2,000, we can start a new life. And Villette was rich. Oh, oh, it's so dangerous. They will catch me. They will hang me. I cannot. I cannot. Father Logan will go to them. He will tell them. He will tell them? No, he cannot tell them what he heard in confession. The police will come. Why, Alma? Why should they come? I have told them nothing, have I? Alma, no one knows. Father Logan knows. But he cannot tell them what he heard in the confessional. Can't you understand that? What are you going to do? Nothing. Nothing at all. In the morning, you are going to the police? Tomorrow is Wednesday, Alma. Isn't that the day when I attend to Mr. Villette's garden? But he is dead. I always work in Mr. Villette's garden on Wednesdays. Tomorrow is Wednesday. Now go to bed. You need to rest. Rest, I rest. Can I help you, Father? We're trying to keep this crowd away from the house. You are the police? Yes. You've heard, haven't you, Mr. Vallette's been murdered? Yes, I had an appointment here this morning. With Vallette? Yes, his, uh... Is there anything I can do? Well, if you had an appointment, you better go in the house. Uh, do you mind? Not at all. Inspector LaRue's in there. Maybe he'd like to talk to you. This way. Father Michael Logan, huh? What church, Father? The Church of Saint Marie, Inspector. Well, how are Father Millet and Father Benoit? They're both very well, thank you. Good. So you had an appointment with Vallette? Yes. Anything special? No, there was something he... You've heard what's happened, of course, Father. Oh, we've got Keller in the next room. Keller? He works at the rectory, doesn't he? Uh, yes, he and his wife work there. Poor devil's terrified. I've been waiting for him to settle down. I see. It was Keller who found the body. You don't mind if we call on you later. No, I'll be at the church. Maybe that we'd like to know what your appointment was all about, eh? Well, I'd better see Keller now. Yes, well, goodbye, Inspector. All right, Murphy, bring him in, will you please? But I have told policemen. I have told them everything. Now, there's no need to be frightened, Keller. Now, how did you find the body? This morning I arrived as usual at half past eight. I came inside. You have a key to this house? No, the door was open. It frightened me. An open door? Why? The door was always locked. I went in and there he was. I could see that he was dead. I wanted to run. Run? You do not understand. How can you? There I was, a man without a country, alone, discovering a murder. I thought of the police. I am always afraid of the police. This is a German fear, this fear. There's nothing to be afraid of here. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Father Logan is here. I heard them say that Father Logan... Well, he was here. He's gone now. What will he think of me? Probably very highly, if you can be of more help to us. Help? 
There are a few things I'd like to know. Now, when you first came into the house, did you call for Mr. Vallette or... Father Logan. Please, we can't talk here. But is it true? It's true, Ruth. Vallette's been murdered. I can't believe it. Michael, we're free. We're free. Are we? Goodbye, Ruth. Father Logan? Come in, Keller. The police, they sent me home. I must talk to you, Father. Why? Why did you come to Villette's house? I know what you must think of me, but I can't give myself up. They would hang me. Has not God forgiven me thanks to you? But the police never would. I don't know what you're talking about. I confess to you. It was my confession. You must tell me what to do. There... There's nothing I can add to what I've already said. Uh, you are so good, Father. It's easy for you to be good. Have you no pity for me? Otto? Alma? Father Benoit, he asks, will you please mend the tire on his bicycle? Yes, yes, right away. The front tire, he left it at the back door. Please, Father. You, you'd better go now and fix the tire. That's about it, Mr. Robertson. I said to myself, you're in no position to go to the Crown Prosecutor. You've got nothing to give him. But I'm here just the same, Mr. Robertson. Oh, you're quite a man, Inspector. Quite a man. Now, we know that Vallette was murdered, strangled, and that robbery may have been the motive. But we're not certain. And no fingerprints and no suspects. Oh, this should be very simple for you, LaRue. I uh, took the liberty of bringing a girl along. A girl? School girl. Oh. Murphy's got her out there in the hall. Just a possibility, Mr. Robertson. All right, LaRue. Let's hear what she's got to say. Thank you, sir. So, you are Augustine. Yes, monsieur. Sorry you had to be dragged out from school, young lady. Oh, but I like to be dragged out from school, monsieur. Well, this is Mr. Robertson. He's the crown prosecutor. Now, your mother called to say that you passed the Vallette house last night. That's right. And what time was that? Eleven o'clock, a little after eleven. I was babysitting for Ma Madame Germain, and I left her house at eleven o'clock. Well, uh, shall we say the time was between eleven and eleven-thirty? yes. And I saw someone leaving Monsieur Villette's house. A man. A priest, Monsieur. What? A priest. Augustine, this is very important. Are you sure? Quite sure, Monsieur. I was walking by the Rue Valentin, and then suddenly there was this priest. He was coming out of the house and walking away. Did you see his face? No. How tall was he? Well, like, like you, Monsieur. And was he fat or thin? Not fat. But not thin, either. Did you notice anything special about him? Anything at all? No. Did he see you, Augustine? I don't think so, monsieur. But you are absolutely sure he was a priest? Yes. Thank you. You may go now. Oh, uh, I must ask you a favor. I don't want you to say anything to anyone about this. Promise? Oh, yes, monsieur. Goodbye. Goodbye, little one. And if you should need me again... Yes? It would be very nice if you could drag me out of school. <laughs> You know what this means. We'll have to check every rectory in town, find out which priests were out late last night. Uh, it's ridiculous to think a priest would be involved. LaRue, you don't really think it could be a priest? Yes, maybe. There was a priest this morning who... Well? Nothing. I'll have to check further. Well, don't be so mysterious. Well, I should know something more by tomorrow. Good day, Mr. Robertson, and thank you. Inspector. Evening, Keller. Father Logan, do you suppose I could see him? Father Logan? Mm. Oh, sit down, please. I'll see if I can find him. Thank you. Who was it, Otto? Who at the door? A man. A man oh. to see Father Logan. They drove away in the man's car. Oh. Alma, have you washed the cassock? N not yet. Where is it? Upstairs in our room. Do not wash it. I do not want it washed. But why? Listen to me. There is something you must never forget. When I... I suppose we might have had this little talk at the rectory, Father. 
Hope you don't mind coming here to my office. Not at all. As long as Father Millet knows where I am. You told him? Yes. Unpleasant bit of business, isn't it, Father? If there's anything I can do... Well, I... just a few questions. Now, how long have you been at St. Marie's? Nearly three years. <laughs> you know, I guess I've known Father Millet for 25 years. I was a choir boy when he was over at the Basilica. Yes, he told me tonight what a fine voice you have. <laughs> He's just forgotten, that's all. I uh, hear you were in the army. Yes. Got the military cross, hmm? Yes. You seem to have done a number of brave things. Well, I survived. Are you given to understatement, Father? Well, that depends. Now, this case, this Vallette murder, it's all understatement so far. You knew Vallette, right? Yes, slightly. Well, then maybe you can help me. What was he like, Father? Oh, I didn't know him well. Well, did you know him socially or in a business sort of way? Actually, neither. I met him once many years ago. Mm. Cigarette? Uh, thank you, no. It's a funny thing. No one seems to have known this Villette, really known him. Yet he was a lawyer, had clients. Not one of them has any information that means anything. May I ask what you were going to see him about yesterday morning? Well, that, uh, that was a personal matter. Well, were you acting for someone, Father? One of your parishioners, perhaps? Uh, uh, I can only tell you that my visit had nothing to do with Villette's death. Oh, of course it didn't. But you do understand, don't you, that I must consider every scrap of information. Yes. When a crime's been committed, each scrap of information is important to us. Of course. I know sometimes it seems like... Crying. It can be very embarrassing. Oh, I'm not embarrassed, Inspector. Good. Well, I've been wondering about that lady you met outside Vallette's house. She was in that crowd out there. I just happened to glance out the window when I saw you talking to her. Inspector, the appointment I had with Vallette could not be of any importance to you. Oh, but we're not discussing that at the moment, Father. You see, with a murder, one has to jump from one detail to another. Forgive me, I guess I jumped too abruptly for you. <laughs> well, perhaps I just don't follow as fast as you jump. <laughs> I'm sorry. See, I have a methodical mind. I have to take things one by one. Well, about this lady you met out there on the sidewalk. I wish I could discuss it, but I can't. May I ask who she is? She isn't involved. Excuse me, Father, but that's something for me to I decide. I know, I know. But you'll have to take my word for it. She's not involved. Your word. I respect your word, but I need help. I'm not able to help. I see. I... Just don't want all this mystification to make things too awkward for you, Father. Awkward for me? A priest was seen leaving Vallette's house at the time of the murder. I saw a priest outside Vallette's house the next morning. Well, Father? Well? Too much mystification might lead one to believe that both priests were one and the same, mightn't it? What do you have to say? What would you want me to say? That's up to you. Well, then... I'd say that a man of intelligence would not be led to believe anything on so little evidence. You're perfectly right. We've checked on every priest in Quebec. Each can account for his movements at the time of the murder. That is, each, except one. Where were you at 11 o'clock, Father? I was walking. Alone? No. Good. Now, if you'll just give me the name and address of the person... I can't. Father, don't you want to help me? I've done my best. But you refuse to answer my questions. I know, I know, and I'm sorry, but it isn't possible for me to answer them. It's a pity. A great pity. But I thank you for coming, Father. Good night. Good night, Inspector. This is LaRue. Get me Mr. Robertson. Yes, yes, the Crown Prosecutor. Try his house. If he isn't home, find out where he is. I've got to talk to him. Before we continue with Act Two of I Confess, here's Francis Scully, our Hollywood reporter. What are you reading, Francis? Well, I've got a batch of reviews on the world premiere of The Robe, Ken. 20th Century Fox held it in New York last Wednesday night. 
6,500 people were invited and 6,000 more gathered outside the theater. Mm, Imagine what Hollywood Boulevard will be like this Thursday night at the Hollywood premiere. How were the reviews, Francis? Oh, just listen to this, Ken. The New York Daily News gave the robe four stars and four stars for CinemaScope. The first time in its history any picture received this rating. And uh, what else did they say about CinemaScope? Well, it's considered the greatest motion picture advance in sound. Mm. How big is that CinemaScope screen again, Francis? Well, it's 65 feet long and 24 feet high. And it's so wide that a chariot has four white horses, not just two, thundering toward the audience. Not to mention close-ups of Richard Burton, Gene Simmons, and Victor Mature all at Uh, once. I love this description of Victor Mature. They write that Victor plays the Greek slave, quote, with the controlled arrogance of a trained leopard, unquote. (laughs) Leopard, eh? And Jean Simmons? Oh, these are the words they use about her. Lovely and passionate. I could add a few words about Jean myself, such as complexion by Lux. And don't forget, Ken, the robe is in technicolor, so audiences will really see what Lux care can mean to a complexion. Well, Jean has been devoted to Lux for many years. I guess it's a habit she picked up in England. Well, Lux seems to be an international custom with most movie actresses. With so many pictures being made on location, Mexico, Rome, the Belgian Congo, why, well, I think you can call Lux the most traveled of all soaps. Yes, Lux gets around all right. Like Jean Simmons, so many stars feel that Lux is the one soap they can depend on to keep their skin looking its very best. Lux is so gentle and mild. And another nice thing, the fragrance of Lux never interferes with any perfume you wear. Thank you, Francis. Once you've used Lux, we think you'll agree with Gene Simmons and nine out of ten screen stars, there's no soap quite like Lux. Now our producer, Mr. Cummings. Act two of I Confess, starring Cary Grant as Father Michael Logan and Phyllis Thaxter as Ruth. It's a few moments later. Mr. Robertson, the Crown Prosecutor, is not at home. But Inspector LaRue has found him. He's been a guest tonight in the home of some old friends, Pierre Granfor and his wife, Ruth. Sorry, Ruth. Looks like I've got to say good night. That phone call just now, it's about that Villette murder. Don't look so unhappy, Willie. Well, there's a very unpleasant angle. A priest is under suspicion. What nonsense. Well, he was seen leaving Villette's house. Which priest? Do they know his name? Inspector LaRue thinks it's a Father Logan from St. Marie's. All right, hate to leave. Thanks for a lovely dinner. Good night, Willie. Oh, no, no, don't come to the door. See you soon, Pierre. Stop worrying. It's ridiculous. Why on earth would Father Logan... Shut up. Oh, please, shut up. I'm sorry. You're still in love with him. Am I? You never spoke about it. And I'm not going to speak about it now. But you are going to speak about it. I'm not going on like this. Do whatever you wish. It's very simple, isn't it? What does one do when his wife's in love with a priest? You can leave me. How easily you can say that. I'm not in love with you. I have never been in love with you. You know that. I never wanted to believe it. That's not my fault. I've never pretended anything with you. I hope he's in trouble. Terrible trouble. Oh, Michael. Michael. Hello? Summary's rectory? I want to speak to Father Logan, please. Father Logan? Oh, but he is asleep. I'm not asleep, Mrs. Keller. Oh, oh, it is very late. I'll take it. Thank you. Good night, Father. Hello? Michael, I've got to see you. Ruth, please. That's impossible. I've got to see you tomorrow morning. I've got to meet you somewhere. Michael, aren't you listening? Uh, I hear you. I'm going to Levis tomorrow morning. The ferry, Michael. The nine o'clock ferry. All right. Good night. Well, good morning. Good morning, Father Logan. Walk over here. We shouldn't be seen together for your sake. 
I had to see you. Ruth, the police have been questioning me. They saw the two of us talking outside of Villette's house. They're trying to find out who you are. I don't care. I've got to tell you, you're being suspected. I know that. The only thing is for me to tell them that you were with me that night. You can't. They want to know why. I'll tell them everything if I have to. You've got to think of yourself. You've got to think of your husband. Think of him before I think of you. I've never been able to do that. You must. It's too late to think of him. I'm not that good. I love you. I've always been in love with you. I know, I know it's wrong, but I can't help it. Do you want me to lie to you? No, I don't want you to lie to yourself. I haven't changed, Michael. I've been married seven years and I haven't changed. But I've changed. And you must understand. I'm a priest. I chose to be what I am. I believe in what I am. Michael. Ruth, I, I want you to see things as they are and not go on hurting yourself. Don't pity me. Our meeting like this is wrong. It's all wrong. It won't happen again. I won't bother you again. Goodbye. Ruth. Ruth, who was it? Who just telephoned? Willie Robertson. He wants me to come to his office now. Why? I was seen on the ferry this morning with Michael Logan. Apparently, I was being followed by a detective. Would you like to tell me what you're going to do? Answer whatever questions they ask me. I... I'm going to tell them why Michael could not have killed Vallette. Oh. Has Father Logan cleared himself to your satisfaction? He didn't have to. I was with him at the time. Would you like me to go with you? I'm in no position to ask favors, am I? Get ready. I'll get the car. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm so terribly sorry about all this. Oh, this is Inspector LaRue. Good evening. Inspector LaRue has promised to keep all this from the press. That is, I'll, I'll do my best. Oh, please, won't you sit down? Thank you. Father Logan is here. Here? Yes, the other room. If you'll join us, Father, please. Good evening, Father Logan. Good evening. Good evening. Father Logan. May we begin, please? What is it you want to know? Madame, you met Father Logan on the ferry this morning. Yes. May I ask the reason for this meeting? I don't think the reason could help you, Inspector. You also met Father Logan on the morning following Vallette's murder in front of the house. Yes. And the reason for this meeting? I had an appointment with Monsieur Vallette. But Father Logan, knowing of the murder, stopped you from entering the house. Am I right? Yes. Of course, Father did not know you had an appointment. But he did know... The night before, I'd met Father Logan. I told him I was going to see Vallette at half past nine the following morning. Madame, just so I don't misunderstand, you met Father Logan on the night that Vallette was murdered? Yes. Where? We took a drive in my car. At what time, please? Between nine and eleven. Are you sure of the time, madame? Yes, I, I came home just after eleven. My husband had come in just five minutes before. That's correct, Inspector. You, uh... You told your husband that you'd just seen Father Logan? No, I, I did not tell my husband. Inspector, I beg you, must your questions be so personal? Madame, do you understand why I must ask these questions? Yes. And I came here to tell you that Father Logan could not have been involved in Monsieur Vallette's death because I was with him at the time. I accept everything you have said, madame. But I must know the reason for your appointment with Vallette. Vallette was blackmailing me. He... he was what? I met Father Logan to ask his advice. But your husband? You had not told your husband about this? No, no, it was nothing to do with my husband. You turned to Father Logan for advice, but not to your husband? Father Logan is an old friend. Then he knew that you were being blackmailed. How could he? I hadn't seen him in years. But you just called him an old friend. Inspector LaRue. Yes, just a moment, LaRue. My wife is not under oath. She doesn't have to answer these questions. Monsieur... I have only one more question. Why were you being blackmailed, madame? You needn't answer that. Why shouldn't she? Ruth, it isn't necessary. Don't answer. Madame, are you trying to protect Father Logan? From what? He hasn't done anything. It would seem as if he had. You don't care whom I hurt, do you? Just as long as I answer your questions. Madame, a man has been murdered. Ruth, if you, if you think you'd like the advice of a lawyer... Thanks, Willie. I, 
don't think that will be necessary. The blackmail was about me and Father Logan, Inspector. You were aware of this, Father? Yes. If you will continue, madame. I'll have to go back a long time, to the beginning of the war. It was long before Michael had entered the church. He was working then for the government, and we, we'd fallen in love. He was one of the first to volunteer. I hated him for that. I was selfish even then. He took things so seriously, war and love. Yes, even love. I begged him to marry me before he left, but he wouldn't. It seemed so long ago. Oh, Ruth. Ruth, how could you talk of our getting married? You know I'll be shipping out soon. Oh, but darling, that's why I want to marry you. Oh, my, aren't there enough widows as it is? Michael. You think I don't love you enough. I love you too much. Much too much. Don't you see? There's just no telling when I get back. Or uh, if I ever will. Meanwhile, you'd better forget about me. How can you say that if you love me? Ah, uh, if I love you. There never can be anyone else, never. Ruth, won't you understand? It's so unfair to you. You think it's fair to tell me to forget you? <laughs> you know something? You're a very stubborn girl, aren't you? His letters were long at first, but after a while there were no letters at all. Nothing, not a word, for over a year. Meanwhile, I'd started working for my future husband. Pierre was... he was... Ruth, you don't have to tell them. You don't have to tell them anything more. I want to. You were very kind to me, Pierre. You realized I was unhappy. And like all kind people, you never asked me why. I was in love with you. Anyway, six months later, we were married. When the war was over, Michael came home. I was at the dock the day the boat arrived. We arranged to meet the following afternoon. It was a lovely day, the end of the summer. We took the ferry and went over to the island. We started to walk, and Michael told me the thoughts that had come to him during the war. The war had changed him. Then suddenly a storm came. <laughs> This won't do at all, will it? You don't even have a jacket. Oh, what's a little rain? Come on, let's run for it. There must be some place we can go. Where are we, anyway? Oh, I don't know. It was a beautiful meadow a minute ago. Oh, you're getting soaked. Oh, look, there's a house across the field. Maybe they'll let us stay there. The house was closed, Inspector. Locked. The storm grew worse. There was a summer house in the garden, a roof and lattice and ivy. It was the only shelter we could find. Sometime during the night, the rain stopped. It was sunlight that awakened me. Michael was seated at a table, his head on his arms. He, he was still asleep. And then a man came walking through the garden. Hello! Well, I've been entertaining guests, I see. He called again and Mike awakened. What a charming rendezvous. I trust you and the lady were not disturbed during the night. But what a compromising situation, monsieur. Michael, no, don't. He... He only defends your honor, madame. Get out. Get out? From my own garden? That doesn't give you the right to insult Madame me. Grandfort? Oh, yes, I know, madame. Ruth? That is, I know of her husband, the distinguished member of Parliament. I've seen you quite often, madame, waiting for him in your car. Oh, how exciting it must be to be young. Young and beautiful. This man, Villette? Villette. What could I say to Michael? I hadn't told him I was married. Father? Let her continue. I didn't see Michael again for five years, nor Villette either. Not till the day that Michael was ordained a priest. Villette attended the ceremonies. And after that, I started to run into him all the time. One day as I left the house, he was waiting for me on the side. And those are the facts, Madame Grandfort. 
If I don't act quickly, there'll be a terrible tax scandal. Only your husband can help me. Then go to my husband. There's nothing I can do. But your husband is so righteous, madame. You, uh, you could persuade him to use his influence, couldn't you? You can't be serious. Madame, must I tell your husband about you and Father Logan? Must I? There's nothing you can tell him. We did nothing wrong. Think it over. I'll give you 24 hours. I was helpless, frantic. If the let started to talk, Pierre's Korean politics would be finished. Michael might be unfrocked. I thought that maybe Michael might help. I telephoned him at the rectory. We met that night, and as we drove around the city, I told him what had happened. I want you to take me back to the rectory, Ruth, and uh, then I want you to go home. What are you going to do? Leave Villette to me. I'll talk to him. Can you, uh, can you meet me in front of his house tomorrow morning, say, at uh, 9.30? Yes, yes, of course. It'll be all right, Ruth. Villette will listen to reason. Don't worry about it anymore. So that explains your appointment with Villette. Yes, I see. I arrived at 9.30. I couldn't understand why the crowd had gathered. Then I saw Michael, and he told me Villette was dead. I couldn't believe it. I was free. The rest you know. Some of it, anyway. Inspector, may my wife leave now? Certainly. Father Logan has his alibi now, doesn't he, Willie? Of course. Thank you. Ruth, come. Good night. Thank Good you, night, madame, Ruth. for your help tonight. Yeah, Willie. Would you like to go now, Father? I said, would you like to go now? Hmm? Uh, go? It's been a terrible ordeal. We're very grateful. Yes. Well, uh, good night. Well, it's over, Inspector. Is it, sir? I'd like you to see this report. What report? Dr. Bonard, the autopsy surgeon. He claims that Valette could not have died before 11.30. Oh, wait Madame a moment. Madame Bramfor said that she left Father Logan at 11. You can do a lot of things in 30 minutes. I had never quite understood why Father Logan should have killed Valette. But now I think I can understand. And I thought it was over. I'm afraid not, Mr. Robertson. Only beginning. We'll continue with Act Three of I Confess in just a few moments. Now we're going to meet lovely Joan Weldon, who was signed by Warner Brothers while singing in Song of Norway. What singing haven't you been doing lately, Joan? I'm in So This Is Love, Mr. Cummings, but I don't sing. I'm actually more interested in becoming a dramatic actress like Barbara Stanwyck. You don't come any better than Barbara. I saw her in the new Milton Sperling production, Blowing Wild, at the studio recently. Gary Cooper, Ruth Roman, and Anthony Quinn are stars in it, too. It was shot in Mexico, mostly near Cuenavaca, and the cast lived in one, at one of those old, established world places. Built in 1527 by Cortez, the Spanish conqueror. Sounds like the picture Blowing Wild would have some wonderful scenery in it. Oh, it has, Mr. Cummings. And a very exciting story involving oil fields and armed bandits. Judging by the looks of Miss Stanwyck at the end of the picture, well, I hope she had Lux toilet soap along with her. Why is that, Joan? Miss Stanwyck was covered with oil and debris. She plays the part of an unscrupulous woman infatuated with Gary Cooper. And I guess you'd say she gets her just desserts in the end. Well, Joan, knowing how much Barbara Stanwyck likes Lux, I'm sure she brought several cakes along. Lux is my favorite soap, too, Mr. Carpenter, for my complexion and in my bath. Most screen stars feel that way about Lux, Joan. They believe there's nothing more refreshing than a Lux bath. It's a great pick-me-up after a strenuous day. It certainly is, Mr. Carpenter. Well, thank you, Joan, and I'll be looking forward to seeing you in a dramatic role soon. Use the generous bath size Lux. We think you'll like its creamy lather and pleasant fragrance as much as nine out of ten Hollywood screen stars do. We pause now for station identification. This is the CBS Radio Network.
curtain rises on Act Three of I Confess, starring Cary Grant as Father Michael Logan and Phyllis Thaxter as Ruth. It's very early the following morning, but already the phone has rung in the ground for home. An urgent call from Mr. Robertson, the prosecutor. And now Ruth has rushed to the church of St. Marie. But I can't talk to you now, Ruth. There are people waiting at the confessional. Mr. Robertson phone. They're going to arrest you. Oh, Michael, what can we do? I don't know. You're not going to let them bring you to trial. Don't you know what that would mean? I've done this to you. I've done it all. No, no, you mustn't say that. They're going to call me as a witness, and all because of what I told them last night. They claim I've given them the motive they've been waiting for. Ruth, please, I must go now. I should have lied, but I told the truth. And now they'll twist everything I've said. They'll turn it, they'll use it. I wanted to help you, to help you. Well, it doesn't matter. There's nothing either of us can do. Walter Logan. Keller, what is it? I, I can talk to you now. You are through with confessions? Yes. You have been talking to the police. They asked about me. You told them about me? I'm going to be arrested, Keller. You? You are trying to frighten me. You think by telling me that I will give myself up. So what are you going to do when they arrest you? I don't know. Ah, you are frightened. Maybe they will hang you instead of me, and that frightens you. But you can't tell them, can you? You can't tell them as long as you are a priest. Come in. Father Logan. You've been looking for me, Inspector LaRue? Yes, Father, yes, indeed we've been looking for you. For about three hours we've been looking for you, every policeman in Quebec. I've been walking, I've been trying to think. You can call it off, Murphy, you just walked in. You had lunch yet, Father? No. Well, let me order something for you. Oh, uh, you're under arrest. Yes, I know. <laughs> Priest arrested for murder. Father Logan charged with Valette murder. Robertson plans speedy trial of accused priest. So, if you will tell the court once again, Sergeant Murphy, where did you find this priestly garment, this cassock? The rectory, sir. Father Logan's room. I found it hidden in his trunk. Hidden? Objection, my lord. On what grounds can the witness claim the article was hidden? Sustained. Sorry, my lord. The Crown is content to establish only the fact that the cassock was in the accused trunk. Now then, Sergeant, what did the police do with this cassock? We sent it to Dr. Bernard, pathologist at Laval University. I have his signed report here, sir. It's Dr. Bernard's opinion that the cassock was stained with human blood. Whose blood? The report says that the blood type is identical to... That of the murdered man, Valette. Thank you. Uh, if it please the court, the Crown would like to recall the witness whom we heard yesterday, but very briefly. Will Otto Keller take the stand? Now then, Mr. Keller, you told us yesterday that you spoke with Father Logan on the night of the murder at approximately 11.45 o'clock. Yes, sir. Under what circumstances? My wife was asleep, sir. I was just about to go to bed, so I opened the window. I saw someone entering the church. Who? I could not tell at that distance, sir, so I went downstairs and walked out of the rectory and across to the church. I saw someone kneeling against the altar rail. As he lifted his head, I saw it was Father Logan, sir. Was there anything about his manner that seemed out of the ordinary? He seemed so distressed, sir. I asked him if he were ill. He said no. He said I should go back and leave him alone. Did you go back? No, sir. Father Logan had always been so very kind to my wife and to me. I wanted to help him if I could. Well? He told me again to leave him alone, so I went back to our room. Your witness, Mr. Crawley. The defense waves examination at this time, my lord. Waves examination. Then the Crown calls Madame Granfor to the stand. Madame Ruth Granfor, please. 
answer your questions in any other way. How can I when you repeatedly twist my words around and rephrase them? The witness will kindly confine herself to answer as to the facts. Madame Granfort, you just told us you were in love with the accused prior to the war. Yes. But what we are trying to find out is whether or not you were still in love with the accused on that night of Villette's murder. Yes, yes. Thank you. And how often had you met with him between the night at the summer house on the island and the night Villette was killed? Never, never. You want this court to believe that a woman in love doesn't make some attempt to I meet her lover? My lord, this line of questioning doesn't seem particularly relevant. But it is, my lord. I am trying to discover whether or not Villette's blackmail was based on his knowledge not merely of a single meeting between the accused and the witness, but of a continuous, uninterrupted no, series of... No, that's not of... true! It's not true! <laughs> My lord, the witness appears to be on the verge of hysteria. May I excuse her for the moment and call the accused? Does the defense object? No objections, my lord. Call the accused. Father Michael Lowe. Suppose we begin with the cassock, Father Logan. This is your cassock. No, sir. It is not mine. Then perhaps you borrowed it from someone? No. Yet it was found in your trunk. Someone must have put it there? Yes. Or can you help us by suggesting who? I can't say. Father Logan, when did you decide to become a priest? After the war. And in becoming a priest, were you perhaps trying to hide from something? I've never thought of the priesthood as offering a hiding place. It involves certain responsibilities, certain morality. Yes. And yet you saw nothing wrong in having a clandestine meeting with a woman. Are you trying to imply that I was a priest at that time? I was not a priest. But did you consider that this woman was married? I, I wasn't aware that she was. And so you spent the whole day with her. Yes. Yes, we were good friends. I hadn't seen her in over three years. Such good friends that you made no effort to go home that night? We were caught in a storm. Oh, then the storm was the villain. I saw nothing wrong in being caught in a storm. Nothing wrong. Then why, on the following morning, did you hit Villette with your fist? Were you anxious to protect Madame's reputation? Yes. Oh, then her reputation was endangered. You suddenly realized there was something more than merely being caught in the storm. Villette... Villette made insinuations. My argument with Villette had nothing to do with any sudden realization. But you hit him in anger. Yes. You hit a man when he merely intruded upon a harmless situation. Then surely you are capable of far more violence when that same man blackmails your friend, Madame Granfort. I am not capable of murder. You would go to such a man, and unable to control your temper, unable to face a public scandal, you would turn again to physical force. No, I would not. No, you would not. You say that you and Madame separated at 11 o'clock on the night of the murder. That's right, yes. Then it was possible for you to be at Villette's house by half past 11. Yes, it was possible, but I did not go there. I went back to the rectory. And what did you do, Father Logan? I, I went up to my room. Then I went downstairs and into the church. Did you see anyone there? Otto Keller. But Mr. Keller has told the court that the time then was 11.45 or after. That isn't true. Then perhaps you are prepared to tell us the truth. I have told you the truth. That is all you have to say. That is all. And I say that you did not return to the rectory until 11.45 or after. That you had met with Villette, that he threatened you with exposure, and that you then proceeded to kill him. No! No! <laughs> Prosecution rest case. Defense blast circumstantial evidence. Judge charges jury. Church withholds all comment. Verdict awaited. Priest to hang if guilty. Silence. Silence. Everybody stands. <clears throat> Gentlemen of the jury, are you agreed on your verdict? We are. Is Michael Logan guilty of murder or not guilty? While we attach grave suspicions to the accused, we cannot find sufficient evidence to prove that he actually killed Monsieur Villette. Our verdict is not guilty. Oh. Silence! Silence! Michael Logan, 
While I have no doubt, as judge of this trial, that the jury reached their conclusions in utmost regard for justice, I must express my personal disagreement with their verdict. Michael Logan, you are hereby discharged, and this court is adjourned. Well, Laro, I told you the cassock wouldn't be enough. They've ruined him. Why couldn't they just have said not guilty and let it go at that? Are you satisfied, Willie? Are you satisfied with all this? Do you think I enjoyed it, Pierre? Someday, perhaps, you and Ruth may forgive me. Ruth? Pierre, look. Here out the window. What are they doing to him? People are angry, madame. If he were anyone else They're but a priest... They're throwing things at him. They're hurting him. The police will handle it. There, you see... I can't even help him now. And after all I've done to him. LaRue, look. Isn't that Mrs. Keller out there? What's she doing? Yes. She's shouting something. She's pointing to her husband and shouting, I'd better get down there. Those were shots. Mrs. Keller. Someone shot Mrs. Keller. What is it, Murphy? What happened? She was running toward me, Mrs. Keller. She kept shouting, he's innocent. The priest is innocent. Keller was about 20 feet in back of her. He shot her twice. Where is she? They've just taken her to that chap over there. Who's getting a statement? No one, sir. She's dead. And Keller? He won't get far. We're after him now. He ran into the hotel down there. I don't want him shot. Well, he's still got the gun, sir. I don't want him dead. I want to talk to him. Yes, sir. Now, where's Father Logan? He went in the shop where Mrs. Keller is. Well, Father... All she was able to say was, forgive me. We, we should have Keller in a few minutes. Now, what about him? Well, I, I'm not sure what you mean. Why did he shoot his wife? Why did she say you were innocent? I can't answer that. Keller worked in the rectory. He also worked as Vallette's gardener. What else can you tell me about him? Well, will you let me try to talk to him? I've got to catch him first. All right, Father, come along. He's somewhere in the hotel. Thank you. What are you trying to do, Father? Protect him? I... I think we better go to the hotel. We've got him cornered, Inspector. Behind those doors is a ballroom. No place to hide. Just the floor and a stage. Every exit's covered. I just sent Farouche for tear gas. Oh, no, please. Let me try to talk to him. No. Murphy, open the doors. Now, the rest of you, stand back. Ready? Go ahead. Keller? What do you want? I want you to give yourself up. Why would I do that? You shot your wife. Isn't that enough? And what about Villette? Villette? So the priest talked. Logan, where are you, Father Logan? Keller. Ah, so you are there. How kindly you hear my confession. And then a little shame, a little violence. That's all it takes to make you talk. I'm going in there. Now get back, Father. I'll kill you. Oh, you show yourself the hypocrite, the pretender. I thought you would rather die than to betray your faith. Keep him covered, Murphy. Yes, sir. Now get ready. Aim for Keller's shoulder. Make him drop the gun. Be easier to hit his leg, sir. Shoulder, the right shoulder. Going to shoot now, Keller. Drop your gun and we shoot. Oh, no, please. Don't make them do it, Keller. That is all you have to tell me. Oh. 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 Drop your gun, Otto. There's been enough bloodshed. You... Must not come closer, Father. I'll shoot you, you know. You won't shoot me, Otto. Why will I not shoot you? Because you call me Otto in such a friendly way, like Alma used to call me Otto. Where is my Alma? She's dead. No. You killed her. It is your fault. Oh, I loved her. It made me cry to see her work so hard. Her poor hands. Her poor, beautiful hands. She can't be dead. She is. And I... I am as alone as you are. Oh, no. Yes. I'm not alone. Yes, you are. To kill you now would be a favor to you. You have no friends. What has happened to your friends, huh, Father? They mob you. They spit at you. It would be better if you were as guilty as I. Then they would shoot you quickly. Look. Three bullets. For you, Father. For you. Oh! oh. Help me, 
the doctor, the hotel doctor. Father. Stand back, please, all of you. Forgive me. Forgive me. My head. Hold my head. Yes, Otto. Pray for me. Ego te absolvo in nomine Patris et Fili et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Michael. It's all over. Yes. I want you to know I, I'm going home with my husband. In a moment, our stars will return. Now here's Hollywood's recommendation for sunshine the year round, Mr. Art Linkletter. Thank you, Ken. And ladies, are you proud to show off your linen closet? You know, a well-kept linen closet is one mark of a good housekeeper. And of course, it's important to have your towels and sheets and all your linens smell just as clean and fresh as they look. And when you wash them with surf, you know they're clean clear through because they smell clean. There's no need to worry about unpleasant odors like stale, sour soap or the almost medicinal odor left by some detergents. You like the clean, sunshine freshness of your surf-washed linens. Mmm, when you wash them with surf, they smell like sunshine. And that's true no matter where you dry them, indoors or out, on damp days or dry ones. All-purpose surf is the safe, white detergent for your linens and for everything you wash. And when you wash them with surf, they smell like sunshine. Now, Mr. Cummings, with our stars. And we call them forward for a curtain call. Cary Grant and Phyllis Thackeray. (laughs) Cary, I certainly enjoyed your work in a dramatic part. Hmm. I think people are inclined to forget what a fine dramatic actor Cary is. Well, of course, of course. Well, it was nothing. I just play anything at all. Anything from comedy to opera. (laughs) Bang, bang. You sing opera, Carrie? Well, of course, I used to be in those romantic musicals, you know, where everybody raises a stein to dear old USC. <laughs> I even had a solo. Oh, you did? What did you sing? Um, High Barmaid. <laughs> what was it? Hey, Barmaid. Why don't you combine your talents and sing comic opera? Remember the Beggar's Opera? Oh, yes. Lawrence Olivia just <laughs> made the famous old comic opera into a motion picture in England for Warner uh, yeah. Brothers. He's pretty versatile, too. Yeah, well, I think I'll leave singing in Shakespeare to Sir Lawrence, and I'll just stick to drama and comedy. <laughs> Very wise, Carrie. I believe in staying with whatever you have confidence in. You said it. <laughs> That's why I've always been a devoted fan to Lux Toilet Soap. It certainly is a dependable complexion, Ken. Yeah, we can always depend on the Lux Radio Theater for the best in motion pictures. So uh, what's for next week, Irving? It's not only one of 20th Century Fox finest pictures but it tells the story of some of our most exciting American history. It's the great love story of Rachel and Andrew Jackson in The President's Lady. And as our stars, we'll have dynamic Charlton Heston recreating his original role. And as his co-star, lovely and talented, Joan Fontaine. Oh, that will be a wonderful show. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. We'll see you soon. Good morning, honey. When you say good morning, does your breath say... Morning, Molly. Morning, Morning, Molly. Morning, Morning, Molly. It won't if you use Chlorident toothpaste. Chlorident absolutely gets rid of that stale, furry taste that's a sure sign of bad breath. Some toothpaste only mask bad breath temporarily. But with Chlorident, that wonderful, clean, fresh feeling tells you your breath is sweet, even hours later. Chlorident hasn't got a little dab of chlorophyll. It's loaded with it. And it's got a patented polishing agent that cleans better than any other toothpaste formula bar none. A great university proved it. Anti-enzyme? Certainly. One brushing stops dangerous acid formations that cause decay for nine out of ten people for hour after hour after hour. So to get rid of morning mouth, get Chlorident. Then when you say good morning, your breath says clean. And fresh. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, invite you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Charlton Heston 
and Joan Fontaine in The President's Lady. This is Irving Cummings saying good night to you from Hollywood. Heard in our cast tonight were Jack Crucian as LaRue, Leonard Penn as Keller, Edgar Barrier as Robertson, Shep Mencken as Murphy, George Baxter as Pierre, Ann Morrison as Alma, Charlie Long as Villette, Jill Oppenheim as Augustine, Bill Johnstone as the defense attorney, and Herb Butterfield, Tony Michaels, and Eddie Marr. Our radio play was adapted by S.H. Barnett, and our music was composed and directed by Rudy Schrager. Well, Francis, why that big smile? Well, I just sort of found $10. What do you mean, sort of? Well, I did some figuring, Ken, and came out $10 a head. Oh, great. How'd you do that? Well, it's like this. I buy about 15 pairs of nylons a year. I spend, oh, a dollar and a quarter to a dollar thirty-five a pair. Mm-hmm. Say, $20 a year for stockings. Now, like any smart gal, I give my sheer nylons Lux Flakes care and... And get double the stocking wear. Hmm? So I cut stocking costs in half and save $10 a year. Now, isn't that money found? You bet it is, Francis. And any woman can do it just by giving her delicate nylons gentle Lux Flakes care. So don't wash your nylons harshly in wash day products. You see, Lux Flakes keep nylon threads strong and elastic so they're less likely to break and cause runs. That's why 96% of stocking manufacturers recommend Lux Flakes. And Lux Flakes are guaranteed safe by Lever Brothers. Remember, if you want double your stocking wear, be sure to use Lux Flakes Care. Lever Brothers Company unconditionally guarantees the quality and performance of Lux Toilet Soap, Lux Flakes, Chlorodent Toothpaste, and Surf, or your money refunded. This is your announcer, Ken Carpenter, reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear The President's Lady, starring Charlton Heston and Joan Fontaine. Every Thursday evening, Lieber Brothers Company brings you the Lux Video Theater. Consult your local newspaper for time and station. This is the CBS Radio Network.